just peace. I've had only two stories that were collaborations. Ordinarily, collaboration is a good way to work just as hard as ever, but only get paid half as much. Keith Laumer summed up the problems in the title of his essay for the SFWA Bulletin, How to Collaborate Without Getting Your Head Shaved. There were these two times, though. Once was with my then-wife, Joan D. Vinge, in The Peddler's Apprentice. I wrote the first part, got bogged down, and Joan finished it. The circumstances of the other collaboration were quite different. My friend Bill Rupp and I simply wanted to write an adventure story. We plotted the thing together using various ideas we had been collecting. For instance, we both admired Paul Anderson's approach to conflict adventures, the way he acknowledges the right that adheres in some wise to almost any cause. Bill wrote the first draft, and I revised it. John W. Campbell bought it for analog. Sadly, this was the last sale I ever made to John. He died just a few months later. In its orbit about Jupiter, an artificial star flickered briefly, its essence oscillating between matter and energy. The complex disturbance generated by those pulsations spread out from the solar system, in violation of several classical theories of simultaneity, at many times the speed of light. Nineteen light years away, a receiver on the second planet of the star Delta Pavonis picked the signal out from the universal static of ultrawave radiation and. Chente felt a slight, though abrupt, lurch as gravity fell to new Canadian normal. That was the only sign that the transmission had been accomplished. The cage's lights didn't even flicker. We can't know, of course, the exact conditions which faced your predecessor. His report is eighteen months overdue, however, so that we must expect the worst. Chente took a deep breath and stood, feeling for the moment exaltation. Three times before he had sat in the transmission cage, and each time he had been disappointed. Believe you are ready, Chente. What can I say to a man about to travel nineteen light years in an instant? For that matter, what will I say to the man who remains behind? The exit was behind his chair. Chente hit the control plate, and the hatch slid silently into the wall. Beyond was the control cubby of a Ramscoop starship. Chente scrambled through the opening and stood in the small space behind the control saddle. The displays were all computer-driven and rather quaint. Neat lettering above one of the consoles read, International Business Machines of Canada, the original Canada back on Earth. Chente had spent hundreds of hours working out in a mock-up of this famous control room, but the real thing was subtly different. Here the air felt completely dead, sterile. The mock-up on Earth had been occupied by occasional technicians, whereas no one but Chente's predecessor had been in this room for more than a century. And it had been more than three centuries since the robot craft had sailed out of the solar system. A monument to empire's past, Chente thought as he slipped onto the saddle. Who goes there? a voice asked in English. Chente looked at the computer's video pickup. He had had plenty of practice with a similar think box on Earth. The mech was barely sentient, but the best mankind could produce in the old days. Chente's superiors had theorized that after 320 years, such a brain would be more than a little irrational. The human responded carefully. Vicente Quintero y Hualero, agent of the Canadian hegemony. He placed his ID before the pickup. Of course it was a fake. The Canadian hegemony had ceased to exist one hundred years earlier, but the computer probably wouldn't accept any more recent authority. I have already received Vicente Quintero y Hualero. It really is senile, thought Chente. That is so, but another copy of Quintero remains on Earth and was used for this latest transmission. A long pause. Very well, sir, I am at your disposal. I so rarely receive visitors, I... You require a situation report, of course. The vocoder's pleasant baritone assumed a sing-song tone, as if repeating some long-considered excuse. After my successful landing on Delta Pavonis II, I sent Earth a favorable report on the planet. Sir, most pertinent criteria were favorable. I see now my mistake. But it would have taken a new program to avoid making it. 
Shortly thereafter I received an initial transmission of 1,500 colonists together with enough ova and sperm to breed a colony. By 2220, the new Canada colony had a population of 8,250,000. Then, then the great planetary disturbance occurred. Chente held up his hand. Please, the hegemony received your reports through 2240. We've re-established contact to find out what's happened since then. Yes, sir, but I must report all the truth first. I wish no one to say that I have failed. I warned of the core collapse several weeks before it occurred, yet still most of the colony was destroyed. The disruption was so great, in fact, that the very continental outlines were changed. Sir, I have done my best to help the survivors, but their descendants have regressed terribly, have even formed warring nation-states. These groups covet every fragment of surviving technology. They stole my communication bombs so that I could no longer report to Earth. They have even attacked my own person and attempted to cannibalize me. Fortunately, my defenses are— The computer broke off and remained silent. What's the matter? A small party is now climbing the hill I stand upon. Do they look hostile? They are always hostile toward me, but this group is not armed. I suspect they saw the coronal discharge that accompanied your arrival. They probably drove here from Freetown. A city? said Chente. Yes, a city-state which has remained neutral in the current warfare. It's built over the ruins of First Landing, the settlement I helped to found. Would you like to see our visitors? Chente leaned forward. Of course. A large screen lit up to show a grass-covered slope. Coming up the hill toward the ship were twelve men and a woman. Beyond them, beyond the hill, the ocean stretched away unbroken to the horizon. Madre de Dios, Chente gasped. On the old maps, this hilltop was 3,500 kilometers inland. The continental outline certainly had been changed by the catastrophe. Say again, sir said the computer. Never mind. Chente ignored the view and concentrated on the people who would soon be questioning him. They made an interesting study in contrasts. To the left, a man and woman walked almost in lockstep, though they remained discreetly apart. The man was dressed in simple black trousers and a short coat. His hat was stiff and wide-brimmed. The woman wore a long black dress that revealed nothing of her from below the neck. Her reddish hair was drawn back and tied with a black ribbon, and her grim face showed no sign of makeup. The two short men in the center wore jumpsuits, apparently modeled after the original colonists' dress. To the right, eight nearly naked men bent beneath an elaborate litter carrying a young male. As the group stopped, the litter was lowered, and he stepped jauntily to earth. The fellow's upper body was heavily oiled. He wore skin-tight breeches with an enormous codpiece. The grimly dressed couple on the left looked straight ahead, trying to avoid the sight of their companion on the far right. You see the cultural fragmentation that has occurred here on New Canada, the computer remarked. How far are they now? Twenty meters. I may as well meet them. Offload the equipment that came through with me. Yes, sir. A hatch slid open, and he entered the airlock beyond. Seconds later, he was standing ankle-deep in turquoise grass beneath a pale, pale blue sky. A slow breeze pushed with remarkable force against his jumpsuit. Sea-level air pressure on New Canada was almost twice Earth's. He was about to greet his visitors when the somber woman spoke, her voice tense with surprise. Chente. Chente bowed. You have the advantage of me, ma'am. I take it you know my predecessor. The past tense would be more appropriate, Freeman Quintero. Your twin was murdered more than a year ago, the fellow in the skin-tight pants said, and smiled at the woman. Chente saw that in spite of his athletic build and flamboyant dress, the man was in his forties. The woman, on the other hand, seemed much younger than she had at a distance. Now she kept silent, but her companion said, it was one of your ships he died on, you slave-holding animal. The shirtless dandy just shrugged. Please, gentlemen, the fat man in the center spoke up. Recall that the condition of your presence here requires a certain mutual cordiality. 
Glares flickered back and forth between shirtless and the Puritans. Or at least courtesy. Mr. Quintero, I am Bretagne Flagon, mayor of Freetown and governor of Wundlich Island. Welcome. The lady is Citizeness Martha Blount, ambassadress to Wundlich from the Commonwealth of New Providence, and— he rushed on as if trying to make both the introductions at once. This gentleman is bossman Pierre Balkworth, ambassador to Wundlich from the Ontarian Confederacy. The woman seemed to have recovered from her initial surprise. Now she spoke with solemn formality. New Providence regards you as our honored guest and citizen. Our nation awaits your— Not so fast, Mistress Blunt, bossman Pierre interrupted. You aren't the only people brimming over with hospitality. I believe Freeman Quintero would be much more comfortable in a society which does not condemn dancing and music as a crime against nature. Please, Flagon repeated, let's not have propaganda spoil the arrival of a visitor from the mother world. As mayor, I wish to offer you any assistance you require, Mr. Quintero. I, uh, ah, I will hold a banquet in your honor tonight. Of course, we will invite guests from both New Providence and Ontario. He sighed unhappily, recognizing the inevitable. You can settle things then. A faint hissing announced the opening of the freight port in the ship's hull. A lift slid down the ancient metal surface with Chente's luggage. Mr. Quintero y Hualero, the computer's vocoder boomed from a hidden speaker, have you further orders at this time? No, I will keep in touch. Beyond this hill I cannot protect you, sir. I'll survive. Yes, sir, doubtfully. Damned machine, Bossman Peer said softly. His perpetual grin had vanished. It should be helping us. Instead, it shoots at anyone trying to make entrance. We had to leave most of our boys at the base of the hill, or we couldn't have got this close. Can I help you with that equipment? Chente stepped between Balkworth's servants and the freight lift. No thanks. I can carry it myself. The Ontarian smiled knowingly. Perhaps you will survive, after all. As they walked down the hillside, Vicente kept silent. So I died here, he thought. Well, that was no great surprise but that he had been killed by the very colonists he had been sent to help made his mission seem doubly difficult. What had happened on New Canada these last 130 years? The lush grass on the hilltop thrived everywhere. He was no botanist, but it looked like some terrestrial type brought by the first colonists. Other vegetation was less familiar. Large ferns and broad-leafed plants stood in scattered clumps. The trees looked like giant flowers. Their trunks rose straight and tall, with purple foliage sprouting from the top. Except for the grass, the land had a strong Jurassic aspect. Chente half expected a large reptile to pop out of the bushes. They had reached the base of the hill when his expectation materialized. A meter-wide something flew low over their heads, then circled above a nearby ridge. A Gretsch. Bretain Flagon said. They're really quite common around here. That poor little fellow must have lost his mother. The poor little fellow looked like a cross between a reptile and a buzzard. Shinte grimaced. A nice place for a lifelong vacation. He'd never cared for paleontology. At the base of the hill they stopped by a large three-wheeled vehicle and a group of armed men with bicycles. The powered tricycle was driven from a bench above and behind the passenger compartment. A brass tank and a piston cylinder sat below the driver's seat. Steamer? Vicente asked as he climbed into the cab. Quite right, Balkworth said. He swung up onto his slave-powered litter and looked down at Quintero. If you're wise, you'll use something time-tested. He patted the satin pillows. Flagon and his driver climbed onto the upper bench, while Martha Blount and her aide got in with Chente. The armed bicyclists started down the road, and the auto got off with a jerk and a jump. The deep cushions could not disguise the absence of an adequate suspension, and acrid black smoke drifted from the firebox into the passenger compartment. 
Behind them, Bossman Piers' bearers were having no trouble keeping pace. Minutes later, the auto was puffing down a long slope that gave an overview of Freetown. The city was built around a crescent-shaped bay, protected on the north by a huge granitic outcropping. Except for that headland, the bay was open to the sea. Have many storms? he said to Martha. Dreadful ones, the woman answered, unsmiling. But the tsunamis are worse. That's why the ships you see are anchored so far out. They come into port only for loading. The city rested on a sequence of terraces that climbed steeply up from the water's edge. Each terrace was split down the middle by a narrow, copper-paved street, while steps and coppered ramps provided communication between one level and the next. Chente noticed that on the first three tiers the buildings were mostly warehouses and sheds. Nearly all these structures were made of wood and had a brand new look. But above the third tier, the buildings were of massive stone construction, eroded and weather-beaten. The most peculiar thing about the stone buildings was their long, narrow shape, their sharp, pointed ends. The prows of those stone arcs pointed uniformly out to sea. Martha Blount followed his gaze. The Freetowners use those wooden buildings for temporary storage of sea freight. They can count on everything in the first three terraces being leveled every two years or so. Beyond the third level, the tsunamis attenuate and the water breaks over the bows of the buildings. The auto turned onto the fourth tier's main street and slowed even further to get through the swarm of Freetowners moving to and from the stone-encased bazaars. Chente shook his head in wonder. You people certainly have managed to adapt. Adapt? The new Providencian ambassador turned toward him, for the first time showing an emotion. Rage. We were nearly wiped out in the cataclysm. That computer-driven monster up there on the hill gave us a real prize. With an advanced technology, a colony on this planet could get along. But with that technology lost, the place is a hell. Adapt? Look. She pointed out of the cab. They were passing near the edge of the terrace now, by blocks of gray rubble, stumpy walls. Life on New Canada is a constant struggle simply to maintain ourselves, and all the while we're weighed down by those Sybarites. She waved her hand back toward Bossman Piers' litter, some fifteen meters away. They drain our resources. They fight us at every turn. Her voice trailed off, and she sat looking at Chente. For a moment, some new emotion flickered across her face, but then she became impassive. Chente suddenly realized the reason for her silence. It was the second time around for Martha. No doubt she had sat in this same vehicle eighteen months earlier, and had had the same conversation with his predecessor. Martha's hand moved toward him, then retreated. She said softly, You really are Chente, alive again. Her tone became businesslike. Be more careful this time, will you please? Your knowledge, your equipment— Many people would kill to get them. She was silent the rest of the way into town. At sunset, the heavy layers of dust in New Canada's atmosphere transformed the pale blue sky into orange, red, and greenish-brown. From where Chente sat within the Freetown Banquet Hall, the skylight shone through narrow horizontal slits cut high up in the west wall to play gentle pastels of orange and green down upon the waiters and chattering guests. It was a most colorful tribute to volcanism. The skylight faded slowly toward gray as the last unpleasant course of the meal was served. Above them, electric lamps mounted on large silver wheels were lit. Clusters of rubies and emeralds hung like clouds of colored stars around the glowing filaments. Occasionally, the earth trembled faintly, causing the wheels to sway as if a slight breeze touched them. The meal over, Bretagne Flagon rose to deliver a few words of welcome to our star-crossed, sick, visitor. Chente couldn't decide whether the phrase was a pun or a malaprop. The speech droned on, and eventually the earthman succeeded in ignoring it. The hall's wide floor was covered from wall to wall, with what could only be gold. The soft yellow metal behaved like some slow sea beneath the weight of the banquet tables and constant passage of human feet. 
Tiny ripples, barely a centimeter high, stood frozen in its surface. New Canada had everything the Spanish conquistadors had ever dreamed of. But this virtue was symptomatic of a serious vice. Heavy metals were plentiful near the planet's surface simply because New Canada's interior was much more poorly differentiated than Earth's. The Starship's computer had reported this fact to its makers on first landing here, but had failed to notice that the process of core formation was ongoing. The cataclysm that hit the colony 150 years earlier was evidence of this continuing process. The abundance of metallic salts on the surface meant that less than 1% of New Canada's land area could be used for farming. And those same salts made the sea life uniformly poisonous. In contrast to the opulent banquet hall, the food served had been scarcely more than a spicy gruel. Mr. Quintero. Applause sounded as Flagon finished talking. The mayor motioned for Chente to rise and speak. The earthman stood and bowed briefly. The applause was equally enthusiastic from the three groups seated at the horseshoe banquet table. On his right sat the Ontarian delegation, consisting of bossman Pierre, three associates, and a crowd of scantily dressed odalisks, all ensconced on piles of wide, deep pillows. Chente had been placed at the middle of the horseshoe with the Freetowners, while Martha Blount and her people sat along the left leg of the horseshoe. All through the meal, while the Ontarians caroused and the Freetowners chattered, the new Providencians had kept silent. Finally, the applause died, and people waited. From above them, the tiny lights burned fiercely, but the stark shadows they cast held abysmal gloom. Chente saw a certain measure of fear in their attentive silence. No doubt many of them had sat right here less than two years before and watched a man identical to the one they saw now. Intellectually, they might accept the idea of duplicative transport, but historians had assured Chente that without a lifetime of experience, no one could really accept such a thing. To his audience, Chente was a man come back from the dead. Perhaps he could take advantage of this fear. I will be brief as most of you will have heard this speech before. There was an uneasy movement and various exchanges of glances. Bossman Peer seemed the only one left with a smile on his face. Your planet is undergoing a core collapse. A century ago, a core tremor sank half a continent and virtually destroyed your civilization. Recently, Earth has been able to reestablish communications with the starship on the hill behind Freetown. The link we have established is a tenuous one, and you can't expect material aid. But Earth does have knowledge it can place at your disposal. Ultimately, the core collapse will proceed to completion, and about ten million cataclysms worth of energy will be released. If this happens all at once, no life above the microbe level will be left on the planet. But if it happens uniformly over a million-year period, you would never even be aware of the change. From the frequency of earthquakes, you know that the latter possibility has already been ruled out. My mission is to discover where between these two extremes the truth lies. For it is entirely possible that a future cataclysm will be powerful enough to wreck your civilization as it is now, yet mild enough so that with adequate forewarning and preparation you can survive. Flagon bobbed his head. We understand, sir. And, as we did with your predecessor, we will cooperate to the limit of our resources. Chente decided to pounce on the double meaning in Flagon's inept phrasing. Yes, I've heard about the splendid help you gave my predecessor. He is dead, I've been told. He waved down Flagon's stammered clarification. Ladies and gentlemen, someone among you killed me. That was an act that threatened all of New Canada. If I am killed again, there may be no more replacements, and you will face the core collapse in ignorance. Chente wondered briefly if he hadn't just invited his assassination with that last threat, but it was too late to retract it. The distressed Flagon again pledged his help. Both Balkworth and Martha Blount chorused similar promises. Very well. I'll need transportation for an initial survey. 
From my discussion with the ship's computer before this banquet, I have decided that the best place to start is the islands that were formerly the peaks of the Heavenraker Mountains. Martha Blount came to her feet. Citizen Quintero, one of our Navy's finest dirigibles is tied down here at Freetown. We could be ready to go in twenty-two hours, and it won't take more than another day to reach the Heavenraker Islands. On the other side of the horseshoe, Bulkworth cleared his throat noisily and stood up. Martha Blount rushed on. Don't, don't make the same mistake the first Quintero did. He accepted Ontarian hospitality rather than ours, only to die on an Ontarian ship. Chente looked at the boss man. Her story is true, but misleading, Bulkworth said easily. He had the air of someone telling a lie that he expected no one to believe, or else a self-evident truth that needed no earnest protestations to support itself. The first Quintero had the good judgment to use Ontarian transportation, but his death occurred when the ship we assigned him was attacked by the forces of some other state. He looked across the table at Martha Blount. The Earthman didn't respond directly. Mayor Flagon, what's the weather like along the Heavenraker chain this time of year? The mayor looked to an aide, who said, In late spring? Well, there are no hurricanes likely. Matter of fact, the Heavenrakers rarely get any bad storms. But the underground weather is something else again. Freetown alone loses three or four ships a year out there, smashed by tsunamis as they sail close to shore. In that case, I'd prefer to go by aircraft. Bulkworth shrugged amiably. Then I must leave you to the clutches of Mistress Blount. I don't have a single flyer in port, and Mayor Flagon doesn't have a single flyer in his state. Your concern is appreciated in any case, Bossman. Citizen Blount, I'd like to discuss my plans in more detail with your people. Tomorrow? She seemed close to a triumphant smile. Fine. Vicente began to sit down, then straightened. One more thing. According to the Starship's computer, all nine communications bombs are missing from their storage racks up on the hill. In order to generate ultrawave distortions, matter must needs be annihilated. Chente referred to the specially constructed nuclear bombs whose detonation could be modulated to carry information at superlight speeds. Such devices lacked the bandwidth to transmit the pattern of a human being. Earth's government used the tiny star that orbited where Callisto had once been for that job. Nevertheless, each of the communication bombs could be said to generate the equivalent of ten megatons of TNT, so they could do considerable damage if they were not hoisted into space prior to use. The silence lengthened. Finally, Chente said coldly, I see. Your nation states are playing strategic deterrence. That's a dangerous game, you recall. It cost Earth more than three hundred million lives a few centuries back. Your colony is in enough trouble without it. His listeners nodded their agreement, but Chente saw with a sick feeling that his words were no more than platitudes to them. The new Providencian airship Diligence flew south for a day and a half before it reached the first of the Heavenrakers. Chente saw a small village and a few farms in a sheltered bay near the coast, but the rest of the island was naked black rock. This was the first stop on a tour that would take them over 2,700 kilometers to the East Frag, the Greenland-sized island that had once been the eastern end of the largest new Canadian continent. Chente had chosen this course since he wanted a baseline of observations along the planet's equator, and the Heavenrakers were the most convenient land masses stretching along such a path. The survey went quickly, thanks to the help of the islanders, though they seemed happy only when the diligence and its guns were preparing to depart. Three days later, the dirigible hung in the clear blue sky over the west coast of the frag. All around them, thunder sounded. For hundreds of kilometers along the coast, they could see tiny rivulets of cherry-colored molten rock dribbling off into the surf, converting the water into a low-lying fog beneath them. Looking inland at the extent of the frozen lava, Chente could see that the land-forming process had added thousands of square kilometers to the area. Quintero turned to his companion at the railing. 
Martha Blount hadn't really changed in these last four days, but she had been revealed in a new aspect. For one thing, she had traded her full-length dress for a gray jumpsuit that covered her but hinted at a lot more than the dress had. From their discussions on the journey out, he had found her to have a quick and lively mind that belied her outward reserve and convinced him that she had earned her high position. At times, he found her interest in his equipment and plan somewhat too intense and her political views too rigid, but he knew better than to expect anything else under the circumstances. And the more he knew of her, the more certain he was that her presence here was not motivated strictly by political interest. There had been something between Martha and the first Chente. He gestured at the red and black landscape shimmering in the superheated air below them. Are you sure you still want to come down with my landing party? She nodded. I certainly do. It's not as dangerous as it looks. We'll be going many kilometers inland before we set down. I'm doing a little reconnaissance here myself. I've never been in this part of the world. Further conversation became impossible as the nuclear jets lit up to angle the diligence down toward the black ridges that thrust up between the rivulets of fire. The jets were just one of many anachronisms in the new Providencian military machine. Apparently they had been salvaged from one of the colony's original helicopters. With them, the dirigible could make nearly 50 kilometers per hour in level flight. The diligence flew inland until the ground below was solid and cold. The airship descended rapidly, then leveled off just before its nose skid rasped across the jagged volcanic slag. Heavy grapnels were thrown out and the ship was drawn to earth. Vicente called to ship's captain Oswald, Who'll be in charge of my ground party? Like Corporal Nord, the officer said, pointing to a tall, muscular man, who together with three others was dragging explosives and equipment out of the diligence's cramped hold. We'll stay on the ground just long enough to drop you off, Citizen Quintero. We're at the mercy of every breeze down here. We'll come back for you in twenty-two hours unless you signal us earlier. He glanced at Martha. Citizen Blount, I suggest you forego this landing. The country is pretty rough. Martha looked back at him and seemed fairly annoyed. No, I insist. Oswald frowned but did not press the matter. Very well. See you in a day or so. Nord and two of the riflemen were the first to hit ground. Martha followed them. Then came Vicente, loaded down with his own special equipment. Two more riflemen with the explosives brought up the rear. The landing site was a flat area at the top of a narrow ridge. The seven of them clambered down the hillside as the huge aircraft's engines throttled up. By the time they reached the bottom of the ravine that followed the ridge, the diligence was already floating five hundred meters over their heads. Let's follow this gorge inland a bit, said Quintero. From what I could see before we landed, it should widen out to where we can do some blasting without risking an avalanche. Anything you say, Nord replied indifferently. Chente watched the man silently as the other moved on ahead. One way or another, this would not be a routine exploration. The new Providencian spent most of the afternoon setting off explosives in the slag. Their firecrackers were bulky and heavy, and the work went slowly. The bombs didn't amount to more than half a ton of TNT, a microscopically small charge to obtain any information about conditions within the planet. Fortunately, Chente's instruments didn't measure mechanical vibrations as such, but considerably more subtle effects. Even so, he had to rely on coincidence counters and considerable statistical analysis to derive a picture of what went on hundreds of kilometers below. Toward evening, the sky became overcast and it began to drizzle. Chente called off their work. In fact, his survey was now complete, and his grim conclusions were beyond doubt. A stiff breeze kept anyone from suggesting that they call down the diligence. Even with perfect visibility, Oswald probably couldn't have brought the airship in against that wind. By the time they set up camp in a deep hollow, almost a cave, beneath the cliff face, they were all thoroughly soaked. Nord put two of his men on watch at the entrance to the hollow, and the rest of the party took to their sleeping bags. As the hours passed, the rain fell more heavily, 
and from the west the steady hissing of the lava masked nearly all other sounds. Abruptly, the cylinder that rested in Chente's hand vibrated against his palm. Someone was tampering with his equipment. Chente raised his head and looked about the cavelet. The darkness was complete. He couldn't even see the sleeping bag he lay in. But now the years of training paid off. Chente relaxed, suppressed all background noise, and listened for nearby sounds. There. At least one person was standing in his immediate vicinity. The fellow's breathing was shallow, excited. Farther away, toward the equipment cache, he could now hear even fainter sounds. Quintero slipped quietly out of the sleeping bag, which he had prudently left unbuttoned, and moved toward the cavelet entrance, lifting and lowering his feet precisely to avoid the irregularities he remembered in the rocky ground. He probably would have got clear away, as the distant hissing and the sound of rain covered whatever sounds he made. He didn't dare pick up any equipment, however. He was forced to settle on what he'd kept with him. Twenty meters out into the rain, he turned and lay down behind a small, sharp hummock of lava. He drew his tiny pistol. Several minutes passed. These were the most cautious assassins he had ever seen. As if to rebut the thought, two of the guards' hand torches lit. Their yellow beams shone down upon his and Martha's sleeping bags. The two other guards held their rifles trained on the bags, ready to fusillade. Before the rifleman could utter more than gasps of astonishment, Chente shouted, Out here! All but one of the men turned toward his voice. Chente raised his pistol and shot the one who still had his rifle pointed at the sleeping bags. There was no report or flash, but his target virtually exploded. The hand torches were doused as everyone scrambled for cover. Martha, he shouted, get out, run off to the side. He couldn't tell whether she had, but he kept up a steady covering fire, sending stone chips flying in all directions off the cavelet's entrance. Then someone stuck one of the torches on a pole and hoisted it up. The others moved briefly into the open to fire all at once down upon his exposed position. But the Earthman got off one last shot into the explosives. The concussion smashed the ground up into his face, and he never heard the cliffside fall across the cavelet, entombing his enemies. Someone was shaking him, and he felt a nose and a forehead nestled against the back of his neck. Gente, please don't die again, please, came Martha's voice. Gente stirred and looked into the wet darkness. His ears were buzzing, and the left side of his head was one vast ache. You all right? he asked Martha. Yes, she said. Her hands tightened momentarily against him, but her voice was much calmer. Now that he was conscious, she retreated again into a shell of relative formality. The others must be dead, though. The whole overhang came down on them. I followed the edge of the landfall trying to find you. You were not more than a couple of meters beyond it. You knew about this plan beforehand? Chente's soft question was almost a statement. Yes. I mean, no. There were rumors that our special weapons group killed the first Chente in an unsuccessful attempt to take his communications bomb. I believed those rumors. We used one of our bombs in the nuclear exchange of year 317. The special weapons people have devised new uses, new delivery systems for our two remaining bombs, but what they really need are more nukes. In the last few months, I've had reports that the weapons people are more eager than ever to get another bomb, that they have some special need for it. When you arrived, I was sure that between the Ontarians and our weapons group, someone would try to kill you. Chente shook his head, trying to end the buzzing pain. The motion only made him want to be sick. Finally, he said, Their assassination attempt seems incredibly clumsy. Why didn't they just do away with me once we were airborne? Now the Providencian ambassador seemed completely in control of herself. She said quietly, That was partly my doing. I knew the weapons people were waiting for another agent to be sent from Earth. When you came through, I made sure you were assigned to an airship crewed by regular Navy men. I was sure it was safe. For years, Oswald has been part of the Navy faction opposed to the special weapons group. But somehow they must have got through to him, and at least a few of his crewmen. Their murder attempt was clumsy, but it was a lot more than I had expected under the circumstances. 
Chente sat up and propped his head against his hands. This morass of new Providencian intrigue was not completely unexpected, but it was ludicrous. Even if the conspirators could dig his bomb out of the avalanche, it could not be fused without a voice code spoken by Chente himself. He saw now his mistake in not revealing that fact upon landing. He had thought that all his dire warnings about the colonists' common peril would be enough to get cooperation. The situation was all the more ludicrous, since he had seen how real the danger of core collapse was. Martha, do you know what I discovered during my survey? No. She sounded faintly puzzled by this sudden change in topic. In 150 years or so, there will be another core tremor, about as serious as the one you call the cataclysm. You people simply don't have time to fight among yourselves. Your only option is to cooperate, to develop a technology advanced enough to ensure your survival. I see. Then the special weapons group are fools as well as murderers. We should be working together to win the Ontarian War, so we can put all our resources into preparing for the next cataclysm. Chente wondered briefly if he were hallucinating. He tried again to explain. I mean the war itself must be ended, not through victory, but simply through an end of hostilities. You need the Ontarians as much as they need you. She shook her head stubbornly. Chente, you don't realize what a ruthless, hedonistic crew the Ontarian rulers are. Until they're eliminated, new providence will go on bleeding, so that no steps can be taken to protect us from the next cataclysm. Chente sighed, realizing that further argument would get him nowhere. He knew his own planet's history too well. He changed the subject. Are there any settlements on the frag? No cities, but there is at least one village about five hundred kilometers southeast of here. It's in the single pocket of arable land that's been discovered on the frag. That doesn't sound too bad. If we start out before dawn, we may be able to avoid Oswald's... Chente, between here and wherever that village is, there's not a single plant or animal we can eat without poisoning ourselves. You'd rather take your chance with Oswald? Certainly. It's obvious that not everyone aboard the diligence was in on this. Martha, I think we can make it through to that village. He felt too dizzy to explain how. Will you come along? Even in the darkness, he thought he felt a certain amount of amusement in her answer. Very well. I could hardly return to the diligence alone anyway. It would give away the fact that you're out here somewhere. Her hand brushed briefly across his shoulder. They started inland at the morning's first light, following along the bottom of one of the innumerable tiny ravines cut through the black rock. A temporary but good-sized stream ran down the middle so that they had to walk along the steep, rough ground near the side of the ravine. The buzzing was gone from Chente's head, but some of the dizziness remained. He was beginning to think that his inner ear had been tumbled by the explosion, giving him a permanent, though mild, case of motion sickness. Martha appeared to be in much better condition. Quintero noticed that since she had made up her mind to come along, she seemed to be doing her best to ignore the fact that they were without food or a reliable means of navigation. Toward noon, they drank rainwater from a shallow puddle in the rocks. Twice during the afternoon, Chente thought he heard the engines of the diligence, nearly masked by the volcanic thunder to the west. By late afternoon, he estimated they were twenty kilometers inland. Excellent progress, considering the ground they were crossing. The ravine became steadily shallower, until finally they left the lava fields and crossed into a much older countryside. The cloud cover swept away, and the westering sun shone down from an orange-red sky upon the savanna-like plain ahead of them. That plain was not covered by grass, but by low, multiple-rooted plants that rose like thick green spiders from the ground. Chente glanced at the sun and then at the girl who trudged doggedly on beside him. Her initial reserves of energy were gone now, and her face was set in lines of fatigue. Rest break, he said, as they entered the greenery. They dropped down onto plants which, despite their disquieting appearance, felt soft and resilient. Something like ice plant back on Earth. The abrupt movement made the world spin giddily around Chente's head. 
He waited grimly until the wave of dizziness passed, then pulled an oblong case from a pocket and began fiddling. Finally, Martha spoke, her tired voice devoid of sarcasm. Some earthside magic? You're going to materialize some food? Something like that. A small screen flashed to life on the wide side of the oblong. He sharpened the image, but it was still no more than abstract art to the uninitiated. A mixed jumble of blue and green and brown. He didn't look up as he said, Martha, did you know that the starship left several satellites in orbit before it landed on New Canada? She leaned closer to him, looked down at the screen. Yes, if you know where to look, you can often see them at night. They were put up for your colony's use, and though you no longer have receiving equipment, they are still in working order. And this thing is reading from a synchronous satellite some 40,000 kilometers up. This picture shows most of the frag. Martha's fatigue was forgotten. We never dreamed the satellites could still work. I feel like God looking down on things this way. Now we can find that village easily. Yes. Using the controls at the side of the display, he began to follow the frag's coastline at medium resolution. Martha spoke up again. I think we're seeing the north coast now. At least the part that isn't under cloud looks like the last map I saw. The village is to the southeast of us, so you're not going to find much of anything. Chente frowned, looked more closely at the screen, then increased the magnification. It was as if the camera had been dropped straight toward the ground. The tiny bay at the center of the screen swelled to fill the entire display. Now they were looking down through late afternoon haze at a large natural harbor. Chente identified thirty or forty piers and a number of ships. All along the waterfront, buildings cast long, incriminating shadows. He pushed a button, and five tiny red lights glowed over the image of one of those buildings. Martha was silent for a long moment. She looked more closely at the picture, and finally she said, Those ships, they're Ontarian. They have an entire naval base hidden away there. The scum. I can imagine what they're planning, to build up a large secret reserve and then tempt us into a major battle. Why, Chente, this changes our entire naval situation. It... Suddenly, she seemed to realize that she was not sitting in some intelligence briefing, but was instead stranded thousands of kilometers from the people who could use this discovery. Chente made no comment, but returned the magnification to its previous level. He followed the coastline all the way around to the south, and eventually found two other settlements, both small villages. Now let's try to find some food, he said. If I'm oriented properly, I've got the picture centered on our location. He stepped up the magnification. On the enlarged scale, they could see individual hillocks and identify the small stream they had crossed half a kilometer back. Toward the top of the picture, a collection of spike-like shadows stretched several millimeters. He magnified the image still further. Animals, Chente said. They look better than two meters long. Then they're buzzards. Buzzards? Yes, herbivores. The next largest thing we know about on the frag is a predator not much more than a meter long. Chente grinned at her. I think I've materialized that food for you. She looked dubious. Only if I can acquire a taste for copper salts in my meat. Perhaps we can do something about that. He looked at the scale key that flickered near the bottom of the picture. That herd isn't more than 5,000 meters away. I hadn't expected luck this good. How long till sunset? Two hours? Martha glanced at the sun, which hung some thirty degrees off the stony ridges behind them. More like ninety minutes. We'll have buzzard soup yet. Come on. The pace he set was a slow one, but in their present state it was about the best they could do. The spidery vegetation caught at their feet, and the ground was not nearly as level as it looked. An hour and three quarters passed. Behind them the sun had set and only the reddish sky glow lighted their way. Chente touched Martha's elbow, motioned her to bend low. If they spooked the herd now, they would have a hungry night. They crawled over a broad hill crest, then lay down to scan the plain beyond. They had not been too cautious. 
The herd was some five hundred meters down the slope, near a waterhole. Chente almost laughed. Buzzards indeed. They certainly hadn't been named by the first-generation colonists. In this light, the creatures might almost have been mistaken for tall men stooped over low against the ground. Their thin wings were clasped behind their backs as they walked slowly about. Chente chose a medium-sized animal that was browsing away from the main group. He silently took his pistol from his coverall and aimed. The beast screamed once, then ran fifteen meters right into the waterhole where it collapsed. The others didn't need two warnings. The herd stampeded off to Chente's right. The creatures didn't run or fly. They bounded in long, wing-assisted leaps. The motion reminded Chente of the impalas he had seen in the San Joaquin Valley. In fact, their ecological niche was probably similar. In which case, he thought, we'd better watch out for whatever passes for lions around here. The humans picked themselves up and walked slowly down toward the abandoned waterhole. Vicente waded cautiously into the shallow, acrid-smelling water. The top of the buzzard's head was blown off. It was probably dead, but he didn't take any chances with it. By the time he got the hundred-kilo carcass out of the pool, the short twilight was nearly ended. Martha took over the butchering, though she remarked that buzzards didn't have much in common with the farm animals she was used to. Apparently, she had not spent her whole life administering. He watched her work in the gathering darkness, glad for her help and gladder for her presence. When the beast was cut into small enough pieces, Chente took a short cylinder from his coveralls and fed some of the meat into it. There was a soft buzzing sound, and then he pressed a cup into Martha's hand. Buzzard soup, minus the heavy metal salts. He could just make out her silhouette as she slowly raised the cup to her lips and drank. She gagged several times, but got it all down. When Chente had his first taste, he understood her reaction. The sludge didn't taste edible. This will keep us alive? Martha asked hoarsely. For a number of weeks, anyway. Over a longer time, we'd need dietary supplements. He continued feeding the buzzard to the processor and bagging the resulting slop. Why hasn't Earth given us the secret of this device, Vicente? Only one percent of New Providence has soil free from metallic poisons, and Ontario is only three or four times better off. With your processor, we could conquer this planet. He shook his head. I doubt it. The machine is a good deal more complicated than it looks. On Earth, the technology to build one has existed for less than thirty years. It's not enough to remove the heavy metals from the meat. The result would still be poisonous, or at least non-nutritious. This thing actually reassembles the protein molecules it rips apart. For the technique to be of any use to you, we'd have to ship a factory whole. You just... Chente heard a faint hiss above and behind him. Martha screamed. As he whirled and drew his pistol, he was bowled over by something that had glided in on them in virtual silence. Chente and the bird-like carnivore spun over in the spiderweed, the thing's beak searching for his face and throat, but finding Chente's upthrust forearm instead. The claws and beak were like knives thrust into his chest and arm. He fired his pistol, and the explosion sent the attacker into pieces all over him. Chente rolled to a sitting position and played fire around the unseen landscape in case there were others waiting. But all he heard was vegetation and earth exploding as the water within them was brought violently to a boil. The whole thing hadn't lasted more than ten seconds. Now the night was silent again. Chente had the impression that his attacker had been built more like a leopard than a bird. New Canada's dense atmosphere and low gravity made some peculiar things possible. Are you all right, Chente? The question made him aware of the slick flow of blood down his forearm, of the gashes across his ribs. He swore softly. No bones broken, but I got slashed up. Are these creatures venomous? No. He heard her move close. Good. The first aid equipment I've got should be enough to keep me going, then. Let's get our stuff away from this waterhole, or we'll be entertaining visitors all night long. He got stiffly to his feet. 
They collected the bags of processed meat and then walked three hundred meters or so from the waterhole, where they settled down in the soft spiderweed. Chente took a painkiller, and for a while everything seemed hazy and pleasant. The night was mild, even warm. The humidity had dropped steadily during the afternoon, so that the ground felt dry. A heavy breeze pushed around them, and there were no identifiable animal sounds. New Canada had yet to invent insects, or their equivalent. The sky seemed clear, but the stars were not so numerous as in an earthly sky. Chente guessed that the upper atmosphere haze cut out everything dimmer than magnitude three or four. He looked for Saul near the head of the Great Bear, but he wasn't even sure he had spotted that constellation. More than anything else, this sky made him feel far from home. He lay back, going over in his mind what he had discovered since his arrival. When his predecessor had failed to report, they had tried to prepare him more thoroughly for his return to New Canada. But none of the historians, none of the psychologists, had guessed what an extreme social system had developed here. It must have begun as an attempt by the shattered colony to reform society after the cataclysm, forging a fragile unity from zealous allegiance. But now it bled the warring nations dry while blinding the people to the possibility of peace, and what was worse, to the absolute necessity of working together. By rights, he should now be a hero among the new Canadians. By rights, they should be taking the technical advice he could give to increase what small chances there might be to survive the next core tremor. Instead, he was marooned on this forlorn continent, and the only person who had any real desire to help him was just as much an hysterical nationalist as everyone else. But his mission still remained, even if he couldn't get the locals to cooperate in saving themselves. In spite of its terrible problems, New Canada was a more viable colony than most. After four centuries of spaceflight, Earth knew how rare are habitable planets. Man's colonies were few. If those failed, there would be no hope for mankind ever to expand itself beyond the solar system, and eventually the entire race would die of its own stagnation. Somehow he had to end this internecine fighting or at least eliminate the possibility of nuclear war. Somehow he had to force the colonists to fight for survival. At the moment he could see only one possibility. It was a long shot, and deception was its essence. How much deception, and of whom, he tried not to consider. Martha? Yes? She huddled tentatively against him, all reserve finally gone. We're going to make for that Ontarian base rather than the village south of here. She stiffened. What? No! In spite of what some of my people tried to do to you, the Ontarians are still worse. Why? Two reasons. First, that naval base is only 250 kilometers away, not 500. Second, I mean to stop this warfare between your two states. There must be peace. A just peace? One where we won't have our mines expropriated by the Ontarians? One where we get our fair share of the farmland? One where feudalism is outlawed? Chente sighed. Yes. Something like that. Then I'll do anything to help you. But how can going to the Ontarians bring peace? You remember those red blips on my display? Those were signals from the transponders that are on each of the communications bombs. If I've been keeping count properly, this means that the Ontarians have all their nuclear weapons stored at this base. If I tell them of New Providence's treachery and offer my services, I may eventually get a crack at those bombs. It might work. Certainly the world isn't safe as long as those fanatics have the bomb, so perhaps it's worth the risk. Quintero didn't answer. He gave one quick glance around, saw no leopards in the pale starlight. Then he drew Martha into his arms and kissed her, and wondered how many times he had kissed her before. 250 kilometers in five days would have been no burden for Chente if he had started fresh and uninjured. As it was, however, his dizziness and wounds slowed him down to the point where Martha could move as fast as he. Fortunately, it didn't rain again, and the nights remained warm. Waterholes were easily detected from orbit, 
and when they ran out of food after three days, they had no trouble getting more meat, this time without having to fight for it. But by the morning of the fifth day, they were both near the limit of their resources. Through the haze of painkiller drugs and motion sickness pills, the landscape gradually became unreal to Chente. He knew that soon he would stop walking, and no effort of will would get him moving again. Beside him, Martha occasionally staggered. She walked flat-footedly now, no longer trying to favor her blisters. He could imagine the state of her feet after five days of steady walking. Ahead stretched a long hill, its crest some five thousand meters away. Chente stopped and studied his display. Just over that hill, and we're home. Martha nodded, tried to smile. The news seemed to give them new strength, and they reached the crest in less than ninety minutes. Below them lay the harbor they had discovered five days earlier on Chente's display. It was separated from the sea by overlapping headlands some ten kilometers further north. South of the green and brown buildings were the unpoisoned farmlands which apparently supported the base. They looked down on the base only briefly, then silently started toward it. The possibility that they might be shot out of hand had occurred to them, but now they were too tired to worry much about it. They were picked up by a patrol before they reached the tilled fields. The soldiers didn't shoot, but it was obvious that the visitors were unwelcome. Chente was relieved of his hardware, and he and Martha were hustled into an olive-drab car that performed much more efficiently than the Huffer Mare Flagon drove. Apparently, the Ontarians could make fairly good machinery when ostentation didn't require otherwise. Their captors made no attempt to prevent them from looking about as they drove through the base toward the water's edge, and Chente forced his tired mind to take in all he could. They tooled over the brick-paved road past row after row of warehouses, a testament to Ontarian perseverance. To bring so much equipment and material must have taken many carefully planned voyages. And to avoid Providencian detection, the supply convoys would have had to be small and inconspicuous. They turned parallel to the long stone quay and drove between huge earthen reservoirs, presumably filled with vegetable oils and piles of kindling. Further along the quay they passed several cruisers and a battleship, New Canadian ships were noticeably smaller than their counterparts in the old-time navies of Earth. A battleship here might run 8,000 tons and mount six 25-centimeter guns. A fleet of airships sat on the mudflats across the bay. No wonder Balkworth had had no flyers to spare on Wundlich. Finally, they stopped before a long three-story building that looked a good deal more permanent than the wooden warehouses. The driver unlocked the door to the passenger compartment and said, Out! Two soldiers covered them with what looked like four-barreled shotguns as they followed the driver up the steps to the building's wide doorway. The inside of the building was quite a contrast to the camouflaged exterior. Deep blue carpets covered the floor, while paintings and tapestries were hung from the polished silver walls. Filament lamps glittered along the windowless hallway. They were led stumbling up two flights to a massive wooden door. One of the guards tapped lightly, and a muffled, though familiar voice from beyond the door said, Enter. They did so and found Peer Balkworth surrounded by aides and a pair of curvaceous secretaries. Freeman Quintero. I should have guessed it was you. And the lovely, though girdle-bound Miss Blount. Indeed. No longer girdle-bound? He raised his eyebrows. Sit down, please. I have the feeling you may fall down if you don't. I apologize that I don't give you a chance to rest before talking, but a decent regard for Machiavelli demands that I ask some questions while your defenses are down. Whatever happened to Captain Oswald and his gallant crew? Chente brought the Ontarian up to date. As he spoke, Balkworth removed a cigar from his desk and lit up. He drew in several puffs and exhaled green smoke. Finally, he waved his hand in amusement. That's pretty sloppy work for the special weapons group, but I suppose they were trying to make your death seem an accident. I hope this opens your eyes, Freeman. 
Though the Special Weapons Group is the most ruthless bureaucracy within the tight little totalitarian state that calls itself New Providence, the other groups aren't much better. New Providence may be slightly ahead of the Ontarian Confederation technologically, but they use their advantage simply to make life unbearable for their citizens and to spread misery to other folks as well. Martha glared dully at Bulkworth, but kept silent. Chente recalled Bulkworth's casual, almost reckless attitude back in Freetown. He came close to smiling. A dandy and a fool are not necessarily the same thing. You know, I think you drove me into the arms of New Providence just to create this situation. Bulkworth looked faintly embarrassed. That's close to the truth. I stuck my neck way out to get your predecessor on one of my vessels. The first Quintero completed his survey and told me his discoveries. I'm sure you've made these same discoveries by now. But he wouldn't believe that a loose confederation like Ontario could handle the preparations for this core tremor. He kept insisting that both New Providence and Ontario must somehow unite and work together. These are nice sentiments, but he just didn't realize how intolerant and uncompromising Miss Blount's friends can be. When the New Providencians killed him, my government, and myself in particular, were the goats. This time I thought I'd let you go with the Providencians. They'd try to kill you and steal your gadgets, but I knew that without your active cooperation they wouldn't get much use out of them. And I knew you were too stubborn to let them cajole you over to their side. If you were killed, then they would look bad. If by some quirk they didn't manage to kill you, I was pretty sure that you would realize what an unpleasant bunch they are. I am truly pleased that you survived, however. Can we depend on your help, or are you even more stubborn than I had guessed? Chente didn't answer immediately. Are you in charge here? Pierre chuckled. As those things go in the Ontarian Confederacy, yes. We've got men and material from four major Bostons here and their chiefs are at each other's throat half the time. But the base was my idea, and the Bosmanic Council in Toronto has appointed me temporarily superior to the three other bossmen involved. The answer gave Chente a moment to think. In his way, the Ontarian was just as likable and just as much the capable fanatic as Martha. The only difference was that by accident of birth, one was supporting a loose feudal confederation and the other a more industrialized, more centralized regime. And both were so in love with their systems that they put national survival before the survival of the entire colony. Finally, he said, Your plan has convinced me. Hell, it practically killed me. If you'll bring in the things they confiscated, I may be able to show you something you can use. Beside him, Martha's expression became steadily darker, though she still maintained her silence. The boss man turned to one of his secretaries. Darlene, go out and have Grzynski bring in any equipment he's holding. The rest of you leave, too. Except Macklin, Trudeau, and our guests. He gestured at Chente and Martha. Chente glanced at his companion, wondered why Balkworth had permitted her to remain. Then he realized that the Ontarian had guessed his involvement with Martha and was gauging his truthfulness by the exhausted woman's reactions. A soldier brought in the various items taken from Chente and Martha and placed them on the low table that sat before Balkworth's empillowed throne. The bossman picked up Chente's weapon. It looked vaguely like a large-caliber pistol, except that the bore was filled with a glassy substance. This does what I think it does? Bossman Pierre asked. Yes, it's an energy weapon, but the radiation is in the submillimeter range, so there isn't much ionization along the beam path, and your target can't see where your fire is coming from. But you'll find this more interesting. He pulled the satellite display toward himself and pushed the green button on its side. The tiny screen lit up to show a section of coast and ocean. Bulkworth was silent for several seconds. Very pretty, he said finally, but the banter was gone from his voice. I never guessed the satellites were still working. The colonial planners built them to last. They didn't expect you would be able to go up and repair them. Hmm. 
Too bad they didn't build our ground receivers the same way. What's that? Balkworth interrupted himself to point at a tiny white V set in the open ocean between two wide cumulus cloud banks. A ship of some kind. Let's have a closer look. Chente stepped up the magnification. The craft was clearly visible, its white wake streaming out far behind it. Why, that's the ram! one of the Ontarian officers exclaimed. This is incredible! That ship left thirty-three hours ago. She must be hundreds of kilometers out, and yet we can see her as if we were flying over in an airship. When was this picture taken? Less than a second ago. The coverage is live. What area can be observed with this gadget? Everything except the poles, though high-resolution pictures are available only up to latitude forty-five degrees. Hmm, we could reconnoiter the entire inner ocean. Peer touched one of the knobs. Now that Chente had activated the device, it responded to the Ontarian's direction. The ram's image dwindled, slid to one side, and they looked down on an expanse of cloud-stippled ocean. Chente started. Almost off the left side of the screen was a cluster of wake Vs, Falkworth increased the magnification until the formation filled the screen. Those aren't ours, one of the officers said finally. Clearly, said Balkworth. It's equally clear that this is a new Providencian fleet, Colonel Macklin, and their wakes point our way. Looks like four Jacob-class battleships, half a dozen cruisers, and twenty destroyers, said the second older officer. But what are those ships in the trailing squadron? His eyes narrowed. They're troop transports. Now I wonder what an invasion force would be doing in this innocent part of the world, said Pierre. The older officer didn't smile at the flippancy. From their wake angles, I estimate they're making thirty kilometers an hour, bossman. If I read the key on the screen right, that means we have less than forty-four hours. Chente glanced across at Martha, saw her eyes staring back at him. Now he knew why the special weapons people had wanted another bomb. Pierre noticed their exchange of looks. Any idea why this invasion should coincide with your arrival, Freeman Quintero? Yes, my guess is that certain Providencian groups discovered your base here some months ago, but deferred attack until they could get still another nuclear bomb, namely the one I brought, for their stockpile. The bossman nodded, then seemed to put the matter aside. Admiral Trudeau, I intend to meet them at sea. We have neither the shore batteries nor the garrison to take them on at the harbor entrance. The officer nodded, looking unhappy. But even with this much warning, he nodded at the screen, they've still caught us with our pants down. I only have three cruisers, two battleships, and a handful of escort craft in port. We can't stop four Jacob-class battle wagons and a half-dozen cruisers with that, boss man. We have the bombs, sir, Colonel Macklin broke in. You army sorts are all alike, Colonel, Admiral Trudeau snapped. The only time you ever used a bomb, it was smuggled into New Providencian territory and exploded on the ground. On the open sea, we need at least twenty kilometers clearance between our fleet and the target. It's mighty hard to sneak a dirigible or a torpedo boat across a gap that wide. Macklin had no answer to the criticism. Chente suddenly saw an opportunity to get at the Ontarian bombs and perhaps to destroy the Providencian nuclear capability in the bargain. He said, But those comm bombs were mounted on drive units powerful enough to boost them out of the atmosphere. Why don't you alter the drive program and let them deliver themselves? The three Ontarians looked at him open-mouthed. Beside him, he heard Martha gasp. Bulkworth said, You can make such alterations? Chente nodded. As long as we know the target's position, I'll have no problem. Martha gave an inarticulate cry of rage as she lunged across the table, picked up the recon display, and flung it to the floor. Macklin and Trudeau grabbed her, forced her away from the table. Balkworth retrieved the display. The picture on the screen still glowed crisp and true. He shook his head sadly at Martha. That's it, then. Trudeau, sound general alarm. 
I want some kind of fleet ready to sail in twenty-two hours. The Navy man left without a word. Balkworth turned back to the Earth Woman. You're wondering why I don't keep the fleet here and lob the bomb out to sea when the enemy comes in range? Shinte considered wearily. That would be the prudent thing to do, if you trusted me. Right. Unfortunately, I don't trust you that far. I'll let you decide which bomb you want and let you supervise the launch. But I'd rather not risk this base on the possibility of a change in your heart. We may not have many ships here yet, but the physical plant we've developed makes this one of the best naval bases in our Confederation, whether it remains secret or not. Chente nodded. Martha murmured something. Balkworth turned to her and bowed almost graciously. You may come along too, if you wish, Miss Blunt. The fearsome, Admiral Trudeau's flagship, displaced 7,300 tons and could run at better than 40 kilometers per hour. She was doing at least that now. Chente stood on the bridge and looked out over the foredeck. After being treated by Ontarian medics, he had slept most of the preceding day. He felt almost normal now, except for a stiffness in his arm and side and occasional attacks of vertigo. He had studied naval types of the 20th century quite thoroughly back home, and in many ways the fearsome was a familiar craft, but there were differences. The Ontarian construction had a faintly crude, misshapen appearance. Standardized production techniques were only beginning to appear in the Confederacy, and without petroleum resources or coal, the nations of New Canada were forced to use vegetable oils or wood to fire their boilers. The greasy black smoke that spouted from the fearsome stacks was enough to cause a queasy stomach even if his inner ear and the rolling sea were not. The ship had a huge crew. Apparently its auxiliary devices were not connected to the central power plant. Even the big deck guns needed work squads to turn and angle them. In a sense, the fearsome was a cross between a Roman galley and a 1910 battleship. So far, Chente's jury-rigged plans had gone much more smoothly than he had dared to hope. At Balquith's direction, Colonel Macklin had shown him the maximum security storage bunker where Ontario's five nuclear weapons were located. Only one was needed for this mission, but the Earthman had been allowed to check the missile's drive units in making his selection. Apparently, neither Macklin or Balquirth realized that a simple adjustment of the drive unit could render the bomb itself permanently unusable. It had taken Chente only a moment to so adjust four of the five weapons. Now the hastily formed Ontarian fleet was under full steam, with the bomb launched less than an hour away. In addition to the fearsome, the fleet contained the battleship Covenant and two large cruisers, essentially as protection for that one bomb. When they were within missile range of the Providencians, the Ontarian fleet would turn away, and Balquirth and Chente would take the bomb aboard the motorized boat which now sat near the fearsome stern. Not until then would Chente be allowed to touch the bomb's trigger. Chente looked down at Martha, who sat beside him on the bridge gazing fixedly out at the ocean. Her wrists had been manacled, but when the sea got choppy, Admiral Trudeau had removed the cuffs so that she could more easily keep her balance. She had not spoken a single word for the last three hours, had seemed almost like a disinterested spectator. Chente touched her shoulder, but she continued to ignore him. The starboard hatch opened, and Balkworth, dressed now in utility coveralls and a slicker, stepped onto the bridge. He spoke briefly with Trudeau, then approached the Earthman. We've got problems, Freeman. This storm has kicked up a bit faster than the weather people predicted. We can't spot our fleet on the display, and the new Providencian force will be under cloud cover in another fifteen minutes. Chente shrugged, and the gesture brought a sharp pain to his side. No matter. That satellite we're reading from was also intended for navigation. It's got radar powerful enough to scan the ocean. We'll be able to keep track of the other fleet almost as easily as if there were no storm at all. Ah, good. Let's go below and take a look at the display, then. You said we could launch the missile from 25 kilometers out? That's the effective range. Actually, the bomb's drive unit could push it much farther, but it wasn't designed as a weapon, so it would be terrifically inaccurate at greater ranges.
Chente and Balkworth left the bridge and went carefully down the steep ladderway to the chart house. The sky was completely overcast now, and a gathering squall obscured the horizon. He could barely make out the forms of the escort craft far off to the side. The hard cold wind that sleeted across the fearsome presaged the storm's arrival. The chart house was hidden from the direct blast of the wind by several armored buttresses and a gun turret. Five armed seamen stood at the entrance. Once they recognized Balkworth, there was no trouble getting inside. The chart house itself was well insulated from the outside, as the instruments it housed required better care than men did. Balkworth had had all of Chente's equipment stowed here, along with the communications bomb, a two-meter-long cylinder of black plastic that rested in a case of native velvet near the cabin's interior bulkhead. Macklin sat beside some bulky and primitive wireless equipment. The young colonel held a repeating slug gun at the ready position. He was the room's only occupant. Apparently, Pierre trusted only his top aides with this Pandora's box of earthly artifacts. All secure, sir, Macklin said. I let the navigator take some charts, but no one else has been by. Very good, Colonel, said Balkworth. All right, Freeman, it's all yours. Chente approached the brass chart table and the satellite receiver. He fiddled briefly with the controls, and the screen turned gray. A tiny point of light moved slowly from left to right across the top of the screen, then returned to the left margin and started across again. That's the scanning trace from the satellite. It's illuminating a square kilometer as it moves across the ocean. The satellite's maser isn't powerful enough to light up a larger area, so the picture must be built up from a sequence of scans. The tiny blip of light shifted down about a millimeter with each scan, but still nothing showed in its track. Finally, two golden blips appeared, and in the scan below that, another blip. The Providencians, Balkworth said almost to himself. Chente nodded. At this resolution, it's difficult to see individual ships, but you get the idea of their formation. What's that red blip? Bossman Pierre pointed to the newest apparition. That must be a transponder on one of the Providencian bombs. All the communications bombs transmit a UHF signal in response to microwave from the satellite. I suppose that originally the gimmick was used to find dud bombs that fell back to the surface without detonating. So they really thought they were going to wipe us out, said Pierre. This is even better than I had hoped. The scanning dot moved relentlessly across the screen, shifting down with each pass to reveal more and more of the Providencian fleet. Finally, they could see the echelon structure of the enemy forces. For ten more scans, no new blips appeared. Then a single red blip showed up far south of the enemy fleet. Chente caught his breath. Falkworth looked across the table at him. How far is that bomb from us? he said quietly. Chente held up his hand and watched the scanning dot continue across the screen. He remembered Martha's remarks about the Providencians having special delivery systems. Then the scanning dot showed the leading elements of the Ontarian fleet, just six lines below the red dot. Less than ten kilometers, Bosman. Falkworth didn't reply. He looked at the display's key, then rattled off some instructions into a speaking tube. General quarters sounded. Seconds later, Chente heard the fearsome's big deck guns fire. Finally, Balkworth spoke to Chente. His voice was calm, almost as if their peril were someone else's. How do you suppose they detected our fleet? There are a number of ways. Martha said the Providencians were experimenting with a lot of gadgets of their own design, in fact, they may not have detected us. That bomb is probably aboard a small unmanned boat. They may just keep it thirty or forty kilometers ahead of their fleet. Then, if it hears the sounds of propellers nearby, it detonates. Ah, yes, research and development. Isn't it wonderful? They stood waiting in silence. Ten kilometers away, a barrage of heavy artillery was arcing down on the cause of that innocuous red blip. Any second now, they would discover just how cleverly the new Providencians had designed their delivery system. From outside the windowless chart house came screams. No other sounds, just screams. Chente smelled fire, noticed the insulation around the closed hatch was beginning to smoke. 
He and Valkworth hit the deck, and Macklin was not far behind. The bomb's searing flash had crossed the ten kilometers, separating them at the speed of light, but they would have to wait almost seven seconds for the waterborne shock wave to arrive. Chente heard a monstrously loud ripping sound, felt the deck smash into his chest and head. He was not conscious when the airborne shock wave did its job, peeling back the charthouse bulkhead and part of the deck above them. Chente woke with rain in his face and the muffled sound of exploding ammunition and burning fuel all around. Behind all these sounds, and nearly as insistent, was a steady roar, the last direct evidence of the nuclear explosion. The Earthman rolled over, cursing as he felt the stitches the Ontarian doctors had put in his side come apart. His head rang, his nose was bleeding, and his ears felt stuffed with cotton. But as he shook the rain out of his eyes, he saw that the others in the chart house had not fared so well. On the other side of the cabin, Macklin's body was sprawled, headless. Nearer, Balkworth lay unmoving, a pool of blood spreading from his mouth. For a few moments, Chente sat looking stupidly at the scene, wondering why he was alive. Then he began to think. His plans to destroy the Providencian bombs were ruined now that the Ontarian fleet had been destroyed. Or were they? Suddenly he realized that this turn of events might give him hope of completing his mission and still escaping both groups. Chente struggled to his feet and noticed the deck was listing. Or was it only his sense of balance gone awry again? He recovered the recon display and his pistol, then picked the communications bomb from its case. The bomb didn't mass more than fifteen kilograms, but it was an awkward burden. Outside the chart house, the mutilated guards' bodies lay amid twisted metal. The ship's paint was scorched and curling even in the rain. The after part of the ship was swallowed by flame, and the few people he saw alive were too busy to notice him. Martha. The thought brought him up short and he reconsidered the possibilities. Then he turned and started toward the bridge. He could see the gaping holes where the glass had been blown out of the bridge's ports. Anybody standing by those ports would be dead now. Then he saw her, crawling along the gangway above. The deck listed a full ten degrees as he pulled himself up a ladder way to reach her. Let's get off this thing, he shouted over the explosions and the fire. He caught her arm and helped her to her feet. What? She shook her head. A trickle of blood ran from one ear down her neck. Her face was smeared with grime and blood. He could barely hear her voice and realized the explosion must have deafened them all. He held on to her and shouted again into her good ear. For a moment she relaxed against him, then pulled back, and he saw her lips mouth, Not with... Traitor! But I was never going to use that bomb on your people... It was just a trick to get at the Ontarian bombs. It was the biggest lie he'd told her yet, but he knew she wanted to believe it. He pointed toward the fearsome stern and shouted, To the launch! She nodded and they staggered across the tilting, twisted deck, toward the flames and the sound of explosions. Everyone they met was going in the opposite direction and seemed in no mood to stop and talk. Now there was only one narrow path free of flames, and the heat from either side was so intense it blistered their skin even as they ran through it. Then they were beyond the flames, on the relatively undamaged stern. Chente saw that the motor launch had been torn loose from its aftermooring cable, and now its stern hung down, splashing crazily in the water. Several bodies lay unmoving on the scorched deck, but no one else was visible. They crawled down to where the bow of the launch stuck up over the railing. Chente had almost concluded they were alone on the stern, when Balkworth stepped from behind the wreckage next to the launch's moorings. The Ontarian swayed drunkenly, one hand grasping the jagged and twisted metal for support. His other hand held a slug gun. The lower part of his face was covered with blood. Chente staggered toward him and shouted, Thought you were dead! We're going ahead with your plan. Through the blood, Peer almost seemed to smile. He gestured at Martha. No, Quintero. His voice came faintly over the sounds of rain and fire. Think you've turned your coat? He raised the pistol, but Chente was close to him now. The Earthman lunged, knocking the gun aside with his bomb, and drove his fist hard into Peer's stomach. The other crumpled. Chente staggered back, clinging to the rail for support. 
It struck him that the fight must have looked like a contest between drunks. He turned to Martha and waved at the launch. We'll have to jump for it before that other cable breaks. She nodded, her face pale with cold and fear. They were cut off from the rest of the ship by the spreading fire, and even as he spoke the fearsome tilted another five or ten degrees. He climbed over the rail and jumped. The drop was only three meters, but his target was moving, and he was holding the bomb. He hit hard on his bad side and rolled down the launch's steeply sloping deck. Gasping for breath, he dragged himself back up the deck and waved to Martha above him. She stood motionless, her fists tightly clenched about the railing. For a moment, Chente thought she would balk, but she slipped over the railing and jumped, her arms outstretched. He managed to break her fall, and they both went sprawling. They crawled clumsily down the bobbing deck toward the craft's cockpit. Martha struggled through the tiny hatch, and Chente pushed the bomb after her. Then he turned and fired at the remaining mooring cable. The launch knifed into the water and for a moment submerged completely, but somehow Chente managed to keep from being washed away. The boat bobbed back to the surface, and he scrambled into the cockpit. From his talks with Balkworth, Quintero knew the boat had a steam electric power plant. It was ordinarily used for espionage work. Looking over the control panel, Chente decided that this was the most advanced Ontarian mechanism he had encountered, just the kind of luck they needed. He depressed the largest switch on the board and felt a faint humming beneath his feet. He eased the throttle forward. As the launch pulled slowly away from the foundering fearsome, he thought he heard the whine and snick of small arms fire caroming off the boat's hull. Apparently, Balkworth was not easily put out of action. But now it was too late to stop their escape. The fearsome was soon lost to sight amid the deep swells and pounding rain. The last Chente saw and heard of the Ontarian fleet was a pale orange glow through the storm, followed by a sound that might have been thunder. Then they were alone with the storm. The storm was bad enough in itself. The tiny cabin spun like a compass needle, and several times Chente was afraid the boat would capsize. Somehow Martha managed to tie down the equipment and dig a couple of life jackets out of a storage cubby. Chente fastened the recon screen to the control board and inspected the radar display. On high resolution, he could distinguish every vessel in the area. Even his motor launch showed, or at least the transponder on his communications bomb did. They would have no trouble navigating through this storm if they didn't sink. He briefly thanked heaven that the comm bombs were about as clean as anything that energetic can be. Nearly all the destruction was radiated as soft X-rays. At least they didn't have to worry that the rain was drenching them in radioactive poisons. Now what? Martha shouted finally. She had wedged herself in the corner trying to keep her balance. Chente hesitated. He had three choices. He could flee the scene immediately. He could use his bomb to destroy the Providencians and their remaining bomb, just as he and Balkworth had planned, or he could indulge in more treachery. The first option would leave the Providencians with a bomb and an enormous advantage in the world. The second option would be difficult to execute. At this point, Martha might be stronger than he was. He might have to kill her. Besides, if he exploded his bomb, he would have no way to make his report to Earth. That left treachery. We're going to try to get picked up by one of the ships in the Providencian fleet. Twenty minutes passed. At the top of the screen, the launch's blip moved closer and closer to the red dot that represented the last Providencian bomb. He kept the screen angled so that Martha didn't have a clear view of it. They should be able to see the ship before much longer. He leaned his head close to Martha and said, Do you know any signals that would keep them from shooting us out of hand? He pointed at the electric arc lamp mounted in the windscreen. Her voice came back faintly over the wind. I know some diplomatic codes. We update them every fifteen days. They just might respect them. We'll have to chance it. Chente helped her light the arc lamp, but there was nothing to see except storm. Chente guided the launch so that its image on the screen approached the other. As they swung over the top of a swell, they saw a long gray shadow not more than two hundred meters ahead. It appeared to be an auxiliary craft, probably a converted cargo ship. Chente reached across the panel and tapped new instructions into the display. Now the machine was reading the transponder's position from its internal direction finders. 
Beside him at the control panel, Martha awkwardly closed and opened the signaler's shutter. For nearly thirty seconds there was no reply. Chente held his breath. He expected that this particular ship would be manned by special weapons people, who might well be trigger-happy and extremely suspicious. On the other hand, depending on what they expected of the Ontarians, the weapons people might be cocksure and careless. Finally, a light high on one of the ship's masts blinked irregularly. They acknowledge. They want us to move in closer. Chente worked the electric boat closer and closer to the ship. Martha continued sending. They were about fifty meters out now, and they could make out the details of the other vessel. Quintero looked closely at his display, then scanned the ship's foredeck. He noticed a shrouded boat lashed down near the bow. Its position agreed with the location of the blip on his display. This was better than he had hoped. That was the twin of the robot boat that had nearly destroyed the Ontarian fleet. He took one hand from the wheel, drew his pistol, and fired a single low-power bolt. The thick windscreen shattered, throwing slivers of glass all around. He stepped the pistol's power to full and aimed at the other vessel's bow. No! Martha screamed as she rammed him against the bulkhead. She was tall and strong, and she fought desperately. They careened wildly about the cabin for several seconds before Chente got a solid, close-fisted blow to her solar plexus. She collapsed without a sound, and the Earthmen whirled back to face the deadlier enemy. The ship's main guns were turned toward him, but he was below them now. He sprayed fire all along the vessel, concentrating on the smaller deck guns and the shrouded boat. Clouds of steam quickly obscured the glowing craters his pistol gouged in the ship's hull, and then the fuel supply aboard the robot boat exploded in a ball of orange-red flame hot enough to melt the controls of the bomb within. There was the sparkle of automatic fire from up in the ship's masts, and the cockpit seemed to shred around him. He fired upward blindly. Chente grabbed the wheel and turned about. The seconds passed, but there was no more Providencian gunfire. The sounds of the burning ship quickly faded behind them, and they were alone. They drove steadily west for three hours. The seas fell. Just as the sun set, the cloud cover in the far west moved aside, so that the sun shone red and gold through the narrow band between horizon and cloud. His reconnaissance screen showed no sign of pursuit. More importantly, there was only one transponder blip glowing on Chente's display, his own. The tiny launch was slowing, and finally Chente decided to try to fire its boiler. He eased the throttle back to null, and the boat sat bobbing almost gently in the sea the sun turned gold. Martha? No response. I had to do it. Had to? Her tone showed despair and unbelieving indignation. She looked briefly up at him through her rain-plastered hair. How many Providencians did you kill today? Chente didn't answer. The rationalizations that men use for killing other men stuck in his throat, at least for the moment. Finally, he said, I told you, I told the Ontarians, unless you work together, you will all be wiped out. But it didn't do any good just to say it. Now Ontario and New Providence have a mutual enemy. Me. I have the only nuclear weapon left, and I have means to deliver it. Soon I will control territory, too. Your nations will spend their energies to develop the technology to defeat me, and in the end you may be good enough to meet your real peril. But Martha had resumed her study of the deck and made no reply. Chente sighed and began to pull back the deck plates that should cover the boiler. The sun set and the first stars of twilight shone through the gap between the clouds and the horizon. Nineteen light years away, his likeness must still be awaiting his report. In a few weeks, Chente would make that report using the Ontarian communications bomb. But the people of the New Canada would never know it for that bomb was the lever he would use to take over some small Ontarian fiefdom. Already he must begin casting the net of schemes and the machinations that would stretch one hundred years into this miserable planet's future. It was small consolation to hope that his likeness would live to see other worlds.
There are a lot of things I like about Just Peace. As a collaboration, it went very smoothly. Bill and I had many small things in our idea boxes that found a nice home here. The Canadian background, the danger of colonizing a planet whose core was about to undergo a phase change. We were vague about Chente's background on Earth. This was deliberate. I assumed Earth had already gone through the technological singularity. We see about as much of Earth as we could understand. One major aspect of Earth's technology leaks into this story, the duplicative transport used to bring Chente to New Canada. Not much is made of it here, but I find the idea immensely intriguing. If we could make exact copies of someone, not just clones, but exact down to quantum limits, what would this do to our concept of ego? The idea has been in SF for many years, at least back to Algis Boudry's Rogue Moon and Paul Anderson's We Have Fed Our Sea. There is plenty of mileage left in the gimmick. It is just one of the issues that I see looming in our future. Our most basic beliefs, including the concept of self itself, are in for rough times. Original Sin Alien contact stories have always been a favorite of mine. I grew up with John Campbell's notion that the humans were short-lived, bright, and terribly aggressive compared to the wiser intellects of galactic civilization. Why not turn that around? Why not have a race even more short-lived, intelligent, and aggressive than humans? John's older, wiser races often tried to keep the human super-race confined to Earth. What would we do if confronted by aggressive primitives with the potential to run circles around us? I hadn't seen any stories with this theme, but knowing science fiction, I guessed that such had already been written. I needed something more. Many human personalities are piled deep with interacting layers of shame and loneliness and hatred. My fictional race would have even more inner turmoil. How to do it? A short lifespan would certainly intensify such problems, but I wanted something that would give individuals real reason to feel guilt. I remembered the extraordinary life cycle of the Hugel, a non-sentient pest, in Silverberg and Garrett's Shrouded Planet. Maybe I could jazz that up and apply it to an intelligent race. Thus was born Original Sin. First twilight glowed diffusely from the fog. On the landscaped terraces that fell away from the hilltop, long rows of tiny crosses slowly materialized. Low trees dripped almost silently upon the sodden grass. The officer in charge was young. This was his first assignment, and it was an assignment more important than most. He shifted his weight from one foot to the other. There must be something to do with his time, something to check, something to worry over. The machine guns. Yes, he could check those again. He moved rapidly up the narrow concrete walk to where his gun crews manned their weapons. But the magazine feeds were all set, the muzzle chokes screwed down. Everything was just as proper as the last time he had checked, ten minutes earlier. The crews watched him silently, but resumed their whispered conversations as he walked away. Nothing to do. Nothing to do. The officer stopped for a moment and stood trembling in the cool dampness. Christ, he was hungry. Behind the troops, and even farther from the field of crosses, the morning twilight defined the silhouettes of the doctors and priests attendant. Their voices couldn't carry through the soggy air, but he could see their movements were jerky, aimless. They had time on their hands, and that is always the greatest burden. The officer tapped his heavy boot on the concrete walk in a rapid tattoo of frustration. It was so quiet here. The mists hid the city that spread across the lowlands. If he listened carefully, he could hear auto traffic below. Occasionally, a ship in the river would sound its whistle, or a string of railway freight cars would faintly crash and rattle as it moved along the wharves. Except for these links with the everyday world, he might as well be at the end of time here on the hilltop with its grasses, its trees. Even the air seemed different here. It didn't burn into his eyes, and there was only a hint of creosote and kerosene in its smell. It was brighter now. 
The ground became green, the fog a cherry brown. With a sigh of anguished relief, the officer glanced at his watch. It was time to inspect the cross-covered hillside. He nearly ran out onto the grass. Low hedges curved back and forth between the white crosses to form an intricate topiary maze. He must check that pattern one last time. It was a dangerous job, but hardly a difficult one. There were less than a thousand critical points, and he had memorized the scheme the evening before. Every so often he broke stride to cock a deadfall or arm a claymore mine. Many of the crosses rose from freshly turned earth, and he gave these an especially wide berth. The air was even cleaner here above the grass than it had been back by the machine guns, and the deep wet sod sucked at his feet. He gulped back saliva and tried to concentrate on his job. So hungry. Why must he be tempted so? Time seemed to move faster, and the ground brightened steadily beneath his running feet. Twenty minutes passed. He was almost done. The ground was visible for nearly fifty meters through the brownish mists. The city sounds were louder, more numerous. He must hurry. The officer ran along the last row of crosses, back toward friendly lines. The cool, sooty concrete, the machine guns, the trappings of civilization. Then his boots were clicking on the walkway, and he paused for three seconds to catch his breath. He looked at the cemetery. All was still peaceful. The preliminaries were completed. He turned to run to his gun crews. Five more minutes. Five more minutes, and the sun would rise behind the fog bank to the east. Its light would seep down through the mists and warm the grass on the hillside. Five more minutes, and children would be born. What a glorious dump! They had me hidden in one of the better parts of town, on a slight rise about three kilometers east of the brackish river that split the downtown area in two. I stood at the tiny window of my lab and looked out across the city. The westering sun was a smudged reddish disk shining through the multiple layers of crap that city traffic pumped into the air. I could actually see bits of ash sift down from the high spaces above. It was the rush hour. The seven-lane freeways that netted the city were a study in still life, with idling cars backed up thousands of meters at the interchanges. I could imagine the shark-faced drivers shaking their clawed fists at each other, frothing murderous threats. Even here on the rise, it was so hot and humid that the soot stuck to my sweating skin. Down in the city basin, it must have been infernal. Further across town was a cluster of skyscrapers seventy and eighty stories high. Every fifteen seconds, a five-prop airplane would cruise in from the east, make a one-eighty just above the rooftops, and attempt a landing at the airport between the skyscrapers and the river. And beyond the river, misty in the depths of the smog, was the high ridge line that blocked the ocean from view. The grayish-green expanse of the Metropolitan Cemetery ran across the whole northern end of the ridge. Sounds like something out of a historical novel, doesn't it? I mean, I hadn't seen an aircraft in nearly seventy years. But as for cemeteries, this side of the millennium such things just didn't exist, or so I had thought. But it was all here on Shima, and less than ten parsecs from Mother Earth. It's not surprising if you don't recognize the name. EarthGov lists the planet Star plus 56 degrees 2966. You can tell the Empire is trying to hide something when the only designation they have for a nearby K-star is a centuries-old catalog number. If you're old enough, though, you remember the name. Two centuries back, Shima was a household word. Not counting Earth, Shima was the second planet where man discovered intelligent life. A lot has happened in 200 years. The Knot Wars, the secession of the free human worlds from EarthGov. Somewhere along the line, Earth casually rammed Shima under the rug. Why? Well, if nothing else, EarthGov is cautious. Read Chicken. When humans first landed, remember spaceships on Shima? The native culture was Paleolithic. 
Two centuries later, their technology resembled Earth's in the late 20th century. Of course, that was no great shakes, but remember, it took us thousands of years to get from stone axe to steam engine. It's really hard to imagine how the Shemans did it. You can bet EarthGov didn't give them any help. Earth has always been scared witless by competition, while at the same time they don't have the stomach for genocide. So they pretend competition doesn't exist. The free worlds aren't like that. Over the last 150 years, dozens of companies have tried to land entrepreneurs on the planet. The Earth police managed to rub out every one of them. Except for me, so far. But then the people who hired me had had a lucky break. EarthGov occasionally imports Shemans to work as troubleshooters. The Empire would import a lot more. Shemans are incredibly quick at solving problems that don't require background work, except that EarthPol can't risk letting the aliens return with what they learn. Somehow, one such contacted the spy system that Samuelson Enterprises maintains throughout the Empire. Samuelson got in touch with me. Together, S.E. and the Shemans bribed an Earthman to look the other way when I made my appearance on Shima. Yes, some Earth cops do have a price. In this case, it was the annual gross product of an entire continent. But the bribe was worth it. I stood to gain 100 times as much, and Samuelson Enterprises had, in a sense, been offered one of the biggest prizes of all time by the Shemans. But that, as they say, is another story. Right now, I had to come across with what the Shemans wanted, or we'd all have empty pockets, or worse. You see, the Shemans wanted immortality. S.E. had impaled many a hick world on that particular gaff, but never like this. The creatures were really desperate. No Sheman had ever lived longer than twenty-five Earth months. I leaned out to look at the patterns of soot on the windowsill, trying at the same time to ignore the laboratory behind me. It was filled with equipment the Shemans thought I might need. Microtomes, ultra-centrifuges, electron microscopes, a real antique shop. The screwy thing was that I did need some of those gadgets. For instance, if I had used my Mamri at the prime integers, Earthpaul would be there before I could count to three. I'd been on Shima four weeks, and considering the working conditions, I thought progress had been pretty good. But the Shemans were getting suspicious and very, very impatient. Samuelson had negotiated with them through third parties on Earth, and so hadn't been able to teach me the Sheman language. Sometime you try explaining biological chemistry with sign language and grunts. And these damn fidget brains seem to think that a project was overdue if it hadn't been finished last week. I mean, the old Protestant ethics stood like a naked invitation to hedonism next to what these underweight kangaroos practiced. Three days earlier, they had posted armed guards inside my lab. As I stood glooming at the windowsill, I could hear my three pals shuffling endlessly about the room, stopping every so often to poke into the equipment. Nothing short of physical violence could make them stay in one spot. Sometimes I would look up from my bench to see one of them staring back at me. His gaze was not unfriendly. I've often looked at a stake just that way. When he saw me looking back, the Sheman would abruptly turn away, unsuccessfully trying to swallow slaver back from the multiple rows of inward-curving teeth that covered his mouth. Actually, the creatures were omnivorous. In fact, they'd killed off virtually all animal life on the planet, and most of their vast population subsisted on cereal crops grown, in insufficient quantities, on well-defended collective farms. I could feel them staring at me right now. I had half a mind to turn around and show them a thing or three. Earthpaul and its detection devices be damned. This line of thought was interrupted as a sports car breezed up from the sentry gate 300 meters away. I was housed in some sort of biological science complex. The place looked like a run-down Carnegie library, if you remember what a library is, and was surrounded by hectares of blackened concrete. Beyond this were tank traps and a three-meter-high barricade. Till now, the only vehicles I had seen inside the compound were tracked military jobs. 
The blue and orange sports car burned rubber as the driver skidded to a stop against the curb beneath my window. The driver bounded out of his seat and double-timed up the walk. Typical. Shemans never slow down. The passenger door opened and a second figure appeared. Normal Sheman dress consists of a heavy jacket and a kilt which conceals their broad haunches and part of their huge feet. But this second fellow was wrapped from head to foot in black, a costume I had seen only once or twice before, some kind of penance outfit. And when he moved, it wasn't with short, rapid hops, but with longer, slower strides, almost as if... I turned back to my equipment. At most, I had only seconds, not really enough time to set the devious traps I had prepared. The two were inside the building now. I could hear the rapid thump-thump-thump as the driver bounced up the stairs, and the softer sound of someone moving unseemly slow, but not slow enough. Through the door came the whistly buzz of Sheman talk. Perhaps those guards would do their job, and I would have a few extra seconds. No luck. The door opened. Driver and passenger stepped into my lab. With nearly Sheman haste, the veiled passenger whipped off the headpiece and dropped it to the floor. As expected, the face behind the veil was human. It was also female. The girl looked about the room expressionlessly. A sheen of sweat glistened on her skin. She brushed straight blonde hair out of her face and turned to me. I wish to speak to Professor Dr. Hjalmar Kekkonen, she said. It was hard to believe that such a flat delivery could come from that sensuous mouth. That's one I'll grant, I said, wondering if she was going to read me my rights. She didn't answer at once, and I could see the throb at her temple as she clenched her jaws. Her eyes, I noticed, were like her voice, pretty, but somehow dead and implacable. She pulled open her heavy black gown. Underneath, she wore a frilly thing which wouldn't have been out of place in Tokyo, or with the Earth Police. She stood at her full height, and her gray eyes were level with mine. It is hard for me to believe. Hjalmar Kekkonen holds the chair of biology at New London University. Hjalmar Kekkonen was the first commander of the Drayling Mercenary Division. Could anyone so brilliant act so stupidly? Her flat sarcasm became honest anger. I did my part, sir. Your appearance on Shima was undetected. But since you arrived, you've been so noisy that nothing could disguise your presence from my superiors in Earthpole. Ah, so this was the cop Samuelson had bought. I should have guessed. She seemed typical of the egotistical squirts Earthpole uses. Listen, miss, whoever you are, I was thoroughly briefed. I've worn native textiles, I've eaten the stuff they call food here, I've even washed in gunk that makes me smell like a local. Look at this place. I don't have a single scrap of comfort. Well then, what is that? She pointed at the coruscating pile of my mummery. You know damn well what it is. I told you I've been briefed. I've only used it on a Hamel base. Without that much analysis, the job would take years. Professor Kekkonen, you have been briefed by fools. We in the Earth Police can detect such activity easily, even from the other side of Shima. She began refastening the black robe. Come with us now. You can always spot EarthGov types. The imperative is their favorite mode. I sat down, propped my heels on the edge of the lab bench. Why? I asked mildly. EarthGov people irritate easy, too. Her face turned even paler as I spoke. It may be that Miss Tsumo hasn't made things clear, sir. I did a double take. It was the cop's native driver speaking English. The gook's accent was perfect, though he spoke half again as fast as a human would. It was as if some malevolent Disney had put the voice of Donald Duck in the mouth of a shark. Professor, you are here working for a group of the greatest Shiman governments. Twenty minutes ago, Miss Tsumo's managers made discovery of this fact. At any minute, the Earth Police will order our governments to give you up. Our people all want to help you, but they have knowledge of the power of Earth. They will attempt to do what they are ordered. For the next five minutes, I have authority to take you from here, but after that, it will probably be too late. The gook made a hell of a lot more sense than the Tsumo character. The sooner we hold up someplace new, the better. I swung my feet off the bench and grabbed the heavy black robe Tsumo held out to me. 
She kept silent, her face expressionless. I've met Earth cops before. In their own way, some of them are imaginative, even likable. But this creature had all the personality of a five-day-old corpse. The native driver turned to my guards and began whistling. They called in some ranking officer who inspected a sheaf of papers the driver had with him. I had just finished with the robe and veil combination when the commanding officer waved us all toward the door. We piled down the stairs and through the exit. Outside, there was no activity beyond the usual sentries that patrolled the perimeter. As the driver entered the blue and orange car, I crawled onto the narrow bench behind the front seat. The car sank under my weight. I mass nearly 100 kilos, and that's a lot more than the average sheman. The driver turned the ignition, and the kerosene-eating engine turned over a couple of times, died. Tsumo got into the front seat and shut the door. Still no alarms. I wiped the sweat from my forehead and looked out the grimy window. Shima's sun had set behind the smog bank, but here and there across the city lingered small patches of gold where the sun's rays fell directly on the ground. Something was moving through the sky from the south. A native aircraft? But Shiman flyers all had wings. The cigar-shaped flyer moved rapidly toward the city. Its surface was studded with turrets, vaguely reminiscent of the gun blisters on a Mitchell bomber. God, this place brought back memories. The vehicle crossed a patch of sunlit ground. Its shadow was at least 2,000 meters long. I tapped Sumo on the shoulder and pointed at the object that now hovered over the estuary beyond the city. She glanced briefly into the sky, then turned to the native. Serbot, she said. Hurry, Earthpole is already here. Serbot, if that was the native's name, twisted the starter again and again. Finally, the engine kicked over and stayed lit. Somehow, all those whirling pieces of metal meshed and we were rolling toward the main gate. Serbot leaned forward and punched a button on the dash. It was the car radio. The voice from the speaker was more resonant, more deliberate than is usual with Shimans. Serbot said, The voice says, See the power of Earth over your city. The speaker paused as if to give everyone time to look up and see the airborne scrap heap over the estuary. Sumo twisted about to face me. That's the Earth Pole flagship. We tried to imagine what the Shemans would view as the warcraft of an advanced technology, and that's what we came up with. In a way, it's impressive. I grunted. Only a demented two-year-old could be impressed. Serbot hissed, his lips curling back from his fangs. He had no chance to speak, though, because we were rapidly coming up on the main gate. Serbot slammed on the brakes. I was leaning against the front dash when we finally screeched to a stop beside the armored vehicle which guarded the gateway's steel doors. Serbot waved his papers out the window and screamed impatiently. The turret man on the tank had aimed his machine gun at us, but I noticed he was looking back over his shoulder at the Earth Pole flagship. The gunner's lips were peeled back in anger, or fear. Perhaps the floating mountain was somehow awesome to the Sheman psyche. I tried briefly to remember how I had felt about aircraft back before the turn of the millennium. Sumo unobtrusively turned off the car radio as a guard came over and snatched the clearance papers from Serbot. The two natives began arguing over the authorization. From the tank, I could hear another radio. It wasn't the voice from the flagship. This sounded agitated and entirely Sheman. Apparently, Earthpole was broadcasting on selected civilian frequencies. Score one against their side. If we could just get past this checkpoint before Earthpaul made its ultimatum. The guard waved to the tank pilot, who disappeared inside his vehicle. Ahead of us, electric motors whined and the massive steel door swung back. Our sports car was already blasting forward as Serbot reached out of the window and plucked his authorization from the guard's claws. The city's streets were narrow, crowded, but Serbot zipped our car from lane to lane like we were the only car around. Worst of all, Serbot was the most conservative driver in that madhouse. I haven't moved so fast since the last time I was on skis. The buildings to right and left were a dirty gray blur. Ahead of us, though, things stood still long enough to get some sort of perspective. We were heading downtown, toward the river. Over the roofs of the tenements, and through a maze of wires and antennas, I could still see the bulk of the Earth Pole flagship. I grabbed wildly for support as the car screeched diagonally through an intersection. 
Seconds later, we crashed around another corner, and I could see all the way to the edge of the estuary. Serbot summarized the Earth Pole announcement coming from the car radio. He says he's Admiral O'Hara. That would be Sergeant O'Hara-san, said Sumo. And he orders Berilesk to turn over the person-eater and doer of crimes, Hjalmar Kekonen. If not, destruction will come from the sky. Several seconds passed. Then the entire sky flashed red. Straight ahead, that color was eye-searingly bright as a thread-like ray of red whiteness flickered from flagship to bay. A shockwave-driven cloud of steam exploded where the beam touched water. Serbot applied the brakes, and we ran up over the curb, finally came to a stop against a utility pole. The shockwave was visible as it whipped up the canyon of the street. It smashed over our car, shattering the front windshield. Even before the car shuddered to a stop, Serbot was out, and Sumo wasn't far behind. The Sheman quickly ripped the identification tags from the rear windshield and replaced them with... counterfeits? In those seconds, the city was quiet, Earth Pole's gentle persuasion still echoing through the minds of its inhabitants. Sumo looked up and down the street. I hope you see now why we had to run. By now, the city and national armies are probably on the hunt for us. Once cowed, the Shemans are dedicated in their servility. I pulled the black veil of my robe more tightly down over my head and swore. So, what now? This place can't be more than four kilometers from the lab. We're still dead ducks. Sumo frowned. Dead ducks? She said. What dialect do you speak? English, damn it. Youngsters are always complaining about my language. Serbot hustled around the rear of the sports car to the sidewalk. Go quick, he said, and grasped my wrist with bone-crushing force. I hear police coming. As we ran toward a narrow alley, I glanced up the street. The place was right out of the dark ages. I'd like to take some of these young romantics and stuff them into a real old-fashioned slum like that one. The buildings were better than three stories high and crushed up against each other. Windows and tiny balconies competed in endless complication for open air. Fresh laundered rags hung from lines stretched between the buildings to become filthy in the sooty air. The stench of garbage was the only detail the scene seemed to lack. The moment of stunned shock passed. Some Shemans ran wildly around while others sat and gnawed at the curbing. This was panic, and it made their previous behavior look tame. The buildings were emptying, and the screams of the trampled went right through the walls. If we had been just ten meters farther away from that alley, we'd never have made it. We huddled near the end of the hot, cramped alley amid the crumbling remains of a couple of skeletons and listened to the cries from beyond. Now I could hear the police sirens, too. At least that's what I assumed the base boo-hoo-hoo -hoo to be. I turned my head and saw that it was just centimeters from the saurian immensity of Serbat's fangs. The Sheman spoke. You may be all right. At one time I had good knowledge of this part of the city. There is a place we may use long enough for you to make good on your agreement with Shima. I opened my mouth to tell this nightmare he was an idiot if he thought I could make progress with nothing more than paper and pencil, but he was already running back the way we had come. I glanced at Sumo. She sat motionless against the rotting wall of the alley. Her face wasn't visible behind the thick veil, but I could imagine the flat, hostile glare in her gray eyes. The look that sank a thousand ships. I drew the sticker from my sleeve and tested its edge. There was no telling who would come back for us. I wouldn't have put anything past our toothy friend, and Earthpole was as bad. What a screwed-up mess. Why had I ever let Samuelson persuade me to leave New London? A guy could get killed here. Sunrise. The disk blazed pale orange through the fog, and momentarily the world seemed clean, bright. Silence. For those few seconds, the muted sounds of the city died. The sun's warmth pressed upon the ground, penetrated the moist turf, and brought a call of life and death to those below. The Shemans stood tense, and the silence stretched on. Ten seconds. Twenty. Thirty. Then, a faint wail. The sound was joined by another and another, till a hundred voices, all faint but together loud, climbed through the register and echoed off nearby hills. 
the dying had discovered their mouths. Near the middle of the green field, one cross among the thousands wavered and fell. It was the first. The fog blurred the exact form of the grayish creatures that spilled from the newly opened graves. As grave after grave burst open, the wailing screams died and a new sound grew, the low buzzing hum of tiny jaws opening and closing, grinding and tearing. The writhing gray mass spread toward the edge of the field, and the ground it passed over was left brown, bare. A million mouths. They ate anything green, anything soft, each other. The horde reached the hedgework. There it split into a hundred feelers that searched back and forth through the intricate twisting of the maze. Where the hedge wall was narrow or low, the mouths began to eat their way through. A command was given, and all along the crest of the hill, the machine scatter guns whirred, spraying a dozen streams of birdshot down on those points where the horde was breaking out. The poison shot killed instantly by the thousands, and tens of thousands were attracted by the newly dead into the field of fire. Only the creatures which avoided the simplest branches of the maze escaped death by nerve poison, and most of those survivors ran blindly into dead ends where claymore mines blasted their bodies apart. Only the smartest, fastest thousand of the original million reached the upper end of the maze. These had grown fat since they climbed from their father's graves, yet they still moved forward faster than a man can walk. Not a blade of grass survived their passage. I'll say one thing about my stay on Shima. It cured me once and for all of any nostalgia I had felt for pre-millennium Earth. Shima had the whole bag. The slums, the smog, the overpopulation, the starvation, and now this. I looked down from our hiding place at the congregation standing below. The Shimans sang from hymnals, and their quacking was at once alien and familiar. On the dais near the front of the room was a podium, an altar, I should say. The candelabra on the altar cast its weak light on the immense wooden cross that stood behind it. It took me all the way back to Chicago, circa 1940, when a similar scene had been weekly ritual. Funny, that was one bit of nostalgia I had never wished to part with. But after seeing those shark-faced killers mouthing the same chants, I knew the past would never seem the same. The hymn ended, but the congregation remained standing. Outside, I could hear the night traffic and the occasional rumble of military vehicles. The city was not calm. A million tons of hostile metal still sat in their sky. Then the minister walked rapidly to the altar. The crowd moaned softly. He was dressed all in black, and I swear he had a clerical collar hung around the upper portion of his necklace body. Sumo shifted her weight, her thigh resting momentarily against mine. Our friend Serbat had hidden us in this cramped space above the hall. He was supposedly negotiating with the reverends for better accommodations. The Earth Pole girl peered through the smoked glass which shielded us from the congregation's view and whispered, Christianity is popular on Shima. A couple of Catholic evangels introduced the cult here nearly two centuries ago. I suppose any religion with a Paul would have sufficed, but the Shimans never invented one of their own. Below us, the parishioners settled back in their pews as the minister began some sort of speech, and that sounded kind of familiar, too. I glanced back at Sumo's shadowed face. Her long, blonde hair glinted pale across her shoulders. Kekkonen, she continued, do you know why EarthGov has quarantined Shima? An odd question. Uh, they've made the usual cultural shock noises, but it's obvious they're just scared of the competition these gooks could provide, given a halfway decent technology. I'm not worried. EarthGov has never put enough store by human ingenuity and guts. Your problem, Professor Doctor, is that you can think of competition only on an economic level. A strange failing for one who considers himself so rough and tough. Look down there. Do you see those two at the end of the pew fight to hold the collection tray? The Shemans tugged the plate back and forth, snarling. Finally, the larger of the two raked his claws across the other's face, opening deep red cuts. 
Shorty squealed and released the plate. The victor ponderously drew a fat wallet from his blouse and dropped several silver slugs into the tray, then passed it down the row, away from his adversary. Those near the struggle gave it their undivided attention, while from the front of the hall the minister droned on. Are you familiar with the Sheman life cycle, Professor? It was a statement. Certainly. And a most economical system it was. From birth the creatures lived to eat, anything and everything. Growing from a baby smaller than your fist, in less than two years the average Sheman massed sixty kilograms, Twenty-one months after birth, a thousand embryos would begin to develop in his combined womb ovary. No sex was necessary for this to happen, though occasionally the Shemans did exchange genetic material through conjugation. For the next three months, the embryos developed in something like the normal mammalian fashion, drawing nourishment from the parent's circulatory system. When the fetuses were almost at term, the womb filled most of the adult's torso, absorbed most of the adult's food intake. Finally, and I still didn't understand the timing mechanism since it seemed to depend on external factors, the thousand baby shemans ate their way out of the parent and began their own careers. Then you know that parricide and genocide are a way of life with these monsters. EarthGov is not the stupid giant you imagine, Professor. The challenge Shima presents us transcends economics. The Shemans are very much like locusts, yet their average intelligence is far greater than ours. In another century, they will be our technological equal. You entrepreneurs will lose more than profits dealing with them. You'll be exterminated. The Shemans have only one natural disadvantage, and that is their short lifespan. In twenty-four months, even they can't learn enough to coordinate their genius. Her whisper became soft, taut. If you succeed, Professor, we will have lost the small chance we have for survival. Miss Iceberg was blowing her cool. Hell, Sumo, I thought you were on our side. You're taking our money, anyway. If you're really so in love with EarthGov policy, why don't you blow the whistle on me? The EarthPol agent was silent for nearly a minute. At first, I thought she was watching the services below, but then I noticed her eyes were closed. Kekkonen, I had a husband once. He was an evangel, a fool. Missionaries were allowed on Shima up to fifty years ago. That was probably the biggest mistake that EarthGov has ever made. Before the Christians came, the Shemans had never been able to cooperate with one another, even to the extent of developing a language. The only thing they did together was to eat. Since they were faster and deadlier than anything else, they would often come near to wiping out all life on a continent, at which point they'd start eating each other and their own population would drop to near zero and stay there for decades. But then the Christians came and filled them with notions of sin and self-denial, and now the Shemans cooperate with each other enough so they can use their brains for something besides outsmarting their next meal. Anyway, Roger was one of the last missionaries. He really believed his own myths. I don't know if his philosophies conflicted with Sheman dogma, or if the monsters were just hungry one day. But my husband never came back. I almost whistled. Okay, so you don't like Shemans, but hating them won't bring your husband back. That would take the skills of a million techs and the resources of... My voice petered out as I remembered that that was about the size bribe Samuelson had offered her. Hmm, I guess I'm getting the picture. You want things both ways, to have your husband back, and to have a little vengeance, too. Not vengeance, Professor Doctor. You are just rationalizing your own goals. Remember the things you have seen on Shima, the cannibalism, the viciousness, the constant state of war between the different races of the species, and above all the superhuman intelligence these monsters possess. You think it ridiculous for me to accept money on a project I want to fail. But never in a thousand years will I have another chance to make such a fortune. And you know a thousand years is too long. It would be so terribly simple for you to fail. I'm not asking you to give up the rewards promised you. Just make an error that won't be apparent until after the rejuvenation treatments are started and you have been paid. 
If nothing else, Sumo had the gall of ten. She was obviously an idealist, that is, someone who can twist his every vice into self-righteous morality. You're nearly as ignorant as you are impudent. S.E. won't buy a pig in a poke. I don't get a cent till my process has boosted the Sheman lifespan past one century. That's the hell of immortality. You can't tell until the day after forever whether you really have the goods. This is one cat you'll have to skin yourself. Sumo shook her head. I intend to get that bribe, Kekkonen. The human race is second with me. But... She looked up, and her voice hardened. I've studied these creatures. If their lifespan is increased beyond ten years, there won't be any Samuelson Enterprises to pay you a century from now. Ah, so self-righteous. The discussion was interrupted as a crack of light appeared in the darkness above us. Serbat's bird voice came faintly. We have moved the Bible classes from this part of the building. Come out. The light above silhouetted some curves I hadn't noticed before as Sumo crawled through the tiny trap. I followed her, groaning. I never did learn what they used that cramped box for. Maybe the reverends spied on their congregations. You could never tell about those cannibals in the back pews. We followed Serbot down a low, narrow corridor into a windowless room. Another sheman stood by a table in the center of the room. He looked skinny compared to our guide. Serbot shut the door and motioned us to chairs by the table. I sat, but it was hardly worth the effort. The seat was so narrow I couldn't relax my legs. Shemans are bottom-heavy. They don't really sit. They just lean. Serbot made the introductions. This is Brother Gorst of the Order of St. Roger. He keeps the rules at this church by the authority of the Committee of Senkanorn. Gorst's father was probably my teacher in second school. Brother Gorst nodded shyly, and the harsh light glinted starkly off his fangs. Our interpreter continued. For this minute we are safe from Sheman police and army forces. The Earth police spaceship is still hanging over the water, but only Miss Sumo can do anything about that. Gorst will help us, but we may not use these rooms for more than three days. They are needed for church purposes later this eight day. There is another time limit, too. You will not have my help after tomorrow morning. Naturally, Gorst has no knowledge of any Earth languages, so... I interrupted. The devil, you say? There's no such thing as half a success in this racket, Serbot. What's the matter with you? The sheman leaned across the table, his claws raking scratches in its plastic surface. That is not your business, worm, he hissed into my face. Serbot stared at me for several seconds, his jaws working spasmodically. Finally, he returned to his chair. You will please take account of this. Things would not be so serious now if you had only given care to the Earth Pole danger. If I were you, I would be happy that Shima is still willing to take what you have to offer. At this time, our governments take Earth Pole's orders, but it is safe to say they hope by Christ's name that you are out of danger. Their attempts to get you will not be strong. The greatest danger still comes from your people. The blonde Earth Pole agent took the cue. We have at least forty-eight hours before O'Hara locates us. She reached into a pocket. Fortunately, I am not so poorly equipped as Professor Kekkonen. This is police issue. The pile she placed on the table had no definite form. It was almost alive. A thousand shifting colors shone from within it. Except for its size, her mamre seemed unremarkable. Tsumo plunged her hand into it, and the device searched slowly across the table. Brother Gorst squeaked his terror and bolted for the exit. Serbot spoke rapidly to him, but the skinny Sheman continued to tremble. Serbot turned to us. The fact is, it's harder for me to talk with Gorst than with you. His special word knowledge has to do with right and wrong, while my special knowledge is of language. The number of words we have in common is small. I guess two years isn't much time to learn to talk, read, write, and acquire a technical education. Finally, Serbot coaxed Gorst back to the table. Sumo continued her spiel. Don't be alarmed. I'm only checking to see that... And she lapsed into Japanese. Old English just isn't up to describing modern technology. That is, I'm making sure that our shield against detection is still working. It is, but even so, it doesn't protect us from premillennium techniques. 
so stay away from windows and open places. Also, my omamori can't completely protect us against... She looked at me, puzzled. How can I explain Foon, Professor? Hmm. Serbat, Earthpol has a weapon which could be effective against us even if we stay hidden. A gas? The Sheman asked. No, it's quite insubstantial. Just imagine that... Hell, that's no good. About the best I can say is that it amounts to a massive dose of bad luck. If the brakes run consistently against us, I'd guess Foon might be involved. Serbot was incredulous, but he relayed my clumsy description on to Gorst, who seemed to accept the idea immediately. Finally, Serbot spoke in English. What an interesting thing. With this Faun, you no longer need to be responsible for your shortcomings. We used to have things like that, but now we poor shemans are weighted down by reason and science. Sarcasm yet. Don't accuse us of superstition, Serbot. You people are clever, but you have a long way to catch up. In the last two centuries, mankind has achieved every material goal that someone at your level could even state in a logical way. And we've gone on from there. The methods, even the methodology, of Tsumo's struggle with Earth Pole would be unimaginable to you. But I assure you that if she weren't protecting us, we would have been captured hours ago. I touched the police issue Mamri. In addition to being our only defense against Earth Pole, it was also my only hope for finishing my biological analysis of the Shemans. Apparently, the Earth Pole agent really meant to keep her part of the bargain with Samuelson et al. Perhaps she thought I would foul things up for her. Fat chance. Before things blew up, I was pretty close to success. Only one real problem was left. Death for a Sheman isn't the sort of metabolic collapse we see in most other races. In a way, you die backwards. If I'm going to crack this thing, I've got to observe death firsthand. Serbot was silent for a long moment. It was the first time I'd seen a Sheman in a reflective mood. Finally, he said, As you have knowledge, Professor, we Shemans come to birth in great groups. The fact is that those who first saw life 709 days before now will give up living tomorrow. He turned and spoke to Brother Gorst. The other bobbed his head and buzzed a response. Serbot translated. There is a death place only three kilometers from here. It is necessary for people of Gorst's order to be on hand at the time of the group deaths. Brother Gorst says that he is willing to take you there, but it will not be possible for you to get nearer than fifty or sixty meters to the place of the deaths. That'll be fine, I said. Fifteen minutes is all I need. Then this is a very happy chance, Professor. If it was not for the group death tomorrow, you would have to take nine more days here. As he spoke, a caterwauling rose from below us. Moments later, someone was pounding at our door. Gorst scuttled over and opened it a crack. There was a hysterical consultation. Then the reverend slammed the door and screamed at our interpreter. Christ help us, said Serbot. There has been a smash-out at the second school two kilometers from here. A large group of young is coming this way. Gorst came back to his chair, then bounded up and paced around the room. From the way he chewed his lip, I guessed he was unhappy about the situation. Serbot continued, We have to make the decision of running or not running from the young persons. Are there any other hideouts you could dig up in this area? I asked. No, Gorst is the only living person I have knowledge of in this place. Hmm. Then I guess we'll just have to stay put. Serbot came to his feet. You have little knowledge of Sheman conditions, Professor, or you wouldn't make that decision quite so easily. It is too bad. You are probably right. Our chances are near zero, one way or the other, but... He snarled something at the other Sheman. Brother Gorst replied shortly. Serbot said, My friend is in agreement with you. We'll be safest at the top of the building. Gorst was already out the door. Tsumo scooped her mamri off the table, and we followed. A spiral stairway climbed twenty meters to end on a flat roof no more than ten meters square. A cross towered over the open space. It was well past midnight. Below and around us were the sounds of running feet and automobile engines being lit. The cars screeched away from their parking slots and headed west. One by one, the lights in nearby buildings went out. The traffic got steadily noisier. Then, after five or ten minutes, it subsided and the neighborhood was still. 
The church spire reached several stories above the nearby buildings, and from there we could see Berylesk spread many kilometers, a mosaic of rough gray rectangles. Shima's single moon had risen, and its light fell silver on the city. Near the horizon, bomb flashes shone through the thinning smog, and I could hear the faint thud-a-dub of artillery. Berylesk wasn't on good terms with its neighbors. Sumo pulled at my arm. I turned. Vast, blue, the glowing earth pole ship hung above the bay. I jerked my outfit's dark veil down across my face. It wouldn't matter how good Sumo's equipment was if her superiors actually eyeballed us. Gorst hustled over to the low parapet and leaned out to look straight down. At the same time, Serbot studied the empty streets and quiet tenements. Finally, I whispered, So where's the action, Serbot? The Sheman glanced at the Earth Pole ship, then sidled over to us. Don't you see why things are so quiet, Professor? More than three thousand children are free in this part of Berylesk, and they are coming our way. Everyone with any brain has run away from here. Children will eat everything they see, and it will be death to fight them. They run together, and they are very bright. In the end, they will be so full that the authorities can take care of them one by one. We are probably the only living older persons within three kilometers, and that makes us the biggest pieces of food around. Sumo stood behind me, close to the cross. She ignored us both as she played with her mamri. From the parapet, Brother Gorst shrilled softly. Gorst is hearing them come, Serbot translated. I turned to look east. There were faint sounds of traffic and artillery, but nothing else. Several blocks away, something bright lit the sides of facing buildings. There was a muffled, concussive thud. Serbot and Gorst hissed in pain. The fire burned briefly, then got it out. The slums of Berylesk were mostly stone, non-flammable, and much more important, inedible. Smoke rose into the sky, blocked the moonlight, and laid twisting shadows on the city. Far away, something laughed, and someone screamed. Voices growled and squabbled. Whatever they were, they seemed to be having a good time. Four blocks up the pike, a street lamp winked out, and there was the sound of breaking glass. In the moonlight, the juveniles were fast-moving gray shadows that flitted from doorway to doorway. The little bastards were smart. They never exposed themselves unnecessarily, and they systematically smashed every street lamp they passed. I didn't see anyone run across the street until their skirmish line was nearly even with our church. Behind those front lines, more were coming. How big was the grade school, anyway? Their lunatic screaming was all around us now. Sumo looked up from her work, for the first time acknowledging our trivial problems. Sir, but aren't we safe from them here? We're so far above the street. The Sheman made a rude noise, but it was a soft, rude noise. They will smell us even up here, and don't doubt they will come this high. We're the best food left. I wouldn't be surprised if the greater part of the young people are there in the church right now, eating the wood seats and giving thought to our downfall. Feet pattered around below us, and I heard a low, bubbly chuckle. I leaned over the parapet and looked down on the church's main roof. A chorus of eager shouts greeted my appearance, and something whistled up past my face. I ducked back, but I had already seen more than enough. There was a mob of them dancing on the deck below us. They were so close I could see the white of their fangs and the drool foaming down their chins. Except that they were near naked, the juveniles looked pretty much like adult shemans. Was there any real difference? Tumo might have a point after all, but that point would be entirely academic unless we could get out of this fix in one piece. Gorst stood a meter behind the parapet with a quarterstaff in his claws. The first head that popped up would get a massive surprise. Serbot paced back and forth, either panicking or thoughtful, I couldn't tell which. How long did we have before the juveniles came up the wall of the steeple? It was maddening. Properly used, Sumo's Omamori could easily defeat this attack, but at the same time such use would certainly put Earth Pole onto our location. I looked around our tiny roof. There was unidentifiable equipment in the shadows beneath the parapet. Memories of a life two centuries past were coming back and so were some ideas. The largest object, an ellipsoidal tank, sat near the base of the cross. A slender hose led from a valve on the tank. 
Half crouching, I ran across to the tank and felt its surface. The tank was cool, and the valve was covered with frost. Serbot, I shouted over the competition from below. What's this gadget? The Sheman stopped his agonized pacing and glared at me briefly, then shouted at Gorst. That's a vessel of liquid natural gas, he translated the reply. They use it to heat the church and to cook. I looked at Serbot, and he looked back at me. I think he had the idea the instant he knew what the tank was. He came over to the tank and looked at the valve. I turned to follow the hose that stretched along the floor to a hole in the parapet. Kikkonen, Tsumo's voice was tense. If you attract Earthpole's notice, that disguise won't hold up. Over my shoulder I could see the glowing hulk of the gunboat. Forget it, girl. If I can't do something with this tank, we'll all be dead in five minutes. Probably less. The juveniles were much louder now. We'd have to hope that if anyone was aboard the ship, they didn't believe in old-fashioned detection methods, like photo-scanning computers. The hose was slack and inflexible. Four meters from the tank, it entered a small valve set in the parapet. I began cutting at it with my knife. Behind me, Serbat said, This looks good. The vessel is nearly full and its pressure is high. There were tearing sounds. And it will get higher now. That hose was tougher than it looked. It took nearly a minute, but finally I hacked through the thing. As I stood up, a head full of teeth appeared over the parapet next to me. I straight-armed the juvenile. It fell backwards, taking part of my sleeve in its claws. We were down to seconds now. I looked down at the hose in my hands and discovered the big flaw in our plan. How were we going to get this thing lit? Then I glanced at Serbat. The Sheman was frantically jamming his coat under the tank. He stepped back and pointed something at the tank. A spark fell upon the coat, and soon yellow flames slid up the underside of the container. Even as those flames spread, he turned and ran to where I stood. But then he slowed, stopped, looked down at the object in his hand. For a long moment he just stood there. What's the matter? The lighter dead? No, Serbat answered slowly. He squeezed the small metal tube, and a drop of fire spurted from the end. I swore and grabbed the lighter from Serbat's hands. I leaned over the parapet and looked down. At least thirty juveniles were coming up the wall at us. Behind me, Tsumo screamed. This was followed by a meaty thud. I looked up to see the Earth Pole agent swing a long broom down on the head of a second monster. I guess she had finally found something more worrisome than her superiors in the sky to the west. Gorst was busy, too. He swept back and forth along the parapet with his quarterstaff. I saw him connect at least three times. The juveniles fell screeching to the roof below. Maybe that would occupy their brother's appetites a few more moments. I pushed our interpreter toward the gas tank. Turn that damn valve, Serbot. The Sheman returned to the tank. Now the flames licked up around the curving sides, keeping the valve out of reach. He ran to the other side of the cross, picked up some kind of rod, and stuck it in the valve handle. Turn it! Turn it! I shouted. Serbot hesitated, then gave the lever a pull. No effect. He twisted the valve again. The hose bucked in my hand as clear liquid spewed through it and arced out into space. That hose got cold. I could feel my hand going numb even as I stood there. I squeezed the lighter. A tiny particle of fire spurted out, missed the stream of gas. On my next try, the burning droplet did touch the stream. Nothing happened. I wrapped the hose in the corner of my jacket, but it was still colder than a harlot's smile. This was probably my last chance to ignite the damn thing. Our gas pressure would fail soon enough, even if the juveniles didn't get me first. The liquid gas left the hose as a coherent stream, but about five meters along its arc, the fluid began to mix with the air. Ah! I shook the lighter again and aimed it further out. The burning speck dropped through the aerated part of the stream. The mist didn't burn. It exploded. I almost lost my footing as a roaring ball of blue-white flame materialized in the air five meters from the end of the hose. If that fireball had been any bigger, we'd have been blown right off the roof. I pointed the hose down over the parapet. The roar of the flame masked their screams, but as I swept the fire along the wall below, I could see the juveniles fall away. The concussion alone must have been lethal. As I dragged the hose along the parapet, I could feel my face blister and my hands go numb. How long did I have before we ran out of gas, or even worse, before Serbot's little fire exploded the tank? 
The ball of blue flame swept across the fourth wall till no one was left there, till the wall was cracked and blackened. The roof and street below were littered with bodies. Then Suma was dragging at my arm. I turned to see five or six gray forms leap from the trap door in the middle of our roof. I didn't have much choice. I turned the hose inward. Hunks of masonry flew past us as the exploding gas demolished the intruders along with the trapdoor, the center of the roof, and part of the cross. The floor buckled, and I fell to one knee. That hose was some tiger's tail. If I dropped it, the top of the building would probably get blown off. Finally, I managed to twist it around so the steam pointed outward again. The explosion ended almost as suddenly as it had begun. All that was left was a ringing that roared in my ears. I was abruptly aware of the sweat dripping down the side of my nose and the taste of dust and blood in my mouth. I dropped the hose and looked down at my numb hands. Was it the moonlight, or were they really bone white? Over by the gas tank, Serbot was busy putting out the fire he had set. He looked okay, except that his clothes were shredded. Sumo stood by the parapet. Her veil and one sleeve had been ripped away. Brother Gorst lay face down beside the large hole our makeshift flamethrower had put in the roof. If anything was left alive in that hole, it was downright unkillable. The ringing faded from my ears, and I could hear low-pitched sirens in the far distance. But I couldn't hear a single juvenile, and the smell of barbecue floated up from the street. Serbot nudged Gorst with his foot. The other's clawed hand lashed out barely missing our interpreter. The reverend sat up and groaned. Serbot glanced at us. You all right? he asked. I grunted something affirmative, and Sumo nodded. An ugly bruise covered her jaw and cheek, and four deep scratches ran down her arm. She followed my glance. Never mind, I'll live. She pulled the mamri from her pocket. You'll be pleased to know that this has survived. What do we do now? It was Serbot who answered. Same as before, we'll stay here this night. Tomorrow you'll be able to see the group death you're so interested in. He moved cautiously to the edge of the hole. The moon was overhead now, and the damage was clearly visible. The room directly below us was gutted, and its floor was partly burned through. The room below that looked pretty bad, too. First, we have to get some way to go down through this hole. Brother Gorst rolled onto his feet and looked briefly at the destruction below. Then he ran to a small locker near the edge of the roof. He pulled out a coil of rope and threw it to Serbot, who tied one end about the cross. Our interpreter moved slowly, almost clumsily. I looked closely at him, but in the moonlight he seemed uninjured. Serbot pulled at the rope, making sure it was fast. Then he tossed the other end into the hole. If past experience is a guide, he said, we won't have any more trouble this night. The young persons fight very hard, but they are bright, and when they have knowledge that their chances are zero, they go away. Also, they fear flames more than any other thing. He turned and slowly lowered himself hand over hand into the darkness. The rest of us followed. My hands weren't numb anymore. The rope felt like a brand on them. I slipped and fell the last meter to the floor. I stood up to see the two Shimans and Sumo standing nearby. The Earth Paul agent was fiddling with the Omamori, trying to re-establish our cover. What was left of the roof above us blocked the Earth Pole ship from view. Through the jagged hole, the full moon spread an irregular patch of gray light on the wreckage around us. The floor had buckled and cracked under the explosion. Several large fragments from a marble tabletop rested near my feet. As my eyes became accustomed to the darkness, I could also see what was left of the juveniles who had used this route to surprise us on the roof. The room was a combination abattoir and ruin. Gorst moved quickly to the west wall, dug into the rubble. His rummaging uncovered a ladder well. We wouldn't have to use that rope again. Brother Gorst bent over and crawled down into the hole he had uncovered. All this time Serbot just stood looking at the floor. Gorst called to him, and he walked slowly over to the ladder. I was right above Sumo as we climbed down. Her progress was clumsy, slow. It was a good thing the rungs were set only fifteen centimeters apart. 
A single beam of moonlight found its way over my shoulder and onto those below me. If I hadn't been looking in just the right spot, I could have missed what happened then. A screaming fury hurtled out of the darkness. Gorst, who was already on the floor below us, whirled at the sound, his claws extended. Then just before the juvenile struck, he lowered his arms, stood defenseless. Gorst paid for his stupidity as the juvenile slammed into him, knocking him flat. He was dead even before he touched ground. His throat was ripped out. Now the juvenile headed for us on the ladder. A reflex three centuries old took over, and my knife was out of my sleeve and in my hand. I threw just before the creature reached Serbot. One thing I knew was Sheman anatomy. Still, it was mostly luck that the knife struck the only unarmored section of his nautichord. My fingers were just too ripped up for accurate throwing. The juvenile dived face first into the base of the ladder and lay still. For a long moment the rest of us were frozen too. If more were coming, we didn't have a chance. But the seconds passed, and no other creatures appeared. The three of us scrambled down to the floor. As I retrieved my knife, I noticed that the corpse's flesh was practically parboiled. The juvenile must have been too shook up by the explosion to run off with the rest of the pack. Serbot walked past Gorst's body without looking down at it. Come on, he said. You'd think I had just threatened his life rather than saved it. This was the first level where the main stairs were still intact. We followed Serbot down them into the darkness. I couldn't see a thing, and the stairs were littered with crap that had fallen in from the disaster area above us. Either Serbot was a fool, or he had some special reason to think we were safe. Finally, we reached a level where the electric lights were still working. Serbot left the stairway, and we walked down a long, deserted corridor. He stopped at a half-open door, sniffed around, then stepped through the doorway and flicked on a light. I have no doubt you'll be safe here for this night. I looked inside. A bas-relief forest had been cut in the walls and then painted green. Three wide cots were set near the middle of the room, on the only carpet I ever saw on Shima. And what did they use the place for? You got me. But whatever its purpose, the room looked secure. A grated window was set in one wall. Nothing was going to surprise us from that direction. And the door was heavy plastic with an inside lock. Sumo stepped into the room. You're not staying with us? she asked Serbot. No, that would not be safe. He was already walking from the room. Just keep memory that you have to be up two hours before sunrise in order to get to the death place on time. Have your... machines ready. The arrogant bastard. What was safe for us was not safe enough for him. I followed the sheman into the hall, debating whether to shake some answers out of him. But there were two good arguments against such action. One, he might end up shaking me, and two, unless we wanted to turn ourselves over to Earthpole, we didn't have any choice but to play things his way. So I stepped back into the room and slammed the door. The lock fell to with a satisfying thunk. Sumo sat down heavily on one of the cots and pulled the mamri from its pouch. She played awkwardly with it for several seconds. In the bright blue light, her bruise was a delicate mauve. Finally, she looked up. We're still undetected, but what happened tonight is almost certainly Foon. There hasn't been a smash-out from that particular school in nearly three years. If we stay here much longer, our bad luck is going to kill us. I grunted. Sumo was at her cheery best. In that case, I'll need a good night's sleep. I don't want to have to do that job twice. I hit the light and settled down on the nearest bunk. Faint bands of gray light crossed the ceiling from the tiny window. The shadowed forest on the wall almost seemed real now. Tomorrow was going to be tricky. I would be using unfamiliar equipment, Sumo's Mamre, out of doors and at a relatively great distance from the dying. Even an orgy of death would be hard to analyze under those conditions. And all the time, we'd have Earthpole breathing down our necks. Several details needed thorough thinking out, but every time I tried to concentrate on them, I'd remember those juveniles scrambling up the church steeple at us. Over the last couple of centuries, I'd had contact with three non-human races. 
The best competition I'd come across were the draylings, carnivores with creative intelligence about 0.8 the human norm. I had never seen a group whose combined viciousness and cunning approached man's. Until now. The Shemans started life by committing a murder. The well-picked skeletons in the alley showed the murders didn't stop with birth. The average human would have to practice hard to be as evil as a Sheman is by inclination. Sumo's voice came softly from across the room. She must have been reading my mind. And they're smart, too. See how much Serbat has picked up in less than two years. He could go on learning at that rate for another century, if only he could live that long. The average is as inventive as our best. Fifty years ago there wasn't a single steam engine on Shima, and you can be sure we in EarthGov didn't help them invent one. In the pale light I saw her stand and cross to my bunk. Her weight settled beside me. My frostbitten hand moved automatically across her back. Money is no good if you are dead, and we'll all die unless you fail tomorrow. A soft hand slipped across my neck, and I felt her face in front of mine. She tried awfully hard to convince me. Toward the end, there in the darkness, I almost felt sorry for a little Miss Machiavelli. She kept calling me Roger. Someone was shaking me. I woke to find Sumo's face hovering hazily in the air above me. I squinted against the hellishly bright light and muttered, What's the matter? Serbat says it's time to go to the cemetery. Oh. I swung my feet to the floor and raised myself off the bunk. My hands felt like hunks of flayed meat. I don't know how I was able to sleep with them. I steadied myself against the bed and looked around. The window was a patch of unrelieved darkness in the wall. We still had a way to go before morning. Tsumo was dressed except for hood and veil, and she was pushing my costume at me. I took the disguise. Where the devil is Serbat, anyway? Then I saw him over by the door, on the floor. The sheman was curled up in a tight ball. His bloodshot eyes roved aimlessly about, finally focused on me. My jaw must have been resting on my chest. Serbat croaked. So, Professor, you have been getting knowledge of sheman life all this time, but you did not ever take note of my condition. If it wasn't for the special substances I've been taking, I would have been like this days ago. He stopped coughed reddish foam. Okay, I had been an idiot. The signs had all been there. Serbat's relative plumpness, his awkward slowness the last few hours, his comments about not being with us after the morning. My only excuse is the fact that death by old age had become a very theoretical thing to me. Sure, I studied it, but I hadn't been confronted with the physical reality for more than a century. But one oversight was enough. I could already see a mess of consequences ahead. I slipped the black dress over my head and put on the veil. Sumo, take Serbat's legs. We'll have to carry him downstairs. I grabbed Serbat's shoulders and we lifted together. The sheman must have massed close to seventy-five kilos, about fifteen over the average adult's weight. If he had been on drugs to curb the burrowing instinct, he might die before we got him to the cemetery, and that would be fatal all the way around. Now we had a new reason for getting to that cemetery on time. We hadn't gone down very many steps before Tsumo began straining under the load. She leaned to one side, favoring her left hand. Me, both hands felt like they were ready to fall off, so I didn't have such trouble. Serbat hung between us, clutching tightly at his middle. His head lolled. His jaws opened with tiny whimpering sounds, and reddish drool dripped down his head onto the steps. It was obviously way past burrowing time for him. Serbat gasped out one word at a breath. Left, turn, first, story. Two more flights and we were on the ground. We turned left and staggered out the side door into a parking lot. No one was around this early in the morning. A sea fog had moved in and perfect halos hung around the only two street lamps left alight. It was so foggy we couldn't even see the other side of the lot. For the first time since I'd been on Shima, the air was tolerably clean. The red one, said Serbat. Tsumo and I half-dragged the Shiman over to a large red car with official markings. We laid Serbat on the asphalt and tried the doors. Locked. 
Gorst's opener, in here. His clawed hand jerked upward. I retrieved the keys from his blouse and opened the door. Somehow we managed to bundle Serbat into the back seat. I looked at Sumo. You know how to operate this contraption? Her eyes widened in dismay. Apparently she had never considered this flaw in our plans. No, of course not. Do you? Once upon a time, my dear, I said, urging her into the passenger seat. Once upon a time. I settled behind the wheel and slammed the door. These were the first mechanical controls I had seen in a long time, but they were grotesquely familiar. The steering wheel was less than thirty centimeters across. I soon found it was only half a turn from lock to lock. A clutch and shift assembly were mounted next to the wheel. With the help of Serbot's advice, I started the engine and backed out of the parking stall. The car's triple headlights sent silver spears into the fog. It was difficult to see more than thirty meters into the murk. The only sheman around was a half-eaten corpse on the sidewalk by the entrance to the parking lot. I eased the car into the street, and Serbot directed me to the first turn. This was almost worth the price of admission. It had been a long time since I'd driven any vehicle. The street we were on went straight to the river. I'll bet we were making a hundred kilometers per hour before three blocks were passed. Go. Go, you... The rest was unintelligible. Serbot paused, then managed to say, We'll be stopped for sure if you keep driving like a sleepwalker. The buildings on either side of the narrow street zipped by too fast to count. Ahead, nothing was visible but the brilliant backglow from our headlights. How could a sheman survive even two years if he drove faster than this? I swerved as something, a truck, I think, whipped out of a side street. I turned up the throttle. The engine tried to twist off its moorings, and the view to the side became a gray blur. Three or four minutes passed. Or maybe it wasn't that long. I couldn't tell. Suddenly, Serbat was screaming. Left turn! Two hundred meters more! I slammed on the brakes. Thank God they'd taught him English instead of modern Japanese, which doesn't really have quantitative terms for distance. We probably would have driven right through the intersection before Serbat would come up with a circumlocution that would tell me how far to go and where to turn. The car skidded wildly across the intersection. Either the street was wet or the Shemans made their brake linings out of old rags. We ended up with our two front wheels over the curb. I backed the car off the sidewalk and made the turn. Now the going got tough. We had to turn every few blocks, and there were some kind of traffic signals I couldn't figure out. That tiny steering wheel was hell to turn. The skin on my hands felt like it was being ripped off. All the time, Serbot was telling me to go faster, faster. I tried. If he died there in the car, it would be like getting trapped in a school of piranha. The fog got thicker, but less uniform. Occasionally, we broke into a clear spot where I could see nearly a block. We blasted up a sharply arched bridge, felt a brief moment of near weightlessness at the top, and then were down on the other side. In the river that was now behind us, a boat whistled. From the back set, Serbot's mumbling became coherent English. Earthman, do you have knowledge how lucky you are? What? I asked. Was he getting delirious? Ahead of me, the road narrowed, got twisty. We were moving up the ridge that separated the city from the ocean. Soon we were above the murk. In the starlight, the fog spread across the lands below, a placid, cottony sea that drowned everything but the rocky island we were climbing. Earthpole's gunboat skulked north of us. Finally, Serbat replied, Being good is no trouble at all for you. You're born that way. We have to work so hard at it, like Gorst. And in the end, I'm still as bad, as hungry as I ever was. So hungry. His speech died in a liquid gurgle. I risked a look behind me. The sheman was chewing feebly at the upholstery. We were out of the city proper now. Far up, near the crest of the ridge, I could see the multiple fences that bounded the cemetery. Even by starlight, I could see that the ground around us was barren, deeply eroded. I pulled down my veil and turned the throttle to full. We covered the last five hundred meters to the open gates in a single burst of speed. The guards waved us through. After all, their job was to keep things from getting out, and I cruised into the parking area. There were lots of people around, but fortunately, the streetlights were dimmed. I parked at the side of the lot nearest the graveyard. 
We hustled Serbot out of the car and onto the pavement. The nearest Chimans were twenty meters from us, but when they saw what we were doing, they moved even further away, whispered anxiously to each other. We had a live bomb on our hands, and they wanted no part of it. Serbot lay on the pavement and stared into the sky. Every few seconds his face convulsed. He seemed to be whispering to himself. Delirious. Finally, he said in English, Tell him, I forgive him. The Shiman rolled onto his feet. He paused, quivering, then sprinted off into the darkness. His footsteps faded, and all we could hear were faint scratching sounds and the conversation of Shimans around us in the parking lot. For a moment we stood silently in the chill, moist air. Then I whispered to Tsumo, How long? It's about two hours before dawn. I am sure Earthpole will penetrate my evasion patterns in less than three hours. If you stay until the swarming, you'll probably be caught. I turned and looked across the rising fog bank. There were thirty billion people on this planet, I had been told. Without the crude form of birth control practiced at thousands of cemeteries like this one, there could be many more. And every one of the creatures was intelligent, murderous. If I finished my analysis, then they'd have practical immortality along with everything else, and we'd be facing them in our own space in a very short time, which was exactly what Samuelson wanted. In fact, it was the price he had demanded of the Shemans, that their civilization expand into space so mankind would at last have a worthy competitor. And what if the Sheman brain was as far superior as timid souls like Tsumo claimed? Well, then, we will have to do some imitating, some catching up. I could almost hear Samuelson's reedy voice speaking the words. Myself, I wasn't as sure. Ever since we were kids back in Chicago, Samuelson had been kind of kinky about street fighting and about learning from the toughs he fought, me, for instance. Give me that, I said, taking the mummy from Tsumo's hand and turning it to make my preliminary scan across the cemetery. Whether Samuelson and I were right or wrong, the next century was going to be damned interesting. The sun's disk stood well clear of the horizon. The mazes and deadfalls and machine guns had taken their toll. Of the original million infants, less than a thousand had survived. They would be weeded no further. Near the front of the pack, one of the smartest and strongest ran joyfully toward the scent of food ahead, where the first schoolmasters had set their cages. The child lashed happily at those around it, but they were wise and kept their distance. For the moment, its hunger was not completely devastating, and the sunlight warmed its back. It was wonderful to be alive and free and innocent. I wrote Original Sin around 1970. For many years, it was my favorite of all my stories. I thought I had said something about basic human issues. I liked the tantalizing glimpses of our future civilization. Remember spaceships? I deliberately wrote it without reference to any real technologies beyond 1940, the idea being that 1940 jargon should probably be as accurate as 1970 jargon in explaining the far future. The word hacker in me was also intrigued by the basic English vocabulary the aliens used. It turned out to be surprisingly difficult to write in that vocabulary. Once I saw the Gettysburg Address redone in basic English, it seemed about as eloquent as the original. I didn't realize until I was writing this story what a feat that was. Nevertheless, I had more trouble selling original sin than almost anything I've written. The early versions were just too cryptic. It bounced and bounced and bounced. But usually the editors liked parts of it, and often they told me what they didn't like. Between the kind advice of Harlan Ellison and Ben Bova, I eventually wrote something that could sell. The Blabber In my novel, Marooned in Real Time, I had a brush with the singularity. After I finished that book, I felt a bit marooned myself. The closer my stories came to the singularity, the shorter the time scales and the less opportunity for the kind of adventure stories that I grew up with. Any future history following these events would be a short run over a cliff into the abyss, with no human equivalent aliens, no intelligible interstellar civilizations. 
If I wanted to build a future history series, it seemed that I was stuck with honest extrapolation and a very quick end to human history, or a series that was overtly science fictional, but secretly a fantasy, since it would be based on the absence of the scientific progress that I see coming. I was stuck. The dilemma lasted about two years. Eventually I found a solution, one that was faithful to my ideas about progress, but which still allowed me to write fiction with human-sized characters and interstellar adventure. The solution? Basically, I turned my extrapolation sideways, as you will see in this next story. The Blabber was a test flight into the universe of my Zones of Thought novels. Some dreams take a long time in dying. Some get a last-minute reprieve, and that can be even worse. It was just over two clicks from the Elvis revival to the center of campus. Hamid Thompson took the long way across the Barker stubbly fields and through the old subdivision. Certainly the blabber preferred that route. She raced this way and that across Ham's path, rooting at roach holes and covertly watching the birds that swooped close on her seductive calls. As usual, her stalking was more for fun than food. When a bird came within striking distance, the blab's head would flick up, touching the bird with her nose, blasting it with a peal of human laughter. The blab hadn't taken this way in some time. All the birds in her regular haunts had wised up and were no fun anymore. When they reached the rock bluffs behind the subdivision, there weren't any more roach holes, and the birds had become cautious. Now the blab walked companionably beside him, humming in her own way, scraps of Elvis overlaid with months old news commentary. She went a minute or two in silence, listening. Contrary to what her detractors might say, she could be both awake and silent for hours at a time. But even then, Hamid felt an occasional buzzing in his head, or a flash of pain. The blab's tympana could emit across a 200 kilohertz band, which meant that most of her mimicry was lost on human ears. They were at the crest of the bluff. Sit down, Blab, I want to catch my breath. And look at the view, and decide what in heaven's name I should do with you and with me. The bluffs were the highest natural viewpoints in New Michigan province. The flatlands that spread around them were pocked with ponds, laced with creeks and rivers, the best farmland on the continent. From orbit, the original colonists could find no better. Water landings would have been easier, but they wanted the best odds on long-term survival. Thirty clicks away, half hidden by gray mist, Hamid could see the glassy streaks that marked the landing zone. The history books said it took three years to bring down the people and all the salvage from the great ship. Even now, the glass was faintly radioactive, one cause for the migration across the isthmus to Westland. Except for the forest around those landing strips, and the old university town just below the bluff, most everything in this direction was farmland, unending squares of brown and black and gray. The year was well into autumn, and the last of the earth trees had given up their colored leaves. The wind blowing across the plains was chill, leaving a crispness in his nose that promised snow some day soon. Halloween was next week. Halloween indeed. I wonder if in man's thirty thousand years there has ever been a celebration of that holiday like we'll be seeing next week. Hamid resisted the impulse to look back at Marquette. Ordinarily, it was one of his favorite places. The planetary capital, population four hundred thousand, a real city. As a child, visiting Marquette had been like a trip to some far star system. But now reality had come, and the stars were so close. Without turning, he knew the position of every one of the tourist barges. They floated like colored balloons above the city, yet none massed less than a thousand tons. And those were their shuttles. After the Elvis revival, Halloween was the last big event on the Marquette leg of the tour. Then they would be off to Westland for more semi-fraudulent peaks at Americana. Hamid crunched back in the dry moss that cushioned the rock. Well, Blabber, what should I do? Should I sell you? We could both make it out there if I did. The Blabber's ears perked up. Talk? Converse? 
Disgust? She settled her forty-kilo bulk next to him and nuzzled her head against his chest. The purring from her foretympanum sounded like some transcendental cat. The sound was pink noise, buzzing through his chest and shaking the rock they sat on. There were few things she enjoyed more than a good talk with a peer. Hamid stroked her black and white pelt. I said, should I sell you? The purring stopped, and for a moment the blab seemed to give the matter thoughtful consideration. Her head turned this way and that, bobbing, a good imitation of a certain prop at the university. She rolled her big dark eyes at him. Don't rush me. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. She licked daintily at the sleek fur at the base of her throat. And for all Hamid knew, she really was thinking about what to say. Sometimes she really seemed to try to understand, and sometimes she almost made sense. Finally, she shut her mouth and began talking. Should I sell you? Should I sell you? The intonation was still Hamid's, but she wasn't imitating his voice. When they talked like this, she typically sounded like an adult human female, and a very attractive one, Hamid thought. It hadn't always been that way. When she had been a pup and he a little boy, she'd sounded to him like another little boy. The strategy was clear. She understood the type of voice he most likely wanted to hear. Animal cunning? Well, she continued, I know what I think. Buy, don't sell, and always get the best price you can. She often came across like that, oracular. But he had known the blab all his life. The longer her comment, the less she understood it. In this case, Ham remembered his finance class. That was before he got his present apartment, and the blab had hidden under his desk part of the semester. It had been an exciting semester for all concerned. Buy, don't sell. That was a quote, wasn't it, from some 19th century tycoon? She blabbered on, each sentence having less correlation with the question. After a moment, Hamid grabbed the beast around the neck, laughing and crying at the same time. They wrestled briefly across the rocky slope, Hamid fighting at less than full strength and the blab carefully keeping her talons retracted. Abruptly, he was on his back and the blab was standing on his chest. She held his nose between the tips of her long jaws. Say uncle, say uncle, she shouted. The blabber's teeth stopped a couple of centimeters short of the end of her snout, but the grip was powerful. Hamid surrendered immediately. The blab jumped off him, chuckling triumph, then grabbed his sleeve to help him up. He stood up, rubbing his nose gingerly. Okay, monster, let's get going. He waved downhill toward Ann Arbor Town. Ha ha, for sure, let's get going. The blab danced down the rocks faster than he could hope to go. Yet every few seconds, the creature paused an instant, checking that he was still following. Ahmed shook his head and started down. Damned if he was going to break a leg just to keep up with her. Whatever her homeworld, he guessed that winter around Marquette was the time of year most homelike for the blab. Take her coloring, stark black and white, mixed with wide curves and swirls. He'd seen that pattern in pictures of ice pack seals. When there was snow on the ground, she was practically invisible. She was fifty meters ahead of him now. From this distance, the blab could almost pass for a dog, some kind of greyhound, maybe. But the paws were too large and the neck too long. The head looked more like a seal's than a dog's. Of course, she could bark like a dog. But then she could also sound like a thunderstorm and make something like human conversation, all at the same time. There was only one of her kind in all Middle America. This last week, he'd come to learn that her kind were almost as rare out there. A tourist wanted to buy her and tourists could pay with coin what Hamid Thompson had sought for more than half his twenty years. Hamid desperately needed some good advice. It had been five years since he'd asked his father for help. He'd be damned if he did so now. That left the university and Lazy Larry. By middle American standards, Ann Arbor Town was ancient, there were older places, out by the landing zone, parts of old Marquette still stood. School field trips to those ruins were brief. The prefab Quonsets were mildly radioactive. 
And of course, there were individual buildings in the present-day capital that went back almost to the beginning. But much of the university in Ann Arbor dated from just after those first permanent structures. The university had been a going concern for 190 years. Something was up today, and it had nothing to do with Hamid's problems. As they walked into town, a couple of police helicopters swept in from Marquette, began circling the school. On the ground, some of Ham's favorite back ways were blocked off by university safety patrols. No doubt it was tourist business. He might have to come in through the main gate, past the math building. Yuck. Even after ten years, he loathed that place. His years as a supposed prodigy, his parents forcing him into math classes he just wasn't bright enough to handle, the tears and anger at home, till he finally convinced them that he was not the boy they thought. They walked around the quad, Hamid oblivious to the graceful buttresses, the ivy that meshed stone walls into the flute trees along the street. That was all familiar. What was new was all the federal cop cars. Clusters of students stood watching the cops, but there was no riot in the air. They just seemed curious. Besides, the feds had never interfered on campus before. Keep quiet, okay? Hamid muttered. Sure, sure. The blab scrunched her neck back, went into her doggy act. At one time they had been notorious on campus, but he had dropped out that summer, and people had other things on their minds today. They walked through the main gate without comment from students or cops. The biggest surprise came when they reached Larry's slummy digs at Morrell Hall. Morrell wasn't old enough to be historic. It was old enough to be in decay. It had been an abortive experiment in brick construction. The clay had cracked and rotted, leaving gaps for vines and pests. By now, it was more a reddish mound of rubble than a habitable structure. This was where the university administration stuck tenured faculty in greatest disfavor, the quad's forgotten quarter. But not today. Today the cop cars were piled too deep in the parking areas, and there were shotgun-toting guards at the entrance. Hamid walked up the steps. He had a sick feeling that Lazy Larry might be the hardest prof in the world to see today. On the other hand, working with the tourists meant Hamid saw some of these security people every day. Your business, sir? Unfortunately, the guard was no one he recognized. I need to see my advisor, Professor Fujiyama. Larry had never been his advisor, but Hamid was looking for advice. Um, the cop flicked on his throat mic. Hamid couldn't hear much, but there was something about that black-and-white off-planet creature. Over the last twenty years, you'd have to have been living in a cave never to see anything about the blabber. A minute passed, and an older officer stepped through the doorway. Sorry, son. Mr. Fujiyama isn't seeing any students this week. Federal business. Somewhere a funeral dirge began playing. Hamid tapped the blab's forepaw with his foot. The music stopped abruptly. Ma'am, it's not school business. Inspiration struck. Why not tell something like the truth? It's about the tourists and my blabber. The senior cop sighed. That's what I was afraid you'd say. Okay, come along. As they entered the dark hallway, the blabber was chuckling triumph. Someday the blab would play her games with the wrong people and get the crap beat out of her, but apparently today was not that day. They walked down two flights of stairs. The lighting got even worse, half-dead fluorescence built into the acoustic tiling. In places, the wooden stairs sagged elastically under their feet. There were no queues of students squatting before any of the doors, but the cops hadn't cleared out the faculty. Hamid heard loud snoring from one of the offices. The Forgotten Quarter, Morale Hall in particular, was a strange place. The one thing the faculty here had in common was that each had been an unbearable pain in the neck to someone. That meant that both the most incompetent and the most brilliant were jammed into these tiny offices. Larry's office was in the sub-basement, at the end of a long hall. Two more cops flanked the doorway, but otherwise it was as Hamid remembered it. There was a brass nameplate, Professor L. Lawrence Fujiyama, Department of Transhuman Studies. Next to the nameplate, a sign boasted implausible office hours. 
In the center of the door was the picture of a piglet and the legend, If a student appears to need help, then appear to give him some. The police officer stood aside as they reached the door. Hamid was going to have to get in under his own power. Ham gave the door a couple of quick knocks. There was a sound of footsteps, and the door opened a crack. What's the secret password? came Larry's voice. Professor Fujiyama, I need to talk to— That's not it! The door was slammed loudly in Hamid's face. The senior cop put her hand on Hamid's shoulder. Sorry, son. He's done that to bigger guns than you. He shrugged off her hand. Siren sounded from the black and white creature at his feet. Ham shouted over the racket. Wait, it's me, Hamid Thompson. From your Transhume 201. The door came open again. Larry stepped out, glanced at the cops, then looked at the blabber. Well, why didn't you say so? Come on in. As Hamid and the blab scuttled past him, Larry smiled innocently at the federal officer. Don't worry, Susie, this is official business. Fujiyama's office was long and narrow, scarcely an aisle between deep equipment racks. Larry's students, those who dared these depths, doubted the man could have survived on old earth before electronic data storage. There must be tons of junk squirreled away on those shelves. The gadgets stuck out this way and that into the aisle. The place was a museum, perhaps literally. One of Larry's specialties was archaeology. Most of the machines were dead, but here and there something clicked, something glowed. Some of the gadgets were Rube Goldberg jokes. Some were early colonial prototypes. And a few were from out there. Steam and water pipes covered much of the ceiling. The place reminded Hamid of the inside of a submarine. At the back was Larry's desk. The junk on the table was balanced precariously high. A display flat, a beautiful piece of night-black statuary. In Transhume 201, Larry had described his theory of artifact management. Last in, first out, and every year buy a clean bedsheet, date it, and lay it over the previous layer of junk on your desk. Another of Lazy Larry's jokes, most had thought. But there really was a bedsheet peeking out from under the mess. Shadows climbed sharp and deep from the lamp on Larry's desk. The cabinets around him seemed to lean inwards. The open space between them was covered with posters. Those posters were one small reason Larry was down here. Ideas to offend every sensible faction of society. A pile of... something lay on the visitor's chair. Larry slopped it onto the floor and motioned Hamid to sit. Sure, I remember you from Transhume. But why mention that? You own the blabber. You're Huss Thompson's kid. He settled back in his chair. I'm not Huss Thompson's kid. Aloud. Sorry, that was all I could think to say. This is about my blabber, though. I need some advice. Ah, Fujiyama gave his famous polywog smile, somehow innocent and predatory at the same time. You came to the right place. I'm full of it. But I heard you had quit school, gone to work at the tourist bureau. Hamid shrugged, tried not to seem defensive. Yeah, but I was already a senior, and I know more American thought and lit than most graduates. And the tourist caravan will only be here another half year. After that, how long till the next? We're showing them everything I could imagine they'd want to see. In fact, we're showing them more than there really is to see. It could be a hundred years before anyone comes down here again. Possibly, possibly. Anyway, I've learned a lot. I've met almost half the tourists, but... There were ten million people living on Middle America. At least a million had a romantic yearning to get out there. At least 10,000 would give everything they owned to leave the slow zone, to live in a civilization that spanned thousands of worlds. For the last 10 years, Middle America had known of the caravans coming. Hamid had spent most of those years, half his life, all the time since he got out of math, preparing himself with the skills that could buy him a ticket out. Thousands of others had worked just as hard. 
During the last decade, every department of American thought and literature on the planet had been jammed to the bursting point, and more had been going on behind the scenes. The government and some large corporations had had secret programs that weren't revealed till just before the caravan arrived. Dozens of people had bet on the long shots, things that no one else thought the outsiders might want. Some of those were fools, the world-class athletes, the chess masters. They could never be more than eighth-rate in the vast populations of the beyond. No, to get a ride you needed something that was odd, out there. Besides the old earth angle, there weren't many possibilities, though that could be approached in surprising ways. There was Gilly Weinberg, a bright but not brilliant ATL student. When the caravan reached orbit, she bypassed the bureau, announced herself to the tourists as a genuine American cheerleader and premier courtesan. It was a ploy pursued less frankly and less successfully by others of both sexes. In Gilly's case, it had won her a ticket out. The big laugh was that her sponsor was one of the few non-humans in the caravan, a Lothal Remar slug who couldn't survive a second in an oxygen atmosphere. I'd say I'm on good terms with three of the outsiders, but there are at least five tour guides that can put on a better show. And you know the tourists managed to revive four more corpsicles from the original Middle America crew. Those guys are sure to get tickets out if they want them. Men and women who had been adults on old Earth 2,000 light years away and 20,000 years ago. It was likely that Middle America had no more valuable export this time around. If they'd just come a few years later, after I graduated, maybe made a name for myself. Larry broke into the self-pitying silence. You never thought of using the blabber as your ticket out? Off and on. Hammond glanced down at the dark bulk that curled around his feet. The blab was awfully quiet. Larry noticed the look. Don't worry. She's fooling with some ultrasound imagers I have back there. He gestured at the racks behind Hamid, where a violet glow played hopscotch between unseen gadgets. The boy smiled. We may have trouble getting her out of here. He had several ultrasonic squawkers around the apartment, but the blab rarely got to play with high-resolution equipment. Yeah, right at the beginning, I tried to interest them in the blab. Said I was her trainer. They lost interest as soon as they saw she couldn't be native to old Earth. These guys are freaks, Professor. You could rain transhuman treasure on them, and they'd call it spit. But give them Elvis Presley singing Bruce Springsteen, and they'd build you a spaceport on Selene. Larry just smiled, the way he did when some student was heading for academic catastrophe. Hamid quieted. Yeah, I know. There are good reasons for some of the strangeness. Middle America had nothing that would interest anybody rational from out there. They were stuck nine light years inside the slow zone. Commerce was hideously slow and expensive. Middle American technology was obsolete, and, considering their location, it could never amount to anything competitive. Hamid's unlucky world had only one thing going for it. It was a direct colony of Old Earth, and one of the first. Their great ship's tragic flight had lasted 20,000 years, long enough for the Earth to become a legend for much of humankind. In the beyond, there were millions of solar systems known to bear human-equivalent intelligences. Most of these could be in more or less instantaneous communication with one another. In that vastness, humanity was a speck, perhaps 4,000 worlds. Even on those, interest in a first-generation colony within the slow zone was near zero. But with 4,000 worlds, that was enough. Here and there was a rich eccentric, an historical foundation, a religious movement, all strange enough to undertake a twenty-year mission into the slowness. So Middle America should be glad for these rare mixed nuts. Over the last hundred years, there had been occasional traders and a couple of tourist caravans. That commerce had raised the Middle American standard of living substantially. More important to many, including Hamid, it was almost their only peephole on the universe beyond the zone. In the last century, 200 Middle Americans had escaped to the beyond. The early ones had been government workers, commissioned scientists. The Fed's investment had not paid off. Of all those who left, only five had returned. 
Larry Fujiyama and Hussein Thompson were two of those five. Yeah, I guess I knew they'd be fanatics, but most of them aren't even much interested in accuracy. We make a big thing of representing 21st century America, but we both know what that was like. Heavy industry moving up to Earth orbit, 500 million people still crammed into North America. At best, what we have here is like mid-20th century America, or even earlier. I've worked very hard to get our past straight. But except for a few guys I really respect, anachronism doesn't seem to bother them. It's like just being here with us is the big thing. Larry opened his mouth, seemed on the verge of providing some insight. Instead, he smiled, shrugged. One of his many mottos was, if you didn't figure it out yourself, you don't understand it. So, after all these months, where did you dig up the interest in the blabber? It was the slug, the guy running the tour. He just mailed me that he had a party who wanted to buy. Normally, this guy haggles. He... Wait, you know him pretty well, don't you? Well, he just made a flat offer. A payoff to the feds, transport for me to Lothal Ramar, that was the nearest civilized system in the beyond, and some fiddle privileges beyond that. And you kiss your pet goodbye? Yeah. I made a case for them needing a handler, me. That's not just bluff, by the way. We've grown up together. I can't imagine the blab accepting anyone without lots of help from me. But they're not interested. Now the slug claims no harm has intended her, but do you believe him? Ah, the slug's slime is generally clean. I'm sure he doesn't know of any harm planned. And he's straight enough to do at least a little checking. Did he say who wanted to buy? Somebody. Something named Ravna and Tynes. He passed Larry a flimsy, showing the offer. Ravna and Tynes had a logo. It looked like a stylized claw. There's no tourist registered with that name. Larry nodded, copied the flimsy to his display flat. I know. Well, let's see. He puttered around for a moment. The display was a lecture model with imaging on both sides. Hamid could see the other was searching internal federal databases. Larry's eyebrows rose. Mm-hmm. Ravna and Tynes arrived just last week. It's not part of the caravan at all. A solitary trader. Not only that, it's been hanging out past the Jovians at the slug's request. The Federal Space Net got some pictures. There was a fuzzy image of something long and wasp-waisted, typical of the outsider's ramscoop technology. But there were strange fins, almost like the wings on a sailplane. Larry played some algorithmic game with the display, and the image sharpened. Yeah. Look at the aspect ratio on those fins. This guy is carrying high-performance fiddle gear. No good down here, of course but hot stuff across an enormous range of environment. He whistled a few bars of Nightmare Waltz. I think we're looking at a high traitor. Someone from the transhuman spaces. Almost every university on Middle America had a Department of Transhuman Studies. Since the return of the Five, it had been a popular thing to do. Yet most people considered it a joke. Transhume was generally the bastard child of religious studies and an astro or computer science department, the dumping ground for quacks and incompetence. Lazy Larry had found the department at Ann Arbor and spent much class time eloquently proclaiming its fraudulence. Imagine trying to study what lay beyond the beyond. Even the tourists avoided the topic. Transhuman space existed. Perhaps it included most of the universe, but it was a tricky, risky, ambiguous thing. Larry said that its reality drove most of the economics of the beyond, but that all the theories about it were rumors at tenuous second hand. One of his proudest claims was that he raised transhuman studies to the level of palm reading. Yet now, apparently a trader had arrived that regularly penetrated the transhuman reaches. If the government hadn't sat on the news, it would have eclipsed the caravan itself. And this was what wanted the blab. 
Almost involuntarily, Hamid reached down to pet the creature. Y you don't think there could really be anybody transhuman on that ship? An hour ago, he had been agonizing about parting with the blab. That might be nothing compared to what they really faced. For a moment, he thought Larry was going to shrug the question off, but the older man sighed. If there's anything we've got right, it's that no transhuman can think at these depths. Even in the beyond, they die or fragment or maybe cyst. I think this Ravna and Tynes must be a human equivalent intellect. But it could be a lot more dangerous than the average outsider. The tricks it would know, the gadgets it would have. His voice trailed off. He stared at the 40-centimeter statue perched on his desk. It was lustrous green, apparently cut from a flawless block of jade. Green? Wasn't it black a minute ago? Larry's gaze snapped up to Hamid. Congratulations, your problem is a lot more interesting than you thought. Why would any outsider want the blab, much less a high trader? Well, her kind must be rare. I haven't talked to any tourist who recognized the race. Lazy Larry just nodded. Space is deep. The blab might be from somewhere else in the slow zone. When she was a pup, lots of people studied her. You saw the articles. She has a brain as big as a chimp's, but most of it's tied up in driving her tympana and processing what she hears. One guy said she's the ultimate in verbal orientation, all mouth and no mind. Ah, a student. Hamid ignored the Larryism. Watch this. He patted the blab's shoulder. She was slow in responding. That ultrasound equipment must be fascinating. Finally, she raised her head. What's up? The intonation was natural, the voice a young woman's. Some people think she's just a parrot. She can play things back better than a high-fidelity recorder. But she also picks up favorite phrases and uses them in different voices, and almost appropriately. Hey, Blab, what's that? Hamid pointed at the electric heater that Larry had propped by his feet. The blab stuck her head around the corner of the desk, saw the cherry glowing coils. This was not the sort of heater Hamid had in his apartment. What's that? That... The blab extended her head curiously toward the glow. She was a bit too eager. Her nose bumped the heater's safety grid. Hot! She jumped back, her nose tucked into her neck fur. A foreleg extended toward the heater. Hot, hot! She rolled under her haunches and licked tentatively at her nose. Jeez! She gave Hamid a look that was both calculating and reproachful. Honest, Blab, I didn't think you would touch it. She's going to get me for this. Her sense of humor extends only as far as ambushes, but it can be pretty intense. Yeah, I remember the Zoo Society's documentary on her. Fujiyama was grinning broadly. Hamid had always thought that Larry and the Blab had kindred humors. It even seemed that the animal's cackling became like the old man's after she attended a couple of his lectures. Larry pulled the heater back and walked around the desk. He hunched down to the Blab's eye level. He was all solicitude now, and a good thing. He was looking into a mouth full of sharp teeth, and somebody was playing the time bomb song. After a moment, the music stopped, and she shut her mouth. I can't believe there isn't human equivalents hiding here somewhere. Really. I've had freshmen who did worse at the start of the semester. How did you get this much verbalization without intelligence to benefit from it? He reached out to rub her shoulders. You got sore shoulders, baby. Maybe little hands ready to burst out. The blab cocked her head. I like to soar. Hammett had thought long about the Heinlein scenario. The science fiction of Old Earth was a solid part of the ATL curriculum. If she is still a child, she'll be dead before she grows up. Her bone calcium and muscle strength have deteriorated about as much as you'd expect for a 30-year-old human. Hmm, yeah. And we know she's about your age. Twenty. I suppose she could be an ego frag. But most of those are brain-damaged transhumans or obvious constructs. He went back behind his desk, began whistling tunelessly. Hamid twisted uneasily in his chair. 
He had come for advice. What he got was news that they were in totally over their heads. He shouldn't be surprised. Larry was like that. What we need is a whole lot more information. Well, I suppose I could flat out demand the slug tell me more, but I don't know how I can force any of the tourists to help me. Larry waved breezily. That's not what I meant. Sure, I'll ask the Lothramar about it. But basically, the tourists are at the end of a nine light year trip to nowhere. Whatever libraries they have are like what you would take on a South Seas vacation, and out of date to boot. And, of course, the federal government of Middle America doesn't know what's coming off to begin with. <laughs> Why else do they come to me when they're really desperate? No, what we need is direct access to library resources out there. He said it casually, as though he were talking about getting an extra telephone, not solving Middle America's greatest problem. He smiled complacently at Hamid, but the boy refused to be drawn in. Finally, haven't you wondered why the campus, Morale Hall in particular, is crawling with cops? Yeah, or I would have, if there weren't lots else on my mind. One of the more serious tourists, Skander Vrinimus Rinathan, brought along a genuine transhuman artifact. He's been holding back on it for months, hoping he could get what he wants other ways. The feds, I'll give him this, didn't budge. Finally, he brought out his secret weapon. It's in this room right now. Ham's eyes were drawn to the stone carving, now bluish-green, that sat on Larry's desk. The old man nodded. It's an ansible. Surely they don't call it that. No, but that's what it is. You mean all these years it's been a lie that fiddle won't work in the zone? You mean I've wasted my life trying to suck up to these tourists? Not really. Take a look at this thing. See the colors change. I swear its size and mass do, too. This is a real transhuman artifact. Not an intellect, of course, but not some human design manufactured in transhuman space. Skander claims, and I believe him, that no other tourist has one. A transhuman artifact. Hammond's fascination was tinged with fear. This was something one heard of in the theoretical abstract, in classes run by crackpots. Skander claims this gadget is aligned on the Lothal Ramar commercial outlet. From there, we can talk to any registered address in the beyond. Instantaneously. Hammond's voice was very small. Near enough. It would take a while to reach the universal event horizon. There are some subtle limitations if you're moving at relativistic speeds. And the catch? Larry laughed. Good man. Skander admits to a few. This thing won't work more than ten light years into the zone. I'll bet there aren't twenty worlds in the galaxy that could benefit from it. But we are definitely on one. The trick sucks enormous energy. Skander says that running this baby will dim our sun by half a percent. Not noticeable to the guy in the street, but it could have long-term bad effects. There was a short silence. Larry often did that after a cosmic understatement. And from your standpoint, Hamid, there's one big drawback. The mean bandwidth of this thing is just under six bits per minute. Huh? Ten seconds to send a single bit? Yep. Skander left three protocols at the Lotharamar end. ASCII, a hamming map to a subset of English, and an AI scheme that guesses what you'd say if you used more bits. The first is Skander's idea of a joke, and I wouldn't trust the third more than wishful thinking. But with the hamming map, you could send a short letter, say 500 English words, in a day. It's full duplex, so you might get a good part of your answer in that time. Neat, huh? Anyway, it beats waiting twenty years. Hamid guessed it would be the biggest news since first contact one hundred years ago. So, um, why did they bring it to you, Professor? Larry looked around his hole of an office, smiling wider and wider. <laughs> it's true. Our illustrious planetary president is one of the five. He's been out there. 
but I'm the only one with real friends in the beyond. You see, the feds are very leery of this deal. What Skander wants in return is most of our zygote bank. The feds banned any private sale of human zygotes. It was a big moral thing. No unborn child sold into slavery or worse. Now they're thinking of doing it themselves. They really want this Ansible. But what if it's a fake, just linked up to some fancy database on Skander's ship? Then they've lost some genetic flexibility, and maybe they've sold some kids into hell, and got nothing but a colorful trinket for their grief. So, Skander's loaned them the thing for a week, and the feds loaned it to me, with close to carte blanche. I can call up old friends, exchange filthy jokes, let the sun go dim doing it. After a week, I report on whether the gadget is really talking to the outside. Knowing you, I bet you have your own agenda. Sure. Till you showed up, the main item was to check out the foundation that sponsors Skander. See if they're as clean as he says. Now, well... Your case isn't as important morally, but it's very interesting. There should be time for both. I'll use Skander's credit to do some net stalking. See if I can find anyone who's heard of Blabbers or this Ravna and Tynes. Hamid didn't have any really close friends. Sometimes he wondered if that was another penalty of his strange upbringing or whether he was just naturally unlikable. He had come to Fujiyama for help, all right, but all he'd been expecting was a round of prickly questions that eventually brought him to some insight. Now he seemed to be on the receiving end of a favor of world-shaking proportions. It made him suspicious and very grateful all at once. He gabbled some words of abject gratitude. Larry shrugged. It's no special problem for me. I'm curious, and this week I've got the means to satisfy my curiosity. He patted the ansible. There's a real favor I can do, though. So far, Middle America has been cheated occasionally, but no outsider has used force against us. That's one good thing about the caravan system. It's to the tourists' advantage to keep each other straight. Ravna and Tynes may be different. If this is really a high trader, it might just make a grab for what it wants. If I were you, I'd keep close to the blabber and I'll see if the slug will move one of the tourist barges over the campus. If you stay in this area, not much can happen without them knowing. Hey, see what a help I am? I did nothing for your original question, and now you have a whole, uh, shipload of new things to worry about. He leaned back, and his voice turned serious. But I don't have much to say about your original question, Hamid. If Ravna and Tynes turn out to be decent, you'll still have to decide for yourself about giving up the blab. I bet every critter that thinks it thinks, even the transhumans, worry about how to do right for themselves and the ones they love. I... Uh-oh, damn. Why don't you ask your pop? Why don't you ask Hussein about these things? The guy has been heartbroken since you left. Ham felt his face go red. Pop had never had much good to say about Fujiyama. Who'd have guessed the two would talk about him? If Hamid had known, he'd never have come here today. He felt like standing up, screaming at this old man to mind his own business. Instead, he shook his head and said softly, It's kind of personal. Larry looked at him, as if wondering whether to push the matter. One word, and Ham knew that all the pain would come pouring out. But after a moment, the old man sighed. He looked around the desk to where the blab lay, eyeing the heater. Hey, blabber, you take good care of this kid. The blab returned his gaze. Sure, sure, she said. Hammond's apartment was on the south side of campus. It was large and cheap, which might seem surprising so near the oldest university around, and just a few kilometers south of the planetary capital. The back door opened on kilometers of forested wilderness. It would be a long time before there was any land development immediately south of here. The original landing zones were just twenty clicks away. In a bad storm, there might be a little hot stuff blown north. It might be only fifty percent of natural background radiation, 
but with a whole world to colonize, why spread towns toward the first landings? Hamid parked the commons bicycle in the rack out front and walked quietly around the building. Lights were on upstairs. There were the usual motorbikes of other tenants. Something was standing in back at the far end of the building. Ah, a Halloween scarecrow. He and the blab walked back to his end. It was past twilight and neither moon was in the sky. The tips of his fingers were chilled to numbness. He stuck his hands in his pockets and paused to look up. The starships of the caravan were in sync orbit at this longitude. They formed a row of bright dots in the southern sky. Something dark, too regular to be a cloud, hung almost straight overhead. That must be the protection Larry had promised. I'm hungry. Just a minute and we'll go in. Okay. The blab leaned companionably against his leg, began humming. She looked fat now, but it was just her fur, all puffed out. These temperatures were probably the most comfortable for her. He stared across the star fields. God, how many hours have I stood like this, wondering what all those stars mean? The big square was about an hour from setting. The fifth brightest star in that constellation was Lothal Ramar's sun. At Lothal Ramar and beyond, faster than light travel was possible, even for 21st century old Earth types. If Middle America were just ten more light years farther out from the galactic center, Hamid would have had all the beyond as his world. His gaze swept back across the sky. Most everything he could see there would be in the slow zone. It extended 4,000 light years inward from here, if the outsiders were to be believed. Billions of star systems, millions of civilizations, trapped. Most would never know about the outside. Even the outsiders had only vague information about the civilizations down here in the slow zone. Great ships, ram scoops, they all must be invented here again and again. Colonies spread, knowledge gained, most often lost in the long, slow silence. What theories the slow zone civilizations must have for why nothing could move faster than light, even in the face of superliminal events seen at cosmic distances? What theories they must have to explain why human equivalent intelligence was the highest ever found and ever created. Those ones deep inside, they might at times be the happiest of all, their theories assuring them they were at the top of creation. If Middle America were only a hundred light years farther down, Hamid would never know the truth. He would love this world and the spreading of civilization upon it. Hamid's eye followed the Milky Way to the eastern horizon. The glow wasn't really brighter there than above, but he knew his constellations. He was looking at the galactic center. He smiled wanly. In 20th century science fiction, those star clouds were imagined as the homes of elder races, godlike intellects. But the tourists call those regions of the galaxy the depths, the unthinking depths, not only was Fiddle impossible there, but so was sentience. So they guessed. They couldn't know for sure. The fastest round-trip probe to the edge of the depths took about 10,000 years. Such expeditions were rare, though some were well documented. Hamid shivered and looked back at the ground. Four cats sat silently just beyond the lawn, watching the blab. Not tonight, blab, he said, and the two of them went indoors. The place looked undisturbed, the usual mess. He fixed the blab her dinner and heated some soup for himself. Yuck, this stuff tastes like shit. The blab rocked back on her haunches and made retching sounds. Few people have their own childhood obnoxiousness come back to haunt them so directly as Hamid Thompson did. He could remember using exactly those words at the dinner table. Mom should have stuffed a sock down his throat. Hamid glanced at the chicken parts. Best we can afford, Blab. He was running his savings down to zero to cover the year of the tourists. Being a guide was such a plum that no one thought to pay for it. Yuck. But she started nibbling. As Ham watched her eat, he realized that one of his problems was solved. If Ravna and Tynes wouldn't take him as the Blab's trainer, they could hike back to the beyond by themselves. 
Furthermore, he'd want better evidence from the slug. Via the Ansible, he could get assurances directly from Lothalramar that Ravna and Tynes could be held to promises. The conversation with Larry had brought home all the nightmare fears, the fears that drove some people to demand total rejection of the caravan. Who knew what happened to those that left with outsiders? Almost all Middle American knowledge of the beyond came from less than thirty starships, less than a thousand strangers. Strange strangers. If it weren't for the five who came back, there would be zero corroboration. Of those five, well, Hussein Thompson was a mystery even to Hamid, seeming kind inside a vicious mercenary. Lazy Larry was a mystery, too, a cheerful one who made it clear that you better think twice about what folks tell you. But one thing came clear from all of them. Space is deep. There were millions of civilized worlds in the beyond, thousands of star-spanning empires. In such vastness, there could be no single notion of law and order. Cooperation and enlightened self-interest were common, but nightmares lurked. So what if Ravna and Tynes turned him down, or couldn't produce credible assurances? Hamid went into the bedroom and punched up the news, let the color and motion wash over him. Middle America was a beautiful world, still mostly empty. With the agrav plates and the room-temperature fusion electrics that the caravan had brought, life would be more exciting here than ever before. In twenty or thirty years, there would likely be another caravan. If he and the blab were still restless, well, there was plenty of time to prepare. Larry Fujiyama had been forty years old when he went out. Hamid sighed, happy with himself for the first time in days. The phone rang just as he finished with the news. The name of the incoming caller danced in red letters across the news display. Ravna. No location or topic. Hamid swallowed hard. He bounced off the bed, turned the phone pickup to look at a chair in an uncluttered corner of the room, and sat down there. Then he accepted the call. Ravna was human, and female. Mr. Hamid Thompson, please. That's me. Curse the stutter. For an instant, there was no reaction. Then a quick smile crossed her face. It was not a friendly smile, more like a sneer at his nervousness. I called to discuss the animal, the blabber, you call it. You have heard our offer. I am prepared to improve upon it. As she spoke, the blab walked into the room and across the phone's field of view. Her gaze did not waver. Strange. He could see that the video transmit light was on next to the screen. The blab began to hum. A moment passed, and then she reacted, a tiny start of surprise. What is your improvement? Again, a half-second pause. Ravna and Tynes were a lot nearer than the Jovians tonight, though apparently still not at Middle America. We possess devices that allow faster-than-light communication to a world in the beyond. Think on what this access means. With this, if you stay on Middle America, you will be the richest man on the planet. If you choose to accept passage out, you will have the satisfaction of knowing you have moved your world a good step out of the darkness. Ahmed found himself thinking faster than he ever had outside of a Fujiyama oral exam. There were plenty of clues here. Ravna's English was more fluent than most tourists, but her pronunciation was awful, human but awful. Her vowel stress was strange to the point of rendering her speech unintelligible, and she didn't voice things properly. Please instead of please, choose instead of choose. At the same time, he had to make sense of what she was saying and decide the correct response. Hamid thanked God he already knew about Ansible's. Miss Ravna, I agree, that is an improvement. Nevertheless, my original requirement stands. I must accompany my pet. Only I know her needs. He cocked his head. You could do worse than have an expert on call. As he spoke, her expression clouded. Rage? She seemed hostile toward him personally. But when he finished, 
Her face was filled with an approximation of a friendly smile. Of course, we will arrange that also. We had not realized earlier how important this is to you. Jeez, even I can lie better than that. This Ravna was used to getting her own way without face-to-face -face lies, or else she had real emotional problems. Either way, and since you and I are scarcely equals, we also need to work something out with the Lothal Ramar that will put a credible bond on the agreement. Her poorly constructed mask slipped. That is absurd. She looked at something off camera. The Lothal Ramar knows nothing of us. I will try to satisfy you. But know this, Hamid Thompson. I am the congenial, uh, humane member of my team. Mr. Tynes is very impatient. I try to restrain him, but if he becomes desperate enough, things could happen that would hurt us all. Do you understand me? First a lie, and now chainsaw subtlety. He fought back a smile. Careful, you might be mistaking raw insanity for bluff and bluster. Yes, Miss Ravna, I do understand, and your offer is generous. But I need to think about this. Can you give me a bit more time? Enough time to complain to the tour director. Yes, one hundred hours should be feasible. After she rang off, Hammett sat for a long time, staring sightlessly at the data set. What was Ravna? Through 20,000 years of colonization on worlds far stranger than Middle America, the human form had drifted far. Cross-fertility existed between most of Earth's children, though they differed more from one another than had races on the home planet. Ravna looked more like an Earth human than most of the tourists. Assuming she was of normal height, she could almost have passed as an American of Middle East descent. Sturdy, dark-skinned, black-haired. There were differences. Her eyes had epicanthic folds, and the irises were the most intense violet he had ever seen. Still, all that was trivial compared to her manner. Why hadn't she been receiving Hamid's video? Was she blind? She didn't seem so otherwise. He remembered her looking at things around her. Perhaps she was some sort of personality simulator. That had been a standard item in American science fiction at the end of the 20th century. The idea passed out of fashion when computer performance seemed to top out in the early 21st. But things like that should be possible in the beyond, and certainly in transhuman space. They wouldn't work very well down here, of course. Maybe she was just a graphical front end for whatever Mr. Tynes was. Somehow, Hamid thought she was real. She certainly had a human effect on him. Sure, she had a good figure, obvious, under soft white shirt and pants. And sure, Hammond had been girl crazy the last five years. He was so horny most of the time, it felt good just to ogle femikins in downtown Marquette stores. But for all out sexiness, Ravna wasn't that spectacular. She had nothing on Gilly Weinberg or Skander Vrinami's wife. Yet if he had met her at school, he would have tried harder to gain her favor than he had Gilly's. And that was saying a lot. Hamid sighed. That probably just showed that he was nuts. I want to go out. The blab rubbed her head against his arm. Hamid realized he was sweating, even though the room was chill. God, not tonight, blab. He guessed that there was a lot of bluff in Ravna and Tyne's. At the same time, it was clear they were the kind who might just grab if they could get away with it. I want to go out. Her voice came louder. The blab spent many nights outside, mainly in the forest. That made it easier to keep her quiet when she was indoors. For the blab, it was a chance to play with her pets, the cats, and sometimes the dogs in the neighborhood. There had been a war when he and the blab first arrived here. Pecking orders had been abruptly revised, and two of the most ferocious dogs had just disappeared. What was left was very strange. The cats were fascinated by the blab. They hung around the yard just for a glimpse of her. 
When she was here, they didn't even fight among themselves. Nights like tonight were the best. In a couple of hours, both Celine and Diana would rise, the silver moon and the gold. On nights like this, when gold and silver lay between deep shadows, Hamid had seen her pacing through the edge of the forest, followed by a dozen faithful retainers. But not tonight, Blab. There followed a major argument, the blabber blasting rock music and kiddie shows at high volume. The noise wasn't the loudest she could make. That would have been physically painful to Ham. No, this was more like a cheap music player set way high. Eventually, it would bring complaints from all over the apartment building. Fortunately for Hamid, the nearest rooms were unoccupied just now. After twenty minutes of din, Hamid twisted the fight into a game of humans, like many pets, the blab thought of herself as a human being, but unlike a cat or a dog or even a parrot, she could do a passable job of imitating one. The trouble was, she couldn't always find people with the patience to play along. They sat across from each other at the dinette table, the blab's forelegs splayed awkwardly across its surface. Hamid would start with some question. It didn't matter the topic. The blab would nod wisely, ponder a reply. With most abstractions, anything she had to say was nonsense, meaningful only to tea-leaf readers or wishful thinkers. Never mind that. In the game, Hamid would respond with a comment, or laugh if the blab seemed to be in a joke-telling behavior. The pacing, the intonation, they were all perfect for real human dialogue. If you didn't understand English, the game would have sounded like two friends having a good time. How about an imitation, Blab? Joe Ortega, President Ortega, can you do that? Hehe, <laughs> that was Lazy Larry's cackle. Don't rush me, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. There were several types of imitation games. For instance, she could speak back Hamid's words instantly, but with the voice of some other human. Using that trick on a voice-only phone was probably her favorite game of all, since her audience really believed she was a person. What he was asking for now was almost as much fun, if the blab would play up to it. She rubbed her jaw with a talon. Ah, yes. She sat back pompously, almost slid onto the floor before she caught herself. We must all work together in these exciting times. That was from a recent Ortega speech, a simple playback. But even when she got going, responding to Hamid's questions, ad-libbing things, she was still a perfect match for the president of Middle America. Hamid laughed and laughed. Ortega was one of the five who came back, not a very bright man, but self-important and ambitious. It said something that even his small knowledge of the outside was enough to propel him to the top of the world state. The five were very big fish in a very small pond. That was how Larry Fujiyama put it. The blab was an enormous show-off and was quickly carried away by her own wit. She began waving her forelegs around, lost her balance, and fell off the chair. Oops! She hopped back on the chair, looked at Hamid, and began laughing herself. The two were in stitches for almost half a minute. This had happened before. Hamid was sure the blab could not appreciate humor above the level of pratfalls. Her laughter was imitation for the sake of congeniality, for the sake of being a person. Oh, God. She flopped onto the table, choking with mirth, her forelegs across the back of her neck as if to restrain herself. The laughter died away to occasional snorts and then a companionable silence. Ahmed reached across to rub the bristly fur that covered the blab's forehead tympanum. You're a good kid, blab. The dark eyes opened, turned up at him. Something like a sigh escaped her, buzzing the fur under his palm. Sure, sure, she said. Hamid left the drapes partly pulled, and a window pane cranked open where the blab could sit and look out. He lay in the darkened bedroom and watched her silhouette against the silver and gold moonlight. She had her nose pressed up to the screen. Her long neck was arched to give both her head and shoulder tympana a good line on the outside. Every so often her head would jerk a few millimeters, as if something very interesting had just happened outside. The loudest sound in the night was faint roach racket out by the forest. 
The blab was being very quiet, in the range Hammond could hear, and he was grateful. She really was a good kid. He sighed and pulled the covers up to his nose. It had been a long day, one where life's problems had come out ahead. He'd be very careful the next few days. No trips away from Marquette and Ann Arbor. No leaving the blab unattended. At least the slug's protection looked solid. I better tell Larry about the second Ansible, though. If Ravna and Tynes just went direct to the government with it, that might be the most dangerous move of all. For all their pious talk and restrictions on private sales, the feds would sell their own grandmothers if they thought it would benefit the planetary interest. Thank God they already had an Ansible, or almost had one. Funny. After all these years and all the dreams, that it was the blab the outsiders were after. Hamid was an adopted child. His parents had told him that as soon as he could understand the notion. And somewhere in those early years he had guessed the truth, that his father had brought him in from the beyond. Somehow, Hus Thompson had kept that fact secret from the public. Surely the government knew and cooperated with him. In those early years, before they forced him into math, it had been a happy secret for him. He thought he had all his parents' love. Knowing that he was really from out there had merely given substance to what most well-loved kids believe anyway, that somehow they are divinely special. His secret dream had been that he was some outsider version of an exiled prince, and when he grew up, when the next chips from the beyond came down, he would be called to his destiny. Starting college at age eight had just seemed part of that destiny. His parents had been so confident of him, even though his test results were scarcely more than bright normal. That year had been the destruction of innocence. He wasn't a genius, no matter how much his parents insisted. The fights, the tears, their insistence. In the end, Mom had left to St. Thompson. Not till then did the man relent, let his child return to normal schools. Life at home was never the same. Mom's visits were brief, tense, and rare. But it wasn't for another five years that Hammond learned to hate his father. The learning had been an accident, a conversation overheard. Hussein had been hired to raise Hamid as he had, to push him into school, to twist and ruin him. The old man had never denied the boy's accusations. His attempts to explain had been vague mumbling, worse than lies. If Hamid was a prince, he must be a very hated one indeed. The memories had worn deep grooves, ones he often slid down on his way to sleep. But tonight there was something new, something ironic to the point of magic. All these years, it had been the blab who was the lost princeling. There was a hissing sound. Hamid struggled toward wakefulness, fear and puzzlement playing through his dreams. He rolled to the edge of the bed and forced his eyes to see. Only stars shone through the window. The blab. She wasn't sitting at the window screen anymore. She must be having one of her nightmares. They were rare, but spectacular. One winter's night, Hammond had been wakened by the sounds of a full-scale thunderstorm. This was not so explosive, but... He looked across the floor at the pile of blankets that was her nest. Yes, she was there, and facing his way. Blab? It's okay, baby. No reply. Only the hissing, maybe louder now. It wasn't coming from the blab. For an instant, his fuzzy mind hung in a kind of mouse-and-snake paralysis. Then he flicked on the lights. No one here. The sound was from the data set. The picture flat remained dark. This is crazy. Blab? He had never seen her like this. Her eyes were open wide, rings of white showing around the irises. Her forelegs reached beyond the blankets. The talons were extended and had slashed deep into the plastic flooring. A string of drool hung from her muzzle. He got up, started toward her. The hissing formed a voice, and the voice spoke. I want her. Human, I want her, and I will have her. Her, the blab. How did you get access? You have no business disturbing us. 
Silly talk, but it broke the nightmare spell of this waking. My name is Tynes. Hamid suddenly remembered the claw on the Ravna and Tynes logo. Tynes, cute. We have made generous offers. We have been patient. That is past. I will have her. If it means the death of all you meat animals, so be it. But I will have her. The hissing was almost gone now, but the voice still sounded like something from a cheap synthesizer. The syntax and accent were similar to Ravna's. They were either the same person or they had learned English from the same source. Still, Ravna had seemed angry. Tynes sounded flat out nuts. Except for the single stutter over meat, the tone and pacing were implacable. And that voice gave away more than anything yet about why the outsider wanted his pet. There was a hunger in its voice, a lust to feed or to rape. Hamid's rage climbed on top of his fear. Why don't you just go screw yourself, comic monster? We've got protection, else you wouldn't come bluffing. Bluffing! bluffy -er! The words turned into choked gobbling sounds. Behind him, Hamid heard the blab scream. After a moment, the noises faded. I do not bluff. Hussein Thompson has this hour learned what I do with those who cross me. You and all your people will also die unless you deliver her to me. I see a ground car parked by your house. Use it to take her east fifty kilometers. Do this within one hour, or learn what Hussein Thompson learned, that I do not bluff. And Mr. Tynes was gone. It has to be a bluff. If Tynes has that power, why not wipe the tourists from the sky and just grab the blab? Yet they were so stupid about it. A few smooth lies a week ago, and they might have gotten everything without a murmur. It was as if they couldn't imagine being disobeyed, or were desperate beyond reason. Hamid turned back to the blab. As he reached to stroke her neck, she twisted, her needle-toothed jaws clicking shut on his pajama sleeve. Blab! She released his sleeve and drew back into the pile of blankets. She was making whistling noises like the time she got hit by a pickup trike, Hamid's father had guessed those must be true blabber sounds, like human sobs or chattering of teeth. He went to his knees and made comforting noises. This time she let him stroke her neck. He saw that she had wet her bed. The blab had been toilet trained as long as he had. Bluff or not, this had thoroughly terrified her. Tynes claimed he could kill everyone. Hamid remembered the ansible. A goddamn telephone that could dim the sun. Bluff or madness? He scrambled back to his data set and punched up the tour director's number. Pray the slug was accepting more than mail tonight. The ring pattern flashed twice, and then he was looking at a panorama of cloud tops and blue sky. It might have been an aerial view of middle America, except that as you looked downward, the clouds seemed to extend forever, more and more convoluted in the dimness. This was a picture clip from the ten-bar level over Lothalrimar. No doubt the slug chose it to soothe human callers and still be true to the nature of his home world, a sub-Jovian thirty thousand kilometers across. For five seconds they soared through the canyons of cloud. Wake up, damn you! The picture cleared and he was looking at a human, Larry Fujiyama. Lazy Larry did not look surprised to see him. You got the right number, kid. I'm up here with the slug. There have been developments. Hamid gaped for an appropriate reply, and the other continued. Ravna and Tynes have been all over the slug since about midnight. Threats and promises. Mostly threats, since the Tynes critter took their calm. I'm sorry about your dad, Hamid. We should have thought to. What? Isn't that what you're calling about? Oh, it's been on the news. Here. 
The picture dissolved into a view from a news chopper flying over eastern Michigan farmland. It took Hammett a second to recognize the hills. This was near the Thompson Spread, 2,000 clicks east of Marquette. It would be past sun up there. The camera panned over a familiar creek, the newsman bragging how online news was ahead of the first rescue teams. They crested a range of hills, and where were the trees? Thousands of black lines lay below, trunks of blown-over trees, pointing inevitably inward toward the center of the blast. The newsman babbled on about the meteor strike and how fortunate it was that Ground Zero was in a lake valley, how only one farm had been affected. Hamid swallowed. That farm was Hussein Thompson's. The place they lived after Mom left. Ground Zero itself was obscured by rising steam, all that was left of the lake. The reporter assured his audience that the crater consumed all the land where the farm buildings had been. The news clip vanished. It was no middle American nuke, but it wasn't natural either, said Larry. A lighter from Ravna and Tynes put down there two hours ago. Just before the blast, I got a real scared call from Huss, something about the Tynes arriving. I'll show it to you if— No! Hamid gulped. No, he said more quietly. How he had hated Hussein Thompson. How he had loved his father in the years before. Now he was gone, and Hamid would never get his feelings sorted out. Tynes just called me. He said he killed my— Hussein. Hamid played back the call. Anyway, I need to talk to the slug. Can he protect me? Is Middle America really in for it if I refuse the Tynes thing? For once, Larry didn't give his you-figure-it shrug. It's a mess, he said. And Sluggo's waffling. He's around here somewhere. Just a sec. More peaceful cloud soaring. Damn, damn, damn. Something bumped gently into the small of his back. The blab. The black and white neck came around his side. The dark eyes looked up at him. What's up? She said quietly. Hamid felt like laughing and crying. She was very subdued, but at least she recognized him now. Are you okay, baby? He said. The blabber curled up around him, her head stretched out on his knee. On the data set, the clouds parted, and they were looking at both Larry Fujiyama and the slug. Of course, they were not in the same room. That would have been fatal to both. The Lothalrimar barge was a giant pressure vessel. Inside, pressure and atmosphere were just comfy for the slug, about a thousand bars of ammonia and hydrogen. There was a terrarium for human visitors. The current view showed the slug in the foreground. Part of the wall behind him was transparent, a window into the terrarium. Larry gave a little wave, and Hamid felt himself smiling. No question who was in a zoo. Ah, Mr. Thompson, I'm glad you called. We have a very serious problem. The slug's English was perfect, and though the voice was artificial, he sounded like a perfectly normal Middle American male. Many problems would be solved if you could see your way clear to give... No. Hammond's voice was flat. Not while I'm alive, anyway. This is no business deal. You've heard the threats, and you saw what they did to my father. The slug had been his ultimate employer these last six months. Someone rarely spoken to, the object of awe. None of that mattered now. You've always said the first responsibility of the tour director is to see that no party is abused by another. I'm asking you to live up to that. Um, technically, I was referring to you Middle Americans and the tourists in my caravan. I know I have the power to make good on my promises with them. But we're just beginning to learn about Ravna and Tynes. I'm not sure it's reasonable to stand up against them. He swiveled his thousand-kilo bulk toward the terrarium window. Hamid knew that under Lothalrimar gravity, the slug would have been squashed into the shape of a flatworm, with his manipulator fringe touching the ground. At one G, he looked more like an overstuffed silk pillow, fringed with red tassels. 
Larry has told me about Skandra's remarkable slow zone device. I've heard of such things. They are very difficult to obtain. A single one would have more than financed my caravan. And to think that Skander pleaded his foundation's poverty in begging passage. Anyway, Larry has been using the Ansible to ask about what your blabber really is. Larry nodded. Been at it since you left, Hamid. The machine's down in my office, buzzing away. Like Skander says, it is aligned on the commercial outlet at Lotharumar. From there, I have access to the known net. <laughs> Skander left a sizable credit bond at Lotharumar. I hope he and Ortega aren't too upset by the phone bill I run up testing this gadget for them. I described the blab and put out a depth query. There are a million subnets all over the beyond, searching their databases for anything like the blab. I... His happy enthusiasm wavered. Sluggo thinks we've dug up a reference to the blabber's race. Yes, and it's frightening, Mr. Thompson. It was no surprise that none of the tourists had heard of a blabber. The only solid lead coming back to Larry had been from halfway around the galactic rim, a nook in the beyond that had only one occasional link with the rest of the known net. That far race had no direct knowledge of the blabbers, but they heard rumors. From a thousand light years below them, deep within the slow zone, there came stories of a race matching the blab's appearance. The race was highly intelligent and had quickly developed the relativistic transport that was the fastest thing inside the zone. They colonized a vast sphere, held an empire of ten thousand worlds, all without fiddle. And the Tynes, the name seemed to fit, had not held their empire through the power of brotherly love. Races had been exterminated, planets busted with relativistic kinetic energy bombs. The Tyne's technology had been about as advanced and deadly as could exist in the zone. Most of their volume was a tomb now. Their story whispered through centuries of slow flight toward the outside. Wait, wait! Prof. Fujiyama told me the Ansible's bandwidth is a tenth of a bit per second. You've had less than twelve hours to work this question. How can you possibly know all this? Larry looked a little embarrassed. A first, as far as Hamid could remember. We've been using the AI protocol I told you about. There's massive interpolation going on at both ends of our link to Lotharumar. I'll bet. Remember, Mr. Thompson... The data compression applies only to the first link in the chain. The known net lies in the beyond. Bandwidth and data integrity are very high across most of its links. The slug sounded very convinced. But Hamid had read a lot about the known net. The notion was almost as fascinating as fittle travel itself. There was no way a world could have a direct link with all others partly because of range limitations, mainly because of the number of planets involved. Similarly, there was no way a single phone company, or even 10,000 phone companies, could run the thing. Most likely, the information coming to them from around the galaxy had passed through five or ten intermediate hops. The intermediates, not to mention the race on the far rim, were likely non-human. Imagine asking a question in English of someone who also speaks Spanish, and that person asking the question in Spanish of someone who understands Spanish and passes the question on in German. This was a million times worse. Next to some of the creatures out there, the slug could pass for human. Hamid said as much. Furthermore, even if this is what the sender meant, it could still be a lie. Look at what local historians did to Richard III or Mohammed Rose. Lazy Larry smiled his polywog smile, and Hammett realized they must have been arguing about this already. Larry put in, There's also this, Sluggo, the nature of the identification. The Tynes must have something like hands. See any on Hammett's blabber? The slug's scarlet fringe rippled three quick cycles. Agitation? Dismissal? The text is still coming in. But I have a theory. You know, Larry, I've always been a great student of sex. 
I may be a he only by courtesy, but I think sex is fascinating. It's what makes the world go around for so many races. Hamid suddenly understood Gilly Weinberg's success. So, grant me my expertise. My guess is the Tynes exhibit extreme sexual dimorphism. The male's forepaws probably are hands. No doubt it's the males who are the killers. The females, like the blab, are by contrast friendly, mindless creatures. The blab's eyes rolled back to look at Hamid. Sure, sure, she murmured. The accident of timing was wonderful, seeming to say, who is this clown? The slug didn't notice. This may even explain the viciousness of the male. Think back to the conversation Mr. Thompson had. These creatures seem to regard their own females as property to exploit. Rather the ultimate in sexism. Hamid shivered. That did ring a bell. He couldn't forget the hunger in the Tynes' voice. Is this the long way to tell me you're not going to protect us? The slug was silent for almost fifteen seconds. Its scarlet fringe waved up and down the whole time. Finally, almost, I'm afraid. My caravan customers haven't heard this analysis, just the threats and the news broadcasts. Nevertheless, they are tourists, not explorers. They demand that I refuse to let you aboard. Some demand that we leave your planet immediately. How secure is this line, Larry? Fujiyama said, Underground fiber optics and an encrypted laser link. Take a chance, Sluggo. Very well. Mr. Thompson, here is what you can expect from me. I can stay over the city and probably defend against direct kidnapping. Unless I see a planet buster coming. I doubt very much they have that set up, but if they do, well, I don't think even you would want to keep your dignity at the price of a relativistic asteroid strike. I cannot come down to pick you up. That would be visible to all, a direct violation of my customers' wishes. On the other hand, there was another pause, and his scarlet fringe whipped about even faster than before. If you should appear, uh, up here, I would take you aboard my barge. Even if this were noticed, it would be a fait accompli. I could hold off my customers, and likely our worst fate would be a premature and unprofitable departure from Middle America. That's very generous. Unbelievably so. The slug was thought to be an honest fellow, but a very hard trader. Even Hammond had to admit that the claim on the slug's honor was tenuous here, yet he was risking a twenty-year mission for it. Of course, if we reach that extreme, I'll want a few years of your time once we reach the outside. My bet is that hard knowledge about your blabber might make up for the loss of everything else. A day ago, Hammond would have quibbled about contracts and assurances. Today, well, the alternative was Ravna and Tynes. With Larry as witness, they settled on two years' indenture and a pay scale. Now, all he and the blab had to do was figure out how to climb 5,000 meters straight up. There was one obvious way. It was Dave Larson's car, but Davy owed him. Hammond woke his neighbor, explained that the blab was sick and had to go into Marquette. Fifteen minutes later, Hammond and the blab were driving through Ann Arbor Town. It was a Saturday, and barely into morning twilight. He had the road to himself. He'd half expected the place to be swarming with cops and military. If Ravna and Tynes ever guessed how easy it was to intimidate Joe Ortega, if the feds knew exactly what was going on, they'd turn the blab over to Tynes in an instant. But apparently the government was simply confused, lying low, hoping it wouldn't be noticed till the big boys upstairs settled their arguments. The farm bombing wasn't in the headline list anymore. The feds were keeping things quiet, thereby confining the mindless panic to the highest circles of government. The blab rattled around the passenger side of the car, alternately leaning on the dash and sniffing in the bag of tricks that Hammett had brought. 
She was still subdued, but riding in a private auto was a novelty. Electronics gear was cheap, but consumer mechanicals were still at a premium. And without a large highway system, cars would never be the rage they had been on old Earth. Most freight transport was by rail. A lot of this could change because of the caravan. They brought 100,000 agrav plates, enough to revolutionize transport. Middle America would enter the age of the air car, and for the first time surpass the home world. So saith Joe Ortega. Past the university, there was a patch of open country. Beyond the headlights, Hamid caught glimpses of open fields, a glint of frost. Hamid looked up nervously every few seconds. Celine and Diane hung pale in the west. Scattered clouds floated among the tourist barges, vague grayness in the first light of morning. No intruders, but three of the barges were gone, presumably moved to orbit. The Lothal Ramar vessel floated just east of Marquette, over the warehouse quarter. It looked like the slug was keeping his part of the deal. Hammond drove into downtown Marquette. Sky signs floated brightly amid the 200-story towers, advertising dozens of products, some of which actually existed. Light from discos and shopping malls flooded the eight-lane streets. Of course, the place was deserted. It was Saturday morning. Much of the business section was like this, a reconstruction of the original Marquette as it had been on Earth in the middle 21st century. That Marquette had sat on the edge of an enormous lake called Superior. Through that century, as Superior became the splashdown point for heavy freight from space, Marquette had become one of the great port cities of Earth, the gateway to the solar system. The tourists said it was legend, ur mother to a thousand worlds. Hamid turned off the Broadway, down an underground ramp. The Marquette of today was for show. Perhaps one percent the area of the original, with less than one percent the population. But from the air, it looked good, the lights and bustle credible. For special events, the streets could be packed with a million people, everyone on the continent who could be spared from essential work. And the place wasn't really a fraud. The tourists knew this was a reconstruction. The point was, it was an authentic reconstruction, as could only be created by a people one step from the original source. That was the official line. And in fact, the people of Middle America had made enormous sacrifices over almost twenty years to have this ready in time for the caravan. The car rental was down a fifteen-story spiral, just above the train terminal. That was for real, though the next arrival was a half hour away. Hamid got out, smelling the cool mustiness of the stone cavern, hearing only the echoes of his own steps. Millions of tons of ceramic and stone stood between them and the sky. Even an outsider couldn't see through that, he hoped. One sleepy-eyed attendant watched him fill out the forms. Hamid stared at the display, sweating even in the cool. Would the guy in back notice? He almost laughed at the thought. His first sally into crime was the least of his worries. If Ravna and Tynes were plugged into the credit net, then in a sense they really could see down here, and the bogus number Larry had supplied was all that kept him invisible. They left in a Millennium Commander, the sort of car a tourist might use to bum around in olden times. Hamid drove north, through the underground, then east, and when finally they saw open sky again, they were driving south. Ahead was the warehouse district, and hanging above it, the slug's barge, its spheres and cupolas green against the brightening sky. So huge. It looked near, but Hamid knew it was a good five thousand meters up. A helicopter might be able to drop someone on its topside, or maybe land on one of the verandas, though it would be a tight fit under the overhang. But Hamid couldn't fly a chopper, and wasn't even sure how to rent one at this time of day. No, he and the Blab were going to try something a lot more straightforward, something he had done every couple of weeks since the tourists arrived. They were getting near the incoming lot, where feds and tourists held payments to date in escrow. Up ahead, there would be cameras spotted on the roofs. He tinted all but the driver's side window, and pushed down on the blab's shoulders with his free hand. Play hide for a few minutes. Okay. Three hundred meters more, and they were at the outer gate. 
He saw the usual three cops out front, and a fourth in an armored box to the side. If Ortega was feeling the heat, it could all end right here. They looked real nervous, but they spent most of their time scanning the sky. They knew something was up, but they thought it was out of their hands. They took a quick glance at the Millennium Commander and waved him through. The inner fence was almost as easy, though here he had to enter his guide ID. If Ravna and Tynes were watching the nets, Hammond and the Blab were running on borrowed time now. He pulled into the empty parking lot at the main warehouse, choosing a slot with just the right position relative to the guard box. Keep quiet a little while, Blab, he said. He hopped out and walked across the gravel yard. Maybe he should move faster, as if panicked? But no, the guard had already seen him. Okay, play it cool. He waved, kept walking. The glow of morning was already dimming the security lamps that covered the lot. No stars shared the sky with the clouds and the barges. It was kind of a joke that merchandise from the beyond was socked away here. The warehouse was big, maybe two hundred meters on a side, but an old place, sheet plastic and aging wood timbers. The armored door buzzed even before Hamid touched it. He pushed his way through. Hi, Phil. Luck. The other guards must be on rounds. Phil Lucas was a friendly sword, but not too bright, and not very familiar with the blab. Lucas sat in the middle of the guard cubby, and the armored partition that separated him from the visitor trap was raised. To the left was a second door that opened into the warehouse itself. Hi, Ham. The guard looked back at him nervously. Awful early to see you. Yeah, got a little problem. There's a tourist out in the commander. He waved through the armored window. He's drunk out of his mind. I need to get him upstairs and quietly. Phil licked his lips. Christ, everything happens at once. Look, I'm sorry, Ham. We've got orders from the top at Federal Security. Nothing comes down, nothing goes up. There's some kind of a ruckus going on amongst the outsiders. If they start shooting, we want it to be at each other, not us. That's the point. We think this fellow is part of the problem. If we can get him back, things should cool off. You should have a note on him. It's Antris Ben Ramped. Oh, him. Ben Ramped was the most obnoxious tourist of all. If he'd been an ordinary Middle American, he would have racked up a century of jail time in the last six months. Fortunately, he'd never killed anyone, so his antics were just barely ignorable. Lucas pecked at his data set. No, we don't have anything. Nuts. Everything stays jammed unless we can get this guy upstairs. Hamid paused judiciously, as if giving the matter serious thought. Look, I'm going back to the car. See if I can call somebody to confirm this. Lucas was dubious. Okay, but it's got to be from the top, Ham. Right. The door buzzed open, and Hamid was jogging back across the parking lot. Things really seemed on track. Thank God he'd always been friendly with the cops running security here. The security people regarded most of the guides as college-trained snots, and with some reason. But Hammett had had coffee with these guys more than once. He knew the system. He even knew the incoming phone number for security confirmations. Halfway across the lot, Hammett suddenly realized that he didn't have the shakes anymore. The scheme, the ad-libbing, it almost seemed normal. A skill he'd never guessed he had. Maybe that's what desperation does to a fellow. Somehow, this was almost fun. He pulled open the car door. Back, not yet. He pushed the eager Blab onto the passenger seat. Big game, Blab. He rummaged through his satchel, retrieved the two comm sets. One was an ordinary head and throat model. The other had been modified for the Blab. He fastened the mic under the collar of his windbreaker. The earphone shouldn't be needed, but it was small. He put it on, turned the volume down. Then he strapped the other comm set around the Blab's neck, turned off its mic, and clipped the receiver to her ear. The game, Blab. Imitation. Imitation. He patted the comm set on her shoulder. 
The blab was fairly bouncing around the commander's cab. For sure, 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 who, who? Joe Ortega, try it. We must all pull together. The words came back from the blab as fast as he spoke them, but changed into the voice of the middle American president. He rolled down the driver's side window. This worked best if there was eye contact. Besides, he might need her out of the car. Okay, stay here. I'll go get us the sucker. She rattled his instructions back in pompous tones. One last thing. He punched a number into the car phone and set its timer and no video option. Then he was out of the car, jogging back to the guard box. This sort of trick had worked often enough at school. Pray that it would work now. Pray that she wouldn't ad-lib. He turned off the throat mic as Lucas buzzed him back into the visitor trap. I got to the top. Someone, maybe even the chief of federal security, will call back on the red line. Phil's eyebrows went up. That would do it. Hamid's prestige had just taken a giant step up. Hamid made a show of impatient pacing about the visitor trap. He stopped at the outer door with his back to the guard. Now he really was impatient. Then the phone rang, and he heard Phil pick it up. Escrow One, Agent Lucas speaking, sir. From where he was standing, Hamid could see the blab. She was in the driver's seat looking curiously at the dash phone. Hamid turned on the throat mic and murmured, Lucas, this is Joseph Stanley Ortega. Almost simultaneously, Lucas, this is Joseph Stanley Ortega, came from the phone behind him. The words were weighted with all the importance Hamid could wish, and something else, a furtiveness not in the public speeches. That was probably because of Hamid's original delivery, but it didn't sound too bad. In any case, Phil Lucas was impressed. Sir! Agent Lucas, we have a problem. Hamid concentrated on his words and tried to ignore the Ortega echo. For him, that was the hardest part of the trick, especially when he had to speak more than a brief sentence. There could be nuclear fire unless the tourists cool off. I'm with the National Command Authorities in deep shelter. It's that serious. Maybe that would explain why there was no video. Phil's voice quavered. Yes, sir. He wasn't in deep shelter. Have you verified, click it, my ID? The click was in Hamid's earphone. He didn't hear it on the guard's set. A loose connection in the headpiece? Yes, sir. I mean, just one moment. Sounds of hurried keyboard tapping. There should be no problem with the voice print match, and Hamid needed things nailed tight to bring this off. Yes, sir. You're fine. I mean... Good. Now listen carefully. The guide, Thompson, has a tourist with him. We need that outsider returned quickly and quietly. Get the lift ready and keep everybody clear of these two. If Thompson fails, millions may die. Give him whatever he asks for. Out in the car, the blab was having a high old time. Her front talons were hooked awkwardly over the steering wheel. She twisted it back and forth, driving and talking at the same time. The apotheosis of life, to be taken for a person by real people. Yes, sir. Very well, let's, click it, click, get moving on this. And on that last click, the Ortega voice was gone. God damn cheap Jack Comset. Lucas was silent a moment, respectfully waiting for his president to continue. Then, Yes, sir. What must we do? Out in the Millennium Commander, the blab was the picture of consternation. She turned toward him, eyes wide. What do I say now? Hamid repeated the line as loud as he dared. No, Ortega. She can't hear anything I'm saying. He shut off his mic. Sir, are you still there? Line must be dead. Hamid said casually, and gave the blab a little wave to come running. Phone light says I still have a connection, Ham. Mr. President, can you hear me? You were saying what we must do. Mr. President? The blab didn't recognize his wave. 
too small. He tried again. She tapped a talon against her muzzle. Blab, don't ad lib. Well, uh, came Ortega's voice. Don't rush me. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. We must all pull together or else millions may die. Don't you think? I mean, it makes sense. Which it did not, and less so by the second. Lucas was making uh-huh sounds, trying to fit reason on the blabber. His tone was steadily more puzzled, even suspicious. No help for it. Hamid slammed his fist against the transbarmer and waved wildly to the blab. Come here! Ortega's voice died in mid-syllable. He turned to see Lucas staring at him, surprise and uneasiness on his face. Something's going on here, and I don't like it. Somewhere in his mind, Phil had figured out he was being taken, yet the rest of him was carried forward by the inertia of the everyday. He leaned over the counter to get Hamid's line of view on the lot. The original plan was completely screwed, yet strangely he felt no panic, no doubt. There were still options. Hamid smiled and jumped across the counter, driving the smaller men into the corner of wall and counter. Phil's hand reached wildly for the tab that would bring the partition down. Hamid just pushed him harder against the wall and grabbed the guard's pistol from its holster. He jammed the barrel into the other's middle. Quiet down, Phil. Son of a bitch! But the other stopped struggling. Hamid heard the blab slam into the outer door. Okay. Kick the outside release. The door buzzed. A moment later, the blab was in the visitor trap, bouncing around his legs. <laughs> that was good. That was really good. The crackle was Lazy Larry's, but the voice was still Ortega's. Now buzz the inner door. The other gave his head a tight shake. Hamid punched Lucas's gut with the point of the pistol. Now! For an instant, Phil seemed frozen. Then he kneed the control tab, and the inner door buzzed. Hamid pushed it ajar with his foot, then heaved Lucas away from the counter. The other bounced to his feet, his eyes staring at the muzzle of the pistol, his face very pale. Dead men don't raise alarms. The thought was clear on his face. Hamid hesitated, almost as shocked by his success as Lucas was. Don't worry, Phil. He shifted his aim and fired a burst over Lucas's shoulder, into the warehouse security processor. Fire and debris flashed back into the room, and now alarms sounded everywhere. He pushed through the door, the blab close behind. The armor clicked shut behind them. Odds were it would stay locked now that the security processor was down. Nobody in sight, but he heard shouting. Hammond ran down the aisle of upgoing goods. They kept the agrav lift at the back of the building, under the main ceiling hatch. Things were definitely not going to plan, but if the lift was there, he could still... There he is! Hamid dived down an aisle, jigged this way and that between pallets, and then began walking very quietly. He was in the downcoming section now, surrounded by the goods that had been delivered thus far by the caravan. These were the items that would lift Middle America beyond Old Earth's 21st century. Towering ten meters above his head were stacks of room-temperature fusion electrics, with them, and the means to produce more, Middle America could trash its methanol economy and fixed fusion plants. Two aisles over were the raw agrav units. These looked more like piles of fabric than anything high-tech. Yet the warehouse lifter was built around one, and with them Middle America would soon make air cars as easily as automobiles. Hamid knew there were cameras in the ceiling above the lights. Hopefully they were as dead as the security processor. Footsteps, one aisle over. Hamid eased into the dark between two pallets. Quiet. Quiet. The blab didn't feel like being quiet. She raced down the aisle ahead of him, raking the spaces between the pallets with a painfully loud imitation of his pistol. They'd see her in a second. He ran the other direction a few meters and fired a burst into the air. Jesus, how many did asshole Lucas let in? Someone very close replied, that's still low-power stuff. Much quieter. We'll show these guys some firepower. Hammond suddenly guessed there were only two of them, and with the guard box jammed, they might be trapped in here till the alarm brought guards from outside. He backed away from the voices, continued toward the rear of the warehouse. Boo! 
The blab was on the pallets above him, talking to someone on the ground. Explosive shells smashed into the fusion electrics around her. The sounds bounced back and forth through the warehouse. Whatever it was, it was a cannon compared to his pistol. No doubt it was totally unauthorized for indoors, but that did Hammond little good. He raced forward, heedless of the destruction. Get down, he screamed at the pallets. A bundle of shadow and light materialized in front of him and streaked down the aisle. A second roar of cannon fire, tearing through the space he had just been. But something else was happening now. Blue light shone from somewhere in the racks of fusion electrics, sending brightness and crisp shadows across the walls ahead. It felt as if someone had opened a furnace door behind him. He looked back. The blue was spreading. An arc welder light that promised burns yet unfelt. He looked quickly away, after images dancing on his eyes, after images of the pallet shelves sagging in the heat. The auto sprinklers kicked on, an instant rainstorm. But this was a fire that water would not quench, and might even fuel. The water exploded into steam, knocking Hamid to his knees. He bounced up sprinting, falling, sprinting again. The agrav lift should be around the next row of pallets. In the back of his mind, something was analyzing the disaster. That explosive cannon fire had started things, a runaway melt in the fusion electrics. They were supposedly safer than meth engines, but they could melt down. This sort of destruction in a middle American nuclear plant would have meant rad poisoning over a continent. But the tourists claimed their machines melted clean, shedding low-energy photons and an enormous flood of particles that normal matter scarcely responded to. Hammond felt an urge to hysterical laughter. Slow-zone astronomers light years away might notice this some day, a wiggle on their neutrinoscopes. One more datum for their flawed cosmologies. There was lightning in the rainstorm now, flashes between the pallets and across the aisle, into the raw agrav units. The cloth-like material jerked and rippled, individual units floating upwards, magic carpets released by a genie. Then giant hands clapped him, sound that was pain, and the rain was gone, replaced by a hot, wet wind that swept around and up. Morning light shone through the steamy mist. The explosion had blasted open the roof. A rainbow arced across the ruins. Hamid was crawling now. Sticky wet ran down his face, dripped redly on the floor. The pallets bearing the fusion electrics had collapsed. Fifteen meters away, molten plastic slurried atop flowing metal. He could see the agrav lift now, what was left of it. The lift sagged like an old candle in the flow of molten metal. So, no way up. He pulled himself back from the glare and leaned against the stacked agravs. They slid and vibrated behind him. The cloth was soft, yet it blocked the heat and some of the noise. The pinkish blue of a dawn sky shone through the last scraps of mist. The Lothal Ramar barge hung there, four spherical pressure vessels embedded in intricate ramps and crenellations. Jeez. Most of the warehouse roof was just gone. A huge tear showed through the far wall. There, the two guards. They were facing away from him, one half leaning on the other. Chasing him was very far from their minds at the moment. They were picking their way through the jumble, trying to get out of the warehouse. Unfortunately, a rivulet of silver metal crossed their path. One false step, and they'd be ankle-deep in stuff. But they were lucky, and in fifteen seconds passed from sight around the outside of the building. No doubt he could get out that way, too. But that wasn't why he was here. Hammond struggled to his feet and began shouting for the blab. The hissing, popping sounds were loud, but not like before. If she were conscious, she'd hear him. He wiped blood from his lips and limped along the row of agrav piles. Don't die, Blab, don't die. There was motion everywhere. The piles of agravs had come alive. The top ones simply lifted off, tumbled upwards, rolling and unrolling. The lower layers strained and jerked. Normal matter might not notice the flood of never-never particles from the meltdown. The agravs were clearly not normal. Auras flickered around the ones trapped at the bottom. But this was not the eye-sizzling burn of the fusion electrics. This was a soft thing, an awakening rather than an explosion. Hamid's eyes were caught on the rising. 
hundreds of them just floating off, gray and russet banners in the morning light. He leaned back. Straight up, the farthest ones were tiny specks against the blue. Maybe... Something banged into his legs, almost dumping him back on the floor. Wow, so loud. The blab had found him. Hamid knelt and grabbed her around the neck. She looked fine. A whole lot better than he did, anyway. Like most smaller animals, she could take a lot of bouncing around. He ran his hands down her shoulders. There were some nicks, a spattering of blood. And she looked subdued, not quite the hellion of before. Loud, loud, she kept saying. I know, Blab, but that's the worst. He looked back into the sky. At the rising agravs, at the Lothalrimar barge. It would be crazy to try but he heard sirens outside. He patted the blab, then stood and clambered up the nearest pile of agravs. The material, hundreds of separate units piled like blankets, gave beneath his boots like so much foam rubber. He slid back a ways after each step. He grabbed at the edges of the units above him and pulled himself near the top. He wanted to test one that was free to rise. Hamid grabbed the top layer, already rippling in an unsensed wind, he pulled out his pocket knife and slashed at the material. It parted smoothly, with the resistance of heavy felt. He ripped off a strip of the material, stuffed it in his pocket, then grabbed again at the top layer. The unit fluttered in his hands, a four-meter square straining for the sky. It slowly tipped him backwards. His feet left the pile. It was rising as fast as the unloaded ones. Wait for me! Wait! The blab jumped desperately at his boots. Two meters up, three meters. Hamid gulped and let go. He crashed to the concrete, lay stunned for a moment, imagining what would have happened if he'd dithered an instant longer. Still, he took the scrap of agra from his pocket, stared at it as it tugged on his fingers. There was a pattern in the reddish-gray fabric, intricate and recursive. The tourists said it was in a different class from the fusion electrics. The electrics involved advanced technology but were constructible within the slow zone. Agrav, on the other hand, the effect could be explained in theory, but its practical use depended on instant-by-instant instant restabilization at atomic levels. The tourists claimed there were billions of protein-sized processors in the fabric. This was an import, not just from the beyond, but from transhuman space. Till now, Hamid had been a skeptic. Flying was such a prosaic thing. But these things had no simple logic. They were more like living creatures or complex control systems. They seemed a lot like the smart matter Larry claimed was common in transhuman technology. Hamid cut the strip into two different sized pieces. The cut edges were smooth, quite unlike cuts in cloth or leather. He let the fragments go. They drifted slowly upwards like leaves on a breeze. But after a few seconds, the large one took the lead, falling higher and higher above the smaller. I could come down just by trimming the fabric. And he remembered how the carpet had drifted sideways in the direction of his grasp. The sirens were louder. He looked at the pile of agravs. Funny. A week ago, he had been worried about flying commercial air to Westland. You want games, Blab? This is the biggest yet. He climbed back up the pile. The top layer was just beginning to twitch. They had maybe thirty seconds, if it was like the others. He pulled the fabric around him, tying it under his arms. Blab, get your ass up here! She came, but not quite with the usual glee. Things had been rough this morning, or maybe she was just brighter than he was. He grabbed her and tied the other end of the agrav under her shoulders. As the agrav twitched toward flight, the cloth seemed to shrink. He could still cut the fabric, but the knots were tight. He grabbed the blab under her hindquarters and drew her up to his chest, just like Pop used to do when the blab was a pup. Only now she was big, her forelegs stuck long over his shoulders. The fabric came taut around his armpits. Now he was standing. Now his feet left the pile. He looked down at the melted pallets, the silver metal rivers that dug deep through the warehouse floor, 
The blab was making the sounds of a small boy crying. They were through the roof. Hamid shuddered as the morning chill turned his soaked clothing icy. The sun was at the horizon, its brilliance no help against the cold. Shadows grew long and crisp from the buildings. The guts of the warehouse lay open below them. From here it looked dark, but lightning still flickered. More reddish-gray squares floated up from the ruins. In the gravel lot fronting the warehouse, there were fire trucks and armored vehicles. Men ran back and forth from the guard box. A squad was moving around the side of the building. Two guys by the armored cars pointed at him, and others just stopped to stare. A boy and his not-dog, swinging beneath a wrong-way parachute. He'd seen enough feds and crooks to know they could shoot him down easily, any number of ways. One of the figures climbed into the armored car. If they were half as trigger-happy as the guards inside the warehouse... Half a minute passed. The scene below could fit between his feet now. The blab wasn't crying anymore, and he guessed the chill was no problem for her. The blab's neck and head extended over his shoulder. He could feel her looking back and forth. Wow, she said softly. Wow. Rockabye baby. They swung back and forth beneath the agrav. Back and forth. The swings were getting wider each time. In a sickening whirl, the sky and ground traded places. He was buried headfirst in agrav fabric. He struggled out of the mess. They weren't hanging below the agrav now. They were lying on top of it. This was crazy. How could it be stable with them on top? In a second, it would dump them back under. He held tight to the blab. But no more swinging. It was as if the hanging down position had been the unstable one. More evidence that the agrav was smart matter, its processors using underlying nature to produce seemingly unnatural results. The damn thing really was a flying carpet. Of course, with all the knots, the four-meter square of fabric was twisted and crumpled. It looked more like the blab's nest of blankets back home than the flying carpets of fantasy. The warehouse district was out of sight beneath the carpet. In the spaces around and above them, dozens of agraves paced him, some just a few meters away, some bare specks in the sky. Westward, they were coming even with the tops of the Marquette Towers, brown and ivory walls, vast mirrors of windows reflecting back the landscape of morning. Southward, Ann Arbor was a tiny crisscross of streets, almost lost in the bristle of leafless trees. The quad was clearly visible, the interior walks, the tiny speck of red that was Morale Hall. He'd had roughly this view every time they flew back from the farm, but now it was nothing around him. It was just Hammond and the blab, and the air stretching away forever beneath them. Hammond gulped and didn't look down for a while. They were still rising. The breeze came straight down upon them, and it seemed to be getting stronger. Hamid shivered uncontrollably, teeth chattering. How high up were they? Three thousand meters? Four? He was going numb, and when he moved, he could hear ice crackling in his jacket. He felt dizzy and nauseated. Five thousand meters was about the highest you'd want to go without oxygen on Middle America. He thought he could stop the rise. If not... They were headed for space, along with the rest of the agravs. But he had to do more than slow the rise or descend. He looked up at the Lothal Ramar's barge. It was much nearer, and two hundred meters to the east. If he couldn't move this thing sideways, he'd need the slug's active cooperation. It was something he had thought about, for maybe all of five seconds, back in the warehouse. If the agrav had been an ordinary, lighter-than-air craft, there'd be no hope. Without props or jets, a balloon goes where the wind says. The only control comes from finding the altitude where the wind and you want the same thing. But when he grabbed that first carpet, it really had slid horizontally toward the side he was holding. He crept toward the edge. The agrav yielded beneath his knees, but didn't tilt more than a small boat would. Next to him, the blab looked over the edge, straight down. 
Her head jerked this way and that as she scanned the landscape. Wow, she kept saying. Could she really understand what she was seeing? The wind shifted a little. It came a bit from the side now, not straight from above. He really did have control. Hamid smiled around chattering teeth. The carpet rose faster and faster. The downward wind was an arctic blast. They must be going up at fifteen or twenty clicks per hour. The Lothalramar barge loomed huge above them, now almost beside them. God, they were above it now! Hamid pulled out his knife, picked desperately at the blade opener with numbed fingers. It came open abruptly and almost popped out of his shaking hand. He trimmed small pieces from the edge of the carpet. The wind from heaven stayed just as strong. Bigger pieces. He tore wildly at the cloth. One large strip. Two. And the wind eased. Stopped. Hamid bent over the edge of the carpet and stuffed his vertigo back down his throat. Perfect. They were directly over the barge and closing. The nearest of the four pressure spheres was so close it blocked his view of the others. Hamid could see the human habitat, the conference area. They would touch down on a broad, flat area next to the sphere. The aiming couldn't have been better. Hamid guessed the slug must be maneuvering, too, moving the barge precisely under his visitor. There was a flash of heat, and an invisible fist slammed into the carpet. Hamid and the blab tumbled, now beneath the agrav, now above. He had a glimpse of the barge. A jet of yellow-white spewed from the sphere, ammonia and hydrogen at one thousand atmospheres. The top pressure sphere had been breached. The spear of super-pressured gas was surrounded by pale flame where the hydrogen and atmospheric oxygen burned. The barge fell out of view, leaving thunder and burning mists. Hamid held on to the blab and as much of the carpet as he could wrap around them. The tumbling stopped. They were upside down in the heavy swaddling. Hamid looked out. Overhead was the brown and gray of farmland in late autumn. Marquette was to his left. He bent around, peeked into the sky. There! The barge was several clicks away. The top pressure vessel was spreading fire and mist, but the lower ones looked okay. Pale violet flickered from between the spheres. Moments later, thunder echoed across the sky. The slug was fighting back. He twisted in the jumble of cloth, trying to see the high sky. To the north, a single blue glowing trail lanced southwards, split into five separate jigging paths that cooled through orange to red. It was beautiful, but somehow like a jagged claw sketched against the sky. The claw tips dimmed to nothing, but whatever caused them still raced forward. The attacker's answering fire slagged the north-facing detail of the barge. It crumpled like trash plastic in a fire. The bottom pressure vessel still looked okay, but if the visitor's deck got zapped like that, Larry would be a dead man. Multiple sonic booms rocked the carpet. Things swept past, too small and fast to clearly see. The barge's gun still flickered violet, but the craft was rising now, faster than he had ever seen it move. After a moment, the carpet drifted through one more tumble, and they sat heads up. The morning had been transformed. Strange clouds were banked around and above him, some burning, some glowing, all netted with the brownish of nitrogen oxides. The stench of ammonia burned his eyes and mouth. The blab was making noises through her mouth, true coughing and choking sounds. The tourists were long gone. The Lothal Ramar was a dot at the top of the sky. All the other agravs had passed by. He and the blab were alone in the burning clouds. Probably not for long. Hamid began sawing at the agrav fabric, tearing off a slice, testing for an upwelling breeze, then tearing off another. They drifted through the cloud deck into a light drizzle, a strange rain that burned the skin as it wet them. He slid the carpet sideways into the sunlight, and they could breathe again. Things looked almost normal except where the clouds cast a great bloody shadow across the farmland. Where best to land? Hamid looked over the edge of the carpet and saw the enemy waiting. It was a cylinder, tapered, with a pair of small fins at one end. It drifted through the carpet shadow, and he realized the enemy craft was close. 
It couldn't be more than ten meters long, less than two meters across at the widest. It hung silent, pacing the carpet's slow descent. Hamid looked up and saw the others, four more dark shapes. They circled in like killer fish nosing at a possible lunch. One slid right over them, so slow and near he could have run his palm down its length. There were no ports, no breaks in the dull finish. But the fins, red glowed dim from within them, and Hamid felt a wave of heat as they passed. The silent parade went on for a minute, each killer getting its look. The blab's head followed the craft around and around. Her eyes were wide, and she was making the terrified whistling noises of the night before. The air was still, but for the faint updraft of the carpet's descent. Or was it? The sound grew. A hissing sound, like Tynes had made during his phone call. Only now it came from all the killers, and there were overtones lurking at the edge of sensibility, tones that never could have come from an ordinary telephone. Blab. He reached to stroke her neck. She slashed at his hand, her needled teeth slicing deep. Hammond gasped in pain and rolled back from her. The blab's pelt was puffed out as far as he had ever seen it. She looked twice normal size, a very large carnivore with death glittering in her eyes. Her long neck snapped this way and that, trying to track all the killers at once. Fore and rear talons dragged long rips through the carpet. She climbed onto the thickest folds of the carpet and shrieked at the killers and collapsed. For a moment, Hamid couldn't move. His hand, the scream, razors across his hand, ice picks jammed in his ears. He struggled to his knees and crawled to the blabber. Blab? No answer, no motion. He touched her flank, limp as something fresh dead. In twenty years, Hamid Thompson had never had close friends, but he had never been alone either. Until now. He looked up from the blabber's body at the circling shapes. Alone at four thousand meters. He didn't have much choice when one of the killer fish came directly at him, when something wide and dark opened from its belly. The darkness swept around them, swallowing all. Hamid had never been in space before. Under other circumstances, he would have reveled in the experience. The glimpse he'd had of Middle America from low orbit was like a beautiful dream. But now, all he could see through the floor of his cage was a bluish dot, nearly lost in the sun's glare. He pushed hard against the clear softness and rolled onto his back. It was harder than a one-handed push-up to do that. He guessed the mothership was doing four or five Gs, and had been for hours. When they had pulled him off the attack craft, Hamid had been semi-conscious. He had no idea what acceleration that shark boat reached, but it was more than he could take. He remembered that glimpse of middle America, blue and serene. Then they'd taken the blab, or her body, away. Who? There had been a human, the Ravna woman. She had done something to his hand. It wasn't bleeding any more. And, and there had been the blabber up and walking around. No, the pelt pattern had been all wrong. That must have been Tynes. There had been the hissing voice and some kind of argument with Ravna. Hamid stared up at the sunlight on the ceiling and walls. His own shadow lay spread-eagled on the ceiling. In the first hazy hours, he had thought it was another prisoner. The walls were gray, seamless, but with scrape marks and stains, as though heavy equipment was used here. He thought there was a door in the ceiling, but he couldn't remember for sure. There was no sign of one now. The room was an empty cubicle, featureless, its floor showing clear to the stars. Surely not an ordinary brig. There were no toilet facilities, and at five G's they wouldn't have helped. The air was thick with the stench of himself. Hamid guessed the room was an airlock. The transparent floor might be nothing more than a figment of some field generator's imagination. A flick of a switch and Hamid would be swept away forever. 
the blabber gone, Pop gone, maybe Larry and the slug gone. Hammond raised his good hand a few centimeters and clenched his fist. Lying here was the first time he'd ever thought about killing anyone. He thought about it a lot now. It kept the fear tied down. Mr. Thompson, Ravna's voice. Hammond suppressed a twitch of surprise. After hours of rage, to hear the enemy. Mr. Thompson, we are going to free fall in fifteen seconds. Do not be alarmed. So, airline courtesy of a sudden. The force that had squished him flat these hours, that had made it an exercise even to breathe, slowly lessened. From beyond the walls and ceiling he heard small popping noises. For a panicky instant it seemed as though the floor had disappeared and he was falling through. He twisted. His hand hit the barrier, and he floated slowly across the room, toward the wall that had been the ceiling. A door had opened. He drifted through, into a hall that would have looked normal except for the intricate pattern of grooves and ledges that covered the walls. Thirty meters down the hall is a latrine, came Ravna's voice. There are clean clothes that should fit you. When you are done, when you are done, we will talk. Damn right. Hamid squared his shoulders and pulled himself down the hall. She didn't look like a killer. There was anger, tension, on her face, the face of someone who has been awake a long time and has fought hard and doesn't expect to win. Hamid drifted slowly into the conference room, bridge, trying to size everything up at once. It was a large room with a low ceiling. Moving across it was easy in zero-g, slow bounces from floor to ceiling and back. The wall curved around, transparent along most of its circumference. There were stars and night dark beyond. Ravna had been standing in a splash of light. Now she moved back a meter, into the general dimness. Somehow she slipped her foot into the floor, anchoring herself. She waved him to the other side of a table. They stood in the half-crouch of zero-g, less than two meters apart. Even so, she looked taller than he had guessed from the phone call. Her mass might be close to his. The rest of her was as he remembered, though she looked very tired. Her gaze flickered across him and away. Hello, Mr. Thompson. The floor will hold your foot if you tap it gently. Hamid didn't take the advice. He held onto the table edge and jammed his feet against the floor. He would have something to brace against if the time came to move quickly. Where is my blabber? His voice came out hoarse, more desperate than demanding. Your pet is dead. There was a tiny hesitation before the last word. She was as bad a liar as ever. Hamid pushed back the rage. If the blab was alive... There was something still possible beyond revenge. Oh, he kept his face blank. However, we intend to return you safely to home. She gestured at the starfields around them. The 6G boost was to avoid unnecessary fighting with the Lothromar being. We will coast outwards some further, perhaps even go into Ram Drive. But Mr. Tynes will take you back to Middle America in one of our attack boats. There will be no problem to land you without attracting notice. Perhaps on the western continent, somewhere out of the way. Her tone was distant. He noticed that she never looked directly at him for more than an instant. Now she was staring just to one side of his face. He remembered the phone call, how she seemed to ignore his video. Up close, she was just as attractive as before, more. Just once, he would like to see her smile. And somewhere there was unease that he could be so attracted by a murderous stranger. If only, if only I could understand why. Why did you kill the blab? Why did you kill my father? Ravna's eyes narrowed. That cheating piece of filth? 
He is too tricky to kill. He was gone when we visited his farm. I'm not sure I have killed anyone on this operation. The Lothal Ramar is still functioning. I know that. She sighed. We were all very lucky. You have no idea what Tynes has been like these last days. He called you last night. Hamid nodded numbly. Well, he was mellow then. He tried to kill me when I took over the ship. Another day like this, and he would have been dead. And most likely your planet would have been so, too. Hamid remembered the Lothal Ramar's theory about the Tynes' need. And now that the creature had the blab. So now Tynes is satisfied? Ravna nodded vaguely, missing the quaver in his voice. He's harmless now, and very confused, poor guy. Assimilation is hard. It will be a few weeks, but he'll stabilize. Probably turn out better than he ever was. Whatever that means... She pushed back from the table, stopped herself with a hand on the low ceiling. Apparently their meeting was over. Don't worry. He should be well enough to take you home quite soon. Now I will show you your... Don't rush him, Rav. Why should he want to go back to Middle America? The voice was a pleasant tenor, human-sounding but a little slurred. Ravna bounced off the ceiling. I thought you were going to stay out of this... Of course the boy is going back to Middle America. That's his home. That's where he fits. I wonder. The unseen speaker laughed. He sounded cheerfully, joyfully drunk. Your name is shit down there, Hamid. Did you know that? Huh? Yep. You slagged the caravan's entire shipment of fusion electrics. Of course, you had a little help from the federal police, but that fact is being ignored. Much worse, you destroyed most of the Agrav units. Whee! Up, up, and away. And there's no way those can be replaced short of a trip back to the outside. Shut up! Ravna's anger rode over the good cheer. The Agrav units were a cheap trick. Nothing that subtle can work in the zone for long. Five years from now, they would all have faded. Sure, sure. I know that, and you know that, but both Middle America and the tourists figure you've trashed this caravan, Hamid. You'd be a fool to go back. Ravna shouted something in a language Hamid had never heard. English, Rav, English. I want him to understand what is happening. He is going back! Ravna's voice was furious, almost desperate. We agreed! I know, Rav. A little of the rampant joy left the voice. It sounded truly sympathetic. And I'm sorry. But I was different then, and I understand things better now. Hey, I'll be down in a minute, okay? She closed her eyes. It's hard to slump in freefall, but Ravna came close, her shoulders and arms relaxing, her body drifting slowly up from the floor. Oh, Lord she said softly. Out in the hall, someone was whistling a tune that had been popular in Marquette six months ago. A shadow floated down the walls, followed by... The blab? Hamid lurched off the table, flailed wildly for a handhold. He steadied himself, got a closer look. No, not the blab. It was of the same race, certainly, but this one had an entirely different pattern of black and white. The great patch of black around one eye and white around the other would have been laughable, if you didn't know what you were looking at. At last, to see Mr. Tynes. Man and alien regarded each other for a long moment. It was a little smaller than the blab. It wore a checkered orange scarf about its neck. Its paws looked no more flexible than his blabs, but he didn't doubt the intelligence that looked back from its eyes. The tines drifted to the ceiling and anchored itself with a deft swipe of paw and talons. There were faint sounds in the air now, squeaks and twitters almost beyond hearing. If he listened close enough, Hamid guessed he would hear the hissing too. 
The Tynes looked at him and laughed pleasantly, the tenor voice of a minute before. Don't rush me. I'm not all here yet. Hammond looked at the doorway. There were two more there, one with a jeweled collar. The leader? They glided through the air and tied down next to the first. Hamid saw more shadows floating down the hall. How many? he asked. I'm six now. He thought it was a different Tynes that answered, but the voice was the same. The three floated in the doorway. One wore no scarf or jewelry and looked very familiar. Blab! Hamid pushed off the table. He went into a spin that missed the door by several meters. The blabber, it must be her, twisted around and fled the room. Stay away! For an instant, the Tynes' voice changed, held the same edge as the night before. Hamid stood on the wall next to the doorway and looked down the hall. The blab was there, sitting on the closed door at the far end. Hamid's orientation flipped. The hall could just as well be a deep, bright-lit well with the blab trapped at the bottom of it. Blab? he said softly, aware of the tines behind him. She looked up at him. I can't play the old games anymore, Hamid, she said in her softest femme voice. He stared for a moment, uncomprehending. Over the years, the blab said plenty of things that, by accident or in the listener's imagination, might seem humanly intelligent. Here, for the first time, he knew that he was hearing sense, and he guessed what Ravna meant when she said the blab was dead. Hamid backed away from the edge of the pit. He looked at the other tines, remembered that their speech came as easily from one as the other. You're like a hive of roaches, aren't you? A little, the tenor voice came from somewhere among them. But telepathic, Hamid said. The one who had been his friend answered, but in the tenor voice. Yes, between myselves, but it's no sixth sense. You've known about it all your life. I like to talk a lot, blabber. The squeaking and the hissing. Just the edge of all they were saying to each other across their two hundred kilohertz bandwidth. I'm sorry I flinched. My selves are still confused. I don't know quite who I am. The blab pushed off and drifted back into the bridge. She grabbed a piece of ceiling as she came even with Hamid. She extended her head toward him, tentatively, as though he were a stranger. I feel the same way about you, thought Hamid. But he reached out to brush her neck with his fingers. She twitched back, glided across the room to nestle among the other tines. Hamid stared at them, staring back. He had a sudden image, a pack of long-necked rats beadily analyzing their prey. So, who is the real Mr. Tynes? The monster who'd smash a world, or the nice guy I'm hearing now? Ravna answered, her voice tired, distant. The monster Tynes is gone, or going. Don't you see? The pack was unbalanced. It was dying. There were five in my pack, Hamid. Not a bad number. Some of the brightest packs are that small. But I was down from seven. Two of myself had been killed. The ones remaining were mismatched, and only one of them was female. Tynes paused. I know humans can go for years without contact with the opposite sex and suffer only mild discomfort. Tell me about it. But tines are very different. If a pack's sex ratio gets too lopsided, especially if there is a mismatch of skills, then the mind disintegrates. Things can get very nasty in the process. Hamid noticed that all the time it talked, the two tines next to the one with the orange scarf had been nibbling at the scarf's knots. They moved quickly, perfectly coordinated, untying and retying the knots. Tynes doesn't need hands. Or put another way, he already had six. Hamid was seeing the equivalent of a human playing nervously with his tie. 
Ravna lied when she said the blab is dead. I forgive her. She wants you off our ship, with no more questions, no more hassle. But the blabber isn't dead. She was rescued from being an animal the rest of her life. And her rescue saved the pack. I feel so happy. Better even than when I was seven. I can understand things that have been puzzles for years. Your blab is far more language-oriented than any of my other selves. I could never talk like this without her. Ravna had drifted toward the pack. Now she had her feet planted on the floor beneath them. Her head brushed the shoulder of one, was even with the eyes of another. Imagine the blabber as like the verbal hemisphere of a human brain, she said to Hamid. Not quite, Tyne said. A human hemisphere can almost carry on by itself. The blab by itself could never be a person. Hamid remembered how the blab's greatest desire had often seemed just to be a real person. And listening to this creature, he heard echoes of the blab. It would be easy to accept what they were saying, yet if you turned the words just a little, you had enslavement and rape, the slugs theory with frosting. Hamid turned away from all the eyes and looked across the star clouds. How much should I believe? How much should I seem to believe? One of the tourists wanted to sell us a gadget, an FTL radio. Did you know that we used it to ask about the Tynes? Do you know what we found? He told them about the horrors Larry had found around the galactic rim. Ravna exchanged a glance with the Tynes by her head. For a moment, the only sound was the twittering and hissing. Then Tynes spoke. Imagine the most ghastly villains of Earth's history. Whatever they are, whatever holocausts they set, I assure you much worse has happened elsewhere. Now imagine that this regime was so vast, so effectively evil, that no honest historian survived. What stories do you suppose would be spread about the races they exterminated? Okay, so... Tynes are not monsters. On average, we are no more bloodthirsty than you humans. But we are descended from packs of wolf-like creatures. We are deadly warriors. Given reasonable equipment and numbers, we can outfight most anything in the slow zone. Ahmed remembered the shark pack of attack boats. With one animal in each and radio communication, no team of human pilots could match their coordination. We once were a great power in our part of the slow zone. We had enemies, even when there was no war. Would you trust creatures who live indefinitely, but whose personalities may drift from friendly to indifferent, even to inimical, as their components die and are replaced? And you're such a peach of a guy because you've got the blab? Yes, though you liked... I know you would have liked me when I was seven. But the blab has a lovely outlook. She makes it fun to be alive. Hamad looked at Ravna and the pack who surrounded her. So the Tynes had been great fighters. That he believed. So they were now virtually extinct, having run into something even deadlier. That he could believe, too. Beyond that, he'd be a fool to believe anything. He could imagine Tynes as a friend. He wanted Ravna as one. But all the talk, all the seeming argument, it could just as well be manipulation. One thing was sure. If he returned to Middle America, he would never know the truth. He might live the rest of his life safe and cozy, but he wouldn't have the blab and he would never know what had really happened to her. He gave Ravna a lopsided smile. Back to square one, then. I want passage to the beyond with you. Out of the question. I... I made that clear from the beginning. Hamid pushed nearer, stopped a meter in front of her. Why won't you look at me? He said softly. Why do you hate me so much? 
For a full second, her eyes looked straight into his. I don't hate you. Her face clouded, as if she were about to weep. It's just that you're such a goddamned disappointment. She pushed back abruptly, knocking the tines out of her way. He followed her slowly back to the conference table. She stood there, talking to herself in some unknown language. She's swearing to her ancestors, murmured at times, that drifted close by Hamid's head. Her kind is big on that sort of thing. Hamid anchored himself across from her. He looked at her face. Young, no older than twenty, it looked. But outsiders had some control over aging. Besides, Ravna had spent at least the last ten years in relativistic flight. You hired my... You hired Hussein Thompson to adopt me, didn't you? She nodded. Why? She looked back at him for a moment, this time not flinching away. Finally, she sighed. Okay. I will try, but... There are many things you from the slow zone do not understand. Middle America is close to the beyond but you see out through a tiny hole. You can have even less concept of what lies beyond the beyond, in the transhuman reaches. She was beginning to sound like Lazy Larry. I'm willing to start with the version for five-year-olds. Okay. The faintest of smiles crossed her face. It was everything he'd guessed it would be. He wondered how he could make her do it again. Once upon a time, the smile again, a little wider, there was a very wise and good man, as wise and good as any mere human or human equivalent can ever be, a mathematical genius, a great general, an even greater peacemaker. He lived five hundred years subjective, and half that time he was fighting a very great evil. The Tynes put in, just a part of that evil chewed up my race for breakfast. Ravna nodded. Eventually it chewed up our hero, too. He's been dead almost a century, objective. The enemy has been very alert to keep him dead. Tynes and I may be the last people trying to bring him back. How much do you know about cloning, Mr. Thompson? Hammond couldn't answer for a moment. It was too clear where all this was going. The tourists claim they can build a viable zygote from almost any body cell. They say it's easy, but that what you get is no more than an identical twin of the original. That is about right. In fact, the clone is often much less than an identical twin. The uterine environment determines much of an individual's adult characteristics, Consider mathematical ability. There is a genetic component, but part of mathematical genius comes from the fetus getting just the right testosterone overdose. A little too much, and you have a dummy. Tynes and I have been running for a long time. Fifty years ago we reached Lothal Ramar, the back end of nowhere, if there ever was one. We had a clonable cell from the great man. We did our best with the humaniform medical equipment that was available. The newborn looked healthy enough. Russell, hiss. But why not just raise the child yourself, Hamid said. Why hire someone to take him into the slow zone? Ravna bit her lip and looked away. It was Tynes who replied. Two reasons. The enemy wants you permanently dead. Raising you in the slow zone was the best way to keep you out of sight. The other reason is more subtle. We don't have records of your original memories. We can't make a perfect copy. But if we could give you an upbringing that mimicked the originals, then we'd have someone with the same outlook. Like having the original back with a bad case of amnesia. Tynes chuckled. Right. 
and things went very well at first. It was great good luck to run into Hussein Thompson at Lotharimar. He seemed a bright fellow, willing to work for his money. He brought the newborn in suspended animation back to Middle America and married a woman equally bright to be your mother. We had everything figured. The original's background imitated better than we had ever hoped. I even gave up one of myselves, a newborn, to be with you. I guess I know most of the rest, said Hamid. Everything went fine for the first eight years, the happy years of loving family, till it became clear that I wasn't a math genius. Then your hired hand didn't know what to do, and your plan fell apart. It didn't have to! Ravna slapped the table. The motion pulled her body up, almost free of the foot anchors. The math ability was a big part, but there was still a chance. If Thompson hadn't welched on us. She glared at Hamid, and then at the pack. The original's parents died when he was ten years old. Hussein and his woman were supposed to disappear when the clone was ten in a faked air crash. That was the agreement. Instead, she swallowed. We talked to him. He wouldn't meet in person. He was full of excuses, the clever bastard. I didn't see what good it would do to hurt the boy any more, he said. He's no Superman, just a good kid. I wanted him to be happy. She choked on her own indignation. Happy? If he knew what we have been through, what the stakes are. Hamid's face felt numb, frozen. He wondered what it would be like to throw up in zero-G. What? What about my mother? He said in a very small voice. Ravna gave her head a quick shake. She tried to persuade Thompson. When that didn't work, she left you. By then it was too late. Besides, that sort of abandonment is not the trauma the original experienced. But she did her part of the bargain. We paid her most of what we promised. We came to Middle America expecting to find someone very wonderful living again. Instead, we found a piece of trash. He couldn't get any anger into the question. She gave a shaky sigh. No, I don't really think that. Hussein Thompson probably did raise a good person and that's more than most can claim. But if you were the one we had hoped, you would be known all over Middle America by now, the greatest inventor, the greatest mover since the colony began. And that would be just the beginning. She seemed to be looking through him, remembering. Tynes made a diffident throat-clearing sound. Not a piece of trash at all, and not just a good kid, either. A part of me lived with Hamid for twenty years. The blabber's memories are about as clear as a Tyne's fragments can be. Hamid is not just a failed dream to me, Rav. He's different. But I like to be around him almost as much as the other one. And when the crunch came, well, I saw him fight back. Given his background, even the original couldn't have done better. Hitching a ride on a raw agrav was the sort of daring that— Okay, Tiny, the boy is daring and quick. But there's a difference between suicidal foolishness and calculated risk-taking. This late in life, there's no way he'll become more than a good man. Sarcasm lilted in the words. We could do worse, Rav. We must do far better, and you know it. See here. It's two years subjective to get out of the zone, and our suspension gear is failed. I will not accept seeing his face every day for two years. He goes back to Middle America. She kicked off, drifted toward the tines that hung over Hamid. I think not, said Tynes. If he doesn't want to go, I won't fly him back. Anger and, strangely, panic played on Ravna's face. 
This isn't how you were talking last week. <laughs> Lazy Larry's cackle. I've changed. Haven't you noticed? She grabbed a piece of ceiling and looked down at Hamid, calculating. Boy, I don't think you understand. We're in a hurry. We won't be stopping any place like Lotharamar. There is one last way we might bring the original back to life, perhaps even with his own memories. You'll end up in transhuman space if you come with us. The chances are that none of us will serve. She stopped, and a slow smile spread across her face. Not a friendly smile. Have you not thought what use your body might still be to us? You know nothing of what we plan. We may find ways of using you like a, like a blank data cartridge. Hamid looked back at her, hoping no doubts showed on his face. Maybe, but I'll have two years to prepare, won't I? They glared at each other for a long moment, the greatest eye contact yet. So be it, she said at last. She drifted a little closer. Some advice. We'll be two years cooped up here. It's a big ship. Stay out of my way. She drew back and pulled herself across the ceiling, faster and faster. She arrowed into the hallway beyond and out of sight. Hamid Thompson had his ticket to the outside. Some tickets cost more than others. How much would he pay for his? Eight hours later, the ship was under ram drive, outward bound. Hamid sat in the bridge alone. The windows on one side of the room showed the view aft. Middle America's sun cast daylight across the room. Invisible ahead of them, the interplanetary medium was being scooped in, fuel for the ram. The acceleration was barely perceptible, perhaps a fiftieth of a G. The ram drive was for the long haul. That acceleration would continue indefinitely, eventually rising to almost half a gravity and bringing them near light speed. Middle America was a fleck of blue, trailing a white dot and a yellow one. It would be many hours before his world and its moons were lost from sight, and many days before they were lost to telescopic view. Hamid had been here an hour, two, since shortly after Tynes showed him his quarters. The inside of his head felt like an abandoned battlefield. A monster had become his good buddy. The man he hated turned out to be the father he had wanted, and his mother now seemed an uncaring manipulator. And now I can never go back and ask you truly what you were, truly, if you loved me. He felt something wet on his face. One good thing about gravity, even a fiftieth of a G, it cleared the tears from your eyes. You must be very careful these next two years. There was much to learn, and even more to guess at. What was lie, and what was truth? There were things about the story that... How could one human being be as important as Ravna and Tynes claimed? Next to the transhumans, no human equivalent could count for much. It might well be that these two believed the story they told him, and that could be the most frightening possibility of all. They talked about the great man as though he were some sort of messiah. Hammond had read of similar things in Earth history, twentieth-century Nazis longing for Hitler, the fanatics of the Afghan Jihad scheming to bring back their imam. The story Larry got from the Ansible could be true, and the great man might have been accomplice to the murder of a thousand worlds. Hamid found himself laughing. Where does that put me? Could the clone of a monster rise above the original? What's funny, Hamid? Tynes had entered the bridge quietly. Now he settled himself on the table and posts around Hamid. The one that had been the blab sat just a meter away. Nothing, just thinking. They sat for several minutes in silence, watching the sky. There was a wavering there, like hot air over a stove, the tiniest evidence of the fields that formed the ram around them. 
he glanced at the Tynes. Four of them were looking out the windows. The other two looked back at him, their eyes as dark and soft as the blabs had ever been. Please don't think badly of Ravna, Tyne said. She had a real thing going with the almost you of before. They loved each other very much. I guessed. The two heads turned back to the sky. These next two years, he must watch this creature, try to decide. But suspicions aside, the more he saw of Tynes, the more he liked him. Hamid could almost imagine that he had not lost the blab, but gained five of her siblings. And the Big Mouth had finally become a real person. The companionable silence stretched on. After a moment, the one that had been the blab edged across the table and bumped her head against his shoulder. Hamid hesitated, then stroked her neck. They watched the sun and the fleck of blue a moment more. You know, said Tynes, but in the femme voice that was the blab's favorite, I will miss that place. And most of all, I will miss the cats and the dogs. Though it was written first, The Blabber is a sequel to both A Fire Upon the Deep and A Deepness in the Sky. In this future, the centuries after the twentieth are very interesting, but discouraging and mystifying to tech optimists such as myself. Computer power increases, but somehow never produces the sentient entities we expect. In the 21st century, the AI gurus of the 20th are seen as old fogies whose wild predictions never came true. Time passes. Humankind spreads through the solar system and then to the nearby stars. Some of our descendants never learn the truth. Others, whose slow boats and relativistic rockets take them galactic outward, eventually reach the beyond. Still others, on missions toward the galactic center, end in mindless destruction. Or maybe not. The most tragic situation of all might be a colony at the edge of the unthinking depths, where even the brightest humans are retarded. The beyond is an interesting place, almost like the wild interstellar playgrounds of 1930s science fiction, except that there are the transhuman reaches just a little further out, beckoning empires to remove themselves from human ken. Traders into those reaches would be very strange beings, when they come back at all. In particular, what about Hamid and the Blab? How did the Tynes race get zapped, and what about the great man who Hamid isn't? When I think of other writers' fictional universes, I imagine that they must be fully formed, and that stories simply explore an already existing place in the writer's mind. That's not the case with my writing. I do have ideas, but too many and not consistent. A Fire Upon the Deep was molded by the blabber, but now A Fire Upon the Deep constrains my work to expand the blabber into a full-length novel. Win a Nobel Prize In 1999 and 2000, there was a remarkable market for short, short science fiction stories. Nature, a weekly magazine which, depending on who is talking, is the first or second most prestigious research science journal in the world. Biological Sciences editor Henry G. persuaded science fiction authors from all over the world to write 900-word stories looking forward into the next millennium. For more than a year, Nature printed a new story almost every week. I think everyone, writers, readers, and editors, had great fun with the stories. I know I had fun with my contribution. Note. Nature has full-color interiors. I took advantage of this using blue ink to imply that certain words and phrases were clickable links. It was a trick that will look very old very soon, but for me it was a novel way to imply backstory. In this present black-and-white edition, I have used the tags less than sign, capital L, greater than sign, and less than sign, forward slash, capital L, greater than sign, to mark the beginning and ending, respectively, of things that are supposed to be web links. Win a Nobel Prize Wealth, chicks, the secrets of the universe, they can all be yours. Dear Johann, 
I was sorry to learn that you have been passed over for tenure. I hope you won't give the bums on your committee another chance to abuse you. This was going to be an ordinary letter. Then I realized that you probably don't remember, Link, me, and Link. We took the same section of Fong's comparative genomics class at Berkeley, but I quit the program and drifted into the arts. See my, Link, sensation triple X, and Link, performances. Now I work in human resources. It's a perfect fit for my technical and people skills. Johan, what I have to offer you is so extreme that I'm afraid your filters would trash my mail before you ever see it. That's why you are reading this as an advertisement in your personal copy of Nature. Hopefully this will show that we're serious. In fact, writing this ad has been a lark. Yes, it's over the top, but it's also the absolute truth. Working with us, you can win a Nobel Prize, and that is just the beginning. So in just a few words, I have to convince you to take the next step. I know you read outside your field, Johan. That's one reason why unimaginative drudges get tenure, and you don't. Have you been following the news about MRI with transfection? The enabling mechanism is an HIV transfection of the subject's glial cells. The inserted genetic material expresses proteins which can be signaled by a 10-gauss modulation of the MRI's gradient magnets. Synced with the RF pulses, they promote the production of selected neurotransmitters. If it's done right, the experimenter can trigger from an alphabet of about 20 neurotransmitters at a spatial resolution only twice as coarse as the MRI's imaging resolution. The neuroscience guys have fallen in love with this. And right behind them are the psych people. With whole brain MRI T scans, researchers could induce almost any psychopathology. In public, that possibility is just ominous speculation. In secret, at least three research labs already have whole brain MRI T. We have such systems ourselves, and though we haven't abused them, they are more scary than the editorials. One of the most horrifying mindsets is something we call specialist fugue state. When applied to a researcher, it creates an idiot savant without a life beyond short-range research goals. This is not what I'm selling you, Johan. But beware, several labs are recruiting specialists for just this nightmare. Maybe they're getting fully informed volunteers. More likely, they're getting duped victims. Either way, the public will soon be seeing all sorts of research productivity that is secretly based on this modern form of slavery. Don't you get trapped by such a scam. No, if you work for us, you'll be running a biotech show. Johan, you are brilliant and well-trained and, well, we've studied you pretty carefully. You can name your price. We have major financing from a small but wealthy nation-state. If you buy in, you'll have resources that rival the CDC. A 10 petaflops computer with a storage area network that mirrors the largest dynamic proteomic sites. All this, and the support staffs, will be fully dedicated to your personal use. So what's our secret? Well, we've improved the MRIT trigger mechanism to respond on millisecond timescales. We can induce direct brain I.O. with the look and feel of memory and thought. For 50 years, people have been predicting mind-machine symbiosis. Now we've actually done it, Johan. You'll want to talk to Wardner. He's our first success. A perfect fit for the technique, though his specialty is strategic planning. With our MRIT technique, Wardner is like a god. You know how your field is these days. More breakthroughs than ever before. But it's dull, dull. A modern cell mechanics lab is like an old-time genomics site, a quietly humming data factory. The same thing has happened in the non-biosciences. Some theoreticians think this is heaven, but take a look at the link... 2013-01-17 editorial, end link, in Nature. For every breakthrough, there are a thousand more hiding in the new data banks. You can change that, Johan. Your mind will interact directly with our world-class automation. You'll solve protein dynamics problems as easily as ordinary people plan a day at the beach. Your working conditions? They can be almost anything you want, except that you'll have to relocate. We've already built a large, link, villa, end link, for you at, link, our Riviera research site, end link. You'll have complete freedom of movement. 
The transfection is not reversible, but it's easy to safe the neuroactives when you are not actually connected. And of course, being connected doesn't involve any messy electrodes. You simply enter the study that we've built in your villa. It's quite spacious, considering it's inside a four Tesla MRI system. And we must be very careful about magnetic materials. Wardner can tell you the usual bozo stories about high-velocity jewelry. Well, that's my pitch, Johan. Obviously, our company must be very secretive at this stage. But please, come out and visit us. No obligation, except to sign a non-disclosure agreement. We ask that you don't tip off your colleagues about this short visit, but we want you to be absolutely comfortable about it. You have family, a cousin, I believe. Feel free to let her know where you are going. I hope you can come, Johan. Your friend. Signed, Helen. Helen Peerless, Director for Human Resources, Link, Mephisto Dynamics, and Link. The Barbarian Princess I believe there are writers who have never been comfortable with short fiction, even when they were beginners. I had the opposite problem. For the first five or ten years of my career, it was almost impossible for me to write novel-length stories. I think I benefited from this disability. Short fiction is a wonderful medium for speculative fiction. Even though science fiction short stories normally make less money per word than novels, the SF magazines are an ideal place for the new writer. Many magazines are wide open to unsolicited submissions. At the same time, most new writers collect a number of rejections before they can sell consistently. So each short story is a kind of small experiment. A writer can get lots of feedback quickly. Eventually, a short fiction writer can grow into writing book-length stories. In my case, this happened in especially easy steps. In 1968, Damon Knight published my novella, Grimm's Story, in his Orbit series. Around that time, Damon was also editing science fiction novels for Berkeley Books. He told me that if I felt like writing an extension of Grimm's Story, he could get me a book contract for the combination piece. The preceding exclamation mark reflects my feelings about this offer. Here I had never sold a novel, and now I was being solicited to write one. I thought that I had finally arrived. I wrote the extension, and in 1969, Berkeley Books published the expanded story as Grimm's World. Years passed. I learned that my first book sale had been unusually good luck. Selling my second novel was hard. But by the mid-1980s, I had success with several novels. Jim Bain offered to reprint Grimm's World, but with some new material. The result was Tatya Grimm's World, Bain Books, 1987, consisting of a new piece, The Barbarian Princess, and a revised version of Grimm's World. Returning to one of my earliest story settings was a lot of fun. I was surprised that I had new things to say, and now I had the ability to say those things well. I think The Barbarian Princess stands well by itself. It appeared separately in Analog in 1986 and made it onto the Hugo ballot. Fairhaven at South Cape was a squalid little town. Ramshackle warehouses lined the harbor, their wooden sides unpainted and rotting. Inland, the principal cultural attractions were a couple of brothels and the barracks of the Crown Garrison. Yet in one sense, Fairhaven lived up to its name. No matter how scruffy things were here, you knew they would be worse further east. This was the nether end of civilization on the south coast of the continent. Beyond South Cape lay 4,000 miles of wild coast, the haunt of literal pirates and barbarian tribes. Ray Gill would soon sail east, but the prospect did not bother him. In fact, he rather looked forward to it. For obvious reasons, there weren't many customers along the south coast run. The Tarul Barge would put in at two of the larger barbarian settlements, villages with a taste for some of Tarul's kinkier publications. There was also an author living in the coastal wilderness. His production was weird and erratic, but worth an extra stop. Except for these three landfalls, the barge would sail straight around the south coast, free of external problems. It would be thirty days before they reached the Austerlays. Thirty days... Sixty wake periods. Enough time for the translators to prepare the Austerlay and Sanart editions. 
enough time for Braley Towns to recondition the Tyrol printers. Ray surveyed his tiny office. Thirty days. That might even be enough for him to dispose of his current backlog. Manuscripts were stacked from floor to ceiling behind him. The piles on his desk blocked his view of Fairhaven Harbor, and more important, the breeze that seeped in from over the water. These were all the submissions taken aboard during their passage through the Chain Pearls and Crown S. There would be some first-class stories here, but most would end up as extra slush in Braley's papermaking vats. Thus, as Ray had once pointed out in an editorial, every submission to fantasy eventually became part of the magazine. Ray jammed the tiny windows open and arranged his chair so he could sit in the breeze. He was about halfway through the desk stack. The easy ones he could decide in a matter of seconds. Even for these, he made a brief note in the submission log. Two years from now, the Tarul Publishing Company would be back in the chain pearls. He couldn't return the manuscripts, but at least he could say something appropriate to the submitters. Other stories were harder to judge. Competent but flawed, or inappropriate outside the author's home islands, over the last few days, a small pile of high-priority items had accumulated beneath his desk. He would end up buying most of those. Some were treasures. Ivam Alek's planet yarns were based on the latest research in spectrometry. Ray planned a companion editorial about the marvelous new science. Alas, he must also buy stories that did not thrill him. Fantasy magazine lived up to its name. Most of his purchases were stories of magic and mysticism. Even these were fun when the authors could be persuaded to play by internally consistent rules. Ray grabbed the next manuscript and scowled. Then there were the truly revolting things he must buy, things like this, another Hrala adventure. The series had started twenty years earlier, five years before he signed on with Tarul. The first few stories weren't bad if you liked non-stop illogical action with lots of blood and sex. Old Kim Trinos wasn't a bad writer. As was to rule custom, Trinos had exclusive control of his series for eight years. Then to rule accepted Hrala stories from anyone. The fad kept growing. Otherwise decent writers began wasting their time writing new Hrala stories. Nowadays, the series was popular all around the world, and practically a cult in the Yeranitos. Prala, the barbarian princess. Over six feet tall, fantastically built, unbelievably strong and crafty and vengeful and libidinous. Her adventures took place in the vast inland of the continent, where empires and wars had no need to conform to the humdrum world that readers knew. She was the idol of thousands of foolish male readers and a model for thousands of female ones. Ray paged slowly through this latest contribution to the legend. <laughs> for its kind, the story was well written. He'd have his assistant editor look it over, make it consistent with the background files she kept on the series. He would probably have to buy it. He tossed the manuscript under his desk and made a note in the submission log. An hour later, Ray was still at it, the in-pile fractionally smaller. From the decks below his windows, there was the continuing noise of supplies being loaded, crewmen shouting at stevedores. Occasionally, he heard people working on the rigging above him. He had long since learned to tune out such. But now there was a different clatter. Someone was coming along the catwalk to his office. A moment later, Coronadas Asquasenia stuck her head in the doorway. Boss, such a deal I got for you. Uh-oh. When Kor's accent thickened and her words came fast, it was a sure sign she had been swept away by some new enthusiasm. He waved her into the office. What's that? Tarul magazines. They don't sell themselves. Other things we need to grab by our interest. Ray nodded. Jespin Tarul had a small circus housed on the afterdecks. They put on shows at the larger ports, hyped all the Tarul publications. Kor was fascinated by the operation. She was constantly trying to add acts representing stories and authors from fantasy. She was good at it, too, a natural-born publicist. Ray figured it was only a matter of time before higher-ups noticed, and he lost his assistant editor. What have you got? 
Who? She corrected him. She stepped back and waved at someone beyond the doorway. I present you Hrala, Princess of the Interior. She pronounced the name correctly, with a throat-tearing rasp that was painful even to hear. The portentous intro brought no immediate action. After a moment, Kor stepped to the door and spoke coaxingly. There were at least two people out there, one of them a princeman from Braley's crew. A second passed, and someone tall and lanky bent through the doorway. Ray rocked back in his chair, his eyes widening. The visitor was remarkable, though not in the way Kor meant. It was a female. There was a slimness in the shoulders and a slight broadening in the hips. And she was tall. The ceiling of Giel's office was six feet high. The girl's tangled red hair brushed against it. But scale her down to normal size, and she might be taken for a street waif. Her face and hair were grimy. A bruise darkened her face around one eye. With her arrival, the room was filled with the smell of rancid grease. He looked at her clothes and understood the source of part of the smell. She was dressed in rags. There were patches on patches on patches, yet holes still showed through. But these were not the rags of a street waif. These were of leather, thick and poorly cured. She carried a walking staff almost as tall as she was. The circus people might have use for such a character, though scarcely as Hrala. He smiled at the girl. What's your name? Her only reply was a shy smile that revealed even healthy teeth. There was a nice face hiding under all the dirt. Kor said, She doesn't understand one word of Sprach, boss. She looked at the door. What did she call herself, Jimmy? The princeman stuck his head into the office. There wasn't room for three visitors. Good afternoon, Master Giel, he said to Ray. Uh, it's hard to pronounce. The closest thing in a civilized name would be Tatya Grimm. The girl's head came up and her smile broadened. Hmm, where did you find her? Strangest thing, sir. We were on a wood detail for Master Towns, a few miles south of here. Just about noon we came across her on the tableland. She had that there walking stick stuck in the ground. It looked like she was praying to it or something. She had her face down near the end of the stick's shadow. We couldn't see quite what all she was doing. We were busy cutting trees. But some boys from the town came by, started hassling her. We chased them off before they could do anything. And she was eager to stay with you? She was when she saw we were from the barge. One of our crew speaks a little hurtic, sir. Near as he can tell, she walked here from the center of the continent. Three thousand miles through lands which, until very recently, had swallowed up every expedition. Ray cast a look of quiet incredulity at his assistant. Kor gave a little shrug, as if to say, Hey, it will make great copy. The princeman missed this byplay. We couldn't figure out quite why she made the trip, though. Something about finding people to talk to. Ray chuckled. Well, if Herdic is her only language, she certainly came to the wrong place. He looked at the girl. During the conversation, her eyes had wandered all about the office. The smile had not left her face. Everything fascinated her. The carved wall panels, the waist-high stacks of manuscripts, Giel's telescope in the corner. Only when she looked at Ray or Kor or Jimmy did her smile falter and the shyness return. Damn. Didn't Kor realize what she had here? Aloud, he said, This is something I should think about. Jimmy, why don't you take this, uh, Tatya over to the public deck? Get her something to eat. Yes, sir. Tatya? He motioned her to follow him. The girl's shoulders slumped for an instant, but she departed without protest. Kor was silent till their footsteps had faded into the general deck clamor. Then she looked at Giel. You're not going to hire her. It was more an accusation than a question. You'd find her more trouble than she's worth, Kor. I'd wager she's a local girl. Who ever heard of an inlander with red hair? Watching her, I could see she understood some of what we were saying. 
Whatever Herdick she speaks is probably in Jimmy's imagination. The poor girl is simply retarded, probably caused by the same glandular problem that sprouted her six feet tall before she's even reached puberty. My guess is she's barely trainable. Cor sat on one stack of manuscripts, propped her feet on another. Sure, she's no inlander, boss. But she's not from Fair Haven. The Haveners don't wear leather like that. She's probably been expelled from some local tribe. And yes, she's dim brain, but who cares? No need for the great Harla to give big speeches in Sprock. I can teach her to strut, wave a sword, make fake herdic war talk. Boss, they'll love her in the Yerenitos. Cor, she doesn't even look like Hrala. The red hair. Wigs. We got lots of nice black wigs. And her figure. She just doesn't have, uh... Giel made vague motions with his hands. No tits? Yes, that's a problem. The true Hrala danced through her adventures wearing next to nothing. But we can fix. The Vice magazine people have props. Take one of their rubber busts and wrap it in brazier armor like Rala wears. It'll fool an audience. She paused. Boss, I can make this work. Tatya may be dim, but she wants to please. She doesn't have any place else to go. Giel knew this last was not part of the sales pitch. Asquasenya had a soft streak undermining her pragmatism. He turned to look out at Fairhaven. A steady stream of supply lighters moved back and forth between the town's main pier and the deeper water surrounding the barge. Tarul was due to lift anchor tomorrow noon. It would be two years before they returned to this part of the world. Finally, he said, Your scheme could cause real problems the next time we visit this dump. Come the night wake period, go into town and look up the Crown's magistrate. Make sure we're not stealing some citizen's kid. Sure, Cor grinned broadly. Victory was at hand. Giel grumbled for a few more minutes. Hiring an actress would mean going up the chain of command to over-editor Ramsey, and perhaps beyond him to Jespin Tarul. That could take days, and much debate. Giel allowed himself to be persuaded to hire the girl as an apprentice proofreader. The move had a certain piquancy, how many writers had accused him of employing illiterate nitwits as proofreaders? Finally, he reminded his assistant editor that she still had a full-time job preparing the issues that would sell in the Austerlays. Cor nodded, her face very serious. The Hrala project would be on her own time. He almost thought he'd intimidated her, until she turned to leave and he heard a poorly suppressed laugh. It took Cor less than two days to understand what a jam she had talked herself into. The barge was back at sea, and there were no distractions from shore folk. But now she found herself working thirty hours a day, setting up the Hrala rehearsals with publicity, looking after the grim girl, and, most of all, getting fantasy into shape. There were so many manuscripts to review. There were good stories, in the slush pile, but more science-oriented ones than ever before. These were Regil's special favorites, and sometimes he went overboard with them. Fantasy had been published for seven hundred years. A certain percentage of its stories had always claimed to be possible. But only in the last fifty years, with the rise of science, could the reader feel that there was a future where the stories might really happen. Regil had been editor of Fantasy for fifteen years. During that time, they had published more stories of contrivance fiction than in all the previous years. He had Spector Ramsey's permission to include two in every issue. More and more, he found readers whose only interest was in such stories. More and more, he found readers who were creating the science that future stories could be based on. Kor knew that in his heart, Ray saw these stories as agents of change in themselves. Take the spectrometry series. During the last five years, he had written a dozen editorials advertising the new science, spectrometry, key to nature's secrets, and soliciting stories based on the contrivance. Now he got one or two new ones at every major stop. Some of them were saleable, some of them were mind-boggling, and some were wretched. Asquasenya had been working on the barge for five quarters and as Regil's assistant for nearly a year. 
She had read her first fantasy story when she was five. It was hard not to be in awe of the magazine's editor, even if he was a crotchety old codger. Giel was forty-one. Cor did her best to disguise her feelings. Their editorial conferences were running battles. This morning was no different. They were up in his office, putting together the first issue for the Austerleys. The slush pile had been reduced to desk height, and they had plenty of room to lay out the pieces Ray had selected for the new issue. Outside Giel's office, the bright light of morning had slowly reddened. They were well into the eclipse season. Once every twenty hours, Seraph blocked the sun or was itself eclipsed. Every wake period was punctuated by darkness as deep as night on the nether hemisphere. Yeel had set algae glow pots on every available hook, yet he still found it hard to read fine print. He squinted at the Evam Alec manuscript Kor was complaining about. I don't understand you, Kor. This yarn is world-shaking. If we didn't put anything else in the next issue, Pride of Iron could carry it all. But they're writing it is so wooden. The characters have no life. The plot makes me sleepy. By the blue light of Seraph Kor, it's ideas that make this great. Pride of Iron is based on spectro results that aren't even in print yet. Fooey. There have been stories with this theme before. T. Liso's Hidden Empire series. He had houses made of iron, streets paved with copper. Anyone who owns jewelry could imagine a world like that. This is different. Alec is a chemist. He uses metals in realistic ways, like in gun barrels and heavy machinery. But even that isn't the beauty of this story. Three hundred years ago, T. Liso was writing fantasy. Ivam Alec is talking about something that could really be. Ray covered the glow pots and threw open a window. Chillness oozed into the office, ocean breeze further cooled by the eclipse. The stars spread in their thousands across the sky, blocked only by the barge's rigging, dimmed only by mists rising from the pulper rooms below decks. Even if they had been standing outside and could look straight up, Seraph would have been nothing more than a dim reddish ring. For the next hour, the stars ruled. Look at that, Kor. Thousands of stars, millions beyond those we can see. They're suns like ours, and, and we buy plenty of stories with that premise. Not like this one. Ivam Alec knows astronomers at Kreersark, who are hanging spectrogear on telescopes. They've drawn line spectra for lots of stars. The ones with color and absolute magnitude similar to our sun show incredibly intense lines for iron and copper and the other metals. This is the first time in history anyone has had direct insight about how things must be on planets of other stars. Houses built of iron are actually possible there. Asquasenya was silent for a moment. The idea was neat. In fact, it was kind of scary. Finally, she said, We are all alone in being so metal poor? Yes. At least among the sun-like stars these guys have looked at. Hmm. It's almost like the gods. They play a big joke on us. Kor's great love was polytheistic fantasy, stories where the fate of mortals was the whim of supernatural beings. That sort of thing had been popular in fantasy's early centuries. She knew Ray considered it out of step with what the magazine should be doing now. Sometimes she brought it up just to bug him. Okay, I see why you want the story. Too bad it's such an ugly little thing. She saw that her point had struck home. A bit grumpily, Ray unmasked the lamps, then sat down and picked up Pride of Iron. It really was plotless. And, on this leg of the voyage anyway, he was the only one capable of pumping it up. She could almost see the wheels going around in his head. But it would be worth rewriting. He could have the story published before these ideas were even in the scientific literature. He looked up, grinned belligerently at her. Well, I'm going to buy it, Cor. Assume anonymous collaboration makes it twice as long. What can we do for illustrations? It took about fifteen minutes to decide which crew artists would work the job. The Austerlay issue would use slightly modified stock yellows. Hopefully they could commission some truly striking pictures as they passed through that island chain. 
The rest of the Austerlay issue was easy to lay out. Several of the stories were already in the Austerlay language. The issue would be mostly fantasy, the new artwork from artists of Crowness and the Chain Pearls. The cover story was a rather nice Hrala adventure. Speaking of Hrala, said Ray, how is your project coming? Will your girl be able to give a show when we start peddling this issue? Sure she will. We get about an hour of rehearsal every wake period. Once she understands about stage performance, things will go just fine. So far, we work on sword and shield stuff. She can memorize things as fast as we can show her. She's awful impressive, screaming around the stage with death in her hand. In the stories, the Hrala sword was magical, edged with metal, and so heavy that an ordinary warrior could not lift it. The Tarul version of death was made of wood painted silver. What about her costume? Or lack of one? Great! We still gotta do changes. Ribbon armor is hard to fit, but she looks tremendous. Svector Ramsey thinks so, too. He saw her? Gil looked stricken. Don't worry, boss. The over-editor was amused. He told me to congratulate you for hiring her. Oh. Well, let's hope we're all still amused when you put her on stage with other actors. Gore gathered up the manuscripts they had chosen. She would take them, together with the production notes, over to the art deck. No problem. You are right. She understands some sprock. She can even speak it a little. I think she was just shy that first day. On stage, she'll mainly scream gibberish. We don't need a new script for each archipelagate. Kor carried the papers to the door. Besides, we get the chance to pull it all together before we reach the Austerleys. We arrive at the village of the termite people in three days. I'll have things ready by then. Gil chuckled. The termite people were scarcely your typical fans. Okay, I look forward to it. Kor stepped into the darkness, shut the hatch behind her. In fact, she was at least half as confident as she sounded. Things ought to work out if she could just find time to coach Tatya Grimm. The giant little girl was stranger than Kor had admitted. She wasn't really dumb, just totally deprived. She'd been born in some very primitive tribe. She'd been five years old before she ever saw a tree. Everything she saw now was novelty. Kor remembered how the girl's eyes had widened when Kor showed her a copy of Fantasy and explained how spoken words could be saved with paper and ink. She had held the magazine upside down, paged back and forth through it, fascinated by both pictures and text. Worst of all, Tatya Grimm had no concept of polemic. She must have been an outsider even in her own tribe. She simply did not accept that dramatic skits could persuade. If Grimm could be convinced of that single point, Kor was sure the Hrala campaign would be a spectacular success. If not, they might all end up with bat dreck on their faces. The day they were to land at the village of the termite people, Ray took the morning off. He walked around the top editorial deck, looking for a place sheltered from the wind and passers-by. This would be his first chance to play with his telescope since Fairhaven. The marvelous weather still held... The sky was washed clean. Widely spaced cumulus spread away forever. A tarul hydrofoil loitered about a mile ahead of the barge, its planes raised and sails mostly reefed. Giel knew there were others out there. Most of the barge's foil bays were empty. The fast boats had many uses. In civilized seas, they ranged before and behind the barge, making landfall arrangements, carrying job orders, picking up finished illustrations and manuscripts. In the wilderness east of Fairhaven, they had a different role, security. No pirates were going to sneak up on the barge. The catapults and petroleum bombs would be ready long before any hostile vessel broke the horizon. So far, all the traffic was friendly. Several times a day, they met ships and barges coming from the east. Most were merchantmen. Only a few publishing companies had to rule's worldwide scope. The hydrofoils reported that the science was docked at the village of the termite people. That ship was much smaller than the Tarul barge, but it published its own journal. It was sponsored by universities in the Tsenarts as a sort of mobile research station. 
Ray looked forward to spending a few hours on the other vessel. It would mean some sales and would give him a chance to make contacts. These were people who appreciated the new things he was doing with fantasy. Notwithstanding Kor's Hrala project, seeing the science would be high point of this landfall. Gil rolled the telescope card into an open area at the rear of the editorial deck. Here, the breeze was blocked by old Jespin's penthouse, yet there was still a reasonable view. He clamped the cart's wheels and leveled its platform. Back in the chain pearls, just after he bought the scope, this operation would have attracted a small crowd and begun an impromptu star or seraph party. Now passers-by said hello, but few stopped for long. Ray had his toy all to himself. He flipped the tube down and took a scan across the northern horizon. They were about fifteen miles off the coast. To the naked eye, the continent was a dark line at the bottom of the sky. The telescope brought detail. Giel could see individual rocks on the dun cliffs. Trees growing in the lee of the hills were clearly visible. Here and there were rounded lumps he recognized as wild termite towers. The village was hidden beyond a small cape. Not a very impressive coast for the greatest land mass in the world. Beyond those cliffs, the land stretched more than 10,000 miles, over the North Pole and partway down the other side of the planet. It was a hundred times more land there than in all the island chains put together. It was an ocean of land, and beyond its coastal fringe, mostly unknown. No wonder it had been the source of so many stories. Ray sighed. He didn't begrudge those stories. In past centuries, speculation about the interior was a decent story base. The island civilizations weren't more than a couple of thousand years old. The human race must have originated on the continent. It was reasonable that older, wiser civilizations lay in the interior. Whole races of monsters and godlings might flourish in those reaches. But during the last thirty years, there had been serious exploration. The Trog head rigs had reached continent center. In the last ten years, three separate expeditions had trekked across the interior. The unknown remained, but it was cut into small chunks. The myths were dead, and the new reality was a dismal thing. An ocean of land is necessarily a very dry place. Beyond the coastal fringe, the explorers found desert. In that, there was variety. There were deserts of sand and heat deserts of rock, and, in the north, deserts of ice and cold. There was no hidden paradise. The nearest thing to the great lakes of legend were saline ponds near continent center. The explorers found that the interior was inhabited, but not by an elder race. There were isolated tribes in the mid-latitude deserts. These folk lived naked, almost like animals. Their only tools were spears and hand axes. They seemed peaceful, too poor even for warfare. The lowest barbarians of the fringe were high civilization compared to them. And all these years the story writers had assumed that the Herdic tribes were degenerate relatives of interior races. Yet interior fantasies were still written. Gil saw hundreds of them a year, and worse, had to buy dozens. Ah, well. It was a living, and it gave him a chance to show people more important things. Ray stepped back from the telescope and turned its tube almost straight up. It was Seraph he really wanted to look at. Hello? Ray looked up, startled. He had an audience. It was the Fairhaven waif. She stood almost behind him and about ten feet away. He had the feeling she'd been watching for several minutes. Hello, indeed. And how are you today, Mistress Grimm? Well. She smiled shyly and took a step forward. She certainly looked better than when he first saw her. Her face was scrubbed clean. In place of rancid leather, she wore tripulation fatigues. If she had been five feet tall instead of six, she would have seemed a pretty preteener. Shouldn't you be rehearsing with Cor? I, uh, that is later. I see. You're off duty. She bobbed her head, seeming to understand the term. 
Somehow, Ray had imagined that Kor or the publicity people would be looking after Tatya all the time. In fact, no matter how incompetent she was, there simply were not enough people to babysit her. The girl must have many hours to herself. No doubt she wandered all over the barge. By the light, the trouble she could get into. They stared at each other for a moment. The girl seemed so attentive, almost in awe of him. He realized she wouldn't leave unless he explicitly told her to get lost. He tried to think of an appropriate dismissal, but nothing came. Damn. Finally, he said, Well, how do you like my new telescope? Good. Good. The girl stepped almost close enough to touch the scope, and Ray went through the usual explanations. He showed her how the wheels could be fastened to the deck. The oil bath in the cart's base damped the sea motion and kept the optics steady. The cart itself was an old drafting rig from the art deck. Ray had removed the drawing table and substituted clamps that attached to the base of his twelve-inch scope. Tatya Grimm didn't say much, but her enthusiasm was obvious. She leaned close to the equipment to see the details Ray pointed out. When he explained something, she would pause for an instant and then bob her head and say, Yes, so nice. Giel wondered if he could have been wrong about her. In some ways, she seemed a more thoughtful and enthusiastic audience than crew people he had shown the gear to. But then he noticed the uniformity of her responses. Everything seemed to impress her equally. Every explanation took the same brief moment for her to absorb. Gill had a retarded cousin, mental age around five years, physical age thirty. After so much living, a retarded person learns to mimic the head movements and nonsense sounds that normal people make in conversation. Ray could imagine the blank look he would get if he asked Tatya something related to his explanations. He didn't try such an experiment. What point was there in hurting the girl's feelings? Besides, she seemed to enjoy the conversation as much as a normal person. He aimed the scope at Seraph as he continued his spiel. The planet was in quarter phase, and the mountains of its southern continent stood in stark relief near the Terminator. Wind and ship vibration jostled the image a bit. On the other hand, the line of sight was straight up, without lots of dirty air to smudge things. This was the clearest day view he'd ever had. So my telescope makes objects seem much closer. Would you like to look? Even a retard should be thrilled by the sight. Yes. She stepped forward, and he showed her how to use the eyepiece. She bent to it, and gave a squeal, a wonderful mixture of pleasure and surprise. Her head jerked back from the eyepiece. She stared upwards at the twin planet, as if to assure herself that it hadn't moved. Just as quickly, she took another look through the lens, and then backed off again. So big! So big! Her smile all but split her face. How can telescope... She reached up as if to jerk the tube's end down to eye level. Giel caught her hands. Oops, be gentle. Turn it around this pivot. She wasn't listening, but she let him rotate the tube so she could look in. Her eyes went wide as she saw the expanded image of her face in the main mirror. Ray found himself explaining about curved mirrors and how the diagonal directed the image from the twelve-inch through the eyepiece. The girl hesitated the same fraction of a second she had after his other explanations. Then, just as before, her head bobbed with an enthusiastic imitation of total understanding. Yes, yes, so nice. Abruptly, she grabbed Ray's hand. And you think this thing? You make it? Tatcha's grip was almost painful. Her hands were slender, but as outsized as the rest of her. You mean, did I invent the telescope? He chuckled. No, Miss Grimm. The basic idea is two hundred years old. People don't invent telescopes just to pass the time on a dull morning. Things like this are the work of scattered geniuses. Part of an invention may exist for decades, useless, before another genius makes the idea successful. The girl's expression collapsed. It might have been laughable if it weren't so pathetic. She had no concept of what was difficult and what was trivial. 
and so her attempt at bright conversation had foundered. Ray turned her gently back to the telescope and showed her how to adjust the focus. Her former enthusiasm did not completely return, but she seemed sincerely taken by the close-up view of Seraph. Ray gave her his usual spiel, pointing out the brown smudges across part of the southern continent. Brush fires, we think. That land must be a lot like the grassy plains north of Bayfast. The religions have all sorts of visions of Seraph, but we now know it's a world much like ours. And the stories of hidden civilizations there might still be true. Ray had written more than one editorial about plans for detecting and communicating with Seraph's hypothetical inhabitants. One of the first steps would be to build an observatory in this part of the world, where Seraph could be observed with a minimum of atmospheric distortion. A couple of people from printing had stopped nearby, were watching intently. They were not the sort Ray would think attracted by sky-gazing. One was Brayley Towns's bomb right. Ray glanced at her questioningly. Sir, we've got a line of sight into the harbor now, the bomb right waved to the north. We were wondering if you'd take a quick look at Termite Town through your scope. Ray hid a sigh and gave up any hope of having the device to himself this morning. The bomb right must have noticed his irritation. She hurried on to say, Something strange is happening with the termite people, sir. So far, the officer types ain't talking, but take a look, will you? Gil eased Tatya Grimm away from the scope and tilted it toward the horizon. He made a quick adjustment with the spotter scope and then looked through the main eyepiece. Looks about like I remember it. There were dozens of towers from water's edge back up the hills around the harbor. The smallest ones were bigger than a house. The largest were over a hundred feet tall. The spaces between were like streets at the bottom of shadowed canyons. Even knowing the truth, one's first reaction was awe. This must be a city, the greatest one in the world. Kreerzark and Bayfast were insignificant, low-story affairs compared to this. In fact, there were only a few thousand humans in this whole city. They dug their burrows and staircases through the termite mounds. They poked air holes through the walls holes that also served as windows. Hmm, there's something different. One of the towers by the moorage. It looks like it was burned or stained with soot. The dark goes as high as the windows overhanging the water. Yes, sir, that's what got our attention, but we couldn't see what made the stain. And there's something strange in the water, too. Ray tilted the scope a fraction. A twisted pile of spikes and filaments stuck through the water directly in front of the scorch-marked tower. Ray sucked in a breath. It looks like ship's rigging, the fiberglass part. The bomb right stepped close, and he let her take a look. She was silent for a moment, then... Uh-huh. That's where they like visitors to dock. Looks like the gooks dumped pet bombs out those windows, right onto the moorage. The guys they ambushed didn't have a chance. A minute before, Ray had been feeling sorry for one retarded girl. Now, he looked across the water. Without a telescope, the village was a barely distinguishable skyline, the scorch unnoticeable. The guys they ambushed. According to the advance reports, there had been exactly one ship tied up at the village. The Science. Crew and publishing folk spent the next few hours speculating. Why was the science ambushed? What would Tarul do about it? The barge stayed several miles offshore, but rumor held that fast boats were doing close recon under cover of the midday eclipse. The only word from the executive deck was that there would be no immediate landing. Top management was not asleep, just terribly indecisive. Ray Gill bluffed his way onto the bridge shortly before eclipse end. All the biggies were there both from ownership and operations. The atmosphere was that of an incipient brawl. Consensus time had not arrived. And I say, sail into catapult range and burn their filthy village to the ground. Barbarians must learn that ambushing merchants is a dangerous sport. The speaker was one of Tarul's nephews, an arrogant pipsqueak who'd be scrubbing decks if it weren't for his relatives. The little man looked angrily around the room, daring anyone to disagree. Fortunately for the company, there were some strong personalities present. 
Barge Captain Machoso stood near the helm, facing the rest. His form was a vague, intimidating shadow in the eclipse light. Machoso was a huge man. The bridge itself had been rebuilt to accommodate his six feet eight inch height. He was in his early fifties and only just beginning to go to fat. The first twenty years of his career had been spent in the Chain Pearls Navy. The man had retired an admiral and the greatest hero of the Loretto Bight affair. Now he crossed his ham-like arms and seemed to lean toward Tarul's nephew. Warlike talk coming from... A wee wimp who couldn't cock a bow, the pause seemed to say. From those who need customers to live. It's true. I could torch the village. It would be expensive. We wouldn't be left with much reserve. And what would we get for it? The termite folk are isolated, Master Crato. There would be few to learn from the lesson. The Tarul Company would lose one, admittedly minor, customer. The barge has visited here four times since I've been captain. We've had less trouble than in some civilized ports. These people are not pirates. The science crew did something, broke some taboo. Machoso turned to look into the harbor. Sunbreak was almost upon them. The land was bright with washed-out pastels. When he continued, his voice held more frustration than certainty. Sure, we have the power to raise the place, but we could never bring off an assault landing. There's no way we can rescue the survivors and find out how to avoid such a debacle in the future. Survivors? Someone had lived through the pet bombing. Ray felt a surge of joy. No one else seemed moved by the news. They already knew. This must be a major point of the debate. We can't just leave them there. The words popped out of Gil's mouth without conscious thought. Dead silence greeted his words. The people closest to him moved slightly away, but didn't look at him. It was as though he had made a bad smell. Machoso turned, and his gaze swept the bridge. Master Townce! Sir! The barge captain pointed at Ray Giel. Take this man out and... Ray's guts went cold. There were stories about Ked Machoso's command of the Chain Pearl Armada. Brief him. Yes, sir. Braley Towns emerged from the crowd and hustled Ray onto the open walkway beyond the bridge. The printmaster shut the hatch and turned to face him. Brief you? The commercial life is turning Ked soft. It took a moment for Ray to realize that the other man was suppressing laughter. Don't you understand that a rescue is what Ked is dying to do? For almost an hour he's been trying to trick these flightless bats into backing one. Oh. Ray was both embarrassed and encouraged. Maybe my, uh, little outburst will start something. I hope so. Braley stopped smiling. But even by Ked's standards... It would be risky operation pulling those science people out. He led Ray to the forward end of the walkway. All around them, twilight brightened suddenly into day as the sun came past the edge of Seraph. Swarms of day bats rose from the harbor. They swept around the towers, their cries coming clear and reedy across the water. Braley gestured at the bridge binoculars. Take a look to the left of the harbor towers. That's where they're holding the survivors. It was some kind of pit, probably the root of a fallen tower. Ray saw termite folk camped around the edge. Towns continued. They're in that hole, out of sight from this angle. See how the locals have set petroleum vats along the edge? They could light and dump those in a matter of minutes. Incinerating the prisoners. The Tarul people would have to sneak in a large party and overpower the guards at those vats all at once. One slip, and a lot of company people would share the fate of those in the pit. We could offer a ransom, Braley. It might be expensive, but the science home universities would probably pay us back, and there'd be lots of good publicity. The spin-offs from such an adventure could fill several issues of the Tarul magazines. You don't understand. The science people aren't hostages. The only reason they're still alive is that an appropriate method of execution hasn't been decided on. The local bosses tell us that no ransom will save the prisoners. 
They won't even tell us what blasphemy the poor suckers committed. The whole matter is closed. And you know, I think the gooks actually expect to continue business as usual with the rest of us. Hmm. Ray had dealt with the village's rulers. Their interest in certain types of pulp fiction had always made them seem relatively civilized. They had not seemed religious, and now he saw that was just a sign of how damned secretive their religion must be. He stared through the binocs a moment more. Beyond the edge of that pit were some good people. We've got to do something, Braley. I know. Ked knows. The printmaster shrugged. After a moment, the two men walked back to the command bridge. Inside, Ray saw that the tension had drained from the meeting. Consensus had finally been reached. Braley smiled sourly and whispered, But we also know how it's going to turn out, don't we? Ray looked around, and with a sinking feeling, he understood. The Tarul Publishing Company had existed for seven hundred years. Few island-bound companies were that old. And yet Tarul had been sailing the oceans of two all that time, contending with tempests and pirates and religionists and governments. There had been disasters. Three hundred years earlier, the old barge was burned to the waterline. Yet the company had survived and prospered. One doesn't last seven hundred years by rushing into everyone else's fight. The barge and its hydrofoils were well armed, but given a choice, they simply avoided trouble. If a village or even an island chain turned to religious nuttery, they lost to rule's business. The years would pass and the regime would fall, or decide that it needed trade more than its crazy convictions. Ketterichi Machoso had done his subtle best to bring another outcome, but it was not to be. The talk now was of delivering a few threats, and if that did not help the science people, weighing anchor and sailing off. There must be some way to stop this. Then he had it. Braley said the termite folk wanted business as usual. For the second time in fifteen minutes, Ray interrupted the meeting. We can't simply take off. We have magazines to sell here and customers who want to buy. This outburst was greeted with the same silence as before. Only this time, it was not Ked Machoso who responded. There was a croaking sound from somewhere behind the Tarul in-laws. The owners looked nervously at each other, then stood aside. Out of the shadows came a very old man in a wheelchair. Jespin Tarul himself. He rolled far enough past his relatives to get a look at Ray Giel. It was only the third time Ray had seen the man. He was wrapped in blankets, his hands clasped and shivering in his lap. Only one eye tracked, and it was starred with a cataract. His voice was quavery, the delivery almost addled. Yes, these folk haven't done us harm, and our business is to do business. He looked in Ray's direction. I'm glad someone still understands this. Machoso didn't sound quite so enthusiastic. It's risky, sir. Not your average sales landing. But I could go along with it if we can get the volunteers. Volunteers who might wangle the prisoners' freedom, or at least discover their exact situation. Ray imagined the wheels turning in the barge captain's head. Sirs, I volunteer for the landing. It was Braley Towns, barely hiding a smile. I, I volunteer. The words were coming from Ray's own mouth. He mumbled the rest, almost as a rationalization to himself. I've handled sales landings here before. Old man Tarul tilted his head at the other owners. Are we agreed? It was not quite a rhetorical question. The explicit recommendation of Jespin to rule counted for a lot, but he was not a majority stockholder. After a moment, there came mumbled acquiescence. To rule looked across the deck. Operations? Are there any objections from them? I have a question. It was Specter Ramsey. He looked at Giel. Have you finished your work on the first Austerlay issue of Fantasy? My assistant can handle what remains, Master Ramsay. He had just finished the rewrite of Pride of Iron. 
Ah. A smile split the gaunt over-editor's face. In that case, I have no objections. And if things didn't work out, there would be plenty of time to put a black border around the editorial page. They didn't go ashore until ten hours later, in the night wake period. It had been a busy time. The landing was to look like the previous ones here. There would only be one boat, less than a dozen people. Except for Ray, who was probably known to the locals, those twelve were not the usual sorts for a commercial landing. Machoso picked people with military and naval backgrounds. The barge captain had imagined many contingencies. Some involved simple gathering of information, perhaps an attempt at diplomacy. Others would mean quick violence and a frantic effort to get back to sea ahead of the termite people. From the beginning, it was agreed that no obvious weapons would be taken. Braley Towns produced explosive powder that could be carried in their jackets. That should pass any inspection the termiters might make. Though it was probably a futile contribution, Ray Giel took his telescope. It had impressed Tatya Grimm. It might have some effect on the locals. On the other hand, such high technology might be what got the science in trouble. Ray broke the scope into its components and stored them in different parts of the landing boat. Coronada's Asquesenia had been furious. She wanted to take her barbarian princess act ashore and pretend that Tatya Grimm was truly Hrala. Machoso rejected the plan, and Ray agreed with him. Asquesenia claimed the girl had absorbed the role these last couple of days, that she was the most convincing Hrala ever produced. It really didn't matter. Ray doubted that the local rulers believed the Hrala stories. In any case, using the act to intimidate could cause the prompt massacre of both prisoners and would-be rescuers. So Kor stayed behind, and Giel found himself on the landing boat surrounded by some very competent fighters. Except for Braley, he knew none of them. They were only a hundred yards from the shore. Seraph was at first quarter, and its blue light lay serene across everything. The loudest sounds were the splash of oars into water and the occasional grunt of a rower. Beach bats and flying fish swooped low around the lighter. The smell of char and oil was stronger than the salt tang of the water. They were passing a ragged jungle of black glass, what was left of the science. The bats swarmed through the twisted rigging. One creature's catastrophe is another's new home. The termite mounds were awesome at this distance. Hundreds of air holes lined their sides. A few of the towers actually broadened with height so that they hung over the water. It was like some artist's vision of a city of the future. Even knowing what the towers really were, it was hard not to feel intimidated. Early seafarers thought the termite folk were non-human. Alas, and fortunately, this was not the work of gods. The locals were normal humans, using mounds that occurred all through this region. They brought in extra materials for the termites, then guided and pruned the structures. Basically, the termite people were herdic folk taking advantage of local circumstance. And strangely, they had no special pride in the towers. They seemed much prouder of the heritage they imagined having lost when they left the interior. Braley Towns kicked at the crate that was their cargo. Still don't see why the gooks are interested in fantasy. Ray shrugged. We don't sell them the whole thing, just stories of the interior. My guess is they see themselves as a great people fallen on hard times. Stories about inner kingdoms stoke that vision. We don't sell more than a few dozen copies per visit, but they pay several coppers for each. Towns whistled softly. Gods, if only our other customers were that eager. He turned to look at the towers. On the other hand, the barge's usual customers bought in much larger quantities and didn't incinerate visitors. The landing boat slid up to a crude pier. Some thirty guards stood along its length, their spears held in salute. The local bosses were in a group just above the landing point. As the Tarul people climbed from the boat, low-ranking priests came down to help carry Ray's crate. So far, everything seemed normal. The tallest of the locals advanced on Ray and gabbled something in a sing-song cadence. This was the priest they usually dealt with. The guy had an excellent reading knowledge of Sprach, but little chance to speak it. His vocabulary was straight out of an old-time adventure novel. After a second, Ray got the avalanche of mispronounced words sorted out. 
Master Giel, happy we are to see you again. The priest bowed in the direction of the magazines. And happy we are to learn more ancestor truth. You and your crew are welcome in the hall. We will examine the new truth and decide on fair payment. Ray mumbled something appropriately pompous, and they walked toward the village, Giel and the termiter priests in the lead. Behind him, the landing party hung together, their tenseness obvious. This was the third time Ray had been here. He marveled that he had not been afraid before. In fact, the place had been a comic relief. Then, when the locals spoke of ancestor truth, it seemed a light turn of phrase. Now he had the wild impulse to run. What if there was some blasphemy in the stories? It put him in a cold sweat to think how casually he published new twists on traditional themes or allowed small inconsistencies into story cycles. And just few days ago, he looked forward to testing the Hrala skit with these people. The tall priest's tone remained friendly. You have come at an appropriate moment, Master Giel. We have confronted blasphemers, who may be harbingers of the final battle. Now is a time when we must consult all sources of truth. Another priest, an older fellow with a limp, interrupted with something abrupt. The tall guy paused and looked faintly embarrassed. Suddenly, Giel knew that he was more than an interpreter, but not one of the high priests. It will be necessary to inspect both your boat and your persons. More blasphemers may come in fair forms. Don't be angered. It is but a formality. I, we, recognize you from before. And if the writings you bring speak to our questions, you can expect payment even more generous than usual. Away from the pier, the smell of burned petroleum products faded, replaced by a barnyard smell and the acrid stench of the tiny insects that built the mounds. Up close, the tower walls were not smooth sweeps. Glabrous patches were surrounded by warty growths. The windows were holes hacked in the irregular surface. Even Seraph's blue light could not make such things beautiful. Behind the front tier of mounds, stone corrals held a few dozen scoats, the source of the farm smell. The place really was a village, similar to backward villages the world over. Without modern science, they had no way of making strong or hard materials. Their spearheads were fire-hardened wood and obsidian. Where the termites did not build for them, their structures were simple piles of stone. It was no wonder travelers had seen no danger from these people. A squad of crossbow-armed troops could take them over. No one guessed they had access to petroleum or the knowledge to produce flammables. They walked some distance through the shadows between the towers. The great hall was cut into the side of one of the largest mounds. The resulting talus was pressed into steps as broad as in front of any government building in Crowness. At the top of the steps, carved wooden barricades blocked the entrance. Ray's guide called something herdic and ceremonial-sounding. Spear-toting priests slid the barricades aside. Their porters carried the crate of fantasies toward the altar at the back of the hall. The place was exactly as Ray remembered it, at least one hundred feet from entrance to altar, but with a ceiling that was nowhere more than seven feet high. It seemed more like a mine than a building. Twelve-foot-wide pillars stood in a rectangular grid across the floor. The pillars were native mound stuff, painted white. The only light came from ranks of candles that circled each of them. As the Tarul people walked toward the altar, they saw hundreds of termite folk standing quietly between the farther pillars. The room couldn't be more than one hundred feet across, but the pillars seemed to go on forever. On his last visit, Ray had walked to the side of the hall, an act of unknowing bravado, he realized now, and discovered that the pillars there were smaller, more closely spaced, and the walls were painted with the image of more pillars stretching off to a faked infinity. Cleverly placed flecks of glass simulated hundreds of faraway candles. Like a lot of primitive folk, the termiters had their own subtleties. Ray expected the threatened body searches would come next. Instead, the Tarul people were gestured to sit before the altar. 
There was a moment of near silence after Gil was asked to open the crate. Now he could hear a faint buzzing that came from all around, the sound of the real termites. They were, after all, inside an enormous hive. He pulled up the lid of the crate, and the insect sound was lost behind the villagers' soft chanting. The high priests lifted the top sheets from the crates. These were color illustrations that would be inside-outside covers on normally bound editions. The color didn't show well in the candlelight, but the termiters didn't seem to mind. The best pictures from previous issues were mounted on the walls behind the altar. The priests pored over the illos, just like ordinary fans thrilled with the latest issue of their favorite magazine. Before, Ray would have smiled at their enthusiasm. Now he held his breath. At least one of those pictures showed Hrala carrying a spring gun. Could that be blasphemy? Then the tall priest looked up, and Ray saw that he was smiling. Wonderful, friend Gil. There is new insight here. We will pay double. The others were lifting manuscript galleys out of the crate and solemnly laying them on velvet reading stands. There couldn't be more than a handful of locals who knew Sprock. Did they preach from the stories? Ray let out a carefully controlled breath. It didn't matter now. The Tarul people had passed the test, and... Outside the hall, someone was shouting. The words were indistinct, but herdic. The priests straightened, listening. The shouts came louder. People were rushing up the steps to the hall's entrance. The barricade slid aside and Seraph's light shone on the arrivals. They were spear carriers from the pier. They rushed down the aisle, still shouting. Their leader was waving something over his head. Everyone was shouting now. Ray saw that Braley's men had slipped into a circle formation. Some of them were reaching into their jackets. Then the newcomer reached the altar, and one of the priests, the old one with the gimp leg, gave an incredible warbling scream. In an instant, all other cries ceased. He took two objects from the guard and held them close to the candles. Strange reflections shifted across his face and the ceiling. He was holding the main mirror and the diagonal bracket from Ray's telescope. How can he know what these are, much less think them blasphemous? The thought hung for an instant in Ray's mind, and then everything went crazy. The old man threw the mirror to the floor, then turned on the Tarul visitors and shouted in Herdic. No translation was needed. His face was contorted with hatred. Spearmen ran forward, weapons leveled. Braley tossed something onto the altar. There was an explosion and swirling gouts of choke smoke. Ray dived to the floor, tried to belly crawl out from under the choke. He heard Braley's men fighting their way toward the entrance. By the sound of it, they had some sort of weapons, strip knives probably. There were screams and ugly ripping sounds, all against a background of coughing and nausea. It sounded like all the villagers had thrown themselves into the fight. They could never get past such a mob. He had underestimated the printmaster. From out of the smoke and shouting came Braley's voice. Down! We're gonna blast! Ray tucked his head in his arms. A second later, there was a flash of light, and invisible hands crashed upon both sides of his head. He looked up. There was blue light ahead. Tounce had knocked the barricade over. Ray came to his knees. If he could move while the locals lay stunned, his poor ears couldn't hear the rumbling. It came through his knees and palms. All around them, the hive was shaking. He saw now that the pillars near the entrance had been smashed. Avalanches of mound stuff, first small, then engulfing, spilled down from above. With that, the tower collapsed on the great hall, and Ray saw no more. Consciousness returned in patches. They were unpleasant dreams. Something was banging his head. It wasn't the knock of his alarm clock. They were dragging him feet first, and his head was bouncing off uneven ground. The dream faded to pleasant grayness, then came back in a new form. He was rolling down a hillside, the rocks cutting into his body. Ray came to rest in foul-tasting water and wondered if he would drown before he woke up. Strong hands pulled him from the water. Through the ringing in his ears, he heard someone say, There, a moment of sitting to catch the breath. He coughed weakly and looked around. No more dreams. The nightmare was reality. 
He was sitting by a shallow pond near the bottom of a pit. The edge of the pit was ten yards above his head, except on one side where it broke low and gave a view of the harbor. He was not alone. There were dozens of people here, all that remained of the science crew. They clustered around the newly fallen. Looking up at their faces, Ray saw hope in some, fear and despair in others. You're looking bad. Can you talk? It was the woman who had pulled him from the pond. She was in her late fifties, an Austerlay by her accent. Her clothes were neat but stained. There was a matter-of-fact friendliness in her voice. In a moment, he would remember who she was. Yes, he croaked. What happened? The woman gave a short laugh. You tell us. Five minutes ago, it just started raining people. Looks like the termite folk have found new blasphemers. Ray swallowed. You're right. And it was his fault. Most of his companions were in worse shape than he. The science prisoners were trying to help, but two of the Tarul people looked freshly dead. Nowhere did he see Braley Towns. He glanced at the Austerlay woman and made a wan smile. We came to rescue you. He gave his captive audience a brief account of the sales landing. Everything was going fine. I was beginning to think they might listen to us, that we'd at least learn more about your situation. Then they found the mirror from my telescope. How could they know what it was, much less... He noticed the look on the woman's face. And how do you think we got in trouble, my sir? We thought to do some observing from the peaks inland. We had a twenty-inch mirror. The seraph seeing should be better here than... She broke off in surprise. Why, you're Ray Giel. Ray nodded, and she continued. So I don't have to tell you the details. You've written enough about the idea. I'm Jana Katz, seraphist at Bergenton. We met once a couple years back. She waved a hand as recognition slowly dawned on Ray. Anyway, we dragged that mirror ashore, gave the termiters a look. They thought it was great stuff till they learned what we wanted to look at. She laughed, but it was not a happy sound. Lots of religions worship Seraph. You know, home of the gods and such garbage. Turns out the termiters think Seraph is something like the god's bedroom, and mortals mustn't peep. So that was how they learned what the parts of a telescope look like. It still doesn't make sense, Ray said. In everything else, they seem to be ancestor worshippers. I've sold them dozens of interior fantasies. How did seraph idolatry get mixed in? The question brought a fit of coughing from the little man sitting beside Katz. I can answer that. The words were broken by more rasping coughs. The fellow's face seemed shrunken, collapsed. Ray wondered that he could talk at all. The termite folk are intellectual pack rats. For three hundred years they've been here, picking up a little of this, a little of that, from whoever was passing through. More coughing. I should have seen through them right off. I've spent my whole life studying coastal barbarians, learning herdic. But these folks are so secretive, I didn't understand what was driving them. Till it was too late. A smile twisted his thin face. I could get a nice research paper out of what we've learned here. Too bad we gotta die first. Regil had years of experience finding loopholes in impossible situations. On paper. Maybe we don't have to die. I never thought the termiters were killers. If their religion is such a hodgepodge, they can't take the taboos too seriously. You've been here for several days. Maybe they just want a graceful way out. It really made sense. Then he remembered Braley's bomb and continued more quietly. If there's anything they'd kill for, I think it would be what my people did to the village hall. You don't understand, fellow. A third science person spoke up, a sharp edge in his voice. Knocking over a termite mound is a peccadillo in their eyes, compared to invading the gods' privacy. They've kept us alive this long because they're having trouble devising a torture death appropriate to our crime. How can you know that for sure? 
We know, Master Giel. Janet Katz's tough exterior broke for an instant, and she looked just as frightened as the others. In the last two days, they've taken three of us from the pit. We could hear the screams. One we could see. Each took longer to die than the last. There was a moment of silence, and then the coffer said, I think the termiters are scared, too, of their seraph gods. If they can't come up with the proper death for us, they think the gods will apply that death to them. The three they killed were little experiments. But there will be no more. The toughness was back in Jana's voice. The next time they come, one big surprise we'll show them. We won't be scoats waiting for the slaughter. Ray looked up at the rim of the pit. There were termite folk all around. Most carried spears, but that wasn't the most deadly thing. Spears kill one at a time, make a slow thing of a massacre. Much more ominous were the priests carrying torches. They stood near the three petroleum vats Brayley had spotted earlier. Each tank was mounted on a crude swivel. Should they choose, the torchbearers could drown their prisoners in flame. A few hours before, that prospect had filled him with sympathetic dread. For Janna and the others, it had come to be the only imaginable out. The hours passed. At the top of the sky, Seraph widened toward full, its western ocean turning dark and reddish with the start of the midnight eclipse. The villagers marched steady patrols around the edge of the pit. Mostly they were silent. The sciences anthropologist said they had long ago stopped responding to his shouted questions. There were no more experiments, but Ray gradually realized the pit was in itself a killing place. The only water was in the shallow pool at the bottom of the pit, and that became steadily more foul. The only food was what the villagers threw into the pit, slabs of scoat cheese and balls of what turned out to be pressed termite larvae. Ray had eaten some exotic things in his years with Tarul, but the larva patties were half-rotted. Hungry as they were, only a few of the prisoners could keep them down. Three of the Tarul prisoners were dead, their bodies broken by the explosion. Two of the survivors had compound fractures. Their moans came less frequently with each passing hour. The prisoners were not alone in the pit. The true builders of the village were here, too. In the silence that dragged between conversations and occasional screaming, Ray heard a scritching sound coming from all directions. At the corner of his vision, a pebble would move. Something would scuttle from one hole to another. The termites were no bigger than a man's thumb, but there must be millions of them in the sides of the pit. They avoided the humans, but their activity was ceaseless. The sides of the pit were not ordinary earth. All the way down to the pool, this was mound stuff. It must be old, the detritus of thousands of years of towers, but it was still used by the tiny creatures. The stones in this soil must have washed down from the hills to the north. The coming of humans was a recent event in the hive's history. The towers of the village crowded around three sides of the pit, but beyond the broken southern lip they could see the harbor. The Tarul barge was less than a quarter mile out, Deck piled on deck, loading cranes sticking out in all directions, masts rising slim into the reddish-blue sky. The barge had never seemed so beautiful to Ray as now. Safety was just twelve hundred feet away. It might as well be the other side of Seraph. An hour earlier, a hydrofoil had arrived from the ocean and docked in a starboard slip. There was no other boat activity, though Ray fancied he saw motion on the bridge. Another meeting? And this time, a final decision to leave? Most of the prisoners huddled on the north slope of the depression. The corpses were carried to the other side of the pit. The prisoners were bright people. They had plenty of time to try to figure a way out, and no success in doing so. The arrival of Ray's group brought new hope, even though the rescue had been a failure. For an hour or two, there was renewed scheming. When it became clear that nothing had really changed, the talk gradually petered out. Many of the prisoners drifted back to inward-looking silence. There were exceptions. 
One thing Ray loved about scientists was their love for speculation. Take Treddy Beckyer, the little guy who spent the hours coughing his lungs out. Treddy was a sickly fellow who should never have been on the science expedition in the first place. He was an anthropologist, and the only captive who spoke fluent Hurtic. He might be dying, but between spasms of coughing, he argued about the origin and future of their captors. He predicted that no matter what the prisoner's fate, the ambush had doomed the termiter culture. Now, outsiders knew there was petroleum nearby. When that news got to the archipelagates, the termiter folk would have lots of visitors. Even if the locals were not booted off their land, they would be forced to make big changes. In thirty years, there would be a real city here. There were others like Treddy, folks who could walk through the gates of death still arguing about ideas. When the planning and the scheming was done, these few still had something to talk about. Ray found himself drawn in. Janet Katz was the most interesting. Before specializing in seraphy, she'd had lots of experience with other branches of astronomy. And you, Bergenton, had the best astronomers in the world, if you accepted the Duden fanatics on the other side of the world. Katz was just the sort of person he'd been hoping to talk to, back when he thought they'd find the science in one piece. For minutes at time, Ray could forget where he was and what his fate must be. Katz had had great plans for the Seraph Observatory. There should be good seeing from the mountains behind the harbor. Ground resolutions better than 100 yards would have been possible with a 20-inch mirror. The issue of intelligent life on Seraph might finally be resolved. Instead, the project had brought them all to this pit. Ray grunted. Other things are happening in astronomy, things that aren't so dangerous. There have been some fantastic discoveries at Krerzark. He described Pride of Iron and the spectroscopic observations it was based on. Can you imagine? With spectroscopy, we can know what things are like on planets around other stars. He sat back, waiting for Jenna's reaction to this news. It was one of the occasional pleasures of his job to be the first person in an entire archipelago to report a breakthrough. Jenna grinned back at him, but there was no surprise in her expression. Ha! Huh? That's one of the results the Yu Tsanart people sent west with science. During the last year, they've got good spectra on twenty stars in our sun's class. Every damn one of them is metal-rich. And we have other results, too. We can measure radial motions with this spectra stuff. She laughed at the expression on his face. You've written a lot of high-flown editorials about spectroscopy, key to the universe. Well, you may have understated the case. Combine the spectral shift data with proper motion studies, and it's obvious our solar system is an interloper, just passing through the local star stream. Outcast Star The title flashed through Ray's mind. There were writers who could run away with that idea, and surely would, if he got out of this alive. You know... It's almost as if someone were picking on the human race, he mused. Out of all the solar systems, that we should be the only low-metal one, the outsider. He didn't like the idea. It smacked of the theistic fantasy Cor Asquasenia so loved, humanity as doormat to the gods. You've got it backward, my sir. Ever hear of the anthropic principle? Most likely, intelligent life exists on two exactly because we are different from the others. Think what an abundance of metals would mean. It's not just a matter of wealth, millions of ounces of iron available for large-scale construction. My guess is such concentrations of metals would change the surface chemistry so much that life would never develop. Jenna's middle-aged features were filled with a happy smugness, but Ray did not feel put down. He was imagining deadly treasure house worlds. Or life might develop, but different than here. Why, there might be... Jenna abruptly grabbed his arm. She was looking past him, her expression intent. His speculations were suddenly of zero interest. There were scattered gasps from the prisoners. He turned and looked into the harbor. The barge had lowered a boat to the water. It glowed with white light, a jewel in the reddening dimness. Then he realized that Tarul had lit a flare at the focus of the bridge's signal mirror. 
its light fell dazzling on the boat, which was nothing more than a freight lander, painted silver and white. Before the flare guttered out, two more were lit at other mirrors. They tracked the boat as it started toward shore. The termiter priests were suddenly shouting. One group of spear carriers ran to the south side of the pit, while others moved to the pet vats and slid the covers aside. Priests dipped their torches into the vats, and the night exploded. The thunder went on and on, drowning the shouts of prisoners and villagers alike. Flame and smoke rose from the petroleum, swirls of red and black across the midnight eclipse. Hundreds of bats swarmed drunkenly in the superheated air, burning, falling. The stench of pet was everywhere. The termiters cowered back from the pyres they had created, but Ray saw a few priests near each, setting long poles against the sides of the vats. A few good pushes, and the prison pit would be wall-to-wall -wall fire. Some of the prisoners collapsed, their mouths open, eyes wide. They must be screaming. Beside him, Janet Katz had caught his arm in both her hands. Her eyes were clenched shut, her face averted from the fires. Something in Ray's mind retreated, and suddenly he wasn't frightened. He wasn't brave. He simply couldn't grasp the reality of his imminent torchhood. He looked back to the harbor. The firing of the vats hadn't stopped the boat. It floated serenely toward them, still lit by the barge's flares. He strained to see what it was carrying. The oarsmen wore black robes, their faces hidden within deep cowls. These weren't Tarul uniforms, yet they were somehow familiar. There was only one other person on the boat. She stood at the bow, scorning all support. Her clothes were white and silver, gleaming in the faraway spotlights. Black hair cascaded around her face and shoulders. Now Ray understood this latest rescue attempt. He damned and thanked Kor all at once for trying. Tarul doused the flares the instant the lighter touched shore. In the roaring red dimness, the figure on the boat was a vague thing. She did something to her robes, and suddenly was near naked, and incredibly female. When she swung over the railing, red silver glinted from her breasts and thighs. The oarsmen followed, clumsy black beetles by comparison. They started up the hillside, and were lost to raise view beyond the south side of the pit. But not lost to the termiters. The spear carriers hadn't moved, but every face was turned toward the approaching party. The priests by the fire vats had dropped their poles and stared in shock. Jenna's grip loosened. She tried to ask him something, but even shouting mouth to ear, she couldn't talk over the flame roar. Ray could only point to the rim of the pit. A minute passed. Villagers at the southeast corner of the pit backed away, and the newcomers appeared. By the light, what a job Kor had done. It was strange to see in the middle of terrible, deadly reality, the incarnation of a hundred fantasies. This was Hrala, complete with a contingent of the Sibhud Sinistra. The Sibhud followed Hrala through most of the stories. Their motives were beyond knowing, but seemed more evil than not. Sometimes they were Hrala's deadliest enemies, sometimes her allies. When they were her allies, the rest of the world better watch out. The black-cowled figures hung silently behind her, looking a dozen times more deadly than any termite or priests. The fraud would have been nothing without its central character. Tatya Grimm had come to Tarul an outsized waif. The makeup people had transformed her. Black hair lapped smooth down to her waist, a perfect copy of all the illustrations. Her body was evenly tanned, though all she wore was ribbon armor, and that only around her hips and breasts. If he hadn't seen the girl before, Ray never would have guessed that bosom was faked. She carried the blade named Death. Crafted of magic metal, edged with diamonds, it was a living creature and one of Hrala's earliest conquests. Without her control, it would take up its original mission to corrupt the powerful and scourge the continent. In fact, the prop was carved from puffwood painted silver and edged with quartz. Any sharp blow would shatter it. Tatya Grimm walked forward, death's flat resting on her shoulder, as though it weighed pounds and not ounces. 
Kor had coached her well. Every motion was fluid, arrogant. She walked straight to a high point on the pit's rim. For a long moment, she surveyed the flaming vats and the priests. Not once did she look at the spear carriers. The villagers stared back, eyes wide. Ray could see the fear mounting in them. Abruptly, Krala's hand flashed out. She pointed at the vats and clenched her fist. The barbarian princess wanted those fires out. The termiter priests scrambled to push the lids back onto the vats. Flames burst sideways, searing the priests. But one by one, the lids were forced into place. There were scattered explosions. One of the vats trembled in its cradle. Then a great silence replaced the violence. For a long moment, everyone listened to the ringing in their ears. Ray couldn't believe his eyes or ears. Did the termiter priests actually believe the stories? Of course, the instant the girl opened her mouth, the illusion would be broken. The grim girl turned, gestured the chief Sib to stand close behind her. The cowled figure slid forward, servile and sneaky at the same time. That must be Coronadas Asquasenya. She might just be close enough to prompt the girl. There was a hissing conversation between the two, broken off by an imperious gesture from the princess. She looked back at the termiters and finally spoke. The words rattled fast, diamond hard. They were not Sprock. Treddy Beckyer gasped. He crawled the few feet that separated him from Ray. That's Herdick. Jenna and Ray dropped to their knees beside him. What's she saying? Beckyer listened a moment more. Hard to follow. She speaks a deep interior dialect. I've only heard it a couple times. He choked back a coughing spasm. Says she's angry as the hot pits of the earth. Termiters have no business holding her property, prey. She means us in any case. She demands reparations, replacements for the dead, and... Dreddy laughed and coughed at the same time. And the return of the survivors. The sharp-voiced speech ended. The barbarian princess stood waiting a reply. Death twitched in her hand, impatient to forego these diplomatic niceties. A voice came from the priests. After a second, Ray recognized it as belonging to the tall termiter. The words were tentative and quavery, totally lacking the menace Tatya Hrala put into hers. Treddy continued his translation. Local guy is explaining our blasphemy. In case you can't tell, he's practically wetting his pants. If he doesn't punish us, the high gods will torture kill his people. And now Hrala is threatening to skewer his guts if he doesn't let us go. He's caught between two dooms. Krala had a reply. She swung death from her shoulder and thrust it skyward. The fake metal gleamed red silver, diamonds glittering. Her speech was as angry and decisive as before. Treddy's translation consisted of a single soft-spoken, Wow. Jenna punched his shoulder, and the little anthropologist remembered his listeners. Whoever she is, she's wonderful. She told the termiter to remember his place that he's too low in the scheme of things to presume upon the high god's vengeance. I can't translate it any better. She packed a freightload of hauteur into a couple sentences. She's telling him if her property is offensive, then that's something between Hrala and the gods. Ray Gill looked from Tatya Grimm to the clustered priests. Hope was a sudden, wonderful thing, Every state religion he'd ever seen had a core of hypocrisy. That was why he'd been against bringing Hrala ashore. He knew the priests would never accept their theology suddenly incarnate. But Kor and the Grim Girl had taken the risk, and now, incredibly, the plan was working. For several minutes, the priests had no reply. They stood in a tight group, speaking in low voices. Around them, the spear carriers held their weapons loosely their eyes never leaving Tatya Grimm. From beyond the rim, an anonymous voice called Hrala. After a moment, 
one of the spear carriers repeated, Hurrah, la! The word was passed back and forth among the low ranking termiters. They pronounced the guttural H with a force and precision that made Ray wince. Hra la, hra la, hra la, hra la. The chant spread around the pit, a soft drumbeat. One of the priests shouted, the chant stumbled, guttered out. After a moment, the priest continued. His voice was placating, but without the quavering fear of before. New guy, said Treddy. He's talking humble, sweet as sugar. Says that for sure Hrala's claim takes precedence over theirs, but... Treddy sucked in a breath. Bastard! He says in dealing with beings so deadly as the high gods, his people need at least to go through the motions of verifying Hrala's identity. Another priest spoke up, his voice high-pitched and not nearly as confident as the first. A mere formality, the second jerk says. So what's the formality, Treddy? Jenna all but shook the little man. Beckyer listened a second longer, then caught back a sob. Nothing much. A little trial by combat. Ray's eyes stayed on Tatya Grimm all through this speech. She didn't flinch. If anything, she stood taller now her chin raised at the impudence of the request. No amount of coaching could have taught her to do that. The girl was as gutsy as anyone he'd ever known. When the priest finished, her reply was immediate, a sharp three syllables filled with anger and arrogance. Certainly, she says, Beckyer translated unnecessarily. And Ray's hope fled as quickly as it had come. The girl looked down at death, and for an instant he saw the gawky youngster who had come aboard to rule just a few days before. She wasn't afraid, just uncertain, feeling her way in a strange situation. The puffwood sword was a magnificent bluff, but they were beyond bluffs now. It couldn't cut butter, and it would shatter at the first blow. The girl gestured imperiously at the chief sib, the one who must be Coronadas Asquasenya. The Sib slid forward and spoke hissingly into Hrala's ear. The rescue party was about out of options. No doubt they were heavily armed. If they acted quickly, while the tattered bluff had some credibility, they could probably fight their way back to the landing boat and at least save themselves. Hrala listened to the Sib for a moment, then interrupted. The two were arguing. It was consistent with all the stories, but why now? Kor's hissing broke into full voice for an instant, and suddenly he realized this was no sham. Krala shook her head abruptly and handed her sword to the Sib. Kor sank beneath the pretended weight of death. She didn't have much choice now. She slunk back to the other Sibs, her fear obvious, but suddenly in character. She held death in her hands. As a Sib Sinistra, she could not be perverted by it. The Sibhood was already pretty perverse. But possessing death and being possessed by it were very close things. It was a theme Ray had insinuated into the series himself. Krala turned back to the Termiter priests. She was smiling, and the anger was gone from her words. Mocking arrogance remained. Say she's happy to fight, but it's no... Fun, wasting death on such easy prey as the termiters. She'll fight with whatever weapons her opponent chooses. That almost started the chant again. The priests shouted it down, and after a moment one of them carried a sword club toward Hrala Tatya. This fellow was no fighter, just an errand boy. He laid the club on the ground, ten feet from the girl, then scuttled back to safety. Prala let him depart, then stepped from the high ground to inspect the weapon. If she's from deep inland, she's never seen a sword club, said Treddy. Spears and pikes are all the inlanders have. Even on the coast, it's a ceremonial weapon. This one was clearly for special occasions. The wood was polished, unmarred. Without metals or composite materials, true swords were impossible. It looked deadly all the same. 
In overall shape, it was something between a club and a pike. Elaborate hooks and blades of bone or obsidian were set along its length. There was a spike of glassy blackness at one end and a hilt at the other. A second grip was set halfway down the pole. Perhaps the thing could be used like a quarterstaff. Krala Tatya picked it up, clearly as mystified as Ray. Somehow the puzzlement didn't take her out of character. She smiled her curiosity, seeming to say, How interesting, how clever. He couldn't tell if she were acting or if this were the same frank wonderment he'd seen in her before. She swung it through a couple of clean arcs, then paused, glanced hesitantly at Kor and the others. Ray understood. This was her last chance to cut and run. Kor started toward her, but the girl turned away and shouted at the priests. He says she's ready. Ray scarcely realized he was holding his breath. The girl could win. The spear carriers were already sold on the fraud. None of them could fight effectively. The more cynical priests weren't fooled, but they were exactly the sort that let others do their fighting. Who did that leave? Mental subnormals too stupid to be afraid? The crowd of priests parted, and someone very broad and heavy started up the incline toward Tatya Grimm. The man's gait was slow, almost shambling. Even from here, Ray could see the dullness in his features. Thank the light. Then he saw the second one. They were nearly identical, giant, stupid, and armed. They carried their sword clubs before them, both as threat and shield. Each was dressed in heavy leather. It was primitive armor, but at least real. Tatya Grimm was virtually naked. What armor she wore, a gaudy fake. Together they outweighed her three to one. The two separated as they approached the girl. They stopped ten feet from her, and for a moment the combatants stared at each other. Ray thought he saw traces of anxiety in the dullard's manner. You'd have to be a vegetable to ignore the mood of the villagers and the deadly confidence that came from the enemy. Twenty years of fantasy collided with reality tonight, and for an instant the fantasy seemed the truer vision. The scene would have made a perfect cover painting. Prala standing straight and fearless before a pair of subhuman attackers, a city of towers spreading on and on behind her. The last blue had disappeared from Seraph's eastern ocean. The disk shaded from brighter reds to darker. The cloud of tarry smoke from the pet's vats still hung in the air, roiling Seraph's continents out of all recognition. Everything. Towers, prisoners, priests, fighters, was lit with shifting reds. It was the color of blood. Hrala's color, the background color of her most chilling battles. A priest shouted at the swordsman, and the moment passed. They came in from opposite sides, their bladed clubs swinging. The girl grabbed her club at the hilt and foregrip and whirled between them. They were slow, and Tatya Grimm was terribly quick. That could only save her from quick death. She danced backwards up the rise. She used the club like a staff, blocking. Blade fragments flew from every blow. She bounded three great steps back and moved both hands to the hilt of the club. She swung it in a quick sweep, her greater reach keeping the two back, till they separated again and came at her from the sides. Even so, she wasn't retreating now. She learns very fast, Treddy said to no one in particular. But some lessons are learned the hard way. The bladed hooks were good for more than terror and disemboweling. One of her parries brought a crashing halt. Her club had locked with the attackers. The swordsman raised his club, swinging her slender body against him. Tatya kicked and kneed him. Even in his armor, the fellow staggered beneath the blows. The second attacker ran forward, rammed the point of his club squarely at the girl's torso. Somehow she sensed the attack and threw herself backwards. The impaling thrust was turned into a deep slash across her chest. She hit the ground and bounced instantly to her feet. For a moment, the action stopped and the antagonists stared at each other, shocked. In the smoky red dimness, details were vague. Yet the fake bosom still seemed to be in place. Everyone could see that the armor around her chest had been slashed open. Everyone could see the ripping wound across her breasts. Everyone could see that Hrala did not bleed. The second swordsman stepped backwards and whimpered. 
His tiny brain finally realized that he should be terrified. He dropped his club and ran from both priests and Hrala. The first fellow didn't seem to notice. He flipped Hrala's club over his head and advanced on her. She didn't retreat, didn't try to rush around him to the discarded clubs. She stood with knees slightly bent, hands held open. Only when the bladed club swung toward her middle did she move, and then it was too fast for Ray to follow. Somehow she caught the foregrip of the club, used it as a brace to swing her body up and ram her foot into the other's throat. The blow jarred the club loose, and the two fell in an apparently random tangle. But only one combatant rose from that fall. The other lay twitching, the point of a sword club struck through his skull. The girl stared at the dying man. A look that might have been horror passed across her face. Her arms and shoulders were shaking. Suddenly she straightened and stepped back. When she looked at the priests, haughty pride was back in her features. Hrala, 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 the chant began again. This time, no priest dared shout it down. Coronada Sasquasenya had plenty of contact with the rescued during the next few days. Some recovered from the horror better than others. Jana Katz could laugh with good humor within ten hours of the rescue. The little anthropologist, Treddy Beckyer, was almost as cool, though it would be some time before his body recovered. But four days out from the village, some of the science people were still starting at shadows, crying without provocation, and for every survivor there would always be nightmares. Kor had never considered herself especially brave, but she hadn't been trapped in that pit. She hadn't seen friends torture murdered. Once they returned to the barge, and the village was irrevocably behind them, it was easy to put the terror from her mind. She could enjoy the welcoming back, the honor given her and Ray Giel and Braley Towns, the greater honor given Tatya Grimm. It was as close to a storybook ending as could be imagined. Thirty-six from the science had died, but nearly one hundred had survived the adventure and would return with the barge, much to the surprise of their sponsoring universities, who hadn't expected to see them for two years. When Tarul sailed into the Austerles, and later the Tsanarts, everyone would be instant celebrities. It would be the story of the decade, and an immensely profitable affair for the Tarul Publishing Company. Whatever their normal job slot, every literate participant in the rescue had been ordered to write an account of the operation. There was talk of starting a whole new magazine to report such true adventures. And management seemed to think that Kor and Ray had masterminded this publishing coup. After all, he had suggested the landing, she had produced Tatya Hrala. Kor knew how much this bothered Ray. He had tried to convince Vector Ramsey that he had fallen into things without the least commercial savvy. Of course, Ramsey knew that, but he wasn't about to let Ray wriggle free. So Giel was stuck with producing the centerpiece account of the rescue. Don't worry about it, boss. They don't want the truth. She and the fantasy editor were standing at the railing of the top editorial deck. Except for the masts and Jespin Tarul's penthouse, this was as high as you could get on the barge. It was one of Kor's favorite places. A third of the barge's decks were visible from here, and the view of the horizon was not blocked by rigging and sails. It was early, and the morning bustle had not begun. A cold, salt wind came steadily from the east. That air was so clean, not a trace of tarry smoke. White tops showed across miles of ocean. Nowhere was there sign of land. It was hard to imagine any place farther from the village of the termite people. Ray didn't answer immediately. He was watching something on the print deck. He drew his jacket close and looked at her. It doesn't matter. We can write the truth. They won't understand. Anyone who wasn't there won't understand. Kor had been there. She did understand, but wished she didn't. Ray turned back to watch the print deck, and Kor saw the object of his interest. The man wore ordinary fatigues. He wandered slowly along the outer balcony of the deck. He was either lonely or bored, or fascinated by every detail of the railing and deck. Kor suspected the fellow wasn't bored. 
part of the Hrala fraud had been the demand that the termiters replace her damaged property, the dead from Braley's party and the science. It seemed unwise to retract the demand completely, so five unfortunate villagers were taken aboard. This was one of them. He had been a termiter priest, their spokesman interpreter. Kor had talked to him several times since the rescue. He made very good copy. He turned out to be a real innocent, not one of the maniacs or hardcore cynics. In fact, he had fallen from favor when the cynics pushed for trial by combat. He had never left the village before. All his sprock came from reading magazines and talking to travelers. What had first seemed a terrible punishment was now turning out to be the experience of his lifetime. The guy's a natural scholar, boss. We dropped the others off at the first hospitable landing. But I hope he wants to stay. If he could learn about civilization, return home in a year or so, he could do his people a lot of good. They'll need to understand the outside world when the petroleum hunters come. Ray wasn't paying attention. He pointed further down the deck. It was Tatya Grimm. She was looking across the sea, her tall form slumped so her elbows rested on the railing and her hands cupped her chin. The ex-priest must have seen her at that instant. He came to an abrupt halt, and his whole body seemed to shiver. Does he know? Ray shook his head. I think he does now. In many ways, the girl was different from that night in the village. Her hair was short and red. Without the fake bust, she was a skinny pre-teener, and by her bearing, a discouraged one. But she was nearly six feet tall, and her face was something you would never forget after that night. The priest walked slowly toward her, every step a struggle. His hands grasped the railing like a lifeline. Then the girl glanced at him, and for an instant it seemed the termiter would run off. Instead. He bowed, and they talked. From up on the editorial deck, Kor couldn't hear a word. Besides, they were probably speaking Herdic. It didn't matter. She could imagine the conversation. They were an odd combination. The priest, sometimes shaking, sometimes bowing. His life's beliefs being shot from under him. The girl, still slouched against the railing, paying more attention to the sea than to the conversation. Even during the welcoming back she had been like this. The praise had left her untouched. Her listless replies had come from far away, punctuated by an occasional calculating look that Kor found more unsettling than the apathy. After several minutes, the priest gave a final bow and walked away. Only now he didn't need the railing. Kor wondered what it must be like to suddenly learn that supernatural fears were unnecessary. For herself, the turn of belief was in the opposite direction. Ray said, There's a rational explanation for Tatya Grimm. For years, we've been buying contrivance fiction about alien invaders. We were just too blind to see that it's finally happened. A visitor from the stars, eh? Kor smiled weakly. Well, do you have a better explanation? No. But Kor knew Tatya well enough to believe her story. She really was from the interior. Her tribe's only weapons were spears and hand axes. Their greatest technical skill was sniffing out seasonal springs. She'd run away when she was eight. She moved from tribe to tribe, always toward the more advanced ones. She never found what she was looking for. She's a very quick learner. Yeah, a quick learner. Treddy Becker said that, too. It's the key to everything. I should have caught on the minute I heard how Jimmy found her praying to the noontime shadow of her quarterstaff. There she had reproduced one of the great experiments of all time, and I put it down to religion. You're right. There's no way she could be from an advanced civilization. She didn't recognize my telescope. The whole idea of magnification was novel to her. Yet she understood the principle as soon as she saw the mirror. Kor looked down at the print deck, at the girl who seemed so sad and ordinary. 
There had been a time when Kor felt the start of friendship with the girl. It could never be. Tatya Grimm was like a hydrofoil first seen far astern. For a while, she had been insignificant, struggling past obstacles Kor scarcely remembered. Then she pulled even. Kor remembered the last day of rehearsals. Sympathy had chilled and turned to awe, as Kor realized just how fast Tatya was moving. In the future, she would sweep into a faraway Coronadas Asquasenya could never imagine. And now she understands us and knows we are just as dumb as all the others. Ray nodded uncertainly. I think so. At first she was triumphant. Our toys are so much nicer than any tribe's. Then she realized they were the product of centuries of slow invention. She can search the whole world now, but she won't find anything better. So here she must stop and make the best of things. I, I really do have a theory, boss. Those old stories of fate and gods, the ones you're so down on, if they were true, she would fit right in, a godling who is just awakened. When she understands this and sees her place in the world, she talked to me after the welcoming back. Her sprach is good now. There was no mistaking her meaning. She thanked me for the hrala coaching. She thanked me for showing her the power of fraud, for showing her that people can be used as easy as any other tool. For a long while, Ray had no response. Fast Times at Fairmont High The last story in this collection has not been published before. In fact, I just finished it, August 2001. Fast Times at Fairmont High is intended as a fairly conservative look at our near future. I hope to build it out to novel length eventually. Juan kept the little blue pills in an unseen corner of his bedroom. They really were tiny, the custom creation of a lab that saw no need for inert fillers or handsome packaging. And Juan was pretty sure they were blue, except that as a matter of principle he tried not to look at them, even when he was offline. Just one pill a week gave him the edge he needed. Final exam week was always chaos at Fairmont Junior High, the school's motto was, trying hard not to become obsolete, and the kids figured that applied to the faculty more than anyone else. This semester, they got through the first morning, Ms. Wilson's math exam, without a hitch. But already in the afternoon, the staff was tweaking things around. Principal Alcalde scheduled a physical assembly during what should have been student prep time. Almost all the eighth grade was piled into the creaky wooden meeting hall, once this place had been used for horse shows. Juan thought he could still smell something of that. Tiny windows looked out on the hills surrounding the campus. Sunlight spiked down through vents and skylights. In some ways, the room was weird even without enhancement. Principal Alcalde marched in, looking as dire and driven as ever. He gestured to his audience, requesting visual consensus. In Juan's eyes, the room lighting mellowed and the deepest shadows disappeared. Bet you the alcalde is going to call off the nakedness exam. Bertie Todd was grinning the way he did when someone else had a problem. I hear there are parents with big objections. You got a bet, said Juan. You know how Mr. Alcalde is about nakedness. Heh, <laughs> true. Bertie's image slouched back in the chair next to Juan. Principal Alcalde was into a long speech about the fast-changing world and the need for Fairmont to revolutionize itself from semester to semester. At the same time, they must never forget the central role of modern education, which was to teach the kids how to learn, how to pose questions, how to be adaptable, all without losing their moral compass. It was very old stuff. Juan listened with a small part of his attention. Mostly, he was looking around the audience. This was a physical assembly, so almost everybody except Bertie Todd was really here. Bertie was remote from Chicago, one of the few commuter students. His parents paid a lot more for virtual enrollment, but Fairmont schools did have a good reputation. Of the truly present, 
well, the fresh 13-year-old faces were mostly real. Mr. Alcalde's consensus imagery didn't allow cosmetics or faked clothes, and yet such rules could not be perfectly enforced. Juan widened his vision, allowed deviations and defacements in the view. There couldn't be too much of that, or the alcalde would have thrown a fit, but there were ghosts and graffiti floating around the room. The scaredy-cat ones flickered on and off in a fraction of a second, or were super-subtle perversions. But some of them, the two-headed phantom that danced behind the principal's podium, lasted gloating seconds. Mr. Alcalde could probably see some of the japery, but his rule seemed to be that as long as the students didn't appear to see the disrespect, then he wouldn't either. Okay, platitudes taken care of, Mr. Alcalde got down to business. This morning, you did the math exam. Most of you have already received your grades. Ms. Wilson tells me that she's pleased with your work. The results will make only small changes in the rest of this week's schedule. Tomorrow morning will be the vocational exam. Oh, yeah. Be ready to learn something dull, but learn it very, very fast. Most kids hated that, but with the little blue pills, Juan knew he could whack it. Soon you'll begin the two concurrent exams. You'll have the rest of finals week to work on them. I'll make the details public later in this assembly. In general terms, there will be an unlimited exam where you may use any legally available resources. All right, Bertie's voice came softly in Juan's ear. All across the hall, similar sentiments were expressed, a kind of communal sigh. Mr. Alcalde's dark features creased in a rare smile. That just means we expect something extraordinarily good from you. To pass the exam, a team had to bring in three times tuition per team member. So even though they could use any help they could recruit, most students didn't have the money to buy their way to a passing grade. The two concurrent exams will overlap the usual testing in visual communication, language, and unaided skills. Some of your parents have asked for more concurrency, but all the teachers feel that when you're 13 years old, it's better to concentrate on doing a few things well. You'll have plenty of time for jumble lore in the future. Your other concurrent exam will be... Miss Washington? Patsy Washington came to her feet, and Juan realized that she, like Bertie, was only present as imagery. Patsy was a San Diego student, so she had no business being virtual at a physical assembly. Hmm. Look, she said, before you go on about these concurrent exams, I want to ask you about the naked skills test. Bertie gave Juan a grin. This should be interesting. The alcalde's gaze was impassive. The unaided skills test, Miss Washington. There is nothing whatsoever naked about it. It might as well be, mister. Patsy was speaking in English now, and with none of the light mocking tone that made her a minor queen in her clique. It was her image and voice, but the words and body language were very un-Patsy. Juan probed the external network traffic. There was lots of it, but mostly simple query-response stuff like you'd expect, a few sessions had been around for dozens of seconds. Bertie's remote was one of the two oldest. The other belonged to Patsy Washington. At least it was tagged with her personal certificate. Identity hijacking was a major no-no at Fairmont, but if a parent was behind it, there wasn't much the school could do. And Juan had met Patsy's father. Maybe it was just as well the alcalde didn't have to talk to him in person. Patsy's image leaned clumsily through the chair in front of her. In fact, she continued, it's worse than naked. All their lives, these... We have had civilization around us. We're damned good at using that civilization. Now you theory-minded intellectuals figure it would be nice to jerk it all away and put us at risk. We are putting no one at risk, Miss Washington. Mr. Alcalde was still speaking in Spanish. In fact, Spanish was the only language their principal had ever been heard to speak. The alcalde was kind of a bizarre guy. We at Fairmont consider unaided skills to be the ultimate fallback protection. 
We're not Amish here, but we believe that every human being should be able to survive in reasonable environments, without networks, even without computers. Next you'll be teaching rock chipping, said Patsy. The alcalde ignored the interruption. Our graduates must be capable of doing well in outages, even in disasters. If they can't, we have not properly educated them. He paused, glared all around the room. But this is no survivalist school. We're not dropping you into a jungle. Your unaided skills test will be at a safe location our faculty have chosen. Perhaps an Amish town, perhaps an obsolete suburb. Either way, you'll be doing good in a safe environment. You may be surprised at the insights you get with such complete, old-fashioned simplicity. Patsy had crossed her arms and was glaring back at the alcalde. That's nonsense, but okay. There's still the question. Your school brochure brags modern skills, and these concurrent exams are supposed to demonstrate that you've delivered. So how can you call an exam concurrent if part of the time your students are stripped of all technology, huh? Mr. Alcalde stared at Patsy for a moment, his fingers tapping on the podium. Juan had the feeling that some intense discussion was going on between them. Patsy's pa, assuming that's who it was, had gone considerably beyond the limits of acceptable behavior. Finally, the principal shook his head. You mistake our use of the word concurrent. We don't mean that all team members work at the same time all the time, but simply that they multitask the exam in the midst of their other activities, just as people do with most real-world work nowadays. He shrugged. In any case, you are free to skip the final examinations and take your transcript elsewhere. Patsy's image gave a little nod and abruptly sat down, looking very embarrassed. Evidently her pa had passed control back to her. Now that he had used her image and made a fool of her, jeez. Bertie looked faintly miffed, though Juan doubted this had anything to do with sympathy for Patsy. After a moment, Mr. Alcalde continued. Perhaps this is a good time to bring up the subject of body piercings and drugs. He gave a long look all around. It seemed to Juan that his gaze hung an instant in his direction. Caray, he suspects about the pills. As you know, all forms of body piercings are forbidden at Fairmont schools. When you're grown, you can decide for yourself. But while you are here, no piercings, not even ear or eye rings, are allowed. And internal piercings are grounds for immediate dismissal. Even if you are very frightened of the unaided skills test, do not try to fool us with implants or drugs. No one raised a question about this, but Juan could see the flicker of communications lasers glinting off dust in the air, muttered conversation and private imagery being exchanged. The alcalde ignored it all. Let me describe the second of the concurrent exams, and then you'll be free to go. We call this exam a local project. You may use your own computing resources and even a local network. However, your team members must work physically together. Remote presence is not allowed. External support, contact with the global net, is not permitted. Damn, said Bertie, totally dipped. Of all the artificial, unworkable, idiotic... So we can't collaborate, Bertie. We'll see about that. Bertie bounced to his feet and waved for recognition. Uh, Mr. Todd? Yes, sir. Bertie's public voice was meek and agreeable. As you know, I'm a commuter student. I have lots of friends here, people I know as well as anyone. But of course, almost none of that is face to face since I live in Chicago. How can we handle my situation? I'd really hate to be excused from this important part of the finals just because I lack a physical presence here in San Diego. I'd be happy to accept a limited link and do my best even with that handicap. Mr. Alcalde nodded. There will be no need, Mr. Todd. 
You are at a disadvantage, and we'll take that into account. We've negotiated a collaboration with the Anderson Academy at St. Charles. They will... Anderson Academy at St. Charles? Oh, in Illinois, a short automobile drive for Bertie. The Anderson people had long experience with team projects. Back into prehistory, in fact, the 20th century. In principle, they were far superior to Fairmont, but their academy was really more like a senior high school. Their students were 17, 18 years old. Poor Bertie. Juan picked up the thread of Mr. Alcalde's speech. They will be happy to accommodate you. Glimmer of a smile. In fact, I think they are very interested in learning what our better students can do. Bertie's face twisted into a taut smile, and his image dropped back onto the chair beside Juan. He made no additional comment, not even privately to Juan. The rest of the assembly was mostly about changes in exam content, mainly caused by the current state of outside resources, experts and technologies, that the school was importing for the non-concurrent exams. All of it could have been done without this assembly. The alcalde just had this thing about face-to-face -face meetings. Juan filed away all the announcements and changes, and concentrated on the unhappy possibility that now loomed over his week. Bertie Todd had been his best friend for almost two semesters now. Mostly, he was super fun and an amazing team partner. But sometimes, he'd go into a tight-lipped rage, often about things that Juan had no control over, like now. If this were one of Bertie's great freeze-outs, he might not talk to Juan at all. For days. The eighth-grade mob broke out of the assembly just before 4 p.m., way past the end of the normal class day. The kids milled about on the lawn outside the meeting hall. It was so near the end of the semester. There was warm sunlight. Summer and the new movie game season were just a few days off. But, carré, there were still finals to get through, and everyone knew that, too. So, while they joked and gossiped and goofed around, they were also reading the exam changes and doing some heavy planning. Juan tagged along behind Bertie Todd's image as the other moved through the crowd. Bertie was dropping hints all around about the unlimited project he was planning. The communication link from Bertie to Juan was filled with cold silence but he was being all charming toward kids who'd never helped him a tenth as much as Juan Orozco. Juan could hear part of what was going on. The other boys weren't freezing him out. They thought Juan was part of the party, and most of them were more than pleased by Bertie's interest. For no holds barred collaboration, Bertram Todd was the best there was at Fairmont Junior High. Bertie was claiming high level contacts, maybe with Intel's idea farm, maybe with software co-ops in China. He had something for everyone, and a hint that they might score far more than a good grade. Some of them even asked Juan for details. They just assumed that he was already part of Bertie's scheme for the unlimited. Juan smiled weakly and tried to seem knowing and secretive. Bertie stopped at the corner of the lawn where the junior high abutted the driveway and the elementary school, the eighth graders carefully kept off the little kids' territory. You don't mess with fifth graders. Along the driveway, cars were pulling up for students. Down by the bike stand, others were departing on bikes and unicycles. Everyone seemed to be laughing and talking and planning. At the corner of the lawn, Juan and Bertie were all alone for a moment. In fact, it was Juan all alone. For an instant, he considered turning off the consensus that made Bertie seem so visibly here. Carré, why not turn it all off? There. The sun was still bright and warm, the day still full of springtime. Bertie was gone, but there was still the other kids, mainly down by the bike stand. Of course, now the fancy towers of Fairmont School were the ordinary wood buildings of the old horse yard and the plascrete of the new school, all brown and gray against the tans and greens of the hills around. But he hadn't bothered to down the audio link, and out of the thin air there was Bertie's voice, finally acknowledging Juan's existence. So, have you decided who you're going to team with for the local project? The question shocked Juan into bringing back full imagery. Bertie had turned back to face him and was grinning with good humor, 
a gaze that might have fooled anyone who didn't really know him. Look, Bertie, I'm really sorry you can't be on a local team out here. Mr. Alcalde is a mother for sticking you with the Anderson crowd, but... Inspiration struck. You could fly out here for the exam. See, you could stay at my house. We'd whack that local exam dead. Suddenly a big problem was a great opportunity. If I can just sell Ma on this. But Bertie dismissed the idea with an offhand wave. Hey, don't worry about it. I can put up with those Anderson guys. And in the meantime, I bet I can help you with the local exam. His face took on a sly look. You know what I got on Wilson's math exam? Yeah, an A. That's great. You got all ten questions. Ten questions, most of them harder than the old Putnam exam problems had ever been. And in Ms. Wilson's exam, you weren't allowed to collaborate or search beyond the classroom. One had gotten a C-plus, knocking down four of the questions. The little blue pills didn't help much with pure math, but it was kind of neat how all Ms. Wilson's talk about heuristics and symbol software finally paid off. Those problems would have stumped some of the smartest 20th century students, but with the right kind of practice and good software, even an ordinary kid like Juan Orozco had a good chance of solving them. Two Fairmont students had cracked all ten problems. Bertie's grin broadened, a morph that stretched his face into a cartoonish leer. Juan knew that Bertie Todd was a dud at abstract problem solving. It was in getting the right answers out of other people that he was a star. Oh, you slipped out of isolation. That wouldn't be hard to do, considering that Bertie was already coming in from outside. I would never say that, Juan, my boy. But if I did, and I didn't get caught, wouldn't that just prove that all this isolated skill stuff is academic crap? I, I guess, said Juan. In some ways, Bertie had unusual notions about right and wrong. But it would be more fun if you could just come out here to San Diego. Bertie's smile faded a fraction. The great freeze-out could be reinstated in an instant. Juan shrugged and tried to pretend that his invitation had never been made. Okay, but can I still be on your unlimited team? Ah, uh, let's see how things work out. We've got at least 12 hours before the unlimited team selections have to be final, right? I think it's more important that you get yourself a good start on the local team exercise. Juan should have seen it coming. Bertie was Mr. Quid Pro Quo, only sometimes it took a while to figure out what he was demanding. So who do you think I should be matching up with? Hopefully someone dumb enough that they wouldn't guess Juan's special edge. The Rackhams are good, and we have complementary skills. Bertie looked judicious. Don and Brad are okay, but you've read the grading spec. Part of your score on the local test depends on face-to-face -face cooperation with someone really different. He made as though he was looking across the campus lawn. Juan turned to follow his gaze. There was some kind of soccer variant being played beyond the assembly hall, senior high students who wouldn't have finals for another two weeks. There were still a few clumps of junior high kids, probably planning for the locals. None of them were people Juan knew well. Look over by the main entrance, said Bertie. I'm thinking you should break out of narrow thinking. I'm thinking you should ask Miriam Goo. I caray. Goo? Miss stuck up perfection. Yes, come on. See, she's already noticed you. But, in fact, Goo and her friends were looking in their direction. Look, Juan, I've collaborated with all sorts, from intel engineers in geriatric homes to full-time members of Pratchett Belief Circles. If I can do that, you... But that's all virtual. I can't work face to face with... Bertie was already urging him across the lawn. View it as a test of whether you belong on my unlimited team. Miri Goo doesn't have your, uh, quickness with interfaces. He looked significantly at Juan. But I've been watching her. She maxed Ms. Wilson's exam, and I don't think she cheated to do it. She's a whiz at languages. Yes, she's just as much of a snob as you think. <laughs> Even her friends don't really like her. But she has no special reason to be hostile, Juan. 
After all, you're no boyo. You're a well-socialized, career-oriented student. Just the sort she knows she should like. And see, she's walking this way. True enough, though Gu and company were walking even more slowly than Juan. Yeah, and she's not happy about it either. What's going on? <laughs> see that little video geek behind her? She dared Mary Gu to ask you. Juan was guessing now. And you put her up to that, didn't you? Sure. But Annette, the video geek, doesn't know it was me. She and I collaborate a lot, but she thinks I'm some old lady in our monk. Annette likes to gossip a lot about us kids, and my little old lady character plays along. Bertie's voice went high-pitched and quavery. Oh, that sweet Orozco boy. I do think your friend Miriam would like him so. Jeez, Bertie. They walked toward each other, step by painful step, until they were almost in arm's reach. Juan had turned off all imagery for a moment. Shed of fantasy, they were pretty ordinary-looking kids. Annette, the video geek, was short and pimply-faced, with hair that hadn't seen a comb so far this month. Miriam Goo was about three inches taller than Juan. Too tall. Her skin was as dark as Juan's, but with a golden undertone. Close-cut black hair framed a wide face and very symmetrical features. She wore an expensive Epiphany brand blouse. The high-rate laser ports were perfectly hidden in the embroidery. Rich kids had clothes like this, usually with broad gaming stripes. This blouse had no gaming stripes. It was light and simple, and probably had more computing power than all the clothes Juan owned. You had to be sharp to wear a shirt like this properly. Just now, Miri looked as though she was tasting something bad. You don't like what you see either, huh? But Miri got in the first word. Juan Orozco. People say you're a clever kid, quick with interfaces. She paused and gave a little shrug. So, want to collaborate on the local exam? Bertie pulled a monstrous face at her, and Juan realized that Bertie was sending only to him. Okay, said Bertie. Just be nice, Juan. Say how you were thinking she and you would make a team with grade points right from the start. The words caught in Juan's throat. Miriam Goo was just too much. Maybe, he replied to her. Depends on what you can bring to it. Talents? Ideas? Her eyes narrowed. I have both. In particular, my project concept is a killer. It really could make Fairmont schools the Rose of North County. That was the school board's phrase. The alcalde and the board wanted these local projects to show that Fairmont was a good neighbor, not like some of the schools in downtown and El Cajon. Juan shrugged. Well, um, that's good. We'd be the kind of high-contrast team the alcalde likes. I really don't want to do this. Let's talk about it more sometime. Annette the video geek put in. That won't do at all. You need to team up soonest. She flickered through various pop culture images as she spoke finally settled on the heroin student from Spielberg Rowling. She grabbed the background imagery at the same time, and Fairmont Schools was transformed into a fairy tale castle. It was the same set they had used at last fall's Halloween pageant. Most of the parents had been enchanted, though as far as the kids were concerned, Fairmont Schools failed the fantasy test in one big way. Here, in real-life Southern California, the Muggles ran the show. Miriam turned to glare at her friend, now a brown-haired little English witch. Will you shut down, Annette? Then back to Juan. But she's right, Orozco. We gotta decide tonight. How about this? You come by my place at 6 p.m. tonight and we talk. Bertie was smiling with smug satisfaction. Well, yeah, said Juan. But in person? Of course. This is a local project. Yeah, okay then, I'll come over. There must be some way out of this. What was Bertie up to? She took a step forward and held out her hand. Shake. He reached out and shook it. The little electric shock was surely his imagination, but the sudden burst of information was not. 
two emphatic sentences sparkling across his vision. Miriam Goo and her friends turned away and walked back along the driveway. There was the sound of muffled giggling. He watched them for a moment. The video geek was going full tilt, picture and sound from a million old movies and news stories. Annette could retrieve and arrange video archives so easily that imaging came as naturally to her as speech. Annette was a type of genius. Or maybe there are other flavors of little blue pills. Dumboso. Juan turned away from them and started toward the bike stand. So what did Miri Goo tell you? When she shook hands. Bertie's tone was casual. How could he answer that question without getting Bertie dipped all over again? It's strange. She said if she and I team, she doesn't want anyone remote participating. Sure, it is a local exam. Just show me the message. That's the strange part. She guessed that you were still hanging around. She said, in particular, if I show you the message or let you participate, she'll find out and she'll drop the exam, even if it means getting an F. And, in fact, that was the entire content of the message. It had a kind of non-negotiable flavor that Juan envied. They walked in silence the rest of the way to Juan's bicycle. Bertie's face was drawn down disapprovingly. Not a good sign. Juan hopped on his bike and pedaled off on New Pala, up over the ridge, and onto the long downslope toward home. Bertie's image conjured up a flying carpet, clambered aboard, and ghosted along beside him. It was nicely done, the shadow following perfectly along over the gravel of the road shoulder. Of course, Bertie's fairy overlay blocked a good bit of Juan's visual field, including the most natural line of sight to see real traffic. Why couldn't he float along on Juan's other shoulder, or just be a voice? Juan shifted the image toward transparency and hoped Bertie would not guess at the change. Come on, Bertie. I did what you asked. Let's talk about the unlimited exam. I'm sure I can be a help with that. If you'll just let me on the team. Bertie was silent a second longer, considering. Then he nodded and gave an easy laugh. Sure, Juan. We can use you on the unlimited team. You'll be a big help. Suddenly the afternoon was a happy place. They coasted down the steepening roadway. The wind that blew through Juan's hair and over his arms was something that was impossible to do artificially, at least without gaming stripes. The whole of the valley was spread out before him now, hazy in the bright sun. It was almost two miles to the next rise, the run up to Fallbrook. And he was on Bertie's unlimited team. So what's our unlimited project going to be, Bertie? Heh, <laughs> how do you like my flying carpet, Juan? He flew a lazy loop around Juan. What really makes it possible? Juan squinted at him. My contact lenses? Smart clothes? Certainly the lens displays would be useless without a wearable computer to do the graphics. That's just the final output device. But how does my imaging get to you almost wherever you are? He looked expectantly at Juan. Come on, Bertie. But aloud, Juan said, Okay, that's the worldwide network. Yeah, you're essentially right, though the long-haul networks have been around since forever. What gives us flexibility are the network nodes that are scattered all through the environment. See, look around you. Bertie must have pinged on the sites nearest Juan, there were suddenly dozens of virtual gleams in the rocks by the road, in the cars as they passed closest to him, on Juan's own clothing. Bertie gestured again, and the hills were alive with thousands of gleams, nodes that were two or three forwarding hops away. Okay, Bertie. Yes, the local nets are important. But Bertie was on a roll. Darn right they are. Thumb-sized gadgets with very low power wireless, just enough to establish location, and then even lower power short range lasers steered exactly onto the targeted receivers. Nowadays, it's all so slick that unless you look close or have a network sniffer, you almost can't even see that it's going on. How many freestanding nodes do you think there are in an improved part of town, Juan? That sort of question had a concrete answer. Well, right now, the front lawn of Fairmont schools has 
247 loose ones. Right, said Bertie. And what's the most expensive thing about that? Juan laughed. Cleaning up the network trash, of course. The gadgets broke or wore out, or they didn't get enough light to keep their batteries going. They were cheap. Setting out new ones was easy. But if that's all you did, after a few months, you'd have metallic garbage, hard, ugly, and generally toxic, all over the place. Juan abruptly stopped laughing. Wow, Bertie, that's the project? Biodegradable network nodes? That's off scale. Yup. Any progress toward organic nodes would be worth an A. And we might luck out. I'm plugged into all the right groups. Kistler at MIT, he doesn't know it, but one of his graduate students is actually a committee, and I'm on the committee. The Kistler people were cutting edge in organic substitution research, but just now they were stalled. The other relevant pieces involved idea markets in India and some Siberian guys who hardly talked to anyone. Juan thought a moment. Hey, Bertie, I bet that literature survey I did for you last month might really help on this. Bertie looked blank. You remember? All my analysis on electron transfer during organic decay. It had been just a silly puzzle, Bertie proposed, but it had given Juan a low-stress way to try out his new abilities. Yes, said Bertie, slapping his forehead. Of course. It's not directly related, but it might give the other guys some ideas. Talking over the details took them through the bottom of the valley, past the newer subdivisions, and then down the off-ramp that led to the old casinos. Bertie and his flying carpet flickered for a second, and then the overlay vanished as his friend lost the battle to find a handoff link. Dunno why you have to live in an unimproved part of town, Bertie grumbled in his ear. Juan shrugged. The neighborhood has fixed lasers and wireless. Actually, it was kind of nice to lose the flying carpet. He let his bike's recycler boost him up the little hill and then off into Las Mesitas. So how are we going to work the concurrency on the unlimited test? Easy. I'll chat up the Siberians in a couple of hours, then shuffle that across to my other groups. I don't know how fast things will break. It may be just you and me on the Fairmont side. Sync up with me after you get done with Miri Goo tonight, and we'll see about using your magical memory. Juan frowned and pedaled fast along white sidewalks and turn-of-the-century condos. His part of town was old enough that it looked glitzy even without virtual enhancements. Bertie seemed to notice his lack of response. So is there a problem? Yes. He didn't like Bertie's unsubtle reference to what the little blue pills did for him. But that was just Bertie's way. In fact, today was all Bertie's way, both the good and the bad of it. It's just that I'm a little worried about the local test. I know Miri gets good grades, and you say she is smart, but does she really have any traction? What he really wanted to ask was why Bertie had pushed him into this, but he knew that any sort of direct question along those lines might provoke a freeze-out. Don't worry, Juan. She'd do good work on any team. I've been watching her. That last was news to Juan. Aloud, he said, I know she has a stupid brother over in senior high. <laughs> William the Goofus? He is a dud. But he's not really her brother, either. No, Miri Goo is smart and tough. Did you know she grew up at a Silomar? In a detention camp? Yup. Well, she was only a baby, but her parents knew just a bit too much. That had happened to lots of Chinese Americans during the war, the ones who knew the most about military technologies. But it was also ancient history. Bertie was being more shocking than informative. Well, okay. No point in pushing. At least Bertie let me on his unlimited team. Almost home, Juan coasted down a short street and up his driveway, ducking under the creaking garage door that was just opening for him. I'll get over to Miri's this evening and start the local team stuff while you're in East Asia. Fine, fine, said Bertie. Juan leaned his bike against the family junk and walked to the back of the garage. He stopped at the door to the kitchen. Bertie had gotten every single thing he had wanted. Maybe not. I bet he still plans on messing with my local exam. But one thing, Miri's handshake, she was real definite, Bertie. 
She doesn't want you coming along, even passively, okay? Sure, fine. I'm off to Asia. Ta! Bertie's voice ended with an exaggerated click. Juan's father was home, of course. Luis Orozco was puttering around the kitchen. He gave his son a vague wave as the boy came in the room. The house had a good internal network, fed from a fixed station on the roof. Juan ignored the fantasy images almost automatically. He had no special interest in knowing what Pa was seeing, or where he thought he was. Juan eeled past his father into the living room. Pa was okay. Luis Orozco's own father had been an illegal back in the 1980s. Grandpa had lived in North County. But in the cardboard shacks and dirt tunnels that had hid amid the canyons in those days. The Orozco grandparents had worked hard for their only son and Luis Orozco had worked hard to learn to be a software engineer. Sometimes, when he came down to Earth, Pa would laugh and say he was one of the world's greatest experts in Regna V. And, maybe for a year or two, that had been an employable skill. So three years of education had been spent for a couple years of income. That sort of thing had happened to a lot of people. Pa was one of those who just gave up because of it. Ma, can you talk? Part of the wall and ceiling went transparent. Isabella Orozco was at work, upstairs. She looked down at him curiously. Hey, Juan, I thought you were going to be at finals until very late. Juan bounced up the stairs, talking all the while. Yes, I have a lot to do. Ah, so you'll be working from here. Juan came into her workroom and gave her a quick hug. No, I was just going to get supper and then visit the student I'm doing the local project with. She was looking right at him now, and he could tell he had her full attention. I just saw about the local exam. It seems like a great idea. Ma thought it was so important to get down on the real ground. When Juan was younger, she always dragged him along when she went on her field trips around the county. Oh, yes, said Juan. We'll learn a lot. Her look sharpened. And Bertram is not in this, correct? Um, no, Ma. No need to mention the unlimited exam. He's not here in the house, is he? Ma, of course not. Juan denied all Snoop access to his friends when he was in the house. Mother knew that. When he's here, you see him, just like when my other friends visit. Okay. She looked a little embarrassed, but at least she didn't repeat her opinion that Little Bertie is too slippery by half. Her attention drifted for a moment, and her fingers tapped a quick tattoo on the tabletop. He could see that she was off in Borrego Springs, shepherding some cinema people from L.A. Anyway, I was wondering if I could take a car tonight. My teammate lives up in Fallbrook. Just a second. She finished the job she was working on. Okay, who was your teammate? A really good student, he showed her. Ma grinned uncertainly, a little surprised. Good for you. Yes, she is an excellent student, strong where you are weak, and vice versa, of course. She paused, checking out the goose. They are a private sort of family, but that's okay. And it's a safe part of town. She chuckled. Yes, very safe. She respected the school rules and didn't ask about the team project. That was just as well, since Juan still had no idea what Miri Gu was planning. But you stay out of Camp Pendleton, hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. You're cleared to go as soon as you have supper. I've got some big money customers running, so I can't take a break just now. Go on downstairs and get your father and yourself something to eat. And learn something from this local project, huh? There are many careers you can have without knowing airy-fairy nonsense. Yes, ma'am. He grinned and patted her shoulder. Then he was running down the stairs. After Pa's programming career had crashed, Mother had worked harder and harder at her 411 information services. By now, she knew San Diego County and its data as well as anyone in the world. Most of her jobs were just a few seconds or a few minutes long, guiding people, answering the hard questions. Some jobs, like the Migración historical stuff, were ongoing. Ma made a big point that her work was really hundreds of little careers, and that almost none of them depended on high-tech fads. Juan could do much worse. That was her message, both spoken and unspoken. 
and looking at Pa across the kitchen table, Juan understood the alternative that his mother had in mind. Juan had understood that since he was six years old. Luis Orozco ate in the absent-minded way of a truly hard worker, but the images that floated around the room were just passive soaps. Later in the night, he might spend money on active cinema. But even that would be nothing with traction. Pa was always in the past or on another world, so Ma was afraid that Juan would end up the same way. But I won't. Whatever the best is, I'll learn it, and learn it in days, not years. And when that best is suddenly obsolete, I'll learn whatever new thing gets thrown at me. Ma worked hard, and she was a wonderful person, but her 411 business was such a dead end. Maybe God was kind to her that she never realized this. Certainly Juan could never break her heart by telling her such a thing. But the local world sucked. San Diego County, despite all its history and industry and universities, was just a microscopic speck compared to the world of people and ideas that swirled around them every minute. Once upon a time, Juan's father had wanted to be part of that wider world, but he hadn't been fast enough or adaptable enough. It would be different for me. The little blue pills would the difference. The price might be high. Sometimes Juan's mind went so blank he couldn't remember his own name. It was a kind of seizure, but in a moment or two it always went away. Always. So far. With custom street drugs, you could never be absolutely sure of such things. Juan had one jaw-clenched resolve. I will be adaptable. He would not fail as his father had failed. Juan had the car drop him off a couple of blocks short of the Goo's house. He told himself he did this so he could get a feel for the neighborhood. After all, it was not a very public place. But that wasn't the real reason. In fact, the drive had been just too quick. He wasn't ready to face his local teammate. West Fallbrook wasn't super wealthy, but it was richer and more modern than Las Mesitas. Most of its money came from the fact that it was right next to Camp Pendleton's east entrance. Juan walked through the late afternoon light, looking in all directions. There were a few people out, a jogger, some little kids playing an inscrutable game. With all enhancements turned off, the houses were low and stony-looking, set well back from the street. Some of the yards were beautifully kept, succulents and dwarf pines arranged like large-scale bonsai. Others were workaday neat, with shade trees and lawns that were raked gravel or auto-mowed dry grass. Juan turned on consensus imagery. No surprise, the street was heavily prepped. The augmented landscape was pretty, in an understated way. The afternoon sunlight sparkled off fountains and lush grass lawns. Now the low, stony houses were all windows and airy patios, some places in bright sunlight, others half-hidden in shadows. But there were no public censors. There was no advertising and no graffiti. The neighborhood was so perfectly consistent, a single huge work of art. Juan felt a little shiver. In most parts of San Diego, you could find homeowners who'd opt out of the community image, or else demand to be included, but in some grotesque contradiction of their neighbors. West Fallbrook had tighter control than even most condo communities. You had the feeling that some single interest was watching over everything here, ready to act against intruders. In fact, that single interest went by the initials USMC. Above him, his guide arrow had brightened. Now it turned onto a side street and swooped to the third house on the right. Carré. He wanted to slow down, maybe walk around the block. I haven't even figured out how to talk to her parents. Chinese-American grown-ups were an odd lot, especially the ones who had been detained. When they were released, some of them had left the USA, gone to Mexico or Canada or Europe. Most of the others just went back to their lives, even to government jobs, but with varying degrees of bitterness. And some had helped finish the war and made the government look very foolish in the process. He walked up the Goose driveway, at the same time snooping one last time for information on Miri's family. So if William the Goofus wasn't really Miri's brother, who was he? William had never attracted that much attention. 
there were no ready-made rumors. And Fairmont's security on student records was pretty strong. Juan poked around, found some good public camera data. Given a few minutes, he'd have William all figured out. But now he was standing at the Goo's front door. Miriam Goo was at the entrance. For a moment, Juan thought she was going to complain that he was late, but she just waved him inward. Past the doorway, the street imagery cut off abruptly. They were standing in a narrow hallway with closed doors at both ends. Miri paused at the inner door, watching him. There were little popping noises, and Juan felt something burn his ankle. Hey, don't fry my gear! He had other clothes, but the Orozco family wasn't rich enough to waste them. Miri stared at him. You didn't know? Know what? That's not your equipment I trashed. I was very careful. You were carrying hitchhikers. She opened the inner door, and her gestures were suddenly polite and gracious. There must be grown-ups watching. As he followed her down the hall, Juan rebooted his wearable. The walls became prettier, covered with silk hangings. He saw he had visitor privileges in the Goo's house system, but he couldn't find any other communications paths out of the building. All his equipment was working fine, including the little extras like 360 peripheral vision and good hearing. So what about those popping sounds, the heat? That was somebody else's equipment. Juan had been walking around like a fool with a kick-me sign on his back. In fact, it was worse than that. He remembered assuring his mother that she would see any friends he brought to the house. Somebody had made that a lie. Fairmont had its share of unfunny jokesters, but this was gross. Who would do such a thing? Yeah, who indeed? Juan stepped from the hallway into a high-ceilinged living room. Standing by a real fireplace was a chunky Asian with buzz-cut hair. Juan recognized the face from one of the few pictures he had of the guy. This was William Goo. Miriam's father, not the Goofus. Apparently, the two had the same first name. Miriam danced ahead of him. She was smiling now. Bill, I'd like you to meet Juan Orozco. Juan and I are doing the local project together. Juan, this is my father. Bill? Juan couldn't imagine addressing his own pa by his first name. These people were strange. Pleased to meet you, Juan. Goo's handshake was firm, his expression mild and unreadable. Are you enjoying the final exam so far? Enjoying? Yes, sir. Miri had already turned away. Alice, do you have a minute? I'd like you to meet... A woman's voice. Yes, dear, just a moment. Not more than two seconds passed, and a lady with a pleasant, round face stepped into the room. Juan recognized her, too, except for the clothes. This evening, Alice Goo wore the uniform of a timeshare lieutenant colonel in the United States Marines. As Miri made the introductions, Juan noticed Mr. Goo's fingers tapping on his belt. Oops, sorry. Alice Goo's Marine Corps uniform was abruptly replaced by a business suit. Oh, dear. And the business suit morphed into the matronly dress that Juan remembered from the photos. When she shook his hand, she looked entirely innocent and motherly. I hear that you and Miriam have a very interesting local project. I hope so. Mainly, I hope Miriam will get around to telling me what it is. But he no longer doubted that Miriam Goo had traction. We'd really like to know more about it. Miri pulled a face. Bill, you know we're not supposed to talk about it. Besides, if it goes right, we'll be all done with it tonight. Huh? But Mr. Goo was looking at Juan. I know the school rules. I wouldn't dream of breaking them. Almost a smile. But I think as parents, we should at least know where you plan to be physically. If I understand the local exam, you can't do it remotely. Yes, sir, said Juan. That is true. We... Miriam picked up smoothly where Juan had run out of words. We're just going down to Torrey Pines Park. Colonel Goo tapped at her belt and was quiet for a moment. Well, that looks safe. Mr. Goo nodded. But you're supposed to do the local project without outside connectivity. Except if an emergency comes up. 
Mr. Goo just tapped his fingers thoughtfully. Juan turned off all the house imagery and zoomed in on Miriam's pa. The guy was dressed casually, but with better clothes sense than most grown-ups had. In the house enhancement, he looked soft and sort of heavy. In the plain view, he just looked hard and solid. Come to think of it, the edge of his hand had felt calloused, just like in the movies. Colonel Gu glanced at her husband, nodded slightly at him. She turned back to Juan and Miri. I think it will be okay, she said, but we do ask a couple things of you. Nothing against the exam rules, says Miri. I don't think so. First, since the park has no infrastructure and doesn't allow visitors to put up camping networks, please take some of the old standalone gear we have in the basement. Hey, that's great, Alice. I was going to ask you about that. Juan could hear someone coming down the stairs behind him. He looked without turning, but there was no one visible yet, and his visitor's privilege did not allow him to see through walls. And second, Colonel Goo continued, we think William should go along with you. Mary's father? No, the goofus. Ugh. This time, Mary Goo did not debate. She nodded and said softly, Well, if you think that is best. Juan spoke without thinking. But, then more diffidently, But wouldn't that violate the exam rules? The voice came from behind him. No, read the rules, Orozco. It was William. Juan turned to acknowledge the other. You mean you won't be a team member? Yeah, I'd just be your escort. The goofas had the same broad features, the same coloring as the rest of the family. He was almost as tall as Bill Goo, but scrawny. His face had a sweaty sheen like maybe... Oh... Suddenly, Juan realized that while Bill and William were father and son, it was not in the order he had thought. It's really your call, Dad, said Mr. Goo. William nodded. I don't mind, he smiled. The munchkin has been telling me how strange things are in junior high school. Now I'll get to see what she means. Mary Goo's smile was a little weak. Well, we'd be happy to have you come along. Juan and I want to look at Alice's gear, but we should be ready in half an hour or so. I'll be around. William gave a twitchy wave and left the room. Alice and I will let you make your plans now, Mr. Goo said. He nodded at Juan. It was nice to meet you, Juan. Juan mumbled appropriate niceties to Mr. and Colonel Goo, and allowed Miri to maneuver him out of the room and down a steep stairway. Huh, he said, looking over her shoulder. You really do have a basement. It wasn't what Juan really wanted to say. He'd get to that in a minute. Oh, yeah, all the newer homes in West Fallbrook do. Juan noticed that this fact didn't show up in the county building permits. There was a brightly lit room at the bottom of the stairs. The enhanced view was of warm redwood paneling with an impossibly high ceiling. Unenhanced, the walls and ceiling were gray plastic sheeting. Either way, the room was crowded with cardboard boxes filled with old children's games, sports equipment, and unidentifiable junk. This might be one of the few basements in Southern California, but it was clearly being used the way Juan's family used the garage. It's great we can take the surplus sensor gear. The only problem will be the stale MREBs. Miri was already rummaging around in the boxes. Juan hung back at the doorway. He stood with his arms crossed and glared at the girl. She looked at him, and some of the animation left her face. What? I'll tell you what. The words popped out, sarcastic and loud. He bit down on his anger and messaged her point to point. I'll tell you what. I came over here tonight because you were going to propose a local team project. Miri shrugged. Sure. She replied out loud, speaking in a normal voice. But if we hustle, we can nail the whole project tonight. It will be one less background task. Still talking silently, directly. Hey, this is supposed to be a team project. You're just pushing me around. Now Miri was frowning. 
She jabbed a finger in his direction and continued speaking out loud. Look, I've got a great idea for the local exam. You're ideal for the second seat on it. You and me are about as far apart in background and outlook as anybody in eighth grade. They like that in a team. But that's all I need you for, just to hold down the second seat. You won't have to do anything but tag along. Juan didn't reply for a second. I'm not your doormat. Why not? You're Bertie Todd's doormat. I'm gone. Juan turned for the stairs. But now the stairwell was dark. He stumbled on the first step, but then Mary Goo caught up with him and the lights came on. Just a minute. I shouldn't have said that. But one way or another, we both got to get through finals week. Yeah. And by now, most of the local teams were probably already formed. Even more, they probably were into project planning. If he couldn't make this work, Juan might have to kiss off the local test entirely. Doormat. Okay, Juan said, walking back into the basement room. But I want to know all about your proposed project, and I want some say in it. Yes, of course. She took a deep breath, and he got ready for still more random noise. Let's sit down. Okay. You already know I want to go down on the ground to Torrey Pines Park. Yeah. In fact, he had been reading up on the park ever since she mentioned it to her parents. I've also noticed that there are no recent rumorings hanging over the place. If you know something's going on there, I guess you'd have an edge. She smiled in a way that seemed more pleased than smug. That's what I figure, too. By the way, it's okay to talk out loud, Juan, even to argue. As long as we keep our voices down, Bill and Alice are not going to hear. Sort of a family honor thing. She saw his skeptical look, and her voice sharpened a little bit. Hey, if they wanted to snoop, your point-to-point -point com wouldn't be any protection at all. They've never said so, but I bet that inside the house my parents could even eavesdrop on a handshake. Okay, Juan resumed, speaking out loud. I just want some straight answers. What is it that you've noticed at Tory Pines? Little things, but they add up. Here's the days the park rangers kept it closed this spring. Here's the weather for the same period. They've got no convincing explanation for all those closures. And see how during the closure in January they still admitted certain tourists from Cold Spring Harbor. Juan watched the stats and pictures play across the space between them. Yes. 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 But the tourists were mainly VIPs attending a physicality conference at UCSD. But the conference itself was scheduled with less than 18 hours lead time. So? Scientists must be adaptable in these modern times. Not like this. I've read the meeting proceedings. It's very weak stuff. In fact, that's what got me interested. She leaned forward. Digging around, I discovered that the meeting was just a prop, paid for by Fox Warner and Game Happenings. Juan looked at the abstracts. It would be really nice to talk to Bertie about this. He always had opinions or knew who to ask. Juan had to suppress the urge to call out to him. Well, I guess. I, um, I thought the UCSD people were more professional than this. He was just puffing vapor. You figured this is all a publicity conspiracy? Yup, and just in time for the summer movie season. Think how quiet the major studios have been this spring. No mysteries, no scandals, nothing obvious started on April 1st. They've fully faked out the second-tier studios, but they're also driving the small players nuts because we know that Fox Warner, Spielberg Rowling, Sony, all the majors, must be going after each other even harder than last year. About a week ago, I figured out that Fox Warner has cinema fellowship agreements with Marco Ferretti and Charles Voss. Who? Oh, world-class biotech guys at Cold Spring Harbor. Both had been at the UCSD conference. I've been tracking them hard ever since. Once you guess what to look for, it's hard for a secret to hide. And movie teasers were secrets that wanted to be found out. Anyway, Miri continued, I think Fox Warner is pinning their summer season on some bioscience fantasy. 
and last year game happenings turned most of Brazil inside out. Yeah, the dinosauria sites. For almost two months, the world had haunted Brazilian towns and Brazil-oriented websites, building up the evidence for their invasion from the Cretaceous. The echoes of that were still floating around, a secondary reality that absorbed the creative attention of millions. Over the last 20 years, the World Wide Net had come to be a midden of bogus sites and recursive fraudulence. Until the copyrights ran out, and often for years afterwards, a movie's online presence would grow and grow, becoming more elaborate and consistent than serious databases. Telling truth from fantasy was often the hardest thing about using the web. The standard joke was that if real space monsters should ever visit Earth, they would take one look at the nightmares documented on the World Wide Net and flee screaming back to their home planet. Juan looked at Miri's evidence and followed some of the major links. You make a good case that this summer is going to be interesting, but the movie people have all cislunar space to play with. What's to think a summer movie will break out in San Diego County, much less at Torrey Pines Park? They've actually started the initial sequence. You know, what will attract hardcore early participants? The last few weeks, there have been little environment changes in the park, unusual animal movements. The evidence was very frail. Torrey Pines Park was unimproved land. There was no local networking. But maybe that was the point. Miri had rented time on tourist viewpoints in Del Mar Heights, and then she had done a lot of analysis. So maybe she had that most unlikely and precious commodity, early warning. Or maybe she was puffing vapor. Okay, something is going on in Torrey Pines, and you have an inside track on it. There's still only the vaguest connection with the movie people. There's more. Last night, my theory moved from tenuous to plausible, maybe even compelling. I learned that Fox Warner has brought an advance team to San Diego. But that's way out at Borrego Springs in the desert. How did you know? I really had to dig for that. My mother, she's doing 411 work for them. Oops. Come to think of it, what he had seen of Ma's work this afternoon was probably privileged. Miri was watching him with genuine interest. She's working with them? That's great! Knowing the connection would put us way ahead. If you could ask your mother, I don't know. Juan leaned back and looked at the schedule his mother had posted at home. All her desert work was under a ten-day embargo. Even that much information would not have been visible to outsiders. He checked out the privilege certificates. Juan knew his mother pretty well. He could probably guess how she had encrypted the details. And maybe get some solid corroboration. He really wanted to pass this exam, but Juan hunched forward a little. I'm sorry. It's under seal. Oh. Miri watched him speculatively. Being the first to discover a Fox Warner movie set up, a summer movie, would give Fairmont the inside track on story participation. It would be a surefire A in the exam. The size of such a win wouldn't be clear until well into the movie season, but there would be some income for at least the five years of the movie's copyright. If this issue had come up with Bertie Todd, there'd now be intense pleadings for him to think of his future and the team and do what his ma would certainly want him to do if she only knew, namely break into her data space. But after a moment, the girl just nodded. That's okay, Juan. It's good to have respect. She moved back to the boxes and began rummaging again. Let's go with what I've already got, namely that Fox Warner is running an operation in San Diego and some of their cinema fellows have been fooling around in Torrey Pines Park. She pulled out a rack of... they looked like milk cartons, and set them on top of another box. Emrebs, she explained opaquely. She reached deeper into the open box and retrieved a pair of massive plastic goggles. For a moment, he thought this was scuba gear, but they wouldn't cover the nose or mouth. They didn't respond to info pings. He searched on their physical appearance. In any case, she continued, even as she pulled out two more pairs of goggles, the background research will fit with my unlimited team's work. 
we're trying to scope out the movie season's big secrets. So far, we're not focusing on San Diego, but Annette reached some of the same conclusions about Fox Warner that I did. You want to be on My Unlimited, too? If this works tonight, we can combine the results. Oh, that was really quite a generous offer. Juan didn't answer immediately. He pretended to be fully distracted by all the strange equipment. In fact, he recognized the gadgets now. There was a good match in the 2005 Jane sensors, but he couldn't find a user's manual. He picked up the first pair of goggles and turned it this way and that. The surface of the plastic was a passive optical lacquer, like cheap grocery wrap in reverse. Instead of reflecting bright rainbow colors, the colors flowed as he turned it, always blending with the true color of the gray plastic walls behind it. It amounted to crude camo color, pretty useless in an environment this smart. Finally, he replied, kind of incidentally, I can't be on your unlimited team. I'm already on Bertie's. Maybe it doesn't matter. You know Annette's working with Bertie on the side. Oh, really? Her stare locked on him for a moment. Then, I should have guessed. Annette is just not that bright by herself. So Bertie has been jerking all of us around. Yeah. Juan shrugged and lowered his head. So how do these goggles work, anyway? Miri seemed to stew over Annette for a few seconds more. Then she shrugged, too. Remember, this equipment is old. She held up her pair of goggles and showed him some slide controls in the head strap. There's even a physical on button right here. Okay. One slipped the goggles over his head and pulled the strap tight. The headset must have weighed two or three ounces. It was an awkward lump compared to contact lenses. Watching himself from the outside, he looked fully bizarre. The whole top of his face was a bulbous gray-brown tumor. He could see Miriam was trying not to laugh. Okay, let's see what it can do. He pressed the on button. Nothing. His enhanced view was the same as before, but when he cleared his contact lenses and looked out with his naked eyes, it's pitch dark from inside, can't see a thing. Oh, Miri sounded a little embarrassed. Sorry, take off your goggles for a minute. We need an MREB. She picked up one of the heavy-looking milk cartons. Meaning? M-R-E-B, she spelled the word. Oh, meal ready to eat with battery. Yes, one of the little pluses of military life. She twisted it in the middle, and the carton split in two. The top half is food from the Marine, and the bottom half is power for the Marine's equipment. There were letters physically stenciled on the food container, something about chicken with gravy and dehydrated ice cream. I tried eating one of these once, she made a face. Fortunately, that won't be necessary tonight. She picked up the bottom half of the MREB and drew out a fine wire. This is a weak point in my planning. These batteries are way stale. The goggles may be dead anyway. Juan's own clothes often wore out before he outgrew them. Sometimes a few launderings was enough to zap them. Oh, no. They built this mil-spec junk to be tough. Miri set down the battery pack and bent Juan's goggles into a single handful. Watch this. She wound up like a softball pitcher and threw the goggles into the wall. The gear smashed upwards into the wall and caromed loudly off the ceiling. Miriam ran across the room to pick up what was left. Colonel Goo's voice wafted down the stairwell. Hey, what are you kids doing down there? Miri stood up and giggled behind her hand. Suddenly she looked about ten years old. It's okay, Alice, she shouted back. I just, um, dropped something. On the ceiling? Sorry. I'll be more careful. She walked back to Juan and handed him the goggles. See, she said, hardly a scratch. Now we supply power. She plugged the wire from the battery into the goggles headband, and you try them again. He slid the goggles over his eyes and pressed on. Monochrome reds wavered for a moment, and then he was looking at a strange grainy scene. The view was not wraparound, just slightly fisheye. In it, Miri's face loomed large, peering in at him. 
Her skin was the color of a hot oven, and her eyes and mouth glowed bluish-white. This looks like thermal infrared, except that the color scheme wasn't standard. Yep, that's the default startup. Notice how the optics are built right into the gear? It's kind of like camping clothes. You don't have to depend on a local network. That's going to be a win when we get to Torrey Pines. Try some other sensors. You can get help by sliding the on button. Hey, yes! Bat, low. Bat 2, NA. Sensors. Passive. Viz amp, OK. NIR, OK. Greater than TIR, OK. Sniff, NA. Audio, NA. Sig, NA. Active. GPR, NA. Sono, NA. X Echo, NA. Gated VIS, NA. Gated NIR, NA. The tiny menu floated in the corner of his right eye's view. The battery warning was blinking. He fiddled with his headband and found a pointing device. Okay, now I'm seeing in full color normal light. Booger's resolution, though. Juan turned around and then back to Miri. He laughed. The menu window is fully bizarre, you know. It just hangs there at the edge of my view. How can I tag it to the wall or a fixed object? You can't. I told you this gear is old. It can't orient worth zip. And even if it could, its little pea brain isn't fast enough to do image slews. Huh. Juan knew about obsolete systems, but he didn't use them much. With equipment like this, there could be no fairy overlays. Even ordinary things like interior decoration would all have to be real. There were lots of boxes, but no inventory data. Some of them must have belonged to the Goofus. They had handwritten labels like Prof and Mrs. William Goo, Department of English, UC Davis, and William Goo Sr., Rainbow's End, Irvine, California. Miri carefully moved these out of the way. Someday William will know what to do with all this, or maybe Grandmother will change her mind and come visit us again. They opened more of the USMC boxes and poked around. There were wild equipment vests, more pockets than you ever saw around school. The vests weren't documented anywhere. The pockets were for ammunition, Juan speculated. For MREBs, Miri claimed. And they might need a lot of the batteries tonight, since even the best of them tested, warning, low charge. They dismembered the MREBs and loaded batteries onto two of the smallest vests. There were also belt mount keypads for the equipment. Ha! Huh, before this is over, we'll be wiggling our fingers like grown ups. They were down to the last few boxes. Miri tore open the first. It was filled with dozens of camo colored egg shapes. Each of them sprouted a triple of short antenna spikes. <laughs> Network nodes. A million times worse than what we have, and just as illegal to use in Torrey Pines Park. Miri pushed aside several boxes that were stenciled with the same product code as the network nodes. Behind them was one last box, bigger than the others. Miri opened it and stood back with exaggerated satisfaction. Ah, so. I was hoping Bill hadn't thrown these out. She pulled out something with a stubby barrel and a pistol grip. A gun! but it didn't match anything in Jane's small arms. Nah, look under sensor systems. She grabbed the loose battery and snugged it under the barrel. Even point blank, I bet this couldn't hurt a fly. It's an all-purpose active probe. Ground-penetrating radar and sonography. Surface reflection x-ray. Gated laser. We couldn't get this at a sporting goods store. It's just too perfect for offensive snooping. It's got attachments, too. Miri peered into the box and retrieved a metal rod with a flared end. Yeah, that's for the radar. It fits on right here. Supposedly, it's great for scoping out tunnels. She noticed Juan's eyeing this latest find and smiled teasingly. Boys, there's another one in the box. Help yourself. Just don't try it out here. It would set off alarms big time. In a few minutes, they were both loaded down with batteries, plugged into the probe equipment, and staring at each other through their goggles. They both started laughing. 
You look like a monster insect, she said. In the infrared, the goggles were big black bug eyes, and the equipment vests looked like chitinous armor, glowing brightly where there was an active battery. Juan waved his probe gun in the air. Yeah, killer insects. Hmm. You know, we look so bizarre. I bet if we find Fox Warner down in Torrey Pines, we might end up in the show. That sort of thing happened, but most consumer participation was in the form of contributed content and plot ideas. Miri laughed. I told you this was a good project. Miri called a car to take them to Torrey Pines. They clumped up the stairs and found Mr. Goo standing with William the Goofus. Mr. Goo looked like he was trying to hide a smile. You two look charming. He glanced at William. Are you ready to go? William might have been smiling, too. Any time, Bill. Mr. Goo walked the three of them to the front door. Miri's car was already pulling up. The sun had slipped behind a climbing wall of coastal fog, and the afternoon was cooling off. They pulled their goggles off and walked down the lawn, Juan in front. Behind him, Miri walked hand in hand with William. Miriam Goo was respectful of her parents, but flippant, too. With her grandfather, it was different, though Juan couldn't tell if her look up at William was trusting or protective. It was bizarre either way. The three of them piled into the car, William taking the back-facing seat. They drove out through East Fallbrook. The neighborhood enhancements were still pretty, though they didn't have the coordinated aesthetic of the homes right by Camp Pendleton. Here and there, homeowners showed advertising. Miri looked back at the ragged line of the coastal fog, silhouetted against the pale bright blue of the sky. The fog is brazen here, she quoted. Reaching talons across our land, said Juan. Pouncing, she completed, and they both laughed. That was from the Halloween show last year, but to the Fairmont students it had a special meaning. There was none of that twentieth-century wimpiness about the fog's little cat feet. Evening fog was common near the coast, and when it happened, Lasercom got whacked, and the world changed. Weather says that most of Torrey Pines Park will be under fog in an hour. Spooky. It'll be fun. And since the park was unimproved, it wouldn't make that much difference anyway. The car turned down Resch Road and headed east, toward the expressway. Soon the fog was just an edge of low clouds beneath a sunny afternoon. William hadn't said a word since they got aboard. He had accepted a pair of goggles and a couple of batteries, but not an equipment vest. Instead, he carried an old canvas bag. His skin looked young and smooth, but with that sweaty sheen. William's gaze wandered around, kind of twitchy. One could tell that the guy had contacts and a wearable, but his twitchiness was not like a grown-up trying to input to smart clothes. It was more like he had some kind of disease. Juan searched on the symptoms he was seeing a and d with gerontology. The strange-looking skin was a regeneration dressing. That was a pretty common thing. As for the tremors, Parkinson's? Maybe, but that was a rare disease nowadays. Alzheimer's? No, the symptoms didn't match. Aha, Alzheimer's recovery syndrome. Old William must have been a regular vegetable before his treatments kicked in. Now his whole nervous system was regrowing. The result would be a pretty healthy person, even if the personality was randomly different from before. The twitching was the final reconnect with the peripheral nervous system. There were about 50,000 recovering Alzheimer's patients these days. Bertie had even collaborated with some of them. But up close and in person, it made Juan queasy. So okay that William went to live with his kids during his recovery but their enrolling him at Fairmount High was gross. His major was listed as hard-copy media, non-graded status. At least that kept him out of people's way. Miri had been staring out the window, though Juan had no idea what she was seeing. Suddenly she said, You know, this is your friend Bertie Toad Vomit. She pulled an incredible face, a fungus-bedecked toad that drooled nicely realistic slime all the way to the seat between them. Oh, yeah? Why is that? He's been on my case all semester, jerking me around, spreading rumors about me. 
he tricked that idiot Annette so she'd push me into teaming with you. Not that I'm complaining about you, Juan. This is working out pretty well. She looked a little embarrassed. It's just that Bertie is pushy as all get out. Juan certainly couldn't argue against that, but then he suddenly realized, You two are alike in some ways. What? Well, you're both as pushy as all get out. Mary stared at him open-mouthed, and Juan waited for an explosion. But he noticed that William was watching her with a strange smile on his face. She shut her mouth and glared at Juan. Yeah, well, you're right. Alice says it may be my strongest talent if I can ever put a cork in it. In the meantime, I guess I can be pretty unpleasant. She looked away for a moment. But besides us both being up-and-coming dictators, I don't see any similarities between me and Bertie. I'm loud. I'm a loner. Bertie Toad is sneaky and mean. He has his warty hands into everything, and no one knows what he really is. That's not true. I've known Bertie since sixth grade. I've known him well for almost two semesters. He's a remote student, is all. He lives in Evanston. She hesitated, maybe looking up Evanston. So have you ever been to Chicago? Have you ever met Bertie in person? Well, not exactly. But last Thanksgiving I visited him for almost a week. That had been right after the pills really started giving Juan results. He showed me around the museum's piggyback, like a 411 tour. I also met his parents, saw their house. Faking all that would be next to impossible. Bertie's a kid just like us. Though it was true that Bertie hadn't introduced Juan to many of his friends. Sometimes it seemed like Bertie was afraid that if his friends got together, they might cut him out of things. Bertie's great talent was making connections but he seemed to think of those connections as property that could be stolen from him. That was sad. Miri wasn't buying any it. Bertie is not like us, Juan. You know about Annette. I know he's wormed into a lot of groups at school. He's everything to everyone, a regular Mr. Fix-It. Her face settled into a look of brooding contemplation, and she was silent for a moment. They were off fresh now, and on the southbound. The true view was of rolling hills, covered by endless streets and houses and malls. If you accepted the roadway's free enhancements, you got placid wilderness, splashed with advertising. Here and there were subtle defacements, the largest boulders morphing into trollishness. That was probably the work of some Pratchett belief circle. Their car passed the Pala off-ramp and started up the first of several miles-long ridges that separated them from Escondido and the cut across to the coast. Last fall, Mary said, Bertram Todd was just another too smart kid in my language class. But this semester he's caused me lots of inconvenience, lots of little humiliations. Now he has attracted my attention. That did not sound like a healthy thing to do. I'm going to figure out his secret. One slip is all it takes. That was the old saying, once your secret is outed anywhere, however briefly, it is outed forever. Oh, I don't know, said Juan. The way to cover a slip is to embellish it, hide it in all sorts of fake secrets. Ha! Maybe he is something weird. Maybe he's a corporate team. Juan laughed. Or maybe he's something really weird. Over the next few miles, he and Miri hit on all the cinema clichés. Maybe Bertie was an artificial boy, or a super brain stuck in a bottle under Fort Meade. Maybe Bertie was a front for alien invaders, even now taking over the worldwide net. Maybe he was an old Chinese war program, suddenly growing to sentience, or the worldwide net itself that had finally awakened with superhuman and certainly malignant powers. Or maybe Bertie was a subconscious creation of Juan's imagination, and Juan was all unknowing, the monster. This one was Miri's idea. In a way, it was the funniest of all, though there was something a little unsettling about it, at least for Juan. The car had turned onto Highway 56, and they were going back toward the coast. There was more real open space here, and the hills were green with a gold edging of spring flowers. 
The subdivisions were gone, replaced by mile after mile of industrial parks. The automated genomics and proteomics labs spread like gray-green lithops, soaking up the last of the sunlight. People could live and work anywhere in the world, but some things have to happen in a single real place, close enough together that super-speed data paths can connect their parts. These low buildings drove San Diego's physical economy. Inside, the genius of humans, machines, and biological nature collided to make magic. The sun sank back behind coastal fog as they entered the lagoon area north of Torrey Pines Park. Off the expressway, they turned south along the beach. The pale cliffs of the main part of the park rose ahead of them, the hilltops shrouded by the incoming fog. The goofus had remained silent through all their laughter and silly talk. But when Miri got back into her speculation about how this all fit with the fact that Bertie was bothering her so much, he suddenly interrupted. I think part of it is very simple. Why is Bertie bothering you, Miriam? It seems to me there's one possibility so fantastic that neither of you have even imagined it. William delivered this opinion with that faintly amused tone adults sometimes use with little kids. But Miri didn't make a flip response. Oh. She looked at William as though he were hinting at some great insight. I'll think about this some more. The road wound upwards through the fog. Miri had the car drop them off at the far side of the driveway circle at the top. Let's scope things out as we walk toward the ranger station. Juan stepped down onto weedy asphalt. The sun had finally, truly, set. Jeez, the air was cold. He flapped his arms in discomfort. He noticed that William had worn a jacket. You two should think ahead a little more, said the goofus. Juan pulled a face. I can stand a little evening cool. Ma was often on to him like this, too. Plan ahead add-ons were cheap, but he had convinced her that they made stupid mistakes of their own. He grabbed his sensor gun out of the car and slid it into the long pocket in the back of his vest and tried to ignore his shivering. Here, Miriam, William handed the girl an adult-sized jacket big enough to fit over her equipment vest. Oh, thank you. She snugged it on, making Juan feel even more chilly and stupid. One for you too, champ. William tossed a second jacket at Juan. It was bizarre to feel so irritated and so grateful at the same time. He took off the probe holster and slipped on the jacket. Suddenly, the evening felt a whole lot more pleasant. This would block about half his high-rate data ports, but hey, in a few minutes we'll be back in the fog anyway. The car departed as they started off in the direction of the ranger station, and Juan realized that some of his park information was very out of date. There were the restrooms behind him, but the parking lot in the pictures was all gone except at the edges, where it had become this driveway circle. He groped around for more recent information. Of course, no one was parked up here. There were no cars dropping people off, either. Late April was not the height of the physical tourist season, and for Torrey Pines Park, that was the only kind of tourist season there was. They were just barely above the fog layer. The tops of the clouds fluffed out below them, into the west. On a clear day, there would have been a great direct view of the ocean. Now there were just misty shapes tossed up from the fog, and above that, a sky of deepening twilight blue. There was still a special brightness at the horizon, where the sun had set. Venus hung above that glow, along with Sirius and the brighter stars of Orion. Juan hesitated. That's strange. What? I've got mail. He set a pointer in the sky for the others to see. A ballistic FedEx package with a Cambridge return address. It was coming straight down, and from very high up. At about a thousand feet, the mailer slowed dramatically, and a sexy voice spoke in Juan's ear. Do you accept delivery, Mr. Orozco? Yes, yes. He indicated a spot on the ground nearby. All this time, William had been staring into the sky. Now he gave a little start, and Juan guessed the guy had finally seen Juan's pointer. A second after that, the package was visible to the naked eye. 
a dark speck showing an occasional bluish flare falling silently toward them. It slowed again at ten feet, and they had a glimpse of the cause of the light, dozens of tiny landing jets around the edge of the package. Animal rights campaigners claimed the microturbines were painfully loud to some kinds of bats, but to humans and even dogs and cats, the whole operation was silent, until the very last moment. Just a foot off the ground, there was a burst of wind and a scattering of pine needles. Sign here, Mr. Orozco, said the voice. Juan did so and started toward the mailer. William was already there, kneeling awkwardly. The goofus spazzed at just the wrong instant and lurched forward, putting his knee through the mailer carton. Miri rushed over to him. William, are you okay? William rolled back on his rear and sat there, massaging his knee. Yes, I'm fine, Miriam. Damn. He glanced at Juan. I'm really sorry, kid. For once, he didn't sound sarcastic. Juan kept his mouth shut. He squatted down by the box. It was a standard 20-ounce mailer, now with a big bend in the middle. The lid was jammed, but the material was scarcely stronger than cardboard, and he had no trouble prying it open. Inside, he pulled out a clear bag, held it up for the others to see. William leaned forward, squinting. The bag was filled with dozens of small, irregular balls. They look like rabbit droppings to me. Yes, or health food, said Juan. Whatever they were, it didn't look like William's accident had done them any harm. Toad vomit, what are you doing here? Miriam's voice was sharp and loud. Juan looked up and saw a familiar figure standing beside the mailer. Bertie. As usual, he had a perfect match on the ambient lighting. The twilight gleamed dimly off his grin. He gave Juan a little wave. You can all thank me later. This FedEx courtesy link is only good for two minutes, so I have just enough time to clue you in. He pointed at the bag in Juan's hand. These could be a big help once you get in the park. Miri. You don't have any time. Go away. Juan, you're trashing our local exam just by being here, Bertie. Bertie looked from one indignant face to the other. He gave Miri a little bow and said, You wound me. Then he turned to Juan. Not at all, my dear boy. The exam proctors don't show you as embargoed. Technically, you haven't started your local exam and I'm simply calling to check in with my loyal unlimited team member, namely you. Juan ground his teeth. Okay, what's the news? Bertie's grin broadened to slightly wider than humanly possible. We've made great progress, Juan. I lucked out with the Siberian group. They had just the insight Kistler was needing. We've actually built prototypes. He waved again at the bag in Juan's hand. You've got the first lot. His tone slipped into persuasion mode. I'm not on your local team, but our unlimited exam is concurrent now, isn't it, Juan? Okay. This was extreme even for Bertie. I bet he had the prototypes ready this afternoon. So we need these breadcrumbs tested, and since I noticed that my loyal teammate is incidentally on a field trip through Torrey Pines Park, well, I thought... Miri glared at the intruder's image. So what have you stuck us with? I've got my own plans here. Totally organic network nodes. Good enough to be field tested. We left out the communication laser and recharge capability, but the wee morsels have the rest of the standard function suite. Basic sensors, a router, a localizer. And they're just proteins and sugars, no heavy metals. Come the first heavy rain, they'll be fertilizer. Miri came over to Juan and popped open the plastic bag. She sniffed. These things stink. I bet they're toxic. Oh, no, said Bertie. We sacrificed a lot of functionality to make them safe. You could probably eat the darn things, Mary. Bertie chuckled at the look on her face. But I suggest not. They're kind of heavy on nitrogen compounds. Juan stared at the little balls. Nitrogen compounds? That sounded like the summary work Juan had done earlier this semester. Juan choked on outrage, but all he could think to say was, 
This, this is everything we were shooting for, Bertie. Yep, Bertie preened. Even if we don't get all the standard function suite, our share of the rights will be some good money. And a sure A grade on the unlimited exam. So, Juan, these came off the MIT Organofab about three hours ago. In a nice, clean laboratory, they work fine. Now how about if you sneak them into the park and give them a real field test? You'll be serving your unlimited team at the same time you're working on your local project. Now that's concurrency. Shove off, Bertie, said Miri. He gave her a little bow. My two minutes are almost up anyway. I'm gone. His image vanished. Miri frowned at the empty space where Bertie had been. Do what you want with Bertie's dung balls, Juan. But even if they're totally organic, I'll bet they're still banned by park rules. Yes, but that would just be a technicality, wouldn't it? These things won't leave trash. She just gave an angry shrug. William had picked up the half-crushed mailing carton. What are we going to do with this? Juan motioned him to set it down. Just leave it. There's a FedEx mini-hub in Jamul. The carton should have enough fuel to fly over there. Then he noticed the damage tag floating beside the box. Carre. It says it's not airworthy. There were also warnings about flammable fuel dangers and a reminder that he, Juan Orozco, had signed for the package and was responsible for its proper disposal. William flexed the carton. Empty, the thing was mostly plastic fluff, not more than two or three pounds. I bet I could bend it back into its original shape. Um, Juan said. Miri spelled things out for the goofus. That would probably not work, William. Also, we don't have the manual. If we broke open the fuel system... William nodded. A good point, Miriam. He slipped the carton into his bag, then shook his head wonderingly. It flew here all the way from Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. The three of them resumed their walk down to the ranger station. Only now they were carrying a bit more baggage, both mental and physical. Miri grumbled, arguing mainly with herself about whether to use Bertie's gift. Even with the fog, Bertie's breadcrumbs could give them a real edge in surveilling the park, if they could get them in. Juan's mind raced along that line, trying to figure what he should say at the ranger station. At the same time, he was watching William. The guy had brought a flashlight. The circle of light twitched this way and that, casting tree roots and brush into sharp relief. Come to think of it, without Miri's Marine Corps gear, a flashlight would have been even more welcome than the jackets. In some ways, William was not a complete fool. In others? Juan was just glad that William hadn't pushed the FedEx mailer back at him. Juan would have been stuck with carrying it around all night. The carton counted as toxic waste, and it would surely rat on him if he left it in an ordinary trash can. Old William had been only mildly interested in the breadcrumbs, but the package they came in, even busted, that fascinated the guy. The park's entrance area still had fairly good connectivity, but the ranger station was hidden by the hillside, and Juan couldn't get a view on it. Unfortunately, the state park's website was under construction. Juan browsed around, but all he could find were more out-of-date pictures. The station might be unscrewed. On an off-season Monday night like this, a single 411 operator might be enough to cover all the state parks in Southern California. As they came off the path into direct sight of the station, they saw that it wasn't simply a rest point or even a kiosk. In fact, it was an enclosed office with bright, real lighting and a physically present ranger a middle-aged guy, maybe thirty-five years old. The ranger stood and stepped out into the puddle of light. Evening, he said to William. Then he noticed the heavily bundled forms of Miriam and Juan. Hi, kids. What can I do for you all? Miri glanced significantly at William. Something almost like panic came into William's eyes. He mumbled, Sorry, Munchkin. I don't remember what you do at places like this. It's okay. Miri turned to the ranger. We just want to buy a night pass, no camping, for three. You got it. 
a receipt appeared in the air between them along with the document, a list of park regulations. Wait one. The ranger ducked back into his office and came out with some kind of search wand. This setup was really old-fashioned. I should have done this first. He walked over to William, but was talking to all three of them, essentially hitting the high points of the park regs. Follow the signs. No cliff climbing is allowed. If you go out on the seaside cliff face, we will know and you will be fined. Are you vision equipped? Yes, sir. Miriam raised her goggles into the light. Juan opened his jacket so his equipment vest was visible. The ranger laughed. Wow, I haven't seen those in a while. Just don't leave the batteries lying around in the park. That's... He turned away from William and swept his wand around Miriam and Juan. That's very important here, folks. Leave the park as you found it. No littering and no networking. Loose junk just piles up, and we can't clean it out like you can other places. The wand made a faint whining sound as it passed over Juan's jacket pocket. Buggers. It must have gotten a ping back. Most likely, Bertie's prototypes didn't have a hard-off state. The ranger heard the noise, too. He held the wand flat against Juan's jacket and bent to listen. Damn false alarm, I bet. What do you have in there, son? Juan handed him the bag of dark brownish balls. The ranger held it up to the light. What are these things? Trail mix. William spoke before Juan could even look tongue-tied. Hey, really? Can I try one? He popped the bag open as Juan watched in wide-eyed silence. They look nice and chocolatey. He picked one out of the bag and squeezed it appraisingly. Then the smell hit him. Dios! He threw the ball at the ground and stared at the brown stain that remained on his fingers. That smells like... that smells awful. He jammed the bag back into Juan's hands. I don't know, kid. You have odd tastes but he didn't question their story further. Okay, folks, I think you're good to go. I'll show you the trailhead. I... He stopped, stared vacantly for a second. Oops. I see some people coming into Mount Kuyamaka Park, and I'm covering there tonight, too. You want to go on ahead? He pointed at a path that led northward from his station. You can't miss the trailhead. Even if it's down, there's a big sign. He waved them on, and then turned to talk to whoever he was seeing at the park in the mountains. Beyond the trailhead, the park was completely unimproved, a wilderness. For a hundred feet or so, Juan had wireless connectivity, but even that was fading. Miri checked in with the exam proctor service to certify that their team was going local. Since the wilderness was very soon going to isolate them from the worldwide net, they might as well get official credit for the fact. But yuck. Just knowing you can't go out in the wide world for answers was a pain. It was like having a itch you can't scratch or a sock with lump in it, only much worse. I've cached a lot of stuff about the park, Mary, but some of it is kind of old. Which would have been no problem, but now he couldn't just go out and search for better information. Don't worry about it, Juan. Last week I spent a little money and used a 411 service. See? A few gigabytes flickered on laser light between them. She was prepared. The maps and pictures looked very up to date. Miri confidently picked one of several trails and got them on a gentle path that zigzagged downward toward the northwest. She even persuaded William to use the third pair of goggles instead of his flashlight. The goofus moved awkwardly along. He seemed limber enough, but every four or five paces there was random spiky twitching. It made Juan uncomfortable just to watch the guy. He looked away, played with his goggles menu. Hey, Miri, try Viz Amp. It's pretty. They walked silently for a while. Juan had never been to Torrey Pines Park except with his parents, and that was when he was little and in the daytime. Tonight, with Viz Amp, the light of Venus and Sirius and Betelgeuse came down through the pine boughs, casting colored shadows every which way. Most of the flowers had closed, but there were glints of yellows and reds bobbing among the manzanita and the low, pale cactus. The place was peaceful, really beautiful. And so what if the goggles' low-res pics only showed the direction you were looking at? That was part of the charm. 
They were getting this view without any external help. A step closer to true reality. Okay, Juan. Try laying out some of Bertie's dung balls. The breadcrumbs? Sure. Juan opened the bag and tossed one of the balls off to the side of the path. Nothing. He popped up some low-layer wireless diagnostics. Wow. This is a quiet place. What do you expect? said Miri. No networks, remember? Juan leaned down to inspect the breadcrumb. The park ranger had gotten a faint response with his wand, but now that Juan wanted a ping response, there was nothing. And Bertie hadn't told them an enable protocol. Well, maybe it doesn't matter. Juan was a pack rat. He had all the standard enablers squirreled away on his wearable. He blasted the breadcrumb with one startup call after another. Partway through the sequence, there was a burst of virtual light in his contacts. Ha! This one's live! He turned and caught up with Miri and William. Good going, Juan. For once, Miri Goo sounded pleased with him. The path was still wide and sandy, the gnarled pines hanging fists of long needles right above his head and right in the goofus's face. Amid the park trivia that Juan had downloaded was the claim that this was the last place on earth these pines existed. They rooted in the steep hillsides and hung on for years and years against erosion and drought and cold ocean breezes. Juan glanced back at William's gangly form shambling along behind them. Yeah, old William was kind of like a human Tory pine. They were in the top of the fog now. Towering and silent, pillars of haze drifted by on either side of them. Starlight dimmed and brightened. Behind them, the node Juan had left was dimming toward a zero data rate. He picked out a second breadcrumb, gave it correct startup call, and dropped it to the side of the trail. The low-layer diagnostics showed its pale glow, and after a second it had picked up on the first node, now bright again. They linked. I'm getting data forwarded from the first node. Ha! Normally, you didn't think about details like that. The gadgets kind of reminded Juan of the toy network his father had bought him, back when Pa still had a job. Juan had been only five years old, and the toy nodes had been enormous clunkers but laying them down around the house had engaged father and son for several happy days, and given Juan an intuition about random networks that some grown-ups still seemed to lack. Okay, I see them, said Miri. We're not getting any communication from beyond the dung balls, are we? I don't want anything forwarded out to the world. Yeah, yeah, this is a local exam. We're isolated, unless we punch out with something really loud. He threw out five or six more breadcrumbs, enough so they could figure their relative positions accurately. In his diagnostic view, the locator gleams sharpened from misty guesstimates to diamond-sharp points of light. Fog curled more thickly over them, and the starlight grew hazy. Ahead of him, Miri stumbled. Watch your step. You know, there's really not enough light anymore. In patches, the fog was so thick that Viz Amp was just colorful noise. Yeah, I guess we should switch back to thermal IR. They stopped and stood like idiots, fiddling with manual controls to do something that should have been entirely automatic. Near-infrared was as bad as visual. For a moment, he watched the threads of NIR laser light that flickered sporadically between the data ports on their clothes. In this fog, the tiny lasers were only good for about five feet. Miri was ahead of him. Okay. That's a lot better, she said. Juan finally got his goggles back to their thermal infrared default. Miri's face glowed furnace red except for the cool blackness of her goggles. Most plants were just faintly reddish. The stair-step timber by his feet had three dark holes in the top. Juan reached down and discovered that the holes felt cold and metallic. Ha, metal spikes holding the timber in place. Come on, said Miri. I want to get down near the bottom of the canyon. The stairs were steep, with a heavy wood railing on the drop-off side. The fog was still a problem, but with TIR you could see out at least ten yards. Dim reddish lights floated up through the dark, blobs of slightly warmer air. The bottom was way down, farther than you'd ever guess. He threw out a few more breadcrumbs and looked back up the path at the beacons of the other nodes. 
What a bizarre setup. The light of the breadcrumb diagnostics was showing on his contact lenses, where he normally saw all enhancements. But it was the USMC goggles that were providing most of the augmentation. And beyond them? He stopped, turned off his wearable enhancement, and slipped the goggles up from his face for a moment. Darkness. Absolute darkness. And chill wet air on his face. Talk about isolation. He heard William coming up behind him. The guy stopped, and for a second they stood silent, listening. Miri's voice came from further down the steps. Are you okay, William? Sure, no problem. Okay. Would you and Juan come down by me? We want to stay close enough to keep a good data rate between us. Are you getting any video off the dung balls, Juan? Bertie had said they contained basic sensors. Nope, Juan replied. He slipped the goggles back on and walked down to her. Any breadcrumb video would have shown up on his contacts, but all he was getting was diagnostics. He started another breadcrumb and tossed it far out into the emptiness. Its location showed in his contacts. It fell and fell and fell until he was seeing its virtual gleam through solid rock. He studied the diagnostics a moment more. You know, I think they are sending low data rate video. That's fine. I'll settle for wireless rate. Miri was leaning out past the railing, staring downwards. But it's not a format I know. He showed her what he had. Bertie's Siberian pals must be using something really obscure. Ordinarily, Juan could have put out some queries and had the format definition in a few seconds. But down here in the dark, he was just stuck. Miri made an angry gesture. So Bertie gave you something that could be useful, but only if we punch out a loud call for help? No way. Bertie is not getting his warty hands on my project. Hey, Miri, you and I are supposed to be a team here. It would be so nice if she would stop treating him like dirt. But she was right about Bertie's tactics. Bertie had given them something wonderful and was holding back all the little things that would make it usable. First it was the enable protocol. Now it was this screwball video format. Sooner or later, Bertie figured they'd come crawling to him, begging him to be a shadow member of the team. I could call out to him. His clothes had enough power that he could easily punch wireless as far as network nodes in Del Mar Heights, at least for a few minutes. Getting caught was a real risk. Fairmont used a good proctor service, but it was impossible for them to cover all the paths all the time. This afternoon, Bertie had as much as bragged they would cheat that way. Damn you, Bertie. I'm not going to break isolation. Juan reviewed the mystery data from the breadcrumbs. There seemed to be real content. So given the darkness, the pictures were probably thermal infrared. And I have lots of known video I can compare them to, Everything that has been seen through my goggles during the last few minutes. Maybe it was time for some memory magic, the edge he got from his little blue pills. If he could remember which blocks of imagery might match what the breadcrumbs could see and pass that to his wearable, then conventional reverse engineering would be possible. Juan's mind went blank for a few seconds, and there was a moment of awesome panic. But then he remembered himself. He fed the picture pointers back to his wearable. It began crunching out solutions almost immediately. Try this, Miri. He showed her his best guess image and sharpened it over the next five seconds as his wearable found more correlation spikes. Yes! The picture showed the roots of the big pine a dozen yards behind them. A few seconds passed and there was another picture, black sky and faintly glowing branches. In fact, each breadcrumb was generating a low-resolution TIR image every five seconds or so, even though they couldn't all be forwarded that fast. What are those numbers all about? Numbers that clustered where the picture detail was most complex. Oops. Those are just graphical hierarchy pointers. That was true, but exactly how Juan used them was something he didn't want pursued. He made a note to delete them from all future pics. Miri was silent for several seconds as she watched the pictures coming in from the crumbs above them on the trail and from the one that he'd dropped way down. 
Juan was on the point of asking for payback, like some straight talk about exactly what they were looking for. But then she said, This picture format is one of those Siberian puzzles, isn't it? Looks like. Those formats were all different, created by antisocials who seemed to get a kick out of not being interoperable. And you untangled it in fifteen seconds? Sometimes Juan just didn't think ahead. Yup, he said, blissfully proud. The uncovered part of her face flared. You lying weasel! You're talking to the outside! Now Juan's face got hot, too. Don't you call me a liar! You know I'm good with interfaces. Not that good. Her voice was deadly. Carré. The right lie occurred to Juan a few seconds too late. He should have said he'd seen the Siberian picture format before. Now the only safe thing to do was confess that he was talking to Bertie. But Juan couldn't bear to tell that lie, even if it meant she would figure out what he had really done. Miri stared at him for several seconds. William's begoggled face had turned from one of them to other like a spectator at a tennis game. He spoke into the silence and for once sounded a little surprised. So what are you doing now, Miriam? Juan had already guessed. She's watching the fog and listening. Miri nodded. If Orozco is sneaking out on wireless, I'd hear it. If he's using something directional, I'd see side scatter from the fog. I don't see anything just now. So, maybe I'm squirting micropulses. Juan's words came out all choked, but he was trying to sound sarcastic. Any laser bright enough to get through the fog would have left an afterglow. Maybe. If you are, Juan Orozco, I will figure it out, and I'll get you kicked out of school. She turned back to look over the drop-off. Let's get going. The steps got even steeper. Eventually, they reached a turn and walked on almost level ground for about sixty feet. The other side of the gorge was less than fifteen feet away. We must be close to the bottom, said William. No, William, these canyons go awfully deep and narrow. Miri motioned them to stop. My darn battery has died. She fumbled around beneath her jacket, replacing a dead battery with one that was only half dead. She adjusted her goggles and looked over the railing. Huh, we have a good view from here. She waved at the depths. You know, Orozco, this might be the place to do some active probing. Juan pulled the probe gun from the sling on his back. He plugged it into his equipment vest. With the gun connected, most of the options were live. Bat, low. Bat two, low. Sensors, passive. Viz amp, okay. NIR, okay. Greater than TIR, okay. Sniff, NA. Audio, NA. SIG, NA. Active. GPR, okay. Sono, okay. X echo, okay. Gated viz, okay. Gated NIR, okay. What do you want to try? The ground penetrating radar. She pointed her own gun at the canyon wall. Use your power and we'll both watch. Juan fiddled with the controls. The gun made a faint click as it shot a radar pulse into the rock wall. Ah! The USMC goggles showed the pulse's backscatter as lavender shading on top of the thermal IR. In the daylight pictures that Juan had downloaded, these rocks were white sandstone, fluted and scalloped into shapes that water or wind could not carve alone. The microwave revealed what could only be guessed at from the visible light, moisture that etched and weakened the rock from the inside. Aim lower. Okay. He fired again. See, way down, it looks like little tunnels cut in the rock. Juan stared at the pattern of lavender streaks. They did look different than the ones higher up, but I think that's just where the rock is soaking wet. Miri was already hurrying down the steps. Toss out more dung balls. Down and around another thirty feet, they came to a place where the path was just a tumble of large boulders. The going got very slow. William stopped and pointed at the far wall. Look, a sign. There was a square wooden plate spiked into the sandstone. 
William lit his flashlight and leaned out from the path. Juan raised his goggles for a moment and got the dubious benefit of William's light. Everything beyond ten feet was hidden behind the pearly white fog. But the faded lettering on the sign was now visible. Fat Man's Misery. William chuckled, and then almost lost his footing. Did you ever think? Old-fashioned writing is the ultimate in context tagging. It's passive, informative, and present exactly where you need it. Yeah, sure, but can I point through it and find out what it thinks it means? William doused his flashlight. I guess it means the gorge gets even narrower further on. Which we already knew from Miri's maps. At the trailhead, this had looked like a valley 100 feet across. It had narrowed and narrowed, till now the far wall was about 10 feet away. And from here... Scatter some more dung balls, said Miri. She was pointing straight down. Okay. They still had plenty of them. He carefully dropped six breadcrumbs where Miri indicated. They stood silently for a moment, watching the network diagnostics. The position guesstimate on one crumb was 25 to 30 feet further down. That was darn near the true bottom of the gorge. Juan took a breath. So are you ever going to tell us what precisely we're looking for, Miri? I don't precisely know. But this is where you saw the UCSD people poking around? Some, but they were mainly south of this valley. Jeez, Miri, so you brought us here instead? Look, you, I'm not keeping secrets. I could see the hills above this canyon from the tourist scopes on Delmar Heights. In the weeks after the UCSD guys left, there were small changes in the vegetation, mostly over this valley. At night, the bats and owls were at first more active and then less active than before. And now, tonight, we've spotted some kind of tunnels in the rocks. William sounded mystified. That's all, Miriam? The girl didn't blow up when it was William asking. Instead, she seemed almost abashed. Well, there's context. Ferretti and Voss were behind the trips to the park in January. One is into synthetic ethology. The other is a world-class proteomics geek. They both got called to San Diego all at once, just like you'd expect for a movie teaser. And I'm sure, almost sure, they're both consulting for Fox Warner. Juan sighed. That wasn't much more than she'd said in the beginning. Maybe Miri's biggest problem wasn't that she was bossy. It was that she was too darn good at projecting certainty. Juan made a disgusted noise. And you figure if we just poke around carefully enough, solid clues will show up? Whatever they may be. Yes. Somebody has to be the first to catch on. Using our probe gear and, yeah, Bertie's dung balls... We're not going to miss much. My theory is Fox Warner is trying to top what Spielberg Rowling did last year with the magma monsters. This will be something that starts small and is overtly plausible. With Ferretti and Voss as advisors, I'll bet they play it as an escape from a bioscience lab. That would certainly fit the San Diego scene. The new breadcrumbs had located their nearest neighbors. Now the extended network showed as diamond-sharp virtual gleams scattered through the spaces both above and below. In effect, they had twenty little eyeballs watching from all over the canyon. The pictures were all low-resolution stuff, but taken together, that was too much data to forward all at once across the breadcrumb net to their wearables. They would have to pick through the viewpoints carefully. Okay, then, said Juan, let's just sit and watch for a bit. The goofus remained standing. He seemed to be staring upward. Juan guessed that he was having some trouble with the video Juan was forwarding to him. Things were going to get pretty dull for him. Abruptly, William said, Do either of you smell something burning? Fire? Juan felt a flash of alarm. He sniffed carefully at the damp air. Maybe. Or it might just be something flowering in the night. Smells were a hard thing to search on and learn about. I smell it too, William, Mary said, but I think things are still too wet for it to be a danger. Besides, said Juan, if there was fire anywhere close, we'd see the hot air in our goggles. Maybe someone had a fire down on the beach. 
William shrugged and sniffed at the air again. Trust the goofus to have one superior sense, and that one useless. After a moment, he sat down beside them, but as far as Juan could tell, he still wasn't paying attention to the pictures Juan was sending him. William reached into his bag and pulled out the FedEx mailer. The guy was still fascinated by the thing. He flexed the carton gently, then rested the box on his knees. Despite all Miri's warnings, it looked like the goofus wanted to knock it back into shape. He'd carefully poise one hand above the middle of the carton, as if preparing a precise poke, and then his hand would start shaking and he would have to start all over again. Juan looked away from him. Jeez, the ground was hard and cold. He wriggled back against the rock wall and cycled through the pictures he was getting from the breadcrumbs. They were pretty uninspiring. But sitting here quietly, not talking, there were sounds, things that might have been insects, and behind it all a faint, regular throbbing. Automobile traffic? Maybe. Then he realized that it was the sound of ocean surf, muffled by fog and the zigzag walls of the canyon. It was really kind of peaceful. There was a popping sound very nearby. Juan looked up and saw that William had done it again, smashed the mailer. Only now, it didn't look so bent, and a little green light had replaced the warning tag. You fixed it, William, said Mary. William grinned. Ha! Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. He was silent for a second, and his shoulders slumped a little. Well, different anyway. Juan looked at the gap in the canyon walls above them. There should be enough room. Just set it on the ground and it will fly away to Jamul, he said. No, said William. He put the carton back in his bag. Okay, so the box is cool. Have a ball, William. They sat listening to the surf, cycling through the video from the breadcrumbs. There were occasional changes in the pictures, quick blurs that might have been moths. Once, they saw something bigger, a glowing snout and a blurry leg. I bet that was a fox, said Mary. But the picture was from above us. Root us more pictures from the bottom of the canyon. Right. There was even less action down there. Maybe her movie theories were vapor after all. He didn't pay as much attention to the movies as most people did, and just now he couldn't do any background research. Dumb. On the way to the park, he had cached all sorts of stuff, but almost nothing about movie rumors. Hey, a snake, said Miri. The latest picture was from a breadcrumb that had landed in a bush just a few inches above the true bottom of the canyon. It was a very good viewpoint, but he didn't see any snake. There was a pine cone, and beside it a curved pattern in the dark sand. Oh, a dead snake. Viewed in thermal IR, the body was a barely visible as a change in texture. Or maybe it's just a shed skin. There are tracks all around it, said Miri. I think they're mouse tracks. Juan ran the image through some filters and pulled up a half dozen good footprints. He had cached pictures from nature studies. He stared at them all, transforming and correlating. They're mouse tracks, but they aren't pocket mice or whitefoot. The prints are too big, and the angle of the digits is wrong. How can you tell? Suspicion was in her voice. Juan was not about to repeat his recent blunder. I downloaded nature facts earlier, he said truthfully, and some fully cool analysis programs, which was a lie. Okay, so what kind of mice? A new picture arrived from the breadcrumb in question. Whoa, wow. What is it? said William. I see the snake carcass now. Apparently he was a couple of pictures behind them. See, William? A mouse, right below our viewpoint, staring straight up at us. Glowing beady eyes looked into the imager. I bet mice can't see in the dark, said Juan. Well, Fox Warner has never been strong on realism. Juan gave top routing priority to picks from the same breadcrumb. Come on, come on. Meantime, he stared at the picture they had, analyzing. In thermal IR, the mouse's pelt was dim red, shading in the shorter fur to orange. Who knew what it looked like in natural light? 
Ah, but the shape of the head looked... A new picture came in. Now there were three mice looking up at them. Maybe they're not seeing the dung ball. Maybe they're smelling the stink. Shh, William whispered. Miri leaned forward, listening. Juan pushed up his hearing and listened too, his fists tightening. Maybe it was just his imagination. Were there little scrabbling noises from below? The gleam of the breadcrumb beacon was almost thirty feet below where they were sitting. The breadcrumb gleam moved. Juan heard Mary's quick, indrawn breath. I think they're shaking the bush it's on, she said softly. And the next picture they saw seemed to be from right on the ground. There was a blur of legs and a very good headshot. Juan sharpened the image and did some more comparisons. You know what color those mice are? Of course not. White, maybe? I mean, lab mice would be neat. In fact, Juan had only just saved himself. He'd been about to say, White, of course, their head shape matches generic 513 lab mice. The conclusion was based on applying conventional software to his cached nature information, but no normal person could have set up the comparisons as fast as he had just done. Fortunately, Miri had some distractions. The breadcrumbs locator gleam was moving horizontally in little jerks. A new picture came up, but it was all blurred. They're rolling it along, playing with it, or taking it somewhere. Both kids bounced to their feet, and then William stood up too, Miri forced her voice down to a whisper. Yeah, lab mice would be neat. Escaped super mice. This could be a remake of Secret of Nim. Those were rats in Nim. A detail. She was already moving down the trail. The timing would be perfect. The copyright on the second remake just lapsed. And did you see how real those things looked? Up till a few months ago, you couldn't make animatronics that good. Maybe they are real, said William. You mean like trained mice? Maybe, at least for parts of the show. The latest picture showed cold darkness. The imaging element must be pointing into the dirt. They climbed down and down, trying their best not to make noise. Maybe it didn't matter. The surf sound was much louder here. In any case, the fake mice were still rolling along their stolen breadcrumb. But while the three humans were moving mainly downward, the breadcrumb had moved horizontally almost fifteen feet. The pictures were coming less and less frequently. Carré, it's getting out of range. Juan took three more breadcrumbs from his bag and threw them one at a time as hard as he could. A few seconds passed, and the new crumbs registered with the net. One had landed on a ledge, forward and above them. Another had fallen between the humans and the mice. The third, ha, ah, its locator gleamed from beyond the mice. Now there were lots of good possibilities. Juan grabbed a picture off the farthest crumb. The view was looking back along the path, in the direction the mice would be coming from. Without any sense of scale, it looked like a picture from some fantasy Yosemite Valley. They had finally reached the bottom and could make some speed. From behind them, William said, Watch your head, munchkin. Oops said Mary, and stopped short. We get carried away there. This might be a big valley for mice, but just ahead, the walls arched to within inches of each other. She bent down. It's wider at the bottom. I bet I could wiggle through. I know you could, Juan. Maybe, Juan said brusquely. He pushed past her and stepped up into the cleft. He got the active probe off his back and held it in one hand as he slid into the gap. If he stood sideways and tilted his upper body, he could fit. He didn't even have to take off his jacket. He sidled a foot or two further, dragging the probe gun behind him. Then the passage widened enough for him to turn and walk forward. Miri followed a moment later. She looked up. Huh, this is almost like a cave with a hole running along the ceiling. I don't like this, Miriam, said William, who was left behind. No way could he squeeze through. Don't worry, William. We'll be careful not to get jammed. In any real emergency, they could always punch out a call to 911. The two kids moved forward another fifteen feet to where the passage narrowed again, even more than before. Caray, the stolen breadcrumb is off the net. 
Maybe we should have just stayed up top and watched. It was a little late for her to be saying that. Juan surveyed the crumb net. There was not even a hazy guesstimate on the lost node. But there were several pictures from the crumb he had tossed beyond all this. Every one of them showed an empty path. Miri, I don't think the mice ever got to the next viewpoint. Hey, did you hear that, William? The mice must have taken off down a hole somewhere. Okay, I'll look around back here. Juan and Miri moved back along the passage, looking for bolt holes. Of course, there were no shadows. The fine sand of the path was almost black, the fallen pine needles scarcely brighter. On either side, the rock walls showed dark and mottled red as the sandstone cooled in the night air. You'd think their nest would show a glow. So they're in deep. Miri held up her probe gun and slipped the radar attachment back onto the barrel. USMC to the rescue. They traversed the chamber from one narrowness to the other. When they put the GPR snout of the guns right up to the rock, the lavender echograms were much more detailed than before. There really were tunnels, mouse-sized and extending back into the rock. They went through three batteries in about five minutes, but... But we still haven't found an entrance. Keep looking, we know there is one. Caray, Miri, it's just not here. You're right. That was William. He had crawled part way in to look at them. Come back here. The critters jumped off the trail before it got narrow. What? How do you know? William backed out, and the kids wriggled out after him. Old William had been busy. He had swept the pine cones and needles away from the edges of the path. His little flashlight lay on the ground. But they didn't need a flashlight to see what William had discovered. The edge of the path, which should have been black and cold, was a dim red, a redness that spread across the rock face like weird, upward-dripping blood. Miri dropped flat and poked around where the heat red was brightest. Ha! I got my finger into something. Can't find an end to it. She pulled back, and a plume of orange followed her hand and then drifted up, its color cooling to red as it swelled and rose above them. There was the faint smell of burning wood. For a moment, they just stared at each other, the big black goggle eyes a true reflection of their inner shock. No more warm air rose from the hole. We must have found an indraft, William said. Both Miri and Juan were on their knees now. They looked carefully, but the goggles didn't have the resolution to let them see the hole clearly. It was simply a spot that glowed a bit redder than anything else. Use the gun, Juan. He probed the rock above the hole and on either side. The tiny passage extended two feet down from the entrance, branching several times before it reached the main network of tunnels and chambers. So what happened to the dung ball they grabbed? It would be nice to get some pictures from in there. Juan shrugged and fed his probe gun still another battery. They must have it in one of the farther chambers, behind several feet of rock. The crumb doesn't have the power to get through that. Juan and Miri looked at each other and laughed. But we have lots more breadcrumbs. Juan felt around for the entrance hole and rolled a crumb into it. It lit up about six inches down, just past the first tunnel branch. Try another. Juan studied the tunnel layout for a moment. If I throw one in just right, I bet I can carry it a couple of feet. The crumb's light disappeared for a moment, and then appeared as data forwarded via the first one. Yes! Still no word from the one they stole, said Mary. They were just the two locator gleams, about six inches and thirty-six inches down their respective tunnels. Juan touched the gun here and there to the rock face. With the GPR at high power, he could probe through a lot of sandstone. How much could he figure out from what came back? I think I can refine this even more, he said, though that would surely make Miri suspicious. That third fork in the tunnel, something soft, is blocking it. A brightly reflecting splotch coming slowly toward them. It looks like a mouse. Yeah, and it's moving between two breadcrumbs, effectively a two-station wireless tomograph. Maybe I can combine it all. 
For a moment, Juan's whole universe was the problem of meshing the breadcrumb tomography with the GPR backscatter. The image showed more and more detail. He blanked out for just a second, and for a moment after that forgot to be cautious. It was a mouse, all right. It was facing up the tunnel toward the entrance the three humans were watching. They could even see its guts and the harder areas that were skull and ribs and limbs. There was something stuck in its forepaw. The whole thing looked like some cheap graphics trick. Too bad Miri didn't take it that way. Okay, I've had it with you, Juan. One person could never work that fast. You doormat. You led Bertie and his committee. Honest, Miri, I did this myself, said Juan, defending where he should not defend. We're getting an F on account of you, and Bertie will own all of this. William had been watching with the same detachment as during Miri's earlier accusations, but this time... I see the picture, Munchkin, but I don't think he's lying. I think he did it himself. But... William turned to Juan. You're on drugs, aren't you, kid? He said mildly. Once a secret is outed... No! Make the accusation look absurd. But Juan floundered, wordless. For an instant, Miri stared open-mouthed. And then she did something that Juan thought about a lot in the times that followed. She raised her hands, palms out, trying to silence them both. William smiled gently. Miriam, don't worry. I don't think Fox Warner is patching us into their summer release. I don't think anyone but us knows what we're saying here at the bottom of a canyon in thick fog. She slowly lowered her hands. But, William... She waved at the warmth that spread up the rock face. None of this could be natural. But what kind of unnatural is it, Munchkin? Look at the picture your friend Juan just made. You can see the insides of the mouse. It's not animatronic. William ran a twitchy hand through his hair. I think somebody in the bioscience labs hereabouts really did have an accident. Maybe these creatures aren't as smart as humans, but they were smart enough to escape and fool... Who was it that was poking around here in January? Ferretti and Voss, Miri said in a small voice. Yes, maybe just hiding down here when the bottom was underwater was enough to fool them. I'll bet these creatures have just a little edge over ordinary lab mice. But a little edge can be enough to change the world. And Juan realized William wasn't talking about just the mice. I don't want to change the world, he said in a choked voice. I just want to have my chance in it. William nodded. Fair enough. Miri looked back and forth at them. What Juan could see of her expression was very solemn. Juan shrugged. It's okay, Mary. I think William is right. We're all alone here. She leaned a little toward him. Was it Bertie who got you into this? Some. My mother has our family in one of the distributed Framinghams. I showed my part of it to Bertie last spring after I flunked adaptability. Bertie shopped it around as an anonymous challenge. He came back with a custom drug. What it does... Juan tried to laugh, but it sounded more like a rattle. Most people would think that what it does is a joke, see? He tapped the side of his head. It makes my memory very, very good. Everyone thinks human memory doesn't count for much anymore. People say, no need for eidetic memory when your clothes data storage is a billion times bigger. But that's not the point. Now I can remember big data blocks perfectly, and I have my wearable put hierarchical tags on all the stuff I see. So I can communicate patterns back to my wearable just by citing a few numbers. It gives me this incredible advantage in setting up problems. So Bertie is your great friend because you are his super tool? Her voice was quiet and outraged, but the anger was no longer directed at Juan. No! I've studied the memory effect. The idea itself came from analysis of my own medical data. Even now that we have the gimmick, only one person in a thousand could be affected by it at all. There's no way Bertie could have known beforehand that I was special. 
Ah, of course, she said, and was silent. Juan hated it when people did that, agreed with what you said, and then waited for you to figure out why you had just made a fool of yourself. Bertie is just very good with connections. He had connections everywhere, to research groups, idea markets, challenge boards. But maybe Bertie had figured out how to do even better. How many casual friends did Bertie have? How many did he offer to help with custom drug improvements? Most of that would turn out to be minor stuff, and maybe those friendships would remain casual. But sometimes, Bertie would hit the jackpot. Like with me. But Bertie is my best friend. I will not blubber. You could find other friends, son, said William. He shrugged. Back before I lost my marbles, I had a gift. I could make words sing. I would give almost anything to get that back. And you? Well, however you came by it, the talent you have now is a marvelous gift. You are beholden to no one other than yourself for it. Miri said softly, I... I don't know, Juan. Custom meds aren't illegal like twentieth-century drugs, but they are off-limits for a reason. There's no way to do full testing on them. This stuff you're taking could... I know. It could fry my mind. Juan put his hands to his face and ran into the cold plastic of his goggles. For a moment, Juan's mind turned inward. All the old fear and shame rose up and balanced against the strange surprise that out of the whole world, this old man could understand him. But even here, even with his eyes closed, his contacts were still on, and Juan saw the virtual gleam of the breadcrumbs. He stared passively for several seconds, and then surprise began to eat through his funk. Mary, they're moving! Huh? She had been paying even less attention than he had. Yes, down the tunnels, away from us. William moved close to the mouse hole and pressed his ear against the stone wall. I'll bet our little friends are taking your dung balls to wherever the first one went. Can you get some pictures from them, Juan? Yes, here's one. A thermal glimpse of a glowing tunnel floor, frothy piles of something that looked like finely shredded paper. Seconds passed, and a virtual gleam showed dimly through the rock. There's the locator beacon of the first crumb. It was five feet deeper in the rock. Now it has a node to forward through. We could lose them, too. Juan pushed past William and tossed two more breadcrumbs down the hole. One rolled a good three feet, the other stopped after six inches, and then began moving on its own. The mice are stringing nodes for us. All but the farthest locator beacon were glowing high-rate bright. Now there were lots of pictures, but the quality was poor. As the crumbs warmed in the hot air of the tunnels, the images showed very little detail, except for the mice themselves. Paws and snouts and glowing eyes. Hey, did you see the splinter sticking out of that poor thing's paw? Yes. I think that's the one I saw before. Wait, we're getting a picture from the crumb they stole to begin with. At first, the data was a jumble. Still another picture format? Not exactly. This picture is normal vision, Mary. He finished the transformation. How? Then she gave a sharp little gasp. There was no scale marker, but the chamber couldn't have been more than a couple of feet across. To the eye of the breadcrumb, it was a wide, high-ceilinged meeting room crowded with dozens of white-furred mice, their dark eyes glittering by the light of a fire in the middle of the hall. I think you have your A, Miriam, William said softly. Miri didn't answer. Rank upon rank of mice crouched around the fire. Three mice stood at the center, higher up, tending the flame, it wobbled and glowed more like a candle than a bonfire. But the mice didn't seem to be watching the fire as much as they were the breadcrumb. Bertie's little breadcrumb was the magical arrival at their meeting. See? Mary hunched forward, her elbows on her knees. Fox Warner strikes again. A slow flame in a space like that. 
those mice should all be dead of carbon monoxide poisoning. The breadcrumbs were not sending spectral data, so who could say? Juan visualized the tunnel system. There were other passages a little higher up, and he had data on the capacity of the inlets and outlets. He thought a few seconds more and gave the problem to his wearable. No, actually, there is enough ventilation to be safe. Mary looked up at him. Wow, you are fast. Your epiphany outfit could do it in an instant. But it would have taken me five minutes to pose the problem to my epiphany. Another picture came in, firelight on a ceiling. The mice are rolling it closer to the fire. I think they're just poking at it. Another picture. The crumb had been turned again and now was looking outwards to where three more mice had just come in from a large side entrance, rolling another breadcrumb. But the next picture was a blur of motion, a glimpse of a mostly empty meeting chamber in thermal colors. The fire had been doused. Something's stirred them up, said William, listening again at the stone wall. I can actually hear them chittering. The dung balls are coming back this way, said Mary. The mice are smart enough to understand the idea of poison. William's voice was soft and wondering. Up to a point, they grabbed our gifts like small children. Then they noticed that the dung balls just kept coming, and someone raised an alarm. There were still pictures, lots of them, but they were all thermal IR, chaotic blurs. The mice were hustling. The locator gleams edged closer together, some moving toward an entrance about three feet above the gully floor. The others were approaching the first hole. Juan touched the probe gun against the wall and pulsed the rock in several places. He was getting pretty good at identifying the flesh and blood reflections. Most of the mice have moved away from us. It's just a rear guard that's pushing up the breadcrumbs. There's a crowd of them behind the crumbs that are coming out by your head, William. William, quick, the FedEx mailer. Maybe we can trap some when they come out. I, yes. William stood and pulled the FedEx mailer from his bag. He tilted the open carton toward the mouse hole. A second later, there was a faint scrabbling noise, and William's arms moved with that twitchy speed of his. Juan had a glimpse of fur and flying breadcrumbs. William slapped the container shut and then stumbled backwards as three more mice came racing out of the lower hole. For a fleeting instant, their glowing blue eyes stared up at the humans. Miri made a dive for them, but they had already fled down the path, oceanward. She picked herself up and looked at William. How many did you get? Four. The little guys were in such a rush, they just jumped out at me. He held the mailer close. Juan could hear tiny thumping noises from inside it. That's great, said Miri. Physical evidence. William didn't reply. He just stood there, staring at the carton. Abruptly, he turned and walked a little way up the trail, to where the path widened out and the brush and pines didn't cover the sky. I'm sorry, Miriam. He tossed the mailer high into the air. The box was almost invisible for a moment, and then its ring of jets lit up. Tiny, white-hot spikes of light traced the mailer's path as it wobbled and swooped within a foot of the rock wall. It recovered and slowly climbed, still wobbling. Juan could imagine four very live cargo items careening around inside it. Silent to human ears, the mailer rose and rose, jets dimming in the fog. The light was a pale smudge when it drifted out of sight behind the canyon wall. Miri stood, her arms reaching out as if pleading. Grandfather, why? For a moment, William Goo's shoulders slumped. Then he looked across at Juan. I bet you know, don't you, kid? Juan stared in the direction the mailer had taken. Four mice rattling around in a half-broken mailer. He had no idea just now what security was like at the FedEx mini-hub, but it was at the edge of the back country, where the mail launchers didn't cause much complaint. Out beyond Jamul, the mice could have their chance in the world. He looked back at William and just gave a single quick nod. There was very little talk as they climbed back out of the canyon. Near the top, the path was wide and gentle. 
Mary and William walked hand in hand. There were spatters of coldness on her face that might have been tears, but there was no quaver in her voice. If the mice are real, we've done a terrible thing, William. Maybe. I'm sorry, Miriam. But I don't think they are real, William. William made no reply. After a moment, Mary said, You know why? Look at that first picture we got from the mouse meeting hall. It's just too perfectly dramatic. The chamber doesn't have furniture or wall decorations, but it clearly is a meeting hall. Look how all the mice are positioned, like humans at an old town meeting. And then at the center... Juan's eyes roamed the picture as she spoke. Yes, there in the center, almost as though they were on stage, stood three large white mice. The biggest one had reared up as it looked at the imager. It had one paw extended, and the paw grasped something sharp and long. They had seen things like that in other pictures and never quite figured them out. In this natural light picture, the tool, a spear, was unmistakable. Miri continued on. See, that's the tip-off, Fox Warner's little joke. A real, natural breakthrough in animal intelligence would never be such a perfect movie poster. So, later tonight, Juan and I will turn in our local team report, and Fox Warner will fess up. By dinner time at the latest, we'll be famous. And my own little secret will be outed. Miri must have understood Juan's silence. She reached out and took his hand, dragging the three of them close together. Look, she said softly, we don't know what, if anything, Fox Warner recorded of us. Even now, we're in thick fog. Except for the mice themselves, our gear saw no sensors. So either Fox Warner is impossibly good, or they weren't close snooping us. She gestured up the path. Now in a few more minutes, we'll be back in the wide world. Bertie and maybe Fox Warner will be wisping around. But no matter what you think really happened tonight... Her voice trailed off, and Juan finished. No matter what really happened, we're all best to keep our mouths shut about certain things. She nodded. Bertie followed Juan home from Miri's house, arguing, wheedling, demanding all the way. He wanted to know what Miri had been up to, what all they had done and seen. When Juan wouldn't give him more than the engineering data from the dung balls, Bertie had got fully dipped, kicked Juan off their unlimited team, and rejected all connections. It was a total freeze-out. By the time Juan got home, he could barely put up a good front for his ma. But strangely enough, Juan slept well that night. He woke to morning sunlight splashing across his room. Then he remembered. Bertie's total freeze-out. I should be frantic. This could mean he'd fail the Unlimited and lose his best friend. Instead, more than anything else, Juan felt like he was free. Juan slipped on his clothes and contacts and wandered downstairs. Usually he'd be all over the net about now, sinking with the world, finding out what his friends had done while he was wasting time asleep. He'd get to that eventually. It would be just as much fun as ever. But just now, the silence was a pleasure. There were a dozen red, please reply lights gleaming in front of his eyes, mostly from Bertie. The message headers were random flails. This was the first time one of Bertie's freeze-outs had not ended because Juan came groveling. Ma looked up from her breakfast. You're offline, she said. Yeah. He slouched onto a chair and started eating cereal. His father smiled absently at him and went on eating. Pa's eyes were very far away, his posture kind of slumped. Ma looked back and forth between them, and a shadow crossed her face. Juan straightened up a little and made sure she saw his smile. I'm just tired out from all the hiking around. Suddenly he remembered something. Hey, thanks for the maps, Ma. She looked puzzled. Miri used 411 for recent information on Tory Pines. Oh, Ma's face lit up. There were a number of 411 services in San Diego County, but this was her kind of thing. Did the test go well? Don't know yet. They ate in silence for a moment. 
I expect I'll know later today. He looked across the table at her. Hey, you're offline too. She grimaced and gave him a little grin. An unintended vacation. The movie people dropped their reservations for a tour time. Oh, just what you'd expect if the operation in East County was related to what they'd found in Torrey Pines. Miri would have seen the cancellation as significant evidence. Maybe it was. But he and Miri had turned in their project report last night, the first local exam to complete. If she were right about the mice, Fox Warner was sure to know by now that their project had been outed, and you'd think they'd have launched publicity. And yet, there were no bulletins, just Bertie and a few other students pinging away at him. Give it till dinner time. That's how long Miri said it might take for a major cinema organization to move into action. Real or movie, they should know by then. And his own secret? It would be outed, or not. Juan had a second serving of cereal. Since he had a morning exam, Ma let him take a car to Fairmont. He made it to school with time to spare. The vocational exam was for individuals, and you weren't allowed to search beyond the classroom. As with Ms. Wilson's math exam, the faculty had dug up some hoary piece of business that no reasonable person would ever bother with. For the vocational test, the topic would be a work specialty, and today, it was Regna 5. When Regna had been hot, back in Pa's day, tech schools had taken three years of training to turn out competent Regna practitioners. It was a snap. Juan spent a couple of hours scanning through the manuals, integrating the skills, and then he was ready for the programming task, some cross-corporate integration nonsense. He was out by noon, with an A. End of the Collected Stories of Werner Vinge by Werner Vinge V-E-R-N-O-R-V-I-N-G-E -E. Read by Terence Aselford in the studios of Potomac Talking Book Services, Incorporated for the Library of Congress, April 2004. Published by Tor, Tom Doherty Associates, LLC, 175 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10010. Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.